This is Cerebral Cinema. Movies of the Mind. What's the matter? What is it? It's another thing from Nick Carter, Master Detective. <laughs> Yes, it's another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective, presented by the three great home brighteners, Linux Clear Gloss, Linux Cream Polish, and Linux Self-Polishing Wax, created by Acme. Of Carter and the mystery of the opera singer's dog. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll hear how Nick Carter solves the mystery of the murder on Mad Mountain by Nick and Patsy in a train which is crossing the hump of Mad Mountain in a raging blizzard. This is a pretty thrilling experience, Nick, riding over the mountain in a blizzard like this. We're just as snug and cozy inside the train here as if we were in our own home. It may be thrilling, Patsy, but it's pretty dangerous, too. Dangerous? What's dangerous about it? Well, up here on Mad Mountain, there's always the danger of a snow slide sweeping down on us and pushing the whole train down into the canyon. Or we could run into extra heavy drifts and get stalled. In fact, that's where Mad Mountain got its name. And the trouble it's always caused the railroad. Well, I don't care. I'm enjoying it just the same. Wonder how much behind schedule we are. Here comes the conductor. I'll ask him. Oh, conductor? Sure. How late are we going to be? Well, I can't tell you, miss. Depends on how long this storm keeps up. Hey, conductor. Didn't you used to be on the New York to Miami run of the Penzi about ten years ago? Uh, yes, I did. Left there eleven years ago next March. I thought so. I used to ride with you often in those days. Is your name Bonner? Robert Bonner? It's, uh, got quite a memory. Sure, I'm Robert Bonner, but I, I don't remember you. <laughs> Detective trained mind remember names and faces, Mr. Bonner. Nick's a great one for that. Uh, Nick? You don't mean you're Nick Carter? Yeah, dear, the first degree. Well, 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 don't that beat off. After 11 years, I would say, Mr. Carter, I, you know, I'm sort of glad you're riding with us this trip. You want me to help you find the tracks again if the train runs off them? <laughs> it ain't the blizzard I was thinking of, bad as it is. That opera star we got hitched on the rear of the train. You mean that private car we saw at the terminal belongs to a real opera star? Who is she? Her name's Pauline Hall, and she just struck up a oh, highfalutin queen of them all. Well, why are you worried about her? Well, after we hitched her car on, I went back to see if everything was okay. Orders, you know. Sure, I know. Well, out she comes wearing more jewels than the Russian royal family. She waves her hand at me and she says, Conductor... Please see that no one is permitted to enter my car at all. I'm not to be disturbed before we get to Sacramento in the morning. That fuzzy little chow dog of hers stands there blinking at me. <laughs> the collar around his neck studded with diamonds. Well, a chow is a high class dog, Mr. Bonner. <laughs> and then, and then, as if there ain't enough trouble for me trying to keep everything straight around here with a blizzard blowing down my neck, I get this telegram from the chief. Says I gotta take care of the dame and her sparklers as if they were my own. <laughs> There's the stuff she's carrying is worth about a hundred thousand cash. That's a lot of jewels to be lying around loose. Yeah, maybe she won't be disturbed in Sacramento in the morning either if that dumb engineer of ours don't use more sand. <laughs> we was an hour behind crawling up the other side. Now we ain't even crawling. Why, Nick, we stopped. We aren't moving at all now. Sounds as if we're in trouble. Yes, sir. We are in trouble. Engineer's whistling for a flag man. You've got to get him out fast. Won't he like that on a night like this? Well, what do you need a flagman for up here in the mountain? Well, the second section, this train's right behind us. And oh. this note, she could plow right into us before she knew we were here. Hey, Carney, Carney, wake up, you. Oh, well, what's the matter now, boss? Now, get your flag and get going. We're stuck. Oh, look, on a night like this... There's no don't... time to argue, Carney. Now, you get ready and start on your way back. And you'll be sure to get back a full half mile, too, before you set up your flares. Be watching. Shake it up. Uh, I suppose I've got to climb out and wait around that opera star's car. She won't let me go through. You bet she won't. When you go by her car, don't cuss the lad you wake her up either. I don't want to be hauled on the carpet for disturbing her nibs. Uh, snow must be up to my waist by this time. Yes, and don't, watch out you don't fall over into the canyon. There ain't much room to spare between the track and the edge of that cliff, you know. Uh, of all the doggone dirty jobs on the railroad, this being a place. <laughs> he doesn't look very happy. No, no, and I ain't very happy either. That doddering old throttle pusher up there in the cab was a real he-man. We wouldn't be stopping for a little snow. Uh, well, ain't nothing to do now but wait. Hope the second section don't jam into us. What's the engineer trying to do? 
trying to do now, Bob. Yeah, sounds like he's signaling to the other section. That dumb flag man of mine set the flares going like I told him to. They ought to stop the rest of this thing. Then there wouldn't be no need for all that tooting and whistling. Well, why don't you look and see if you can see the flares, Mr. Bonner? Huh? They certainly show up across the snow. Now that it stops snowing. Well, that's just what I'm going to do. You want to come, Mr. Carter? Wait till I get my coat on and I'll be right with you. Uh, you ready, Mr. Carter? You take a look out at the platform ahead of the car here. Now, now watch out while I open up here. There we are. Hey, it's mighty cold out here. Must be near zero. Yeah, very near. Hey, that's the other section, Mr. Carter, and they got the signal. Well, that takes care of that. Hey, wait a minute. Whoa, whoa, what's that? Good gosh, it sounds like... It is, it's an avalanche. Look out. Sounds like a big slide. Yes, sir. Awful close. Too close for comfort. Yes, sir, indeed. Mr. So went right by us. And what about the flag man? You suppose that he might have been. Uh, uh, Carney. He must have been right in the past. I better see if he. I'll go with you. Come on. Uh, now, once you step along this edge of the canyon, Mr. Uh, Carter, a thousand feet drops to the state highway at the bottom. Don't worry. I'm watching. And look at the clean car here. Not a light in it. Not a peep out of the old girl. I'd have thought the noise of that slide would have woken the dead. Didn't you say she had a maid and a porter with her, too? Funny they're not awake. Yeah. Probably she's got them both and scared. Don't dare make a sound while she's asleep. The dog, too. Didn't hear a peep out of him, either. Hey, Bob, look ahead there. Yeah. That slide cleared off a place about a quarter mile wide. Yes, it only missed us by about a hundred yards. Wait a minute. I've got my flashlight here. Let me see if we can see anything of Connie anywhere. Thanks, Mr. Carter. There ain't no use looking for him. Not after that. Hey, listen. I don't hear nothing. There it is again. And it's down there over the edge of the canyon. Here, flash your light down there. See if it... Oh, I can't see a thing. Must have... Hey, Bob, look there. The flagman. Carney. Yes. Caught on that little tree down there. Must be 50 feet down the side of the floor. What's he doing down there? He must have slipped and fallen over the edge on his way back. Yeah, but... Hey, that's not Carney making that noise. No, it isn't, but... I can't see anything else down there that's making it. Yeah, no wonder they named this Mad Mountain. Well, go get a couple of porters and some rope. All right. We'll have to get Carney out of there quick if he's still alive. <laughs> key to the Queen's private car? The Queen? Well, no, no. What do you want that for? You know what I found down there when I was getting Connie's body? No, I ain't got any idea. Well, that child dog of hers is caught in a clump of bushes just below where Connie was. Yeah? The dog was doing that crying we heard before. He stopped now. Yeah, I'll bet that darn dog got out of the car and chased Carney, and Carney fell over the edge trying to get away from him. Certainly hope you're right, Bob, but I don't think so. Well, what do you think did happen then? I'll tell you in a minute. Here's the end of the Queen's car. Yeah. Maybe I've got a key that'll fit this door. Now they have a special lock on it. I can't wait to take it now. Watch out. Hey, we can't go busting into private cars like that. We can this time. Now I can unlock it from the inside. Well, what do you think you're going to find in here? Come on in, shut the door. All right. I don't see what... Look here, Bob. Look. Hey, what are those things on the rug there? That, that ain't... That ain't... Hey, what's that? I came from in here. Well, that's her porter all tied up. Yes. And he's been drugged, too. Well, I don't understand. I thought so. See there? Oh, look at all that blood. Yes. And the queen put up quite a struggle for her life. But she lost. Well, I'll say there was a fight here. Look at this room. Everything upside down. Yeah. Everything valuable gone. Nothing left but some toilet articles. 
Where's the maid's compartment? Uh, it's, it's over here. Oh, gosh almighty. She's dead, too. Strangled to death, looks like. Those purple marks around her neck couldn't mean anything else. Oh, what a smell. What is it, Mr. Carter? It smells like perfume. Yeah, see that? Broken perfume bottle. Got smashed in the struggle. Smell is so strong, it's sickening. Oh, I'm going to catch it for this. What's in the other compartment? I wouldn't know. I, I just hope it ain't more bodies. Well, we'll see. Aha, uh-huh. just as I suspected. See those cigarette burns on the dresser and the empty bottles? Two men hid in here, waited until the time was right, then killed the queen and her maid and stole the jewels. How do you know there was two men? Two different brands of cigarettes here. Oh, yeah. Hey, where do you suppose they got aboard? Probably hid in here before the car left the junction. Well, do you suppose they're still on the train? See if the front door of the car is unlocked. Oh, sure, sure. Yes, Mr. Carter, it's not locked. And they probably went out that way. And they're somewhere on the train now. Bob, they must have figured that nobody would enter this car before it reached Sacramento. Uh-huh. They were all set to drop off at one of the way stations before that. But undoubtedly, the snow slide interfered with their plan. And in this deep snow, there's no place they could go without being in danger of their lives. Uh-huh. Yes, I feel sure they're still on the train. Well, can you find any clues to tell us who they are? Well, I hope so. Well, like, could you take some fingerprints, maybe? Well, it would take too long to fingerprint everybody in the train. No, we've got to find some other way to do it. Yes, but how? Oh. I don't know yet, no. but I think I have an idea. Well, what do we do now? Bring Carney's body in here. Let the passengers think he was killed in the slide, but don't let them know he was murdered. Murdered? You say Carney was murdered, too? I thought you said his neck was broken. It was. But the back of his head was crushed in, too. And that was no accident. Oh, poor That's what led me to believe that there might have been trouble here in the Queen's car. Bob, as I see it, the chow made trouble for the killers when they started their work. So they took it outside to get rid of it, but they ran it to Carney. Uh-huh. They killed him and threw him and the dog into the canyon. And as so long as the killers think that Connie and the dog are both dead, we let them keep on thinking so. At least until I can rescue that chow. Are you crazy, Mr. Carter? That that mud ain't worth risking your neck for? No. I have an idea. Maybe he can tell us who the killers are. Oh, what the heck? Chows can't talk. I have an idea. Maybe this one can't. At least I'm going to find out anyway. thinks he can make the child talk, at least enough to tell him who killed the opera singer and stole her jewels. Will the dog still be alive by the time he can get down to rescue it? And will it tell him what he wants to know? We'll see in just a moment. And now back to our story. We left Nick planning to rescue the dead opera singer's dog, which is caught on a bush on the side of the canyon, in the hopes that it might some way reveal the identity of the murderers of his mistress. But where did Nick go, Mr. Bonner? He wouldn't even tell me, Miss Bowen. He just told me to come to the baggage car, get all the extra rope we have, and wait till he got back. No, I wish you wouldn't try to rescue that dog tonight. It's, it's too dangerous in the dark on a freezing night like this. I tried to tell him that, but he wouldn't listen to me. Just said that the dog was going to help him find the killers. Crazy talk. Perhaps it isn't so crazy, Mr. Bonner. Nick has a way of knowing what he's talking about, but... I wish you would... that rope for me, Brown. Oh, look, Mr. Carter, now why don't you let me take the baggage and mail crews and search the train for these killers? That'll be useless, Bob. Uh, Those cooks are only two out of several hundred people on this train. How could you tell them from the others? Well, I... Furthermore, once you let the passengers know there have been two murders on this train, you'll see what happens. Oh, gosh, Nick, you're right. We might have a panic on our hands. I guess you're right, but I don't like it just the same, risking your neck for a fool dog. I like dogs, and this one's hurt and probably freezing by now. Nick, what were you doing in the train just now? I thought you said you weren't going to try to spot the killers. I wasn't, Patsy. Not exactly. Well, then what were you doing? Looking for something. Well, did, did you find... Maybe. We'll see you later. I'll be let to have that rope. You sure you don't want me to come with you? No, you stay here. I don't want any of the train crew or passengers to know what's going on. Okay, whatever you say. If Mr. Bond is not going with you, I am. Well, now that the storm is over, I guess it's safe enough. But you better dress warmly, Patsy. It's mighty cold out. Well, look, Nick, there's an extra trainman's outfit here. That's heavy enough. It's... Could I use that, Mr. Bond? Sure, sure, if you can get into it. I can get into it all right with plenty left over. Patsy, I want to get that dog while he's still alive. Hurry up, will you? Let's get going. <laughs> On the brakeman? Oh, yes, I can see the marks in the snow. Is the dog here too, Nick? Yes, Patsy. He was caught in a small bush just below where the brakeman was. How are you going to get down to him? I'm going to tie this larger rope to the rail here if I can find it under the snow. Oh. Yes, yes, 
it is. myself down the side of the canyon with it. Mm -hmm. You keep hold of this smaller rope. When I've tied the dog to it, you pull it up. Okay. I can climb back up the other rope myself. It's a good thing we have a headlight from the locomotive on the second section to help us. Gosh, it's bright. Yes, even though it's at least a half mile down the track, it's light enough for us to see by. All right, are you ready? Well, gee, Nick, suppose your hands get so cold you can't pull yourself back up. Don't worry, they won't, Patsy. I'll be getting enough exercise so I'll keep warm. It's you I'm worried about. Are you warm enough? Oh, well, sure. This outfit I've got on keeps all the cold out. I'm okay. All right, then. I'm off. I'll let you know as soon as I'm ready to have the dog pulled up. Yeah, I'll be waiting. Take care of yourself, Nick. I'm all right. Careful, Nick. Now, here he is, Patsy, and he's still alive. Oh, good. Oh, poor little fella. All right, steady, Bill. We'll have you up where it's nice and warm in no time. There we are. Now, let's put this little rope around your belly. Yeah. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Now, I'll tie it around your forelegs so it won't slip. Yeah. I don't want to lose you now. You're too valuable to me. You ready, Nick? Just a minute. Take it easy, will you? You'll be all right. There we are. Now, we'll have a nice ride. All right, pull him up, Patsy. Careful. Okay. Coming up. I'll just pull myself up with you so I can keep my eye on you and be sure you won't slip out of the rope. Don't fight it, boy. Don't fight it. Easy now, easy. You okay, Nick? Yes, we're both coming along all right. Oh, the poor little fellow. He must be frozen. Yeah, it probably is. There. I'm not too warm myself. All right, boy. You untie him, will you, while I get this rope off the track? Okay. Yeah, take it easy, pup. Yeah, I, I don't blame you for being mad. I'm mad, too. All right, now. All right. There you are. Can you stand up? Oh, Nick, do you suppose any of his bones are broken? I hope not. You let me see. Oh, I think he's just suffering from exposure. It's hardly more than a cup. Well, I'll carry him back to the dining car. We'll get the chef to fix him something hot. Some good hot milk with a little brandy in it ought to make him feel like a new dog. And something hot wouldn't hurt us either. Come on. compartment of the first car. I want to show the dog something. Easy now, Bob. The smoking compartment's just ahead here. Quiet, right, boy, quiet. You'll get your chance in just a minute. I remember back some 20 years ago, we were held up in for four days in a slide on the railroad up in Kennedy. Yeah, yeah. Somebody's always been where it's was. Now, listen, Bob. I'm going to let the dog loose when we get to the door of the compartment. Mm -hmm. I'll follow him in, and you stay back on me. I don't want to seem to brag. I was just going to say... All right, shut up. up. This is bad enough now without you making it worse. Oh. Hey, Bob, you hear that? Yeah, but what? Quiet. I'm letting him loose. Uh, of course, it's the dog, what? Way down. Button your left. You ready, Bob? Yes. Yeah. All right, here goes. We stay here until I say so. I just can't keep that trap shut when that... Oh, 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 all right, Bob, take their guns away from them. Yeah. Be sure you get all of them. And see what else they have on them at the same time. Sure, Mr. Carter, sure. I'll give them a good going over. Carter, you ain't Nick Carter. I certainly am. Wouldn't you know, Pete? We pull a job way up here in the mountains, and Nick Carter has to be on the train. Oh, shut up. You ain't got nothing on us, nothing. No, I think I have plenty. Prove oh, it. You want to search us? Find anything interesting, Bob? No, oh, nothing. Just these three guns. Nothing else. Hey, you say we ain't done nothing. I told you you got no right. You and your pal murdered the opera singer and are made in the private car tonight. Just slugged the brakeman and threw him over the cliff. 
You stole all the singer's jewels. You call that nothing? Ah, this guy's nuts, Pete. Yeah. Go out and throw the copper. But get me a doctor face, will you? My leg's all set up. Look, I'm bleeding. I'll get you a doctor after I get your confession. We don't know nothing about it, do we, Mike? No. We don't know a thing. It wasn't even there. All right, very well. We'll all sit right here and wait until you two decide to give us the information we want. All right, Flatfoot, sit. You can wait till next year, but you won't lay nothing from us. Okay. I'll wait. Now, look, copper, i got to get a doctor. Hey, Bob. Huh? You know how quick hydrophobia sets in after a dog bite? Well, I know I don't. Uh, pretty quick, I think. Let's see, if I remember correctly, there's no cure for it after it does set in, is there? Well, uh, sure, I don't believe there is. No cure. Oh. How long would you say it is since the dog bit Pete here? It must be about ten minutes now, I'd say. Just ten minutes, huh? And it only takes hydrophobia about five minutes. Yeah, all right, all right. I'll tell him. I'll tell him. Give me a doctor. You'll get a doctor when I get your confession. <laughs> okay, okay. We, we killed him, Mike and me. We, we hit in the old dame's car before I left the yard. Where are the jewels? We, we made a bundle out of them and then threw them clear off the cliff. They're down near the state road at the bottom. Get me a doctor. We're dying. You're not dying. Not yet. I am. I am. I got hydrophobia. Sure. Get a doctor, will You're you? You're a fool. You can't get hydrophobia from a dog bite unless the dog has hydrophobia before he bites you. Huh? And this dog is as clean and healthy as a dog could be. There are no more danger from those bites than I am. You mean, you mean I, I ain't going to get sick from the bite? Not in the slightest. He, he tricked us. Uh, that dirty double cross and right out of You ought to keep quiet. Bob, yeah. see if you can find a doctor. And take the dog back to Patsy. He's done a good night's work. And bring some rope to tie up these cheap thugs. Sure, Mr. Cutter. Come on, Pooch. Come on, come on, Come on. I, uh, I beg your pardon, Mr. Carter. Why, why, yes. Uh, hey, where are you? I, I'm here under this seat. Is it safe to come <laughs> out now? Yes, indeed. Come on out and join the party. Uh, thank you. It's, uh, it's much more comfortable out here. <laughs> yes. Mr. Carter, may I ask you a question? Why, certainly. Go right ahead. How, uh, how did you know these were the men who, uh, uh killed somebody? Oh, very simple. When I walked through the train a while ago, I noticed that the tobacco smoke in this compartment was scented heavily with perfume. Perfume, these thugs got spilled on them when a bottle of perfume broke in the opera singer's car during the fight. Oh, that, that, that is wonderful, Mr. Uh, Carter. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> well, I couldn't be absolutely positive just from the perfume. And I couldn't know which of the six men in the compartment were the ones I wanted. And knowing that the men were armed, I had to be sure. Yes, 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 of course. So I brought the dog in here knowing that a child would never stop hating the men who killed his mistress. And he supplied me with the additional evidence I needed. Then it was a very simple matter, as you heard, to get their confession. And the, 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 the jewels, will you, will, 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 will you get those too? I shall notify the state police as soon as I can contact them. The snow slides and the marks I made going down the side of the cliff after the dog will mark the place closely enough. That, 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 that's wonderful. That, that, that dog's a smart dog, isn't he? <laughs> well, a lot smarter than these two crooks. He'll never go to the electric chair... That's more than I can say for them. What's the matter? What is it? It's another case for Nick Carter, Master Detective. Yes, it's another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Presented by the three great Linux home brighteners. Linux clear gloss, Linux cream polish, and Linux self-polishing wax. Created by Acme, America's great producer of Acme quality paint. Today's curious adventure, The Funeral Wreath. Or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the White Verbenas. In just a moment, we'll hear how Nick Carter made a funeral wreath give him the answer to a cold-blooded murder. But first, a word of advice. As a homemaker, you know what a job it is to keep a home attractive. 
That's why you've appreciated the new beauty which Chemtone, the Miracle Wall Finish, has brought to your walls. And that's why you'll appreciate Linex Cream Polish, which restores your furniture's original handsomeness in one quick, easy application. Yes, Linex Cream Polish saves one whole step in your housekeeping routine, for it cleans as it polishes without tiresome rubbing. And it removes cloudy dust and polish accumulation, banishes fingerprints, helps to conceal ugly scratches, drying to a hard finish that leaves no oil to attract more dust. So ask for Linex Cream Polish now at your hardware, paint, or department store. Headquarters for all three great Linex home brighteners and Chemtone, the miracle wall finish that covers in one coat. And now for today's mysterious adventure with Nick Carter. As we look in on Nick's office, we find Lieutenant Riley telling Patsy and Nick about a rather unfortunate experience. Well, it's like this, you see, Nick. Tonight, after old man Bramwell gave me the devil this morning about there being four robberies on his street in three weeks, I picked the best man I got on the force. And I sent him up to Pine Street, where all these robberies have been taking place, and I told him to watch like his life depended on it. Mm -hmm. And then about one o'clock this morning, I got to thinking about it. And I decided to go up there and have a look for myself. Uh, Just to be sure, you know. Sure, I know. The demon of the police force goes on the job himself. Oh, now, look, Nicky, you're going to let me tell this or not. Sorry, Riley, go on with your story. Well, like I said, uh, I went to Pine Street myself, and I found the cop I'd sent up there was right on the job okay. And everything was quiet as, as far as I could see. So I asked him how he was making out. Nothing stirring so far, Lieutenant. No suspicious characters around at all. You've been right here all the time, eh, Green? Oh, every minute, Lieutenant. Good. And just dropped around to be sure. Uh, Lieutenant, have you got a minute to spare? What do you mean, have I got a minute? Well, <laughs> like this. My wife's having a baby tonight, I expect. Oh. Uh, she went to the hospital this afternoon, uh, just before I came on duty. And being is how I'm out here where no one could reach me. Well, I, I just kind of thought I'd, I'd you like want to You want to to see if you're a father yet. <laughs> well, yes, sir. <laughs> and I, I thought that if you wouldn't mind watching here a minute, I, I just phoned from the drugstore just around the corner. It'll only take me a minute, sir. Oh, if you sure, mind. sure. Go ahead and phone. I'll wait until you come back. But, but don't stand gabbing for a half an hour, man. Oh, oh I, I won't, sir. So he went off and left you all alone, huh? Oh, too bad. I'd say it was too bad. If we'd both been there, we might have got that dirty crook. So what happened then, Lieutenant? Well, I, I stood there in the shadow of the corner house, you see, watching. Uh-huh. And a moment later, I saw a dark figure come out of old Bramwell's house, which was just two doors up the street. Now, I knew Bramwell and his wife lived there alone with, with all your maids, so I wondered who it would be coming out there at that time of night. And what made me even more suspicious, there was no light on in the hall, like there would be if somebody was saying goodnight to him. So I says to myself, I'll just go over and find out who he is, because I'm not taking no chances tonight. And you went over? I did that. The guy just stood there at the top of the steps. He seemed to be fumbling with with something in a bag there. And as soon as I got up to the house, he turned around and, and hung something right beside the door. But it was too dark to see what it was at first. But as he started down the steps, I saw it was a funeral wreath with a long stream of a purple ribbon on it. How was the man dressed, Riley? Just like an undertaker, Nick. Black gloves and a tall hat and a long black coat. Could you see his face? No, not very well in the dark patches. Well, I wasn't looking for nothing like that. So I asked him who was dead. I regret to inform you that Mr. George Bramwell has just passed away. Bramwell, you said? Old man Bramwell himself? Yes. Very suddenly. Almost in his sleep, you might say. Oh, and he was down to see me just this morning. Looking fine, he was. Yes, very sad. Well, if you'll pardon me, I must be going. Uh, allow me to present you with one of my cards. Huh? In case you ever have need of a man in my profession. A card? Oh, yeah, thanks, thanks. This is J. Atherton Osgood, mortician. Yes. If you should ever need my services, I should be happy to be of service in any way I can. J. Atherton Osgood. Osgood? There ain't no undertaker in this town where that... Hey, you! Just a minute. There ain't no... no. Uh, 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 uh. So long, copper. Uh, uh. Uh. Well, tell, well, tell you what happened. Uh, that man, the, the one with the black bag... What? There's nobody on the street, Lieutenant. What happened, happened to you? Undertaker. He knocked me down. <laughs> what? <laughs> What's that? Hey, that, that came from Bramwell's house. Uh, Come on. Come on. Are, are you all right, sir? Can you walk? Of course I can walk. I can go. I know. What's the matter here, lady? What are you screaming at? 
Look there. Glamorous. <laughs> with his head all smashed in. Oh, gosh, Lieutenant. No wonder you're worried. I'm afraid to read what the newspapers will say. I can see him now. Lieutenant Riley of the Metropolitan Police talks to murderer on steps of murder's man's home and then is tricked into letting him go. Oh, it is a sorry day for me. Well, Riley, feeling sorry for yourself isn't going to hurt you anywhere. This man interests me. Huh? He goes to commit a murder and takes a funeral wreath along to hang on the door of his victim's home. <laughs> That's a new one on me. Nick, why don't you give Riley a hand? See if you can't find this crook for him. I think I will, Patsy. That is, if Riley wants me to. Wants you to? What do you think I've been telling you this for? Just to pass the time of day? Very well, Riley. Very well. Since you beg me so politely, I'll be only too happy to put my talents at your disposal. Where do we begin, Nick? Now, you say the murderer wore gloves. So you must have left no fingerprints behind him. Yeah, that's right, Nick. And I went all through the Rose Gallery this morning. There's nothing there that looks like him. Which leaves us, if I'm not mistaken, with two clues. The funeral wreath. And the card he gave you. Uh, neither one of them is worth the tinker's dam. No? Why not? Well, that's the same kind of wreath they tack on anybody's door when there's a death in the family. And you certainly don't think that guy forked over his own card, do you? You're wrong on both counts, Riley. Now, how do you figure that, Nick? Well, take the card first. May not be, probably isn't his own. But it's somebody's card. Look at it, Patsy. It's not printed, it's engraved. Mm-hmm, you're right. If it was a phony, chances are it would just be a printed one. Ah, good morning, folks. Beautiful morning. Lovely morning, isn't it? Yes, I'll nice hear you, you, you reporter. Hi, Johnny, oh. come on in. Oh, morning, Johnny. It doesn't try. Now, look here, it? Johnny. Would you see if you dare to print a word of this in that yellow rag you work for? I'll... Now, 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 hold on, Lieutenant. It's not a yellow rag, and I don't work for it. I'm a feature writer and not a reporter. So just keep your shirt on, huh? Whatever it is, it's getting you all hot and bothered. Riley's in the spot, Johnny. And the very thought of publicity makes him squirm. Oh, fear not, fear not, lovely policeman. Your secret shall be locked forever within the four walls of my heart. Lovely policeman. Hey, Nick. <laughs> it's a long story. I'll give you the details later. But right now, I've got a job for you. If you have time to do it, huh? always at your service, Nicholas. And the beautiful Patsy. Speak on. I want you to get hold of someone who can let you into the public library. At this hour of the day? I don't care if it is early in the morning, and I don't care how sore they get about letting you in. But dig up somebody who can find you a copy of the Mortician's Annual. The Mortician's Annual? Yes, you know what. The Undertaker's trade publication. See if you can find an undertaker named J. Atherton Osgood. Uh, J. Atherton Osgood, huh? All right, then what? Come back here and let me know what it says about him. And make it a rush order. This can't wait. Huh? Consider it done, Nicholas. I'm on my way. Hello? Are you batty? Did you mean to tell me you think that guy's name really was J. Atherton Osgood? Not at all, Riley. But since it's a genuine business card, he must have picked it up somewhere along his travels. This man Osgood may help us get a line on him. Uh, too much for me, Nick. Uh, you want me for anything more here? No, not just now, Riley. I'll let you know if I do. Well, what are you going to do? Uh, I'd rather be shot than do what I have to do, Nick. What's that, Lieutenant? Go down to headquarters and explain to the reporters how it happened that that <laughs> crook got away from me last night. <laughs> oh, well, well, good luck to you. <laughs> and you better put a shamrock over your left ear for luck. Okay, Nick, okay. Have your fun. But you're laughing at a sick man. So long. So long, Lieutenant. <laughs> I uh, don't envy Riley when the reporters get after him. <laughs> well, Patsy, we've got something to do ourselves. Get me the latest city directory. Right here, Nick. I was using it. What do you want to know? I want a list of all the florists in the city. What on earth for? We're going to call on them and see which of them made this funeral wreath and for whom. So get busy. <laughs> through, Patsy? Just a couple more, Nick. But what a list. Maybe we'll be lucky and only have to call on a few of them. I should hope so. Why, if we have to call on... Hi, folks. Your messenger is back. Johnny. Well? Oh, yes, yes. Very well. <laughs> I might say okay. Well, what do you mean? Well, I routed out the sweetest little redhead sub third assistant librarian you ever saw. His name was Myrtle O'Toole. And I got her to open one of the branch libraries for me. Did you get what I wanted? That? Sure. Uh, Myrtle was kind of sore at me for making her lose her beauty sleep, but, uh, hi, Susan. Oh, yes, hi, Susan. Mm, Casanova winters in person. Johnny, what did you find out? Ah, uh, yeah, Nick. Down in black and white. J. Atherton Osgood, Funeral Chapel, Akron, Ohio. Yep. Johnny, Patsy, and I are going out. I want you to go through the files and see what you can find that has to do with Akron. Right, Nick. Uh, about what date? 
Say, um, say within the last year. Mm-hmm. I'm not quite sure of the date yet. I finished the list, Nick. You want to go now? Yes, Patsy. The sooner the better. Okay. Get your hat and let's be on our way. Hey, Nick. Where are you going with that funeral wreath? I don't know for sure, Johnny, but I hope to hang it around a murderer's neck before long. <laughs> Nick believes the funeral wreath which the killer hung on his victim's door will lead him to the killer himself. What can there be about that wreath that makes it such an important clue? We'll see in just a moment. Ever notice how much a shining, clean floor adds to the appearance of any room? All your rooms will look brighter, more attractive, when you protect your wood floors and linoleum with Linex Clear Gloss, the durable coating that flows on easily without brush marks, drying to a hard, tough finish, which wears and wears, and looks well for a long, long time. Linex Clear Gloss gives a lustrous, transparent finish to all wood or linoleum surfaces in your home, resisting boiling water, hot grease, perfume, fruit acids, even alcohol. And it's so easy to keep clean, for Linex Clear Gloss keeps the dirt on the surface where it's easily wiped away. Its gleaming beauty, its protective durability, make it a standby in thousands of American homes. So get it now. Famous Linex. Spelled L-I-N dash X. Linex Clear Gloss. The ideal way to protect your floors and woodwork. Remember to ask for it at your paint hardware or department store, where you'll find all three great Linex home brighteners and Chemtone, the miracle wall finish that dries in one hour. And now back to our story. We left Nick and Patsy trying to find the florist who made the funeral wreath which the killer hung on the door of the man he had just murdered. That's it, Patsy. Just ahead. Uh-huh. I right, Silverman. Well, I hope this florist can tell you more than the other fool we visited. They didn't know from nothing. And I hope this wreath doesn't get worn out before I find out who made it. Yes, what is it? Did this funeral wreath come from your shop? From my shop. Let me see. No, it couldn't be from here. All day yesterday, business was very bad. I sent out not one single order all day. Only two customers. All right, I'll uh, I'll take your word for it. But how about the day before? Did you send it out then, perhaps? That's not possible, mister. These flowers, they are too fresh. They could not have been picked before yesterday. Or so fresh, they wouldn't be now. You mean the wreath was definitely made up yesterday? Sure, mister. Couldn't be before yesterday. The flowers, they are too fresh. Any idea who might have made it up? That I couldn't say, mister. It's a very ordinary piece. Could be anybody made it. Okay, thanks. Uh, come sometime when you want to buy something, maybe? Yes, mister. Thanks, I will. Any luck, Nick? No. I did find out the wreath was definitely made yesterday. That's all. Oh. Well, who's next on the list? Before we visit the next place, I want to call Johnny and ask him what he found. Maybe that'll give us a lead. <laughs> I found three notices from the Akron police, Nick. Any of them the man we want, Johnny? Well, I, I can't tell. Descriptions are so general, they don't mean much. What are the dates on them? Well, one is dated almost a year ago. One is dated about three months ago, and, and the other is two months ago. I see. Well, not much help there, I'm afraid. And, uh, wait a minute. Two of the men are wanted for murder and robbery, and the other for robbery alone. Okay, Johnny, sit tight. I may need you again. So long. So long, Nick. I gather he didn't find anything that will help us. No, not without some additional evidence. Oh, too bad. Well, I'd better call on the next florist on our list. That's the only lead we have that's any good. <laughs> Mr. Schwartz? That's just right. Could you tell me if you made this wreath? Did I make it? No, mister, I did not make it. Well, could you tell me who might have made it? Let me look. Hmm. Yes. I could not say for certain, mister, but I am in this business a long time, and I think this was not made by a professional florist. Oh? Is that so? Are you sure? Mm, no, I am not sure. But it looks as if it was made by someone who has seen a lot of wreaths like this, but who's not a regular florist. Someone who's seen a lot of wreaths like it, but not a professional florist. Funny none of the other florists noticed that. They probably were not as experienced in the business as I am. Or they did not look closely enough. 
But I'm sure it is not professional. And, well, another thing. These flowers. Yes? Well, like a book, I know all the greenhouses around here. And not one of them grows flowers like these. That I'm sure. Thanks very much. You've told me a lot, Mrs. Schwartz. So long. Goodbye, Mr. Betsy, I think we've got something. Oh, good. What is it? Find me a telephone. I want to talk to Mr. J. Arthur de Nasgood of Akron. Yes, he was a tall, thin, sallow-looking man. Thin cheeks. Looked like a cartoon of old man gloom. I see, Mr. Osgood. And you say he left your employ very suddenly? Yes, it was about three months ago. He went home one night and he never showed up again. No word from him at all. That's the man, all right. Thanks very much, Mr. Osgood. Could he help you, Nick? Yes, Patsy. He says he had a man working for him as undertaker's assistant who left him suddenly about three months ago. Huh? And his description of the man agrees with Riley's description of the man who killed Bramwell last night. So what do we do now? Visit some more floors? No, Patsy. We visit some undertakers. <laughs> Sure, the killer worked for an undertaker, Nick. It's logical, Patsy. He apparently came to town about three months ago. But he started these robberies, as far as we know, only three weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Now, what could be more natural than for him to get a job at the trade he knew, undertaker's assistant? That would give him time to look over the town and decide where he wanted to pull his jobs. And would it also legalize his being in town in case anything came up to question it? Well, we've tried seven undertakers, and none of them had any nice fresh assistants. Hope we have better luck at this next one. <laughs> Uh, yes, Mr. Carter, we do have a new assistant, a eh? Mr. Carnes, a very fine man, most efficient. Came here about three months ago, but I'm sure he can't be the man What you does are... he look like? Why, he's about as tall as you are, not nearly as heavily built. His cheeks are thin, and he looks rather like... Like the... old man Gloom? Well, I wouldn't like to say that, but he does... Well, now that you mention it, he does rather resemble that character, yes. I'd like to see him. Why, he's not here today, Mr. Carter. He's home packing his bag. Packing his bag? You mean he's leaving town? Oh, just overnight, that's all. We're shipping one of our late <clears throat> clients to Cleveland. Uh, Mr. Carnes is going with a body to deliver to relatives there. I see. Well, do you mind telling me where your Mr. Carnes lives? Why, I'm not sure, Mr. Carter. I've never become that friendly with Mr. Great Carnes. heavens, man. Surely you know where your own employees live. Oh, but he's not one of my employees, Mr. Carter. I'm not the head of this establishment. Mr. Grayson is. He could tell you, of course. Well, where's Mr. Grayson? I'll ask him. I'm very sorry to say he's not here today. Not here? No, he's been called out into the country no. to supervise a very special... All right, all right. And you say you don't know Carnes' home address? No, I don't. But I believe he lives on Oakmont Terrace, if I remember correctly. Oakmont Terrace? Yes, Mr. Carter, but I don't know the number. I'll find it out. Oh, by the way, this body that Carnes is taking to Cleveland, who got it ready for shipment? Why, our Mr. Carnes did. He came to work early this morning in order to get it ready in time, and now he's... Thanks, that's all I want to know. So long. I mean just that, Riley. He lives on Oakmont Terrace, but I don't know the number. Now listen, Riley. Meet me at the corner of Oakmont and Denver as soon as you can. Okay. I want you to identify the man for me when I find him. I'll be out there in two shakes of a lamb's tail, Nick. I want to get my hands on that guy. I'll give him the worst trip. Yes, I know, I know, Riley, but wait till we catch him first. See you at Oakmont and Denver in 20 minutes. Drive slowly along the street, Patsy. I want to see if I can get any clue to which is Carnes' house. You don't expect to find him sitting on his doorstep, do you, Nick? Hardly, Patsy. But one of the florists I visited gave me an idea. An idea about what? About the flowers and that wreath. He said that... Ah, there. That's the house. My hunch was right. You mean the house where Carnes lives? Yes, I'm sure of it. Why, Nick, how can you tell? By the garden in front of the house. Well, what can... 
Oh, there's Riley putting around the corner up there. Shall we go meet him? Yes. I want to get this over with as soon as I can. Right. Hey, Nick. What's cooking? Just this, Riley. I feel sure the killer of old man Bramwell lives in that gray bungalow up the street. Huh? I think he's probably in there now. I'm going in and see. You wait outside in case he gets away from me. Oh, but why not let me go in? Because you know him when you see him. I don't. So you wait outside. And you, Patsy, stay down here at the corner out of the way. But suppose he tries to shoot you, Nick. Wouldn't it be safer to take Riley in? If there's any shooting, Riley can come in and give me a hand. I'll do that, Nick, and happy to get a shot at that rat. Okay, let's get going. Leave your car here so he won't suspect anything if he should happen to look out the window. Sure. uh, How'd you happen to get on the track of this mug, Nick? Investigation, Riley. Huh? Investigation and deduction, plus common sense. That don't tell me much. I'll give you the details later. All right, here's the house. Now remember, stay here unless they're shooting, or unless he gets away from me. Mm-hmm. Then you grab him. Right, Nick. And good luck. Mr. Carnes here? Uh, yes, that second door there. Shall I call him? No, he's expecting me, thanks. Oh, all right. You can go right in, then. Thanks. Hey, what the... Your name, Carnes? Yeah, so what? I want to talk to you. Is that any reason for busting into a guy? I mean, is that any reason why you should enter my room without knocking? Why, yes. I was afraid I might not catch you if I lost any time. You seem to be leaving town. I don't know what you have in your mind, but I'm sure I'm not the one you want to see. I don't believe I know you. Well, I know you. You work for Grayson, the undertaker, don't you? And you're leaving town to chaperone a dead body to Cleveland. That's quite correct. I know a lot more, too. I know you killed George Bramwell last night in cold blood and took 3000 in cash and 10000 in jewels from a safe. It was a pretty slick stunt to impersonate a departing undertaker and leave the wreath in the door... Go on, you interest me. But that was where you made your mistake, Carnes. Because a florist told me that wreath wasn't made by a real florist, but by someone who's seen lots of them. So I figured that the killer who might have worked for an undertaker sometime was you. So you picked me out as the culprit. There's another mistake to you is that card you picked up in Akron. Gave us a good line on you. Of course, going into the undertaking business here was an excellent idea. From your point of view, gave you a splendid chance to find out where the rich homes were located without attracting attention. Is that all? Not quite. I have a hunch that if we were to pry up the lid of that casket you're going to chaperone out of town, we'd find you'd hidden the loot in there. This is all very entertaining. But so far you haven't shown any proof that connects this wild story up to me. So I must ask you... How about this, then? That homemade funeral wreath was made of white verbenas. A very uncommon flower around here. And there's a fine bed of verbenas growing in front of this house. The only white verbenas anywhere around here. So put on your hat, Carnes, and we'll go out and let Lieutenant Riley identify you as the man who slugged him last night. You can go to... Oh! 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 Should make... should take better aims, Carnes. You really hope to shoot your way out. You got nothing on me. I was just trying to... Whatever you're trying to do, that shot you fired just now was a signed confession of guilt. Yeah, you're all right, Nick. You can get it. Yes, yes, everything's under control, Riley. There's your killer. Hey, that's the guy, all right. Convicted by his own funeral wreath, which is poetic justice if I ever heard it. In just a moment, Nick and Patsy will bring you a preview of next week's exciting case. Here's a suggestion. Give your floors a handsome surface in a jiffy with Linex self-polishing wax. The liquid wax you simply wipe on without rubbing or polishing. Linex self-polishing wax keeps all your floors, wood, tile, and linoleum, looking their shining best. Yet it's so quick to use, and it dries to an elastic, satiny finish that wears amazingly and is unusually resistant to dirt and water. It contains the greatest possible amount of genuine carnauba wax, with no gum, shellac, or resin to chip or crumble. And with Linex self-polishing wax, there's no need of rewaxing the whole floor. When most used parts begin to show wear, you can rewax only those parts that need it. Best of all, Linex self-polishing wax is the non-skid floor finish, resisting slip even when water is spilled on it. This fact has been proved by the underwriter's laboratories whose seal is on each bottle. 
So get it now. Linex self-polishing wax to keep your floors beautiful the easy way. If your dealer hasn't yet received his supply of the three great Linex home brighteners, he'll probably have them soon. Ask him to save one or all of them for you. Acme will see that he gets them and you get them as quickly as possible. And now let's hear from Nick Carter himself. How about it, Nick? Have you got something new and exciting for us next week? I think so, Ken. In the courtyard of a new and expensive apartment building, the body of a man was found floating in the lily pool. With a large knife in his back. There was practically nothing to tell us who did it or why. But when I got started on the investigation, I found a very confusing trail that took me all over town in unexpected directions. And led right to the murderer, thanks to a costly mink coat, which unfortunately did not belong to me. But Patsy, you made a nice little sum of money out of that coat, even if it wasn't yours. <laughs> True enough. <laughs> that was some compensation for what I went through. Well, it sounds interesting, Nick. What do you call the story? I call it Death in the Pool. Or the Mystery of the Mink Coat. And that's all until next week. So long. So long, everybody. And so long to you, Nick and Patsy. We'll be looking forward to seeing you again next week. <laughs> next week, at the same time, listen to another curious experience of Nick Carter, Master Detective, entitled Death in the Pool. Or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Mink Coat. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is a copyright feature of Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. It is presented at this same time and over these same stations by the three great Linex home brighteners. Linex Clear Gloss, Linex Cream Polish, and Linex Self-Polishing Wax. Created by Acme, America's great producer of Acme quality paints. In the Nick Carter Adventures, Lon Clark is starred as Nick. Helen Choate is featured as Patsy. Lieutenant Riley is played by Humphrey Davis. Original music is played by Lou White. The programs are written and directed by Jock McGregor. This is Ken Powell speaking for the thousands of Linux dealers all over America and saying so long until next week. It's another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective, presented by the three great Linux home brighteners, Linux Clear Gloss, Linux Cream Polish, and Linux Self-Polishing Wax, created by Acme, America's great producer of Acme quality paints. Today's curious adventure, Death in the Pool. Or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Mink Coat. In just a moment, we'll hear how an expensive mink coat helped Nick Carter solve the mystery of the dead man found floating in the lily pool. But first, here's something you'll want to remember. A home is a place to enjoy. That's why you keep it as lovely as you can. Thousands of American homemakers have discovered that Chemtone, the miracle wall finish, is the way to new wall beauty. Now, renewing the beauty of your floors, Linex self-polishing wax gives a satiny luster without tiresome rubbing. And it resists wear, water, and dirt amazingly, for it contains real carnauba wax. You can actually clean with a damp cloth or mild suds. What's more, Linex self-polishing wax, the non-skid floor finish, resists slip even when water is spilled on it. Get Linex self-polishing wax at your paint, hardware, or department store. Headquarters for all three great Linux home brighteners and Chemtone, the miracle wall finish. And now for today's mysterious adventure with Nick Carter. As our story opens, Nick and Patsy, his assistant, are driving home a girl who is not feeling well. Where does she live, Patsy? In the Gray Bar Apartments, Nick. It's the one with the big lily pool in the court. Oh, that one. She would live in a place like that. All show, nothing else, just like Sally. I wish you wouldn't talk that way about her, Nick. She used to be one of my best friends years ago. Well, she's no friend of mine. I have no use for girls that drink the way she does. She's had a lot of trouble recently, Nick, and she just drinks to make herself forget. Her husband divorced her about a year ago just because she went out on a few parties he didn't approve of. 
She's been alone ever since. Funny, you standing up for her, Patsy. Usually you'd be the first to condemn anyone who plays around the way I understand she does. All right, Nick, think what you like. Just as long as we get her home to her apartment so I can put her to bed. Yep. Who's going to bed? Evelyn's young yet. Let's go somewhere. The only place you're going, young lady, is home to bed. Well, who's that? I don't know him. Oh, yes, you do, Sally. That's Nick Carter, the man I work with. Never heard of him. This the place? Just ahead, Patsy? Yeah, stop at this first entrance. She lives on this side. Okay. Come on, now, Sally. This is where you live. I'll get out first and give you a hand. Get out, Miss Self. Don't need a hand. can take care of myself. Want me to go up with you? No, Nick, you wait here. She'll be all right. All right. But don't let her keep you up there all night. I won't. Uh Uh-oh, I'd better go after her. She'll fall in the lily pool if she's not careful. Yeah. She's getting pretty close to the edge of it. You better... Oh, heavens, they... She's not terrified. Come on. What's the matter, Sally? What is it? Man in the pool. A man. He's dead. Dead. Help! 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 Yes, Riley, over here, by the edge of the pool. Yeah, Patsy phoned me that she found a man's body in the pool. Drowned, was he? Flash your lights this way, Riley. Okay. Holy smokes, Nick. Look in his back. Yes, a knife. Right between the shoulder blades. Did you find the body, Nick? Not exactly. It was Patsy's girlfriend who found it, really. What's her name? Sally Reeves. Oh, not that one. Where is she now? Oh, Patsy's putting her to bed. She lives in this house. She's... Well, slightly under the weather. Uh, how did she happen to find him? Oh, Patsy and I were at a small friendly gathering, having a quiet evening, and then she walked in. Got well lit up and wrecked the party. Patsy wanted to bring her home, so we did. As she went by the pool, she started screaming. I came over here and found this. Well, let's have a look at him. Nick, that's Arthur Reeves. What? That's Sally Reeves, ex-husband. And you say she found him? That's right. Very interesting. Maybe she found him because she knew just where to look for him. Lieutenant Riley seems to think Sally did it herself. He's a dope. Well, you said she's hated her husband ever since he divorced her, Patsy. Maybe she did kill him. Oh, Nick. Well, she certainly acted guilty enough when they questioned her. That doesn't mean anything, and you know it. Maybe and maybe not. Well, Riley will find out. Oh, Nick, you can't leave it to Riley. Well, that's certainly what I'm going to do. This is none of my affair. Nick Carter, you've got to make it your affair. No, Patsy. But I'm not going to see Sally put in jail for something she didn't do. You've got to help her, Nick. And why? Because I asked you to, that's why. Oh, Patsy. Oh, Nick, will you do it? Well, I suppose I'll have to if you put it that way. Oh, Nick, I knew you would. But it's against my better judgment. I don't care why you do it, just as long as you do it. Now, where do we start? Well, I guess the best thing is to go down and see Riley in the morning. Find out just how the case against her stacks up so far. Then we'll see where we go from there. Hey, good morning, Nick. And Patsy. Hi, Riley. Well, Lieutenant, have you let Sally out of jail yet? Let her out? I should say not, Patsy. She's in for good the way it looks now. She did it all right. Riley, do you mind telling us just what the case is against her so far? No, I don't mind at all. Uh, which side are you on in this, Nick? I'm on the side of the law, just as I always am. She'd know me well enough for that by now. Oh, sure, sure. Well, here it is. Reeves was Sally's ex-husband. He divorced her for seeing too much of other guys, and she hated him for it. In spite of the 500 bucks a month alimony he was paying her, or, or supposed to be paying her. She said he hadn't paid her anything for the last three months. Exactly. Uh, you're proving my case for me, Patsy. What? Now, Reeves' partner tells me that Reeves was having a tough time making both ends meet, let alone paying his alimony. He spent too much on his second wife. And here's another thing. Reeves just took out a $50,000 insurance policy in this Sally's favor. Hmm. Is that so? He hmm? had to. That was part of the divorce settlement. You should have done it before this. Yeah, I know. But that insurance policy is another swell motive for Sally to want Reeves dead. She wouldn't kill anybody. Well, here's another point, then. She says she got to your party about 9.30 or 10 o'clock. 
Well, the medical examiner says the guy was killed at least by nine o'clock. So she could have killed him and gone to your party for an alibi. Where does she say she was from, say, eight o'clock up to the time she got to our party? Uh, she says Reeves called her and asked if he could see her about 8.30. So she said yes and sat in her apartment waiting for him, but he never showed up. So she says. It's a fine alibi, I don't think. It's no alibi at all. Who was the last one to see Reeves alive? Oh, he, his partner, Workman. He said Reeves was at the shop, but left to go to see Sally about something. Amazing how everything points to Sally, isn't it? Oh, it ain't amazing, Nick. It's natural. She did it. She didn't do it, and Nick's going to prove it. Oh, is he now, Patsy? Well, how is he going to get around the facts? Nick's going to dig up some new facts, Lieutenant. Then you'll see how wrong you are. Well, maybe, but I doubt it. Look, Lieutenant, can I see Sally? Oh, sure, sure. I guess it'll be all right. Uh, would you like to see her now? If I can. Okay, I'll fix it. You go ahead with your investigation, Nick. I'll go back to the office and wait for you when I'm through here. All right. I'll see you then in a little while. I think I'll go down and have a talk with Reeves' partner first. Now, Mr. Workman, you say Reeves was here in the store last night after dinner? Uh, yes, Mr. Carter. He was checking stock with me. Then he left to see Sally. That was about 8.30. He said he'd be right back to help me finish checking. Did he say why he wanted to see her? He said he was going to ask her to let him out of some of the alimony he owed her. I see. But he didn't come back. Uh, no. I stayed here by myself until about 1 o'clock. Mm -hmm. I should judge by the type of furs you carry here, Mr. Workman, that you must do a pretty good business. That's right, Mr. Carter. Then how do you account for Mr. Reeves having such a hard time keeping up his alimony payments? Well, Mr. Reeves is a heavy spender. He spent money freely himself, and his second wife was extravagant. Mm. Did Reeves have any insurance for the partnership? The kind, I mean, that leaves you any money if he dies. Oh, no, Mr. Carter. We talked about it, but decided it wasn't necessary. Have you and he ever had any trouble? Oh, not the slightest. We've always been the best of friends. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for your trouble, Mr. Workman. I guess that's all for now. Anytime I can help you, let me know. Oh, uh, by the way, mind if I use your phone? Oh, not at all. It's on the desk over there. Thanks. Just want to call my office. I'll be in the back room if you want me. Thank you. Nicholas Carter's office. Oh, Patsy, how'd you find Sally? Oh, better than I expected, Nick. She's so mad at Riley for thinking she did it, but she hasn't had time to be depressed. How'd you make out? Nothing new. That is nothing definite. I'm going to see Reeves' wife. Then I have to drop in on the DA, so I may be tied up the rest of the day. Oh, that's good, Nick, because Sally wants me to go and stay in her apartment while she's away. She has a cat and a canary, and she wants me to take care of them. And I think that's a swell idea. What's so swell about it? Well, don't you see? It'll give me a chance to go all through a thing. I'll bet you I find something to help prove she's innocent. Or guilty. Now, Nick, don't be like that. If you'll drop over there around 8 o'clock tonight, I'll show you what I found. Okay, see you about 8, then, at Sally's apartment. No wonder Sally couldn't afford to let any of the alimony installments be this. Lost her money to live in this place. <coughs> Patsy! 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 Patsy, where? Patsy! What happened, Patsy? Patsy, can you hear me? Uh, that you and me? Yes, what's the matter? A man. He, he tried to. That's it. Well, what started out to be, for Nick at least, a routine investigation has suddenly taken a strange turn. What's happened to Patsy? And what does this have to do with Nick's attempts to find out who really killed Arthur Reeves? We'll see in just a moment. If you have furniture you treasure, you want to keep it handsome. And Linux Cream Polish will protect its beauty effectively. For Linux Cream Polish is designed to restore your furniture's original beauty in one quick, easy application. Yes, Linux Cream Polish actually cleans as it polishes, removing the cloudy accumulation of dust and polish, banishing messy fingerprints, helping conceal ugly scratches. And it dries to a hard, lustrous finish that leaves no oily film to attract more dust. This makes less work for you. Linex Cream Polish, the creamy white preparation that saves you one whole step in your furniture upkeep, is truly the modern way to protect the things in your home. Depend on it to give you added leisure 
to give your furniture added loveliness. Ask for it by name. Linex. L-I-N dash X. Linex Cream Polish. One of the three great Linex home brighteners. Get it now at your nearest paint department or hardware store where you'll find it together with Linex self-polishing wax, Linex clear gloss, and Chemtone, the miracle wall finish that covers in one quick coat and dries in one hour. And now back to our story. We left Nick trying to revive an unconscious Patsy so he could find out what had happened to her in Sally Reed's apartment. Feeling better now, Patsy? Yes, Nick. I'm all right. Ooh, except for that crack on the head. Well, what happened? Can you tell me? Uh, I don't quite know, Nick. I was standing here in front of the bedroom mirror trying on Sally's new fur coat. Oh, Nick, isn't it heavenly? Yes, yes. It's certainly a valuable piece of fur. But what happened, Patsy? Well, as I was trying on the coat, a man came through the door. He's wearing a mask. He told me to take off the coat and give it to him or he'd kill me. I told him I wouldn't do it. Did he have a gun? Oh, I didn't see one. How'd he talk? Well, it was sort of funny, as if he were trying to disguise his voice. It sounded as if he might have had something in his mouth. Probably did. It's an old trick. Without your best friend wouldn't recognize you. Then what? He tried to jerk the coat off me, so I scratched his face for him. Good for you. Not so good, Nick. Look at my fingernails. They're all broken. Oh, they'll go in again. Then what happened? He hit me and knocked me down just as you rang the buzzer. He must have gone out the back door as you came in the front. Then I must have gone out cold. He was certainly completely out when I found you. What does all this mean, Nick? Where did Sally get this coat? You know? Oh, yes, her ex-hubby gave it to her instead of some back alimony that he owed her. He took it out of the stock at the store about two weeks ago and brought it to her. Took it out of the stock at the store, huh? Well, does that mean something to you? I don't know, Betsy. But either this coat is tied up with a murder, or it's an extraordinary coincidence. Well, how can you find out? Get the history of the coat, first of all. Well, how do you do that, for heaven's sake? I know a man who can tell me. Come on. I'm glad you phoned him in advance. I'd hate to have made all this trip for nothing. Hello, Mo. Nick, how are you? Come in, come in. This is Patsy Bowen, my assistant, Mo. How do you do? Hello, glad to see you. Hey, now, what is this puzzle you say you got for me? Here's a fur coat, Mo. Have a look at it. Why, it's beautiful, Nick. Beautiful. What can you tell me about it? Well, it's worth at least $4,000. No, that isn't what I mean. What can you tell me about the coat itself? So everything I could tell you about it, Nick. But I might have to rip it apart a little here where it's sewed. Go ahead. I want to know as much as you can tell me. Sure, Nick, sure. Now, I rip a little of the lining here. Then I cut a few of the stitches here. Let the skins are sewed together. Now, look, Nick. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You see this little blue mark on the skin here? Yes. That means the coat was sold by Fishbone Brothers. Uh, their mark. The skins were sewed together by Herman Schultz, who works for them. Nobody else in the business stitches like Herman. Anything else? Well, Fishbone Brothers make up the coat. They sell it to a retailer. <laughs> That's all I could tell. Suppose they could tell me anything else about it? You can ask them. They got a store right on the block from me. I could telephone them that you are coming, and they should take good care of you right away. Thanks, Mo. Oh, by the way, that knife there on the counter, is that any particular kind of knife? All for your to make garments used in, Nick. That is a good knife for training the skins. Why do you ask? Oh, just saw one while ago when I was curious. Come on, Patsy. Let's go see Fishburne Brothers. to keep you waiting, Mr. Carter, but I wanted to be sure of the facts. This coat was sold by us to Perry Long. And Perry Long sold the coat to a Mrs. Jackson Moody who lives in Boston. But three months ago, she reported it stolen and offered $500 reward for its return. $500? Oh, Nick, we can claim that reward. We found the coat. You found it, Patsy. The reward's yours if you want it. Is that what you wanted to know, Mr. Carter? Yes, thanks. That's exactly what I wanted to know. Oh, Patsy, call Riley and tell him to meet us at Reeves and Workman's place. Well, what are we going back there for? I want to see if Workman can add anything to what we already know about this stolen coat. Goodbye. Hmm? Oh, goodbye. Why, Mr. 
Carter, I didn't expect to see you again tonight. I just want to ask you a few more questions, if you don't mind. Oh, uh, no, uh, not at all. Come in, all of you. Working pretty late, aren't you? Uh, yes, I am. You see, without Mr. Reeves, there's so much more for me to do. It's pretty dark in here for you to be working, isn't it? Oh, no, I can see plenty well in this light. Well, uh, Lieutenant Riley has to make some notes, so... Make notes? On what, Nick? Why, in Mr. Workman's answers to my questions, naturally. Sure you won't mind if I turn on another light, will you, Mr. Workman? Oh, now, really, Mr. Carter, Nick, I... Nick, look! His face is scratched right across the cheek. Uh, yes, uh, there was a cat sleeping on a pile of furs a little while ago, I... Didn't see him, and when I tried to move the furs, he jumped at me and scratched me. What an alibi. Uh, uh, now, uh, what was it you wanted to ask me? Well, first, Mr. Workman, I'd like your permission to look around your shop a bit. Oh, now, see here, Mr. Carter, I don't see what right you have Riley. to come in here and... Uh... See that Mr. Workman stays where he is while I take a look around the place. Now, look here, you can't come Just in here and do it. Where you are, Workman. Nick knows what he's doing. But I don't understand Just what... Just tight. Nick will tell you when he's ready. Well... This is an interesting package, Workman. Addressed to some firm out in San Francisco. Seems to be full of pieces of fur coats, some odd neck pieces, and other odd pieces of fur. All expensive fur, too, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, that's uh, just some pieces I had left over. I don't think so, Workman. What do you think they are, Nick? I think Workman is a receiver of stolen furs. Really? He cuts them up and ships them to the West Coast. His accomplice out there ships his stuff east. And they put them together and mix the furs up so they can't be identified. You're crazy. I, I wouldn't get mixed up in anything like that. Riley? Hmm? Ever see a knife like this one before? By golly, Nick, that's the same kind of knife that killed Reeves. You're quite sure? Of course I am. That same dark-colored handle, the same two metal bands around it, I'd know that anywhere. That's the same kind of knife we saw at Moe's a little while ago, Nick. Except that the handle is different. Exactly, Patsy. The knife's a regular furrier's knife. But I imagine that sometime in the past year, Mr. Workman had new handles put on all his old knives. Right, Mr. Workman? Say, now, look here. If you're trying to connect me with Reeves' murder, you're all wrong. I didn't kill him. Ever see this fur coat before? Uh, no. And I suppose you weren't the man who tried to take it away from Patsy tonight at Sally's apartment. No, of course not. Hey, what's that about, Nick? You didn't tell me about anybody trying to rob Patsy. Reeves gave Sally a very expensive fur coat out of the stock here at the store instead of paying her some back alimony. But Reeves didn't know it was stolen. Then when you arrested Sally, Workman knew he had to get that coat back before you found it, recognized it from the description that's been sent out, and traced it back to him. So we tried to steal it from Patsy tonight in Sally's apartment. Lies. All lies. Hey, Nick, I'm beginning to see what you're leading up to. Do you, Riley? I'll say I do. Reeves finds out that Workman is dealing his stolen furs. They get into a fight about it. Workman tells Reeves the coat he gave to Sally was stolen. Reeves is sore and starts for Sally's house to get it back. That's where he was headed when he was killed last night. I'll bet that's it. Go on, Riley. Doing well so far. But when Reeves leaves, Workman gets scared. He doesn't want Reeves to tell anybody he's selling stolen furs. But the only way he can stop him is to kill him. So he grabs one of his fur knives, beats it up to the apartment house before Reeves gets there, waits for him, and kills him. Why, it's as plain as the note on your face. You're crazy, all of you. I didn't kill Reeves. Where were you between 8 and 10 last night? I told you I was here in the store, taking stuff, alone. That ain't no alibi. Come on, workman. I'm taking you down to headquarters. We got ways of making fellas that have nothing to say talk a lot down there. No, I was right, Nick. Sally didn't do it. Oh, Nick, you're wonderful. Well, thanks for those few kind words, Patsy. Okay, Riley. Take him down to headquarters and wait for me there. Well, ain't you coming, Nick? Now, there's one last bit of evidence that'll clinch this case, Riley, and I think I know right where to put my hand on it. Meet you in your office in about half an hour. Nick. Well, glad to see the four of you gathered here to welcome me. Riley, Patsy, Sally, and Mr. Workman. Mm -hmm. Now let's sit down and be real cozy. What's all this about, Mr. Carter? They won't tell me anything except that you've got some news for me. Okay, Nick. Okay, Riley, go right ahead. Well, Sally, it's like this. Mr. Workman here is the man who killed your ex-husband, Arthur Reeves. That's a lie, Riley. Oh, no, it is. Selling stolen furs, your knife, Sally having a fur coat that was stolen, and you trying to get it back, it all adds up. Just wait till the jury gets it. Then, you know I didn't do it. Of course we know it. And I'm apologizing right here and now to both you and Patsy for being such a dumb idiot as I was. I should have known you wouldn't kill him. Isn't it wonderful, Sally? You're free. And Nick did it. I knew he would. 
Now, I can collect the $500 reward for recovering the stolen fur coat. Oh, it's just super, super, Patsy. You collect that money, and I'll collect the $100,000 on the insurance that Arthur took out for me. I don't think you will, Sally. But, Mr. Carter, why not? Yes, Nick, why can't she get that money? Sally? Yeah? You told me Reeves never got to your apartment last night. That you didn't see him at all, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, that's right. I waited and waited, but he didn't come. Riley. Hmm? Got the things you found in Reeves' pocket? Well, sure, Nick. There you are. Sally, in Reeves' pocket was a bill for women's clothes, addressed to you, postmarked the morning of the murder. It must have been delivered to you that afternoon. Now, if you didn't see Reeves, how did that bill get in his pocket? Why, You did see him, didn't you? Yes, he tried to take my fur coat away from me, but I wouldn't let him. And you got into an argument about money, didn't you? He was broke and couldn't give you any, so you gave him this bill and said he could at least pay that, right? Well, he... And by the time he left you, you were so mad you could have killed him, weren't you? But I didn't kill him. Workman did. Workman didn't kill him, Sally. You did. After he left, you grabbed up that furrier's knife, ran down the stairs, rushed over to where he was still standing beside the pool, and plunged the knife in his back before he knew you were there. No. No, I never owned a knife like that. I couldn't have done it. Ever see this picture, Sally? Huh? I found it in your apartment a few minutes ago. A flashlight shot of a tea party you had in your apartment. Dated three months ago. And on the table is one of workman's fur knives being used as a cheese knife. So you did own a knife like that. All right, I... I did kill Arthur. I had to have money quick. I got a lot of bills that have to be paid. He wouldn't give me any money. Insurance was all I could get. So? So I killed him. Well, Nick, so she did do it. I was right all the time. I told you I didn't do it. I knew you didn't do it all along, workman. But I had to do it this way to break down the case against Sally. Sorry. You say you knew all along, Nick? Certainly. A new workman couldn't have done it because he'd never have chosen such a public place as the court inside a large apartment house at nine o'clock on an early fall evening. <laughs> There's altogether too much chance of his being seen. He'd have picked a much safer spot. Furthermore, he never would have killed him before he got that stolen coat back from Sally. Yeah. No, Riley, only someone who was so mad they didn't stop to think would kill a man in such a public place. Well, then I, I, I gotta let workman go? He was dealing in stolen furs, wasn't he? Oh, by golly, you're right, Nick. I'll see that he gets his for that, I will. Come along, you. And you too, Sally Reeves. I'm going to push you both right where you belong. I knew it was you right from the very first. And you tried to go to show me up. Well, Nick, I was certainly wrong that time. You certainly were, Patsy. Completely wrong. She wasn't like that when I knew her years ago. Well, times change. So do people. You couldn't know what she's like now. I'm sorry, Nick. Gee, I suppose I'll never hear the end of this. You probably won't, Patsy. But don't feel too bad. If it hadn't been for you, we'd never have caught workmen and broken up his racket and stolen furs. And the right person is going to pay for Reeves' murder. Those are the things that really matter. Always. Just a moment, Nick and Patsy will bring you a preview of next week's exciting case. But before they do, a word to the wise. When you use Linux clear gloss on your floors, linoleum, furniture, and woodwork, they look as though you'd spent hours polishing them. And yet Linux clear gloss is so easy to apply, so easy to keep clean. Linux clear gloss is a durable, protective coating which is brushed on easily, drying without brush marks to a tough, transparent f- surface that sturdily resists alcohol, perfume, fruit acids, boiling water, and hot grease. The brilliant beauty of Linex Clear Gloss is a constant source of satisfaction to every homemaker, for it wears and wears, keeping its good looks for a long, long time. Linex Clear Gloss keeps dirt on the surface, too, where it's easily wiped away. So protect and beautify every wood and linoleum surface in your home with Linex Clear Gloss. It'll add sparkle to your home and save you hours of housework. Thousands of American homemakers have already learned what a time-saving, labor-saving product Linex Clear Gloss is. Learn for yourself what a household help it can be. Ask for it by name. Famous Linex Clear Gloss. Available at your paint, hardware, or department store. If your dealer hasn't received his supply of the three great Linex home brighteners, he'll have them soon. Ask him to save one or all of them for you. Acme will see that he gets them, and you get them, as quickly as possible. And now let's hear from Nick Carter himself. What exciting story have you got for us next week, Nick? Can you tell us a little about that? 
Well, Ken, next week I'm going to tell you about a murder in a little country town. Patsy and I had gone there for our vacation. But for that one day, we got very little vacation. A friend of the sheriff was shot to death in his home in the early morning, and the sheriff made Nick take over. The sheriff found one big clue that satisfied him. But Nick found a number of small clues that really solved the murder. What do you call a story, Nick? I call it Murder in the Night. Or the Mystery of the Milkman's Discovery. So long for now. So long, everybody. And so long to you, Nick and Patsy. We'll be looking forward to seeing you again next week. Next week, at the same time, listen to another curious experience of Nick Carter, Master Detective, entitled Murder in the Night. Or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Milkman's Discovery. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is a copyright feature of Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. It is presented at this same time and over these same stations by the three great Linux home brighteners. Linux Clear Gloss, Linux Cream Polish, and Linux Self-Polishing Wax. Created by Acme, America's great producer of Acme quality paints. In the Nick Carter Adventures, Long Clark is starred as Nick. Helen Choate is featured as Patsy. Original music is played by Lou White. The programs are written and directed by Jock McGregor. This is Ken Powell speaking for the thousands of Linux dealers all over America and saying so long until next week. This is Mutual. whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Presented by the three great Linux home brighteners. Linux clear gloss, Linux cream polish, and Linux self-polishing wax. Created by Acme, America's great producer of Acme quality paints. Today's curious adventure, Murder in the Night. Or Nick Carter and the mystery of the milkman's discovery. In just a moment, we'll hear how Nick Carter solved the mystery of the murder in the night. But before we do, listen to this. Homemaking is an art. And as a successful homemaker, you know that the real achievement is keeping your home attractive. That's why you use Chemtone, the miracle wall finish, to give your walls renewed loveliness. Now, to keep floors, woodwork, and furniture at their shining best, it's the three great Linux home brighteners. Linux clear gloss, the durable super varnish that dries to an elastic, transparent surface which protects all wood and linoleum in your home. Linux cream polish, which cleans as it polishes, leaving no oily film on your furniture. And Linux self-polishing wax, which beautifies your floors with a satiny yet tough non-skid finish that resists wear, water, and dirt. Get the three great Linux home brighteners at your hardware, paint, or department store. Your headquarters also for Chemtone, the miracle wall finish. And now for today's mysterious adventure with Nick Carter. Nick and Patsy are spending a short vacation at the home of Walter Summers, sheriff of a small county in upper New York State. Peace reigns supreme over the Summers household as our story opens. A peace which, unfortunately, is rudely shattered by... All right, all right. Just a minute. Sheriff Summers speaking. Sheriff, this is Jed Peters. Yes, Jed. Well, what do you want at this hour of the morning? Sheriff, I'm at the Parsons' place. You know, out on the edge of town. Yes, yes, I know. What's the matter? Well, I stopped in here a while back to deliver the Parsons their milk, like I always do. And when I got here, I found Laura and Mrs. Parsons all tied up to a chair. Well, I asked her what had happened. She couldn't talk much, but she said something about a man killing her husband and tying her up. What? I looked in, and sure enough, Mr. Parsons is dead. Shot through the head. 
Quick now, he ran away. Mr. Parsons murdered? Yes, Sheriff. And Laura, Mrs. Parsons is in pretty bad shape. You better hurry up. All right, Jed. I'll be right over as soon as I can. Now, don't touch a thing and don't let nobody else touch nothing. Come on. Goodbye. Hey, what's all that about, Walt? Oh, I waked you up, didn't I? I'm sorry. No, I ain't neither. Because I'd had to wake you anyhow. What's well, early in the morning? After more than six o'clock. Just quarter to six. Oh. But murderers don't care what time it is. Murderer? Yeah. Oh, don't tell me somebody killed somebody way up here in the country. Yes, darn it. First time in 16 years of being sheriff I ever had a murder in this county. I'm sure glad you're here. Oh, now look here, Walt. I came up here for a rest, not to chase down a murderer. You're a good chap. You don't need me. Maybe not, but you're coming along just the same. Oh, no. Get up now before I pull the clothes off the bed and pour this pitcher of water over you. All right, all right, all right. I suppose there's no way out. But you ought to be in charge. Well, if that's the way you want it, that's all right with me. Now hurry up and get some clothes on while I tell the medical examiner to meet me at the Parsons' place in 15 minutes. <laughs> Surprised Patsy didn't want to get up and come along. Well, when I asked her, she just said she'd see us later. Uh, said she wanted to get all the beauty sleep she could first. <laughs> Looks as if she was going to get the vacation, not you. Don't fool yourself. I'm going to see that this killing is solved in record time. If I have to prove I did it myself. Anything for peace and quiet. You know, it's funny about the Parsonses. Young Henry Parsons and his wife, a right pretty little girl she is, too. They come to town about two years ago stayed at the hotel till they found a house that they liked. It's a little bungalow, built right smack on the edge of the cliff overlooking the river. The fellow that owns the bungalow, he sort of took a liking to Henry and got him a job in the lumber mill. He's been there ever since. Good steady worker, they tell me. Did they have any enemies? Oh, not so far as I know. They never went out much, but everybody liked him. He was a real nice fellow. And if ever I saw two people in love with each other... It was them two. Yeah, they was more lovers than married folks. Eastways more than most married folks that I've seen. Hmm. This is going to be pretty bad for her, then. Losing the man she loves. Yes, you're right. There, that's the house. The gray one with the smoke coming out the chimney. Oh, I tell you, it's going to be terrible, Nick. I'm dreading having to ask her any questions about it. Uh, you wouldn't want to... Oh, no. No, no, not much I wouldn't. I'm just a private in the rear rank today. Uh, I thought you wouldn't. Well, this is it. Might as well get it over with as soon as we can. Come on, let's go in. The door's probably open. Yes, it is. Doug Winslow ought to be here in just a few minutes now. He only lives a few miles further from here than I do. Morning, Sheriff. What? Doug, you here already? You must have flew over. Well, I left as soon as I got your message. Good for you. I uh, meet Mr. Nick Carter, a friend of mine. Hello, Mr. Carter. Morning, Doctor. Parsons is dead, all right. Shot right through the head. He's there in the dining room. Uh, Miss Parsons taking it pretty hard, is she? Terrible hard, Sheriff. I put her to bed in the spare room. Somebody gave her a real good sock in the jaw, judging by the looks. I'd like to give her a sedative, but I knew you'd want to talk to her first, so I've been waiting till you got through. Oh, thanks, Doc. I knew I could count on you. Say, where's Jed? I don't see him around. Well, Jed felt the babies had to have their milk, murder or no murder. So I told him to go ahead, but to come back soon as he could. And I told him not to tell a soul what happened here. Well, that's something anyway. I hope he minds what you told him. Now, look, Sheriff, you going to question Mrs. Parsons now, or is it? Yes, right now, Doc. Come on, then. Come on, Nick. Right with you, Walt. Morning, Miss Parsons. I'm terrible sorry to hear about Henry. Now, can you tell me what happened? I'll do my best, Sheriff. Good girl. Now, suppose you start right at the beginning and, and just tell us whatever you can. Well, I was asleep when I heard a loud noise. It woke me up. What kind of a noise? I don't know, just a loud noise. Like an explosion. Like... Like yeah, all right, all right, we know what you mean. And then what? I woke up, I found that Henry wasn't in bed beside me. That scared me, so I called him. And that's when I started to get out of bed. And I saw... I saw... Yes, Miss Parsons, what was it you saw? Henry on the floor. All right, steady now, take it easy. And what did you do then? I screamed. Man, Mrs. Parsons, did you get a look at this man who hit you? Should you tell us what he looked like? About medium size, dark skin, had an old clothes he hadn't shaved for several days. With a scar across his forehead and down over his cheek. Did you ever see him before? No, never. 
ever. Well, now, suppose you go on with your story. When I became conscious again, I was gagged and tied up in one of the kitchen chairs. The man said he was sorry he had to kill me, but he couldn't take any chances on my telling the cops about it. Did he have a gun, Mrs. Parsons? Yes. I could see it in his pocket. He said he couldn't shoot a woman. He knew a better way to do it. And what did he do? He turned on the gas. He said that was an easy way to die. And he left me. Where'd he go then? I... I heard him moving around in the dining room. And I heard him climb out the window and shut it. And he left the gas turned on. Yes. I almost died before Jed got in and turned it off. And then Jed cut you loose. Yes. It seemed hours later. Well, that's about all she can tell us, Mom. She better not be. Yeah. Well, thanks, Miss Parsons. That'll be all for now. We'll let you know if we want to know anything else. I'll send the dog in. Thank you. Doc, you can put her to sleep now. Wait a About time, too. Poor kid. She's pretty near all in. Nick, you heard it described that man that done it. Why, yes. Why? I know him. You know him? Not personally, I don't mean, but I know who he is. He's been hanging around town for over a week now. There's been two burglaries while he's been here, too. I've been going to arrest him on suspicion, but now, by gosh, i got a real reason to arrest him. Yes. Looks that way. Well, let's take a look at the body. Yeah. Doc said it was here in the dining room. Yes, there it is. He must have just been coming out of the bedroom when he was shot. Yeah. Never knew what hit him, seems like. Now, look there, Walt. The center window. What? Oh, the catch is smashed. So that's how he got in. Yes. Hmm? Henry must have heard him in here, got up to see what was going on, and the burglar shot him. Footprints here on the windowsill, too. And I can see some prints down in the garden under the window. Well, sir, that settles it. I'm going to find that trap, and I'm going to get a confession out of it. Now, wait, Walt, wait. You have to have more evidence than a footprint to convict a man of murder. But Mrs. Parsons can identify him easy, because she saw him. Well, suppose you go after him. I'll stay here and see what else I can take up in the way of evidence. You, You don't want to go with me? No, it's better if we each work on a separate angle. Get results quicker that way. Okay, Nick. I'll get hold of my deputy, and we'll find that murdering tramp in short order. Just a minute, Walt, just a minute. I thought I heard someone just outside this door. You mean somebody's listening? I think so. Let me open that door. Well, Jed, what are you doing here? Uh, nothing. Well, Jed, do you hear anything worth listening to? Uh, I wasn't listening. I just happened to be standing here. Well, if you wasn't listening, I didn't know All what right, you'd... Well, let me handle this. Well, I... How does it happen you're back so soon, Jed? Got your milk all delivered? Well, just took the milk to houses where they got babies, and I came back just like Doc told me to. Of course. You tell anybody about the murder? No, Doc said not to. Mm-hmm. Jed, what time was it when you first heard Mrs. Parsons moaning? When I set her milk on the back porch, about five o'clock. Five o'clock? Uh. Yeah. But you didn't phone the sheriff until after five thirty. What delayed you? Why, uh, I was untying Laura, uh, Mrs. Parsons, and trying to get her to tell me what had happened. I see. Did you break in the front door or the back when you came in? Neither one. The back door was unlocked. Oh, the back door was unlocked. So you just came in that way. Why, well, sure I did. So what are you trying to do, get me balled up? I'm not trying to do anything to you, Jed. I just want to get all the facts straight. Okay. What else you want to know? Suppose you tell us just what happened when you came in the back door. Well, Laura, Mrs. Parsons was tied up in one of the chairs near the gas stove. I smelled gas, and she said whoever it was had turned it on to suffocate her. So I, I turned it off. Gosh, she was almost out. Then I cut the ropes that were holding her, and I let her loose. What else did she say? She didn't say nothing much. She was just about unconscious when I found her. She talked about a man coming in and uh, killing her husband and some other stuff I didn't get. I see. And what did you do then? Why, I uh, I took her into the spare room and I put her on a the bed. Then I called the sheriff. That's all. Dad, I noticed you're pretty friendly with Mrs. Parsons. What do you mean by that? Why, the way you call her Laura, that's all. Oh. Well, you see, uh, she's been giving me grammar lessons for about an hour every day after my milk's delivered, so uh, I got to know her kind of well. Mrs. Parsons is very pretty, isn't she? You're darn right she is. Well, look her on the whole route. You like her very much, don't you? Sure I do. She's been awful good to me, and I... Well, I just like her. You in love with her, Jed? In love with her? Of course not. She's married. You weren't so much in love with her that you'd be jealous of her husband? Want him out of the way, perhaps? Hey, look here, you. If you're trying to say I killed Mr. Parsons, you can... Shut up, shut up, Jed. Nick's doing the talking here. You're just answering questions. Well, he didn't think he'd come around here making cracks like that. I don't know as I'd call that a crack. 
been considerable talk around town about how much time you've been spending with Miss Parsons. I never took no stock in it before, but now... I tell you, there's nothing to it, Sheriff. We were just good friends, that's all. All right, Dad, that's all for now. But don't go anywhere. But I ain't finished delivering my milk yet. Listen, if Nick says wait, you wait. I'll tell you when you can go. Murder's a serious thing. Of all the thick-headed, dumb clock tires. Did really had anything to do with it, Nick? He certainly had the motive and the opportunity. Can't afford to overlook any angle until we're sure. For the present, I suspect everyone. What kind of name is that? That's Mrs. Barnum. There may be more trouble. Come on, come on. What new development is this? Has something happened to Mrs. Parsons as well as her husband? We'll see in just a moment. Nothing adds more to any room than a floor that's bright and shining and sparkling clean. And that's just the way all your floors look when you protect them with Linex Clear Gloss Varnish. For Linex Clear Gloss, the durable super varnish, gives a beautiful transparent gloss that keeps its beauty a long, long time because it wears and wears. Linex Clear Gloss is easy to apply, drying without brush marks. And it protects your floors, protects every wood and linoleum surface in your home against damage by hot grease, boiling water, perfume, fruit acid, even alcohol. What's more, Linux Clear Gloss is easy to keep clean, or keep dirt on the surface where you can wipe it away in a jiffy. Yes, Linux Clear Gloss is the finest protective finish you can use to keep your home looking lovely. That's why thousands of American homemakers depend on it. Ask for it by name, Linux, L-I-N-X, Linux Clear Gloss Varnish. You'll find all three great Linux home brighteners and Chemtone, the Miracle Wall Finish, at paint, hardware, and department stores everywhere. We left Nick and the sheriff racing down the hall toward the room where Mrs. Parsons had been sleeping in the effort to find out why she was screaming. That's bad, Nick. Please, Mrs. Parsons, take this to Mud. What's the trouble, Doc? She's having this time. I didn't give her a big enough dose to pour, I guess. Now she won't take nothing. Here, let me hold her. All right, now put the glass to her lips. And then she'll take it. <laughs> Uh, that did it. That'll keep her quiet. Gosh, I thought she was being killed from the noise she was making. You fellas find anything? Yes, sir. We found the marks where the killer, uh, that is, the fellow we think must kill him, broke in through the window in the dining room. I'm going out after him now. Uh, where will you be, Nick? If I'm not here, I'll be at your place. I'm going back and get Patsy as soon as I'm through here. We came up here for a vacation, you know. All right, Nick. I'll be seeing you. Good luck with your hunting. How far? We know that a burglar entered the Parsons' house last night and stole some silverware. Uh-huh. When I went back to look after Walt left, I found the sideboard in the dining room was cleaned out. He may have shot Parsons when Parsons surprised him taking the stuff. What about Jed? Well, he certainly had the motive. He loved Mrs. Parsons. And he had the opportunity. That of being on the spot at practically the same time the murder took place. Do you know when that was? Well, we got there about six. He'd been dead roughly about an hour then. Which one of the two do you think did it? I'm not ready to answer that yet, Patsy. While I was looking over the scene of the crime after Walt left, I found several little things that indicate there may be a third party involved. A third party? What do you mean? Look out, Doc. Get in that bike, Patsy. Pull over. Pull over. Phew. Gosh, that was too close. Yes. Kids would learn to watch where they're going when they're on the main highway. Well, we missed him. Yeah. So it's all right this time. Can you uh, see the Parsons' house in this road, Nick? No, the cliff's too steep. How are you going to know where to look, then? Before I left the house, I hung one of my handkerchiefs in the clothesline right at the edge of the cliff. Oh, that's good. I think we can see it from here. Should be just ahead. I'll watch for it. Ah, yes, there it is. Slow down a little. Okay. Now stop. Right here. Right. Good thing you hung that handkerchief up there. You'd never know there was a house there. Now, you know what you're looking for, don't you? Yes. You don't think it could have gone across the road, do you? I doubt it, Patsy. Take a trained baseball player to throw it that far. No, it's somewhere between the road and the bottom of the cliff. Now, you look from here up that way, and I'll look from here down. We've got to find it if it's here. We can't give up until we do. Careful, 
feet. We don't want to warn him. We're here. But he's a desperate character. Good thing those kids seen him coming this way, Sheriff. Saves us a lot of hunting around. See anything in that shack they told us about you? No, no. But it should be just ahead. Take it easy now. There it is. Right, right there. All right. Now, listen, Pete. You stay out here in front. Keep behind that big tree and fire your gun over the shack once in a while. Keep his attention on you. Hmm. I'm going round back and creep up on him from that side. Then I'll get him before he knows I'm there, see? But keep hid. I don't want to lose the deputy. Okay, Sheriff. I'll watch him. Want me to start firing now? No. Let me get a head start so he won't see me. And then start firing. I'll, I'll signal you, Wayne. Okay, good luck. There's a signal. Here goes. Get your hands up. We got you surrounded. You can't get us here. Got him? Oh, nabbit. There ain't nobody here. Has he been living there, Sheriff? Yeah, he's been here all right. But he must have cleared out right after the murder. Must have got scared and run for it. Well, look, Sheriff. Huh? Here's a fork under this whole piece of carpet. Got a big initial P on it. Uh-huh. One of Parsons is likely. Oh, this is our man, all right. What now, Sheriff? We're going back to the office and send out an alarm for him. He won't get fur before he's nabbed. I'll see to that. <laughs> At your house, Walt. We found the gun. You got the man you went after? <laughs> we sure did. Good. Got him and the stuff he stole, too. He was caught in the next town trying to pawn some of that silver. My deputy just brought him in. What does he have to say? Oh, he says he found the silver in the woods near his shack. Says he never was near the person's house. Well, we'll change his mind for him when we show him what we know. Mm-hmm. Well, Walt, after I started thinking things over, I went back to Parsons' place. Found a couple of very interesting bits of evidence that I'd overlooked before. Suppose you take the burglar out there. I want Mrs. Parsons to identify him. I'll meet you there in 15 minutes. Okay, Nick. We'll be there. Good. I want to get back to my vacation. Well, now that we're all here, Doc, will you ask Mrs. Parsons to join us? I want to identify this man. He's feeling a little quieter now. I'll get her. Have I got to stick around here forever, Sheriff? I've got a job to do. If I don't get back, I'll be fired. If you don't stay where you are, there'll be trouble. Now you sit down. But I've got to get back. Sit down. There's some things I want to ask you as soon as Mrs. Parsons gets here. Oh, well. Take your prisoner over to the other side of the room. But she won't see him unless she first comes in. All right, Nick. Come on, you. Come on. All right. Quit shoving. I'm coming. Mr. Carter. Won't you make this as quick as you can? I don't feel I can stand much of this question. We'll spare you all we can, Mrs. Parsons. But there are certain things we have to know. Won't you sit down here next to Patsy? Yes, here, Mrs. Parsons. Let me go. All right. But I... Ah! There! That's the man! He did it! He is the entire I am not. I may have touched you, but I never touched your old man. Well, uh, looks as if that settled it. If you're the one that hit her, you're the one that killed Henry. We found you with the silverware on you, and Miss Parsons here identifies you. Now, are you going to admit that you did it? No, because I didn't. I swiped the stuff, maybe, but I didn't croak nobody. I just gave her a clout on the jaw to keep her quiet. Uh-huh. Well, Nick, what you got to say now? Are you satisfied? No, Walter, I'm not. There are several things that don't match up here. No, uh, I don't know what's the matter with you, Nick. But I know you'll do it the way you want to anyway, so go ahead. Now, you. What time did you break into this house? About two o'clock. Did you say either Mr. or Mrs. Parsons? I looked in, they were both asleep. I didn't wake them up. You did? You woke Henry and... Please, Mrs. Parsons, please be quiet. Nick knows what he's doing. You just took what silver you could find and went out again, huh? Yeah. The woman woke up and was going to stop me, so I had to sock her one to keep her quiet. Then I ducked out. That's all. He's a lying, thieving, murdering... I don't think so, Walt. But, Nick, listen... Let me finish, please. Ted, what was Mrs. Parsons wearing when you found her this morning? Why, uh... She had a pink sore house coat, lots of lace on it. Yes. Did she look pretty in it? She sure did. But that don't mean I had... Just any... answer my questions, please. Mrs. Parsons, did you ever see this gun before? But... No, I never saw it before. You sleep on two pillows, don't you? I guess... And you never saw this gun before? No. No, I didn't. That's peculiar. When I lifted the top pillow off your bed this morning, I found a little hollow on the top of the bottom one. And this gun just fits it. That's a lie. I, I have... Uh... You like Jed. 
he's a nice boy. But I... You liked your husband better? Of course. I loved Henry. Yes. You loved him so much you couldn't bear to have him leave you. Isn't that true? I, I don't... What are you getting at, Nick? I don't get this. Walt, Mrs. Parsons killed her husband. I didn't. I, I didn't. It was that man. Oh, yes, are you crazy, Nick? What well, makes you think she did it? Think? I know she did it. As I see it, she woke up and heard the burglar in the dining room. She'd already decided to kill Henry, but hadn't decided how to do it. And now the thought came to her that she could kill Henry and blame it on the burglar. She'd undoubtedly seen the man around town and knew exactly what he looked like. Remember that very excellent description she gave us, Walt? Well, sure, sure, but well, I... she never saw him that clearly by flashlight. You're lying! You can't prove it. About five o'clock, she got up. Took a gun from under her pillow, went into the dining room and called Henry very excitedly. When he rushed out of bed to see what was the matter, she waited for him at the dining room door and shot him as he came through. Then she took off her nightdress and put on the pink house coat. I found the nightdress with some spots of blood on it under the mattress on her bed. You're lying. I wore that house coat to bed last night. I was cold. Yes. I... Was that house coat rumbled up when you saw it this morning? Why? Well, gosh, it looked like new to me. I thought so. Mrs. Parsons, you went to the kitchen. Waited until a few minutes before you knew Jed was due to arrive. Then you turned on the gas, tied yourself in the chair as best you could, and waited for Jed. You knew there was no danger of your suffocating before Jed arrived. And you knew that Jed was half in love with you already. And that when he found you in that very feminine and attractive garment, he'd never noticed that the knots which bound you were tied very clumsily and not very skilled. Well, that's a lie. She was all tied up good in time. That's what she wanted you to think. Well, why should she do it? Yes, Nick. What earthly reason would she have to do it? I didn't do it. I didn't do it. Well, uh, remember when we approached the house this morning, we saw smoke coming out of the chimney? Yes, I... Well, and I remembered that smoke a little while ago. I went down to have a look at the furnace. I was curious whether there should be a fire going on a warm day like this. And I found this. <laughs> a letter from Henry's real wife in the city, saying that she was happy he had at last decided to return to her and his son, from whom he'd run away when he came here with Laura. And there was the motive, plain enough. Laura couldn't bear the thought of his leaving her. It was a blow to her pride that he was tired of her. So she killed him. Her fingerprints around this gun we found, if you want definite proof. All right, I killed it. And I'm glad. He couldn't fight me that way. But I never go to the chair. I killed myself first. Better take her away, Walter. <laughs> and keep your eye on her. Murder demands that the murderer pay the penalty for his crime. Gosh, Nick, I still can't believe it. She was such a darn nice little girl. Why, Nick, if she hadn't tried to burn that letter, she might have gotten away with it. Yes, Patsy. That was what first led me to think she did it. Until I found that letter, I could find no motive for her killing him. And without the motive, nothing made sense. But the furnace was so choked with the ashes that the paper she tried to burn just smoldered. And where there's smoke, you know. Yes, I know. Where there's smoke, Nick Carter solved the case with it. Just a moment, Nick and Patsy will bring you a preview of next week's exciting case. A home that's truly lovely is a place folks want to be. A place where there's fun and relaxation and real joy of living. Your whole family takes pride in your home when you keep it looking attractive with the three great Linux home brightness. Linux cream polish, for instance, which cleans as it polishes, gives your fine furniture a handsome luster, drying to a hard surface that leaves no oily film to attract more dust, to make more work. Yes, in one quick, easy application, Linux Cream Polish actually removes the cloudy accumulation of previous polish and dust, banishes messy fingerprints, and helps conceal ugly scratches. For Linux Cream Polish cleans as it polishes, without tiresome rubbing, saving one whole step in your cleaning day routine. So depend on this modern, easy shortcut to furniture beauty. Get all three great Linux home brighteners at your dealers now. Linux Clear Gloss Varnish, Linux Cream Polish, and Linux self-polishing wax. In case your dealer hasn't received his supply of the three great Linux home brighteners, he'll have them soon. Ask him to save one or all of them for you. Acme will see that he gets them and you get them as quickly as possible. And now let's hear from Nick Carter himself. How about next week's story, Nick? Can you give us a hint? In spite of the fact that the doctor said it was heart failure, a young man felt so sure that his uncle had been murdered that he arranged a midnight seance with a famous medium. And had everyone who could have committed the murder there to see what went on. And did the medium succeed in contacting the dead uncle? Uh, she claims he did. 
Everyone there thought they recognized his voice. And did he accuse anyone of murdering him? That's where the story starts, Ken. And that's where it's going to end for you. Yes, now. yes, no more until next week. So long. So long, everybody. And so long to you, Nick and Patsy. We'll be looking forward to seeing you again next week. <laughs> Next week at this time, listen to another curious experience of Nick Carter, Master Detective, entitled Unexpected Death. For Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Seance Murderer. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is a copyright feature of Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. It is presented at this same time and over these same stations by the three great Linux home brighteners. Linux Clear Gloss. Linux Cream Polish, and Linux Self-Polishing Wax. Created by Acme, America's great producer of Acme quality paints. In the Nick Carter Adventures, Long Clark is starred as Nick. Helen Schultz is featured as Patsy. Original music is played by Lou White. The programs are written and directed by Jock McGregor. This is Ken Powell speaking for the thousands of Linux dealers all over America and saying, so long until next week. This is Mutual. It's another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective, presented by the three great Linux home brighteners Linux Clear Gloss, Linux Cream Polish, and Linux Self Polishing Wax, created by Acme, America's great producer of Acme quality paints. Today's curious adventure Death Plays the Lead. Or Nick Carter and the mystery of the accidental clue. In just a moment, we'll hear how Nick used an accidental clue to solve a murder at a U.S. Army camp and break up a spy ring. But first, ask yourself this. Do folks have fun when they visit you? Make your home a more enjoyable place to be with modern shortcuts to household loveliness. Probably you've already found how Chemtone, the miracle wall finish, brings new beauty to your walls. And for floors, woodwork, and furniture, the three great Linux home brighteners do an equally fine job. Linux self-polishing wax, which beautifies your floors with a satiny yet tough non-skid finish that resists wear, water, and dirt. Linux cream polish, which cleans as it polishes, leaving no oily film on your furniture. And Linux clear gloss varnish, the durable super varnish that dries to an elastic, transparent surface which protects all wood and linoleum in your home. You'll find the three great Linux home brighteners at your hardware, paint, or department store. Your headquarters also for Chemtone, the miracle wall finish. Now for today's mysterious adventure with Nick Carter. Somewhere in these United States is an army training camp. And somewhere in that camp is the USO Theater, which on account of the rain pouring down outside is unusually well filled. As our story opens, Nick Carter with his two assistants, Patsy and Scubby, are hurrying backstage in the theater in the company of their host, Major Wayne. Right through here, Nick. Gosh, what a mob. Look, Scubby, there are more soldiers backstage here than I Yeah. Quiet. Quiet, please. Quiet. Where's Mr. Dexter? Right here, Major. I'm glad you could get here so soon. This is bad business, Mr. Dexter. Very bad business. Who was it was killed? My leading lady, Margot Craven. She was shot in her dressing room, right in here. Mr. Dexter, this is Nick Carter. He just happened to be here visiting me today, but I'm going to ask him to take over the investigation for me. We're lucky to have such a great detective here when we need him. Thank you, Dexter. Now, suppose you tell me what you know about this right from the beginning. Of course. It really started right after the first act. I was in my office when Ross Craven, Margot's husband, came in. Well, Dexter, you've done it again. It's a hit. You really like the show, Craven? I certainly do. But say, what's the matter with my wife? Why, what do you mean? Is anything the matter with Margot? I just stopped in the dressing room and she was crying. 
And she swears she won't go on for the second act. <laughs> she will, if I have to drag her on. Those boys will be disappointed. You go out front, Craven, and don't worry. I'll go back and see her. All right, Dexter. You know, sometimes I think she should have married you instead of me. You certainly can handle her better than I can. Did he mean anything special by that, Dexter? It's no secret that I've been in love with Margot for years. But she married Craven, and that was the end of it for me. I see. Suppose you go on with your story. I started backstage, and just as I got to the passageway where Margot's dressing room was, I heard a shot. I ran to her room, opened the door, and found her lying on the floor. I just had time to be sure she was dead when Patty came in. Who's Patty? Patty Bird, my assistant, my best friend, and my pal and protector. He entered the dressing room right behind me. Is she... is she dead? Yes. Yes, she's dead, Patty. Well, did she kill herself? I don't know. That must be the gun on the floor there. A pearl-handled thirty-two. And I think I have seen her have it before now. Yeah. Oh, hey, she left the window open. It's raining in. I'd better close it. Well, it's lucky you weren't in here with her when it happened. I saw you crossing backstage as the shot was fired, but I wish someone else had seen you. Meaning what? Uh, meaning that lots of people knew you was in love with her. That it nearly broke you up when she married Craven, that's all. They might think you killed her because you was jealous. That's absurd. Five minutes, Mrs. Craven. Five minutes. Well, Patty, there's one call she'll never answer. Never again. Oh, gosh, Mr. Dexter, that's tough. I've been examining the gun, Nick. There are no prints on it at all. I see. Dexter, do you have any idea why Mrs. Craven refused to go on for the second act tonight? Why, uh, she... I can tell you why. Yes? And who are you? That is Carl Shaw, our star. Mr. Shaw, what did you mean by saying you could tell why? Margot Craven was in love with Dexter. She was eating her heart out for him. Said if she couldn't have him, she'd wreck the show. That's why she wouldn't go on for the second act. And I'll bet he went in to argue with her, maybe threatened her. And she grabbed the gun for protection. They struggled for it and it went off, killing her. Do you know that that happened? No, but I know Margot and I know Dexter. Look here, Shaw. Dex won't defend himself. I'll do it for him. Why don't you tell Mr. Carter the truth? That you were in love with Margot yourself. That you've been threatening to kill her ever since she married Craven. Sometimes she teased you till you got so mad you almost went crazy. Are you insinuating that I killed yes, her? Yes, I am, and right to your face. What's the matter here? What's happened? Margot. Margot. That's her husband, Mr. Carter. Your wife's dead, Mr. Craven. Dead? You didn't kill her, did you, Dexter? We don't know who killed her yet. We aren't even certain she didn't kill herself. I was afraid Dexter might have done it. He has such a rotten temper. And it would have been my fault because I asked him to come back here and argue with her. Mr. Craven, do you know anyone who might have had reason to kill her? Yes. Carl Shaw. What? He had a filthy temper and Margot was always teasing him. You lie. Maybe you killed Margot yourself. Why do you say that, Mr. Shaw? Craven didn't love his wife. He wanted to be rid of her. You told me that's a lie and you know it. Mr. Craven, where have you been since you talked to Dexter before? You certainly didn't get as soaked as you are now sitting in a theater. Well, uh, no, I, I went out and, and walked around to cool off. Then I saw the soldiers leaving the theater, so I came back to find out what happened. Nick, don't move too suddenly. But as soon as you can, look at the window. The window, will you? Oh, a face. What was that, Nick? No, it's gone now. There was a face at the window, staring in at us, Major. There's nothing but rain there now. Scubby. Yeah, Nick? Take a look outside. See if you can find any footprints. The mud's so thick out there, you ought to be able to find some good ones. Sure thing, Nick. I'll be right back. Well, Major, I'm afraid we'll have to ask the whole company to stay here in town tonight. Accommodations may not be too good, but they'll have to do until the case is cleared up. Looks to me as if any one of several people might all equally well be guilty. We'll see that they're all taken care of, Nick. There are tracks all right, Nick, but there's nobody there now. I'll put a guard out there for tonight, Nick. We can take a better look at the prints in the morning. That's all, folks, but don't go anywhere until I say so. Have a drink. Thanks, Craven. I don't drink. I don't ever want to be sober again. When I'm sober, I remember all the rotten little things I did to Margot. She should have married Dexter. He's always been the kind of man that I wanted to be and never was. But I beat him just once. When I married Margot. That rather evens things up, doesn't it? 
So that's why you married her. Because Dexter loved her and you wanted to beat him at something. Yeah. But don't tell anybody. Craven, did you kill Margot? No. Why should I kill her? You were outside and could have shot her through the window. She was shot with her own gun and you admitted you'd been in a dressing room just before you talked to Dexter. You could have taken her gun then. So, now you're trying to frame me for her murder. I'm not trying to frame anyone. I'm trying to find out the truth. Well, yeah, why don't you ask Dexter then? He was the first one in her room. He found her. Or ask Carl Shaw. He hated her. And loved her. I guess they're the same thing sometimes. Sorry to see you in this condition, Craven. I'll talk to you again when you're more yourself than you are now. Good night, Craven. Nick. Scubby and I have been waiting here in the lobby for you. Yeah. Did you get any more dope, Nicodemus? No, Scubby. Too many suspects and too few clues. Can we do anything for you, Nick? No, not just now, Patsy. It's getting late. I think I'll turn in. Well, I'll toddle off to my room then, if nobody minds. Okay, Patsy. See you bright and early in the morning. Good night, Patsy, old kid. Got lots of nice, pretty beauty sleep. Mm, wouldn't do you any harm to get some of that beauty sleep you're talking about. You need it more than I do. Oh, that's what you think. I got eyes. Oh, well, well I guess I'll put my car in the garage. I left it standing outside when I drove down from the theater. Hey, Nick, I've got something important to tell you. How about going to your room where we can talk? Why, sure thing, Scubby. Just as soon as I get the car put away for the night. I'll be right with you then. It won't take me but a couple of minutes. Right, Nick. I'll wait for you here in the lobby. Good evening, Mr. Carter. What the... Keep your mouth closed, Mr. Carter, and climb in behind the wheel. Just a moment. Uh, only one gun tonight, huh? That's all. Okay, get going. Very well. You're giving the orders for now. Drive straight out Main Street, Mr. Carter. Oh, so it's you. You know me? Don't know your name, but I do know that you're the man I saw staring in the dressing room window earlier this evening. Yes. You'll drive straight ahead for about five miles. When you come to a crossroad, you'll turn left and continue on. I'll give you further directions then. Pull up behind that car just ahead on the left. I haven't had time to search him yet, but he must have him. The MP didn't get him. We know that. If you'd only tell me what this is all about, maybe I could help you. Step out of your car, please. It's very simple. Margot Craven got some papers which didn't belong to her. Got them by accident. They belong to us, and we want them. Papers? What papers? Oh, nothing that concerns you. We're sorry we have to drag you into this. I admire your work greatly. But we think you may have those documents, and... We must have them. Hey, wait a minute. Is that why she was killed? Because she had them? No, Mr. Carter. They had nothing to do with her murder. Nothing at all. Come on. Search him and be done with it. I don't enjoy standing out here in the rain. Well, of course. Now, permit me to be sure you have no papers on you, Miss Carter. Go ahead. Craven's been taken care of. I searched Carter's car while I waited for him. So if he doesn't have them on him, I don't know where they are. Well, they're not on him. Uh, Mr. Carter... On your word of honor, you know nothing about our papers? I do not. How much does that mean? Oh, with Mr. Carter, it means a great deal. Well, thank you. That's a bit unexpected, but very welcome. If we find later that you've lied, we shall, of course, kill you. Now you may get back in your car. Watch out. We're still covering you with our guns. That's better. Now what? Now I take over. We're going to drive away and leave you here. I'm sure you won't try to follow us. And why not? Because you're going to sleep right now. Oh. Miles from the little army camp town. Alone and unconscious in his car. What's going to happen to Nick now? Are the men he just met mixed up in the murder? Or was Margot Craven killed by one of her so-called friends? We'll see in just a moment. Whatever floor surfaces you have in your home, wood, linoleum, rubber, or asphalt tile, you chose them because you found them attractive. 
Keep them that way with Linux self-polishing wax, which beautifies without tiresome rubbing and polishing. Simply wipe Linux self-polishing wax on any floor surface, and it dries to a satiny yet tough finish which wears amazingly. That's because Linux self-polishing wax contains the greatest possible amount of genuine Carnauba wax. And once you've applied Linux self-polishing wax, there's no need for you to re-wax the whole floor when parts of it begin to show wear. A floor finished with Linux self-polishing wax is easy to keep clean, too. For Linux self-polishing wax is unusually resistant to dirt and water, keeping the dirt on the surface, where it's wiped away in a jiffy with a damp cloth or mild suds. And the underwriter's laboratories, whose seal is on every bottle of Linux self-polishing wax, have proved that it's the non-skid floor wax, resisting slip even when water is spilled on it. Get Linux, L-I-N-X. Linux self-polishing wax now. You'll find all three great Linux home brighteners and Chemtone, the miracle wall finish, at hardware, paint, and department stores everywhere. And now back to our story. Slugged unconscious by a pair of desperate men, Nick Lay slumped over the wheel of his car for several long minutes. Then when the sharp stabs of pain which accompanied his return to consciousness had died down slightly, he slowly drove back to the hotel where Scubby was waiting for him. Taking Scubby to his room, he told him what had happened. Well, I'll be doggone, Nick. You're the luckiest guy in the world. What's lucky about getting your head split open? I mean, you're lucky that you didn't stop and talk with me before you went and put your car away. Here. Oh, what's this? If I'm not mistaken, those are the papers your friends wanted. Where'd you get them, Scubby? I found them behind the dressing table in Margot's room. You did? Well, when was that? While you were busy talking to Dexter, I was looking around, and, well, I ran into these. Well, why didn't you say something about it then? I thought you might like to go through them before we turned them over to the police. This is the first time since then that I've had a chance to give them to you alone. Hmm. Yeah. What are they, Nick? Scubby, these are in code. I rather think they should be turned over to Major Wayne at the camp. Well, why give them to him? Use your head, Scubby. They're in code, I said, and Margot got them at an army camp. These were given to her by mistake. And that can mean only one thing, as I see it. Spies. Gosh, Nick. Do you really think so? I do. Come on. I'll get my car out of the garage and take them out to camp right now and turn them over to Major Wayne. Maybe these papers will help us catch the killer of Margot Craven. Still raining. What a night. Yes, what a night in more ways than one. So we meet again, Mr. Carter. What the deuce are you... You again. If I were you, I would be very quiet. I won't hesitate to shoot you both if I have to. Keep your hands in plain sight and walk over to the little door at the far end of the bar room. Move carefully and slowly. Shall we walk, Nick? Slowly and carefully, as the gentleman says? I guess we'd better, Scabby. I told you I was not a man who could safely be lied to. I didn't lie to you. Mr. Carter, those papers we are looking for are in your overcoat pocket right now. Please give them to me at once. Certainly. Thank you. You're a man of sense. I regret it is a little late for having sense. Here are the others now. Oh, well, it's about time you were coming. Hey, Nick. Oh, sorry, Nick, that's Carl Shaw. So I see. Carl Shaw. Well, this is fine. Did you get the papers from him? Yes. No thanks to you. It wasn't our fault that my sister was assigned to the wrong dressing room. I had a devil of a time getting things fixed up so she could change, but Franz threw the papers through the window before Margot got her things out. She'd never seen my sister, so the mistake was natural. Mistakes are never natural, and mistakes are never tolerated. I'll be happy when that man Carter dies. He's too clever to be allowed at large. Yes, you're right. But he's such a prominent man, his death will make quite a stir. It's unfortunate. It will break up the show unit, which we have so carefully organized... Now, Shaw, you will have to form a new unit of your own and take it around to the different camps. The work must go on. Of course. When do we take care of Carter? As soon as we've finished our work here, we're going to pack up and move on to another town. 
On the way, we shall dispose of Mr. Carter and his able assistant. Right now, we must see about the contents of these papers. They must go out at once. And we better tie up these two guys so to be sure they'll still be here when we get back. Yes, Mike. Tie them both, hand and foot. And leave them back at the bar. We'll take care of them later. Hey, what are you doing, Nick? You've been wriggling around like that for the last half hour. I'm getting these ropes off my wrist, Gubby. I hope. Yeah? Well, how are you coming? I'll have my hands loose in another few minutes. Well, how are you doing it, Nick? I tried to get my hands free, but gosh, these ropes are too tight for me. Hey, what's the secret? The secret's very simple, Scubby. When the ropes were put on us, they were damp. I enlarged my wrist muscles as much as I could, but he tied the rope too tight for me to get out of it. But I found a hot water pipe under the bar here, and I've been drying the ropes out against that. As it dries, the rope is stretching just enough to let me get loose. But I've had to keep wriggling around so as to keep the wet parts of the rope against the hot pipe. Nice work, Nick, old boy. We'll fool these thugs yet. If they only leave us alone just a couple of minutes longer, we'll be out of here. You'd better not drive too close to the hangout, Major Wayne. No, I won't, Nick. I'll stop a couple of blocks away and we'll sneak up on them from there. Sorry, I couldn't arrest them myself and save you the trouble. But I have no official standing in cases of espionage, naturally. Quite so, Nick. But I'm glad you're going to give me a hand to capture them. Don't forget, Paddy and I are here too, Major. Of course, Dexter. I'm only too glad that you and Paddy happened to be with me when Nick brought me the news. Now, we'd better work out a plan of action before we get there. You know the layout, Nick. What do you suggest? I think it'd be a good idea for one of us to knock on the door of the place. Then when it opened, the rest of us, who will be in hiding just out of sight of the door, will rush in and take over. If we try to rush them from outside, someone may get killed before we can get inside. Good. I'll go ahead and knock at the door. No, Major, let me do that. I'd like that job. Patty, I can't let you risk yourself like that. That's my job. Please, Major, I want to do it. I got a special reason. But I think it's too dangerous. I can't let... I think it's a good idea, Major. Paddy would be just the man for the job. Well, of course, Nick, if you say so, but I don't oh, like... Oh, thanks, Mr. Carter. You're a good egg. Well, you better stop somewhere in here, Major. This is close enough. Right. Now, uh, give me your attention, please. We'll hide near the front door of the building, except Paddy. You'll go to the door and knock on it. When someone answers the door, we'll rush in. Nothing happens to Paddy. I can't understand you're wanting him to do that job. I'll explain later, Major. Oh, there. The door's opening. Well, what do you want? Get your hands up. Come on, Nick. He's an outside. No, so, that's it. Uh, well, I... oh, oh, oh. Drop that gun before I... You, I hear you. The rest of you come out with your hands up. The building is surrounded. No, we're coming. Don't shoot. We get up. Stop shooting. We're coming out. Nick! Nick! Paddy's badly hurt. See what you can do for Paddy, Nick. I'll take care of these enemy spies. All right, Major. How bad is it, Patty? Curtains, Nick. Last curtain for me. We shouldn't have let you do this, Patty. But I wanted to, Dex. I wanted to. But why, Patty? Why? I think I can answer that, Dexter. Yes. Nick can tell you. He knows. What's he talking about, Nick? What do you know? Patty, you killed Margot Craven, didn't you? Yes. I killed her. But now I'm dying just like I hoped to could. You killed Margot? But why, Patty? Why? Because Patty was afraid that she'd wreck your business and your life, Dexter. She was the kind of a woman who had to rule everybody with whom she came in contact. And she could have ruled you in the end because you loved her. Unless I'm mistaken, Patty tried to argue her out of a sit-down strike. There was a fight, and she was killed. Accidentally, perhaps. And then Patty jumped out the window, ran outside, and came back in just as you went into the dressing room from backstage. Right, Patty? Yeah. I don't know how you knew it, but... I felt you did. Thanks for letting me go first. This way. Oh. Patty. Patty. You've put me in your debt forever. But, Nick, how did you know that he killed the craven woman? I thought it would have been Shaw or her husband or, well, maybe even Dexter. 
Well, Stubby, for one thing, there were those footprints in the garden outside her window. You found where a man had stood on tiptoes to look in. Yeah. But you didn't notice that there were also definite marks of where someone had jumped out the window. And Patty was the only one in the dressing room when we got there who had on his shoes the black dirt that was used in making those flower gardens. Oh, I see. Also, I could see he'd just come in out of the rain. And then, too, Scubby, you remember that Dexter said that the first thing Patty did when he followed Dexter into the dressing room was to rush over and close the window? Yeah. Well, Dexter hadn't even noticed it was open. But Patty was more interested in getting it closed than examining the body of the woman because he already knew she was dead. Yeah, I see. Well, it's simple when you explain it. And another thing. You recall those papers you gave me? The ones in code? Yeah, sure. Well, as soon as you gave them to me, I knew that I had seen them in Patty's pocket when we first entered the dressing room. Yeah? Yes. I recognized the big blot of ink in the upper corner. But it didn't mean much to me until I heard Shaw say that the papers had been delivered to Margot by mistake. Uh That they should have gone to his sister, who was one of the spy ring operating through the camp show. I knew then that Patty had picked them up in Margot's room when he was there before she was shot. He probably picked them up without knowing what they were. And as soon as he found they were in code, wanted to get rid of them again. So he left them where you, Scubby, found them. But couldn't he have been a spy himself? No, Scubby, because if he was, he'd never have left those valuable papers where they could fall into the wrong hands. And finally, when I heard him say that he'd do anything in the world to help Dexter, it all added up. He wasn't interested in hurting Margot. He just wanted to keep her from hurting his friend and his god, Dexter. And if that meant her death, that's what it had to be. He loved Dexter more than he loved his own life. Well, you sound almost as if you condoned this murder, Nick. I never condone murder, Scubby. You know that. But I understand it. And sometimes I feel sorry for the murderer. And in this case, I'm happy that the murderer won't have to stand trial before an earthly judge. The courts above may treat him more leniently than our earthly courts would. In just a moment, Nick and Patsy will bring you a preview of next week's exciting case. But before they do, consider this. When it comes to keeping up your furniture's appearance, fingerprints and scratches are two of your greatest problems. But Linex Cream Polish, the quick, easy way to furnish your beauty, banishes fingerprints, helps hide ugly scratches in one application. Linex Cream Polish actually cleans as it polishes, too, saving one whole step in your cleaning routine and removing cloudy dust and polish accumulation immediately. And, best of all, Linex Cream Polish dries to a hard surface that leaves no oily film to attract additional dust. Make additional work for you. Save hours of extra work each week for the added leisure time you need to do the things you like to do. Ask for Linex Cream Polish at your dealers now. Get all three great Linex home brighteners, Linex Self-Polishing Wax, Linex Cream Polish, and Linex Clear Gloss Varnish. The three great Linex home brighteners will keep your floors, your woodwork, your furniture looking the way you want them to look. So ask for these products at your hardware, paint, or department store by name. The three great Linex, L-I-N-X, Linex home brighteners. Another outstanding investment, the world's safest investment, in fact, is United States war bonds. And every bond you buy brings victory nearer, makes America safer. Let's go for the knockout blow. Now let's hear from Nick Carter himself. Well, Nick, would you care to give us a hint as to your next week's story? Yes, Ken. I'll give you just a hint or two, and that's all. A gangster dead on the beach of an exclusive Long Island estate. A dope peddler shot to keep him from talking. Hindu servant who knew too much and not enough. A movie star in the making. And plenty of trouble for Nick on the way. On the way where? To the solution, naturally. Nick never goes anywhere else once he gets started on a case. Okay, I'll be waiting for that solution he digs up in this one. What do you call it, Nick? Murder by suicide. Or the mystery of the death on the beach. And no more until next... So So long, everybody. And so long to both of you. We'll be looking forward to seeing you again next week. Next week at the same time, listen to another curious experience of Nick Carter, Master Detective, entitled... Murder by Suicide. Or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Death on the Beach. 
Nick Carter, Master Detective, a copyright feature of Street and Smith Publications Incorporated, stars Lon Clark as Nick with Helen Choate as Patsy. Original music is played by Lou White, and the programs are written and directed by Jock McGregor. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented at this time and over these same stations each week by the three great Linux home brighteners. Linux clear gloss varnish, Linux cream polish, and Linux self-polishing wax. Created by Acme, America's great producer of Acme fine quality paints. This is Ken Powell speaking for the thousands of Linux dealers all over America and saying so long until next week. This is Mutual. It's another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Today's curious adventure, Grands of Murder, or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Grecian Daggers. for today's mysterious adventure with Nick Carter. As we commence today's story, we find Nick and Patsy strolling through one of the streets in the West 40s in the heart of the theater district. It's mid-afternoon. Oh, gosh, Nick, things certainly look different here in the theater district in the daytime, don't they? True enough, Patsy. But if we only knew what's going on behind the walls of some of these theaters along here, we might find mystery and excitement right now, even in broad daylight. <laughs> for instance, look over there in front of the Risdale Theater. What? Oh, yes, that's Riley's official car, isn't it? Certainly is. There's one of his men on guard at the front door of the theater. Oh, come on, Nick. Let's see what's doing. Yeah, that's the theater where Risdale's rehearsing his new super-colossal spectacle play, The Sacrifice, if I remember correctly. Oh, that's right, Nick. Leo Fane's playing the lead. There are three leading women. Mara Dabre, Lita Lindman, and Bella Claire. Gosh, I'll bet there's going to be a super-duper when it opens. Easy, Patsy. See if I know this man on guard here. Hmm, no, I don't. You can get inside here. Just tell him who you are. And maybe Riley doesn't want us inside. Oh. Then we better play it safe. I have an idea. You wait here a second. Okay. Good luck to you. This will be easy. We'll be saying hello to Riley in just a minute. Say, hey, fella, that's your car out there? Yeah. So what? You mind if the kid let air out of the tires? What? Say, if those kids are playing around with them. <laughs> Come on, Patsy. Let's scroll in and see what Riley's doing here. <laughs> right with you, Nick. <laughs> Oh, gosh, Nick, isn't this the swankest theater you ever saw? Yeah. And the decorations cost Rizville plenty. Oh, they must have. He built the theater, you know, to house his super terrific productions. Mm -hmm. Well, let's see what's inside. Gosh, I'll say there's excitement in here. Come on, let's find Riley and see what goes on. It's a wonderful scene you're directing here, Riley. Is this part of a new show? Curtis, well, what the devil are you doing here? Patsy, quiet those women down, will you? Oh, sure, I'll take care of it. Will you tell me, Nick, how you got in here? I gave orders to... I got in by the simple laws of cause and effect, Riley. Cause and effect? I don't get it. Very simple. I caused your man at the door to leave his post, and then I effected an entrance. Somebody ought to teach you not to stick your nose in what it ain't wanted. But now that it is stuck in... Well, all right. But, but, but mind you know, this is my case, and I don't want no interference and no meddling. I don't want your face. Yes. Ah, I think it has been a murder. Who, what, and where? Yes, the deceased is Leo Frayne, America's sweetheart and fortune's gift to women. And the party who bumped him off... Is... Leo running around with her Come on now, come on. Well, Rizdale, did Frayne act so badly you had to kill him to teach him a lesson? Oh, this is awful, Mr. Carter. I'm ruined. This will finish me as a producer. Everything I have in the world is sunk in this play. I lose my theater, too. I'd... Oh, it's the end of everything for me. Oh, come on. Pull yourself together, man. If rumor can be believed, you won't lose as much as all that. Haven't I heard that you have your stars insured against that thing? Oh, sure, the big stars, yes. 
Crane's appearance in the show is insured for fifty thousand dollars. So is Myra Debray's. I've already put a lot more than fifty thousand into this thing. Tough, but you'll get over it. I think what I'll lose in the play alone that would have grossed a million with Crane in the lead. The part was written for him. You can't go on without him. I hope it's not as bad as all that. Now tell me what happened. Okay. Leo Frayne was stabbed half an hour ago. There were only seven people in the theater. Three women, Stella Claire, Myra Debray, and Little Lindman. Four men, Frayne, my stage manager, the doorman, and myself. He was on the way to my office when he was killed. Just at the foot of the stairs leading to my office. It's backstage there. Any idea who would have been interested in seeing him killed? I think Frayne has fought with everyone here at some time or another this afternoon. Lindman fought with him, Myra fought with him, Bella and he had a big argument. He even had an argument with the stage manager. How about you? You fight with him, too? I would have liked nothing better, but I didn't. Actors are hard enough to handle anyway without fighting with them. Well, how about showing me the victim, Rizdale? Very well. Come on this way. Hey, Tyson, keep out of here while we're gone. Don't let anybody leave the stage till we get back. Now, show Nick the body, Rizdale. Well, Riley. I never expected to find you in a murder case without all those so-called experts you have down at headquarters. Yeah, with three bump-offs in the Bronx and two in Brooklyn, everybody's busy. Anyway, I don't need them. Here we are. This little alcove at the foot of the stairs. I'll, I'll hold this curtain back so you can see in. Hmm. Leo Brain has certainly taken his last bow. Very pretty speech, Mr. Carter, but not very helpful. Thought I wasn't supposed to be helpful. Well, you don't have to stand around doing nothing now that you're here. Well, here's the way it looks to me. I was in my office, and I sent word to Frayne to meet me there. He was just about to go up the stairs when he met somebody and started to talk with him. Probably one of the women, I should say. Why'd you say that? Because I doubt if Frayne would have stopped to talk to a man. But he always had time for a woman. Hmm. Also, a woman could have been holding a dagger in her hand, and he'd never noticed it. Because it was part of all the women's costumes in this act. While he was talking to her, she stabbed him. And he fell back into that chair where, where he is now. And she pulled a curtain across the alcove and went back to her dressing room. You say the dagger that was used on Frayne is part of the costume? Yes. All the women wore them in their hair for the big sacrifice scene. Oh, so there were a lot of them all alike, eh? All identically the same. How many there be all together? That's uh, three, six, eight, nine. Nine and all. Rizdale, you said you thought a woman killed Frayne. This would certainly prove your statement. What? Well, look. Now, what are them, Nick? Two long black hairs caught in the handle of this dagger in Frayne's chest. Then it was a woman did it. Well, a woman is back here. That lets Lita Lindman out. She's a blonde. Yeah, yeah, sure, she's out. Hey, give me them hairs, Nick. They're evidence. Thanks. Yes, sir. We have found which of the women has black hair and a jealous disposition, and we got the killer. Now, let's check up on those daggers for Rizdale, where the dressing room? Down here, Lieutenant. Wasn't Della Claire's dagger in her hair when I saw her on the stage a few minutes ago? Yes, yeah, she's still in costume. The other daggers ought to be here. This is Lindman's dressing room. Now, there's her dagger on the dressing table there, which leaves Myra Debray's dagger not accounted for. Well, Debray's dressing room's over here. Mm -hmm. And there on the table, Lieutenant, is another pretty silver dagger. Oh, well, what do you know? Oh. Just this, Riley. If one of those three women did it, she didn't use her own dagger. Yeah, but where did the extra dagger come from? It could have been one of the chorus daggers. Or the killer could have used her own dagger and then borrowed one from the chorus to replace hers. Sure, Nick, that's it. And let's see if one of the chorus daggers is missing. Over here, Lieutenant. They're all there on the dressing table. Let's see. Five, seven, eight. No, seven. You said there should be nine, Rizdale. That leaves two missing. Yes. Yeah. Well, get the stage manager. He'll know. Can you call him from here? No, but the other end of this corridor leads right out into the orchestra pit. I'll get him at once. Hey, wait a minute, Rizzo. Yes? You say you can get from here directly to the orchestra pit? Oh, yes. Why? When you were telling me the story earlier, you said that you sent your stage manager, McIntosh, out front to get your script just before Frayne was killed, didn't you? Well, yes, but... And McIntosh knew that you were expecting Frayne to come up to your office. I believe I mentioned it yet. Oh, McIntosh is where he could get to this part of the theater where Frame was killed and back outside again quickly without being seen. Yes, 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 but so what? He had a quarrel with Frame. He knew Frame would be here in the corner just about then. And he knew all about them. None of that proves anything, Riley. Let's get on with our investigation. Well, oh, I wish we had a technician with a microscope here. That would tell who belongs to them here fast enough. Quite true, Riley. But if the dagger that killed Frayne was taken from the chorus dressing room, those hairs could have come from any dark-haired girl in the chorus. Look, uh, we aren't doing anything just standing here. Let's do something. You suppose the doorman could tell us anything? Well, we can ask him, but he's a little deaf. He, he already told us he didn't hear anything unusual. Well, I'll ask him anyway. Call him in, won't you? Of course. 
Henry! Henry! Yes, sir. Come in here, will you? Yes, sir. You want me, Mr. Ridgedale? Yes, Henry. Lieutenant Riley wants to ask you a few questions. Now, Henry, after everybody else had left, did you pay any attention to what went on down here? Eh? Uh, after everybody else had left, did you notice what went on down here? Oh, no, sir. That ain't my job. You didn't hear anything? People passing or talking or a cry? No, sir. Once or twice I heard a door shut, I think, and just before we found Mr. Frayne, I heard him leave his dressing room and slam his door. Uh-huh. Anything else? I thought I heard a door shut very quiet-like right after that, but I can't be sure. I, I don't hear as well as I used to. You say you heard a door close quietly. Any idea which one it was? No, sir. Ain't even sure I heard it. Looks as if somebody snuck out into the corridor as the frame started for the stairs and killed him. Maybe they planned it, but maybe they just saw they was alone and done it. Oh, I don't like this. We're getting nowhere fast. Oh, does it feel hot in here? My just... Uh, what's the matter here? Why'd you get that handkerchief you're using? This handkerchief? Yes. Whose is it? Well, why, it's mine. Why? Because there's blood on it. Fresh blood stain. <laughs> Is it possible that Rizdale himself is the killer of Leo Frayne? Or is this some new and unexpected twist of the case? We'll see in just a moment. And now back to our story. We left Rizdale trying to explain to Nick and Lieutenant Riley how there happened to be fresh blood stains on his handkerchief. Can you explain those blood stains, Rizdale? Blood am I? But I can't. Wait. Yes, of course. Now, now I remember. This, this isn't my handkerchief. As I came down the steps looking for frame tonight, I found this at the foot of the stairs. I picked it up without thinking, and, and well, just a moment later, when I found Frame's body, I must have stuck it in my pocket without thinking what I was doing. May I see it? Oh, of course. Here. Hmm. A little small for a man's handkerchief. And here are some initials. It's a bit fancy, but I should say they were. D-A. B-A. Huh? B-A? Sabre. Uh, has Miss Sabre got black hair with him? Yes, she has. That settles it. She wraps this around the handle of the dagger to keep the blood off her hands and to keep her fingerprints off the handle. Well, this handkerchief and them black hairs we found in the dagger will send her right to the chair. If the hairs are hers, Riley. And don't well, forget how easy it'll be for anyone to pick up a lost handkerchief and use it for a false clue. Now, look here, Nick Carter. Will you stop trying to tell me how to run my own business? I am just trying to point out to you, Riley, that if those hairs didn't come from Mr. Bray's head, you're right back where you started, handkerchief and all. Sure, all right, all right. <laughs> then what do we do now? Well, it, it isn't any of my business, but I have an idea that might work. Well, let's have it by all means. Suppose whoever left this handkerchief near the body didn't do it intentionally. Hmm? Suppose they just dropped it without noticing it. Now, nobody but us knows it's been found, but whoever lost it is bound to think about it when the excitement dies down a little. Hmm. Then she'll get scared and maybe look for it. Suppose we give her the chance to find it. How do you mean, give her a chance? Well, like this. We put the handkerchief right back where I found it, only hidden a little more. Then we'll send the three women back to their dressing room. Then we give them a chance to sneak out. Uh, It'll be an interesting experiment, Riley, even if it doesn't prove anything. Okay, we'll see. We'll try it. But where can we hide somebody to watch? There's a vacant men's dressing room just down the hall here. Suppose I put Henry here on guard in there. There's a phone there. He can phone us as soon as he sees anybody come out. We'll be in my office. Okay. You, you got that, Henry? Yeah, sure. Sure, I can do it. Now, Henry... You can sit right here. We'll leave the door open a crack, and as soon as you see one of them leaving your dressing room, call me at once. Yeah, I got it, Mr. Isdale. I'll watch real good. Now, let's get those women down here. A poor detective think if you make so much noise. <sighs> now, Patsy, what's the trouble? Well, Nick, everything was peaceful enough when suddenly Bella jumped up and came over here and started yelling at Miss Lindman. And she started yelling back, and a minute there was a swell fight going on. Didn't I say I wanted no noise here? Well, I meant it. 
I don't want a sound out of any of you. Now go back to your dressing rooms and stay there and be quiet. And don't stare out of them until I say you can. Mr. Bray. Yes, Mr. Carter? Were things around here this afternoon really as bad as Risdale says they were? Yes, Mr. Carter, every bit. Even I lost my temper once. Crane was especially unpopular all afternoon today. Why, he even quarreled with Macintosh, who generally never takes the trouble to quarrel with anyone. That Macintosh over there? Uh, oh, yes. He's an ugly little man, but I guess he's all right. How did Crane take all the argument that was going on? Well, it was making him jumpy. He was talking of quitting the show, and he said I had to lay down the law to all the rest of us to soothe him. But I- I'd better go on back to my dressing room before the lieutenant gets mad. Well, before you go, Mr. Bray, may I borrow your handkerchief just a moment? Well, I don't seem to have it. I, I must have left it in my dressing room. I'm sorry. Hey, come on, let's get up to Rizzo's office and see what happens. If anything, we don't expect this will produce much in the way of results. Well, come on, anyway. Even you could be wrong, you know. <laughs> Waiting's a tough game, isn't it? Yeah, I'd rather be doing something. If we had a microscope, we could save time. Huh? Let me have those hairs we found, will you, Riley? What do you want them for now? Just to match them up with these hairs. Uh, what did you suppose? A specimen of Claire's hair and Red Ray's. I have a pocket magnifying glass here. Thought I'd see if they could be matched up. Roughly? Oh, sure, here you are. Hmm. Yes. The Ray's hair is finer than Claire's. And it has a faint ripple that Claire's doesn't have. Yes, rather, there's almost no question but what the hairs found on the dagger match the Bray's hairs. Near as I can tell. Oh, look, I'm going crazy sitting here. I can't think. My nerves are like a jackrabbit. I... Oh, is he the one who got an aspirin? Aspirin? Not me. Sorry, Rizale. I don't carry them either. Oh, my head is splitting. I... I think my secretary keeps some of her desk in the next office. If she doesn't, I'll fire her. Oh, by the way, the ring for this office is two short ones. All the office phones are on the same line. Now, if you hear two short rings, it'll probably be Henry. So you better answer fast. I'll be right back. Risdale seems to have the heebie-jeebies. Mm, so would you, Nick. If you was losing a hundred grand, even if it wasn't all your own money. Well, look, what about them hairs? I feel sure the hairs of the braids are all right. But I'm not yet positive just what they prove. Mm, They're mm. probably... Po- oh, oh, that's Henry. Yeah, Lieutenant Riley speaking. They just came out. I can't be sure who it is, but it is a woman. She's just picking up the handkerchief now. Huh? Now she's starting back to her... Henry! Henry, what is it? What happened? What is it, Riley? Something's happened to Henry. Happened to Henry? Yeah, let's go. <laughs> well, this door wasn't locked when I left it. It was open so Henry could... See who was going down the corridor with a handkerchief. Key was on the inside. I, I don't get it. Well, haven't you got a key that'll open it? Yes, I have a master key. Here. Henry. Nick. Look. Oh. Another runner in Vegas. Yes. Right in the middle of his back. He's dead, all right. She must have seen him looking out or heard him talking to me. She pushed the door open and stabbed him before he could turn around. It's gone. The handkerchief is gone from where we left it. That settled it. No more stalling. We'll break her door down if we have to. Hold everything, Riley. Take it easy. What do you mean, take it easy? You want a live prisoner or a dead one? What do you mean by that? Look here. If Mr. Bray is guilty and you break her door down, she'll know you have the goods on her. Well, she still has one of those daggers. And if I know her, she'll use it on herself if she's guilty. Well, so what? Further, furthermore, Henry said he couldn't be sure who it was he saw, didn't he? No, Nick, it couldn't be anybody but Dr. Bray. Even if you're right, Riley. If you let her think she's gotten away with it, you can search her dressing room and she's out of it. Then you can find the handkerchief and the key she locked this room with. They'll be hidden somewhere in there. All the rooms have private washrooms. Now, she might try to put the key and the handkerchief down one of the drains. It'll take a plumber to get at them if she does. Mm, and by golly, we'll get a plumber and tear out every pipe in the place. All right, Risky, he'll get him out. It's your idea. Get the women out of the dressing room so we can search them. All right. Carter and I will go up to my office. I'll call them from there and then ask them to come up. Okay, okay. Get going. <laughs> Do we have to wait here, Mr. Carter? It won't be long now. 
We just wanted to get all three of you out of the way while Lieutenant Riley digs up the evidence that will send somebody to the electric chair. The chair? Did you know that human hair can be identified just the same as fingerprints can? And just as exactly? Well, I didn't. No, I. I can recall reading that recently. Why? Whose hair have you found, Mr. Carter? I'd rather not divulge that. You got them, Nick. The key and the handkerchief. They were both in the drain pipe caught in the first trap. Which room did you find them in? Mr. Brave, how do you explain this handkerchief and key which we found in your dressing room? Uh, let me see that handkerchief. Yeah. Why, I can't explain it, Lieutenant. It's not my handkerchief. But not yours. No, it's... It's mine, Lieutenant. I thought so. You know it, Miss Clear? Yes. Well, it's a very elaborate nanogram. Hardly anybody could read it, but it is D.C. It does look something like my nanogram. D apostrophe A. Except that my nanogram is very plain and simple. Here. Well, I'll be a... I'll bet you killed him anyway. You... Hold on, Riley. Where did you find that key and handkerchief? In my leg Bray's dressing room. Right. And since Mr. Bray wouldn't have put it in there in her own dressing room... And Della Clare couldn't have. And since McIntosh wasn't on the scene at all when Henry was murdered, the only other possible person who could have killed both Frayne and Henry is... Ah, you mean Nita Lindman? No, Riley. I mean Mark Risdale. Oh, gosh, Nick, I don't see how you figured that all out as fast as you did. There were too many clues, Patsy. The black hairs on the dagger was a clue. The handkerchief with the blaze initials on it was a clue. But both together were just a little too pat. Oh. Nobody leaves several incriminating clues around. Bothered me until I found that it wasn't that raised handkerchief. Then everything fell right into place. What do you mean, everything? Well, Rizdale had a flop on his hands, and he knew it. Uh-huh. He was broke. He was going to lose his theater. But the appearance of Frayne and Debray was insured for $50,000 each. That is, Rizdale got $50,000 if either Frayne or Debray did not appear in the show for any reason except voluntary withdrawal. So... If he could kill Frame and hang the killing on Myra Debray, he could collect $100,000 cash. And that would put him on his feet again. Oh, I see. So he sent everybody home, except the seven who had to be there. Then he went to his office, sent for Frame, and then laid in wait for him at the foot of the stairs, having arranged that no one else would be around at the time. And after killing him, he went back to his office and waited until the body was found. And he planted the handkerchief there, thinking it was Myra Debray. That's it. It was easy enough for him to plant the hairs on the dagger. But how did he kill Henry? You were all there together, weren't you? And he was clever enough to make it look so. He planted Henry in the vacant dressing room, and we all started upstairs. He'd probably have invented some excuse to stay behind, but Lindman started screaming just then, and we all rushed up on stage. That's right. Well, that gave Risdale a couple of minutes to slip back into the corridor, stab old Henry, lock the door, plant the key and handkerchief in the drain in Debray's room, and then join us in the office. But, Nick, you heard old Henry speaking when Riley answered the phone, didn't you? No, Patsy, I didn't. I heard Risdale impersonating Henry. Oh, I get it. You recall he slipped into the next office to get some aspirin? Well, he used the house phone in there, called his own office, impersonated Henry. Remember, he used to be an actor years ago, and then faked the blow in the fall. It was almost a beautiful alibi. And if he hadn't mistaken Bella's handkerchief for Myra's, he might have gotten away with it. Yes, Patsy. And that was a fatal error. Either the handkerchief or the hairs of the dagger would have been excellent proof. But he was so anxious to be sure Debray was the goat that he planted too much. He wove too many strands to his web, and one of them tripped him up. Well, so long for now. So long, everybody. And so long to you, Nick and Patsy. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is featured in Street and Smith magazines. Ron Clark is starred as Nick with Helen Chalt as Patsy. Original music is played by Lou White, and the programs are written and directed by Jock McGregor. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented at this time and over these same stations each week by the three great Linux home brighteners. This is Mutual. Thank you.
Yes, it's another case for that most famous of all manhunters. The detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Presented by the three great Linux home brighteners. Linux clear gloss, Linux cream polish, and Linux self-polishing wax. Created by Acme, America's great producer of Acme quality paints. Today's curious adventure, Murder Goes to College, or Nick Carter and the Mystery at Spring Lake. In just a moment, we'll hear how Nick Carter solved the mystery at Spring Lake. But first, a Christmas suggestion. There's nothing that adds more to hospitable cheer than a bright, well-kept home. American homemakers have learned how much surroundings can mean. That's why they've come to depend on Chemtone, the miracle wall finish, to beautify their walls. And for your floors, woodwork, and furniture, it's those three great Linux home brighteners. Linux clear gloss varnish, the durable super varnish that dries to an elastic, transparent surface which protects all wood and linoleum in your home. Linux cream polish, which cleans as it polishes, leaving no oily film on your furniture. And Linux self-polishing wax which beautifies your floors with a satiny yet tough non-skid finish that resists wear, water, and dirt. Get the three great Linux home brighteners at your hardware, paint, or department store. Your headquarters also for Chemtone, the miracle wall finish. And now for today's mysterious adventure with Nick Carter. As we start our story today, we find Nick and his assistant Patsy in Nick's car racing toward Mount Albans College for girls in response to a hurried phone call from the dean of the school. But if this girl killed herself, Nick, what are you supposed to do? If a girl kills herself, there's no criminal to catch. If it was suicide, Dean Collingwood wants me to find the reason for it. Oh, isn't that a little out of your line? Well, yes, it is, Patsy, but she's an old friend of mine, so I said I'd do it. But why does she care why the girl killed herself? Oh, she thinks that if some of the parents felt that the girl disliked the school enough to kill herself to get out of it, they'd take their own daughters out of Mount Albans in droves. Huh? The school will be ruined. How did she die, Nick? Well, the dean said she found a box of sleeping capsules on the table beside the girl's bed, together with an empty water glass. She thought they might be the cause. Well, when Nicholas Carter gets on the scene, everything will be all straightened out. We'll all know exactly what happened and why. <laughs> And this, Margaret, is my assistant and severest critic, Patsy Bowen. Patsy, Dean Collingwood, head of Mount Albans. How do you do, Miss Bowen? Fine, thank you. Have you notified the police yet, Margaret? Why, no. I uh, wanted you to look things over first, Nick. I see. Well, who found the body? When Miss Jordan failed to appear for breakfast, one of the maids was sent to see if she needed help or if she were ill. When no one answered the maid's knock, why, of course, she came back to me. Then you found her? Yes, I found her. Dead. How many people know about the tragedy so far? Oh, only the maid, myself, and, of course, you two. Good. Let's keep it that way for a while longer. Now, may I see your room, please? Yes, of course. It's on the next floor. This way, please. What can you tell me about this Jordan girl? She was an only child. Her mother is a widow. Did she have any close friends? Yes. She and three other girls were together quite a lot. They were Miss O'Hearn, Miss Grinnell, and Miss Brown. They all interested in the same things? <laughs> My three friends were interested primarily in young men and good times. But Miss Jordan's hobby was amateur photography. Did she have money? Yes, she did. Her mother gave her everything she wanted. This is her room, Nick. I'll say she had money, Nick. You don't get rugs like these with cigar coupons. Are these the sleeping capsules, Margaret? Yes. Hmm. You can't buy these in this state without a prescription. She had a prescription, the number of it, and the physician's name uh, on the box. So I see. And I'll check with him later. Well, Patsy, suppose you look over the things on that side of the room while I go through her desk here. See if you can find anything that might help us learn what's happened. Right, Nick. Any letters, bills, notes, and so on, you know. But I know. Oh, you really shouldn't read her letters, Nick. They're, they're private. Well, if any reporters happen to get hold of them, they'll be as public as Central Park. Reporters? What have they to do with this? Everything. You can't hide suicide or murder. Nick, please, this, this mustn't be murder. Well, I hope not, Margaret, for your sake. Well, this is interesting. Letter to a mother. Started but never finished. Darling mother, I hope you will remember always how close we have been and how much happiness we've had together. You've been so good to me. 
And that's as far as you got. Hmm, I wonder why she didn't finish it. That sounds like a farewell letter. It was a farewell note, of course. Well, why wasn't it finished then? Well, she was probably overcome with emotion. I don't think so. She hadn't been crying. Her eyelids aren't red or swollen. Good girl, Patsy. Well, Margaret, will you ask your chemistry professor to analyze one of these sleeping capsules? Very well, Nick. Although I still think that this is all nonsense. Also, I'd like to use your study. I want to talk to this Jordan girl's three friends, one at a time. Very well. But don't tell them anything about the Jordan girls being dead. All right, Nick. I'll send the first girl in to you in a few minutes. Come in. You wanted to see me, sir? I'm Mary Grinnell. Yes, Miss Grinnell. Come in, won't you? Yes, sir. Miss Grinnell... I'm afraid I have a shock for you. Your friend, Edith Jordan, has just killed herself. Oh, no. Edith wouldn't do that. She just wouldn't. No? Well, at any rate, she's dead, I'm sorry to say. Can you shed any light on the situation? I, I'm afraid not. I'm sorry. Well, do you know anything about her actions last night? We studied together for our mid-year exams. In your room or hers? In mine. She went back to her room early, though. Said she wanted to write a letter and then turn in early. That must have been the letter we found there, Nick. Probably. Can you tell me anything else, Miss Grinnell? No, sir. <laughs> Nothing. All right, then. Run along. And please don't mention what I've told you to anyone. <laughs> Miss O'Hearn, I'm sure you'll be sorry to learn that your friend Edith Jordan has killed herself. Oh, no. No, she wouldn't. Well, she couldn't. She, she wasn't that kind of a girl. What makes you say that? Oh, 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 lots of things. And especially because we planned to go to a matinee together on Saturday. She even got the tickets for us. Hmm. Tell me, Miss O'Hearn, in your opinion, did Edith ever seem morbid or unhappy? Oh, no, never. Uh, oh, except... Except what? Well... When Edith first came here, she was very gay. Lately, she's been very quiet. I don't know why, though. Well, thanks very much, Miss O'Hearn. Ask Miss Brown to come in, will you? Yes, sir. You can go in now, Alice. All right. You wanted to see me? Miss Brown, Edith Jordan killed herself last night. Killed herself? <laughs> no, you couldn't make me believe that. Why do you say that? It just wasn't that kind. And besides, lately she's been afraid of something. Afraid? Afraid of what? I don't know, but, but for the last month she's lived in fear of something. That might account for the sleeping capsules, Nick. Possibly. How do you know she was afraid, Miss Brown? Well, we, we girls never lock our doors here in the dormitory, but she did. Perhaps she was just timid. She wasn't timid when she first came here. No? Well, do you know when she first began locking her door? Yes. It was right after someone took a shot at her in the woods. What's that? Someone shot at her? Are you sure? Edith said she knew it was true, but she asked me not to mention it to anyone. Was she alone when this happened? Why, yes. She often went into the woods alone with her camera. And did she go into the woods after this someone took a shot at her? Oh, no. After that, she used her car and took pictures from the highway. Oh, she had her own car? Yes, sir. Well, do you happen to know whether Miss Jordan was taking a sleeping remedy lately? I don't think she was. She had some harmless preparation the doctor gave her, but I don't think she ever used it. Well, apparently it wasn't entirely harmless. Unless I'm mistaken, she died from taking it. Well, thank you, Miss Brown. <laughs> Yes? Uh, Mr. Carter, Dean Collinwood asked me to let you know what I found out when I analyzed the sleeping capsule she gave me. Oh, yes, yes. What was it? Oh, I found nothing unusual about it. Just a sleeping remedy that's in common use. Would they be enough to kill anybody? Oh, no, indeed. Not unless they were accompanied by something far more deadly. Well, thank you, Professor. Thank you very much. It's quite all right, Mr. Carter. Oh, hello, Margaret. Come in. Well, Nick, have you learned anything yet? 
Only that I'm sure Miss Jordan didn't kill herself. But Nick, that's the one thing I don't want to find out. Yes, I know, Margaret, but I can't help facts being facts. Well, what now? I think I'll take a run into town and talk with a physician who prescribed the capsules for her. Oh, uh, will you do something for me, Nick? Certainly. Uh, Will you take the bus into town and, and come back in Miss Jordan's car? It's being repaired there, and the garage phoned a short time ago that it's ready. I promised to send someone in for it. Of course. Thank you. Uh, Patsy, mm-hmm. while I'm gone, I want you to go over Edith Jordan's room with a fine-tooth comb. Notice every little thing. Looking for anything special, Nick? No, Patsy, just looking. Uh-huh. You've heard what these girls have told us. See if you can find anything to explain the Jordan girls' actions during the past few weeks. I'll see you when I get back from town. <laughs> Dr. Steele, according to the label on the package, you prescribed some sleeping capsules for Miss Edith Jordan. Edith Jordan? Oh, yes, I remember her now. Plucky kid. Ah, not a whimper out of her when I set her collarbone. Even refused an anesthetic. Did you say she broke her collarbone? Why, yes, it was uh, oh, about two months ago, I should say, but... There were no complications, and the injury healed rapidly. Do you remember how it happened? Oh, uh, yes, an automobile accident. Uh, That was when I prescribed the sleeping remedy for her, just as a precaution. I don't suppose she needed a very strong dose. No, no, it was a very small one. One three-quarter grain capsule, and, well, a second one an hour later, if required. What would be a deadly dose, Doctor? Oh, from 40 to 50 times that much, probably. Did you give her the prescription? No. No, I phoned it into the drugstore, and he had it ready for her when she got there. I often do that. I see. Well, thank you very much, Doctor. You've been very kind. Now, if you'll tell me which way the drugstore is, I won't bother you any longer. Edith Jordan had a broken collarbone a few weeks ago. That's something no one but the doctor had ever known about before. What else is Nick going to uncover in his search for the real reason why Edith Jordan was found dead in her bed in exclusive Mount Albans College? We'll see in just a moment. If you're a homemaker, you have every reason to take pride in a home that fairly gleams with the evidence of careful attention. And every wood and linoleum surface in your home will gleam when you use Linex Clear Gloss Varnish. Because Linex Clear Gloss lends a lustrous finish that keeps its beauty a long, long time. It lessens your housework amazingly, too, for it's so easy to keep clean. Dirt stays on the surface where you can wipe it away in a jiffy. And Linex Clear Gloss is so simple to apply. You just brush it on, and it dries without brush marks to an elastic, transparent finish that wears and wears. A finish which protects every surface to which it's applied. Yes, it's a fact. Linex Clear Gloss protects all the wood and linoleum surfaces in your home against damage by boiling water, hot grease, fruit acids, perfume, even alcohol. In every way, it's truly the super varnish. Ask for it by name at your dealers. Linex, L-I-N-X. Linex Clear Gloss Varnish. You'll find all three great Linex home brighteners and Chemtone, the miracle wall finish, at hardware, paint, and department stores everywhere. And now back to our story. As we left Nick, he was learning things about the dead girl, Edith Jordan, that not even Dean Collinwood, Dean of exclusive Mount Albans College for Girls, knew. Did she commit suicide or was it murder? Let's pick up Nick as he calls at the drugstore where the sleeping capsules the doctor prescribed for Edith Jordan were made up. Yes, sir? I'm sorry to bother you, but would you be good enough to allow me to see the prescription for a sleeping remedy prescribed for Miss Edith Jordan by Dr. Steele about two months ago? I'm sorry, sir, but our records are available only to the police or the doctor. But I can assure you that the prescription was filled exactly as ordered. Very well, I understand. I I thought you would. Uh, Sad case, isn't it? Yes, very. Oh, did you fill the prescription yourself? I believe I did. I remember thinking that college girls these days use far too many sleeping preparations. Uh, Yes, of course. Thank you. The 
this is her car, Mr. Carter. Well, I should have expected a girl with her money to have a more expensive car. Oh, no, she wasn't no show-off. Yeah, too bad her luck ran out, finally. Luck ran out? What do you mean by that? Her accident? Oh, uh, look, bud, that was no accident. How do you mean? Why, someone sawed the gadget on the steering wheel almost through. First time the car went around a sharp curve at high speed, it gave way. Only as luck would have it, instead of going over the embankment, the car just turned into a hill of dirt along the road and buried its nose in the dirt. Miss Jordan got off with just a broken collarbone instead of being killed altogether. Did you tell Miss Jordan what you just told me? You bet I did. Didn't worry her at all. I had to told the cops, too, only the boss said it was none of our business if she didn't want to report it. I see. Well, now, thanks very much. Be seeing you. Well, what can I do for you, Mr. Carter? You're running a story on the suicide of the Jordan girl at Mount Albans College? Sure we are. That's big news for this town. Well, could you add one little paragraph to your story? What kind of paragraph? Miss Jordan left a diary. It's locked in a steel box for which we've not been able to locate the key. Well? Uh-huh. may take a day or so to have a new key made, as it's a very special type of lock. But we expect the diary to clear up the motive for the suicide. Yeah, that's very interesting, Mr. Carter. Uh, may I quote you on that? Well, if you don't mind, I'd rather you'd use that well-known phrase, it is understood. Oh. That should cover it. I see what you mean. I don't know what you've got up your sleeve, Mr. Carter, but we'll play along with you. Your little item will be understood in this evening's paper. Thank you. Thank you very much. It should help us immensely. Well, Patsy, find anything in Edith Jordan's room? Oh, I don't expect it amounts to much, Nick, but here it is. Exhibit A, a hat with what looks like a bullet hole through the crown. Yes. So Miss Brown was right. Someone did shoot at her. Anything else? The only other thing I found was this. Exhibit B, a picture that Edith Jordan took just before she was shot at. What? She, had an, she didn't have any enlarging apparatus, so she gave it to Alice Brown, who does have an enlarger. She wanted it blown up. But why? Well, look, Nick, it's a picture of Spring Lake. That's just north of here. Here in the center of the background is a figure. Neither Edith nor Alice knew who or what it was, so Alice made an enlargement of it to see if they could recognize it. But beyond the fact that it seems to be the figure of a man, it doesn't mean much. You can't see who he is. Patsy, where did you get this? Alice Brown gave it to me. She had it in her room. She and Edith thought there might be some connection between the shooting and this picture, but they couldn't seem to find any. Doesn't mean much, does it? Mm-mm. And yet... Did you find out anything in town? Well, yes and no. The way things look now, this is the situation. Edith Jordan, perhaps unknown to herself, knew something that placed her life in danger. What? She was shot at, and she was in a phony auto accident in which she got a broken collarbone. I don't think she ever used the sleeping capsule she got from Dr. Steele until very recently. No? She'd probably been getting more and more nervous about things until at last she felt she had to have something to put her to sleep. So last night, she took one or more of the capsules, and they killed her. Hmm. And yet, the physician who prescribed them is a reputable man. And the drugstore, where they were made up, also has a good reputation. So far, that's as far as... Hey, uh, mind if I come in and bother you a few minutes, Mr. Carr? Of course not, Sheriff. Come right on in. Thank you. Howdy, ma'am. Hello. Hey, look, Mr. Carr, you got some theory about this kid committing suicide? Only one theory, Sheriff. She didn't kill herself. Ah, can you prove that? I expect to be able to. When? In the next 24 hours. 24 hours, huh? Will you give me that long without interfering? Yeah. Yep, you got it. You know, that picture of Spring Lake there in your desk reminds me we, uh, we came across a murder out there at the lake just yesterday. What was the murder? Why do you ask? Thought maybe there might be some connection between the two killings, that's all. Oh, heck No. Notice this college girl and the woman we found out at the lake are two different kinds of people. No connection at all. Well, what was it you found at the lake? Young woman. Been dead a couple of months. It was a waitress at the roadhouse near the lake. And what happened to her? Oh, slugged in the back of the head, skull crushed, then almost buried in the brush. A uh, hunter found her yesterday. Hmm. Too bad. By the way, Mr. Carter, what's the idea of withholding evidence? What evidence? That there diary. Oh, 
the diary. Yeah. You know, I'm going to break somebody for overlooking that this morning when they search that girl's room. Wait 24 hours, Jeff. Remember, you gave me 24 hours. Yeah. Yeah, I remember. Why I let you wind me around your finger this way, I don't know. It couldn't be because you haven't any clues and you think that I might have one, could it? Huh? Well, uh... (laughs) Could be, Carter. Uh, Could be. (laughs) Did I understand you correctly, Nick? You want to spend the night in the girls' dormitory? That's what I said, Margaret. I want your permission to spend the night in Edith Jordan's room. Nick, that would be most irregular. Margaret, murder is most irregular, too. You're sure it is murder? Absolutely positive. And I hope to solve it by spending the night in her room. But if it was murder, how was it done? Probably the contents of one of the sleeping capsules was changed to a deadly poison. But, Nick, that means... That that means that no stone must be left unturned to catch the murderer. I just wanted to see if you needed anything you don't have before I leave you. No, Patsy, I'm all set. What are you going to do, Nick? Just sit here and wait? That's it, exactly. Just wait. I have all the evidence I need for a conviction, except the name of the killer. I could guess at that, but I couldn't prove it. I expect the killer to prove it for me. Why do you suppose Edith Jordan never told anyone about her fears? Probably she didn't want to worry anyone. She had only suspicions, no matter how strong those suspicions were... And if I guess correctly the kind of girl she was, she wouldn't want to burden anyone else with her troubles. It's too bad, isn't it? She might have been alive now if she'd only told somebody. True enough, Patsy. And hindsight is always better than foresight. Well, Nick, I'll say good night. Happy hunting to you. Thanks, Patsy. I'll just sit here in the dark and wait. Get your hands up. Up with your hands, I said. I can see you plain enough. That's better. Now for some light. Well, so it's you, the mechanic from the garage. What's all this about, anyway? You came here to get the diary, didn't you? Oh, did I? I thought so. That was your picture Miss Jordan got on her snapshot of Spring Lake, wasn't it? Oh, was it? Prove it. I can do that, too. In the picture, the cap on the head of the little figure has two white dots on it. In the same place where you wear your two white union buttons. You can't call that proof. Anybody can have those. You must have taken that picture at the time you were burying that girl you killed. The waitress. You were afraid she'd identify you as the one in the picture, so you took a shot at her. But you missed. Then you tried another stunt. You worked late at the garage one night and weakened the steering gear or car. When that failed to kill her, you were very careful to be the first to point out to her that the steering gear had been tampered with. In that way, she'd never think to blame you for it. It was very clever, my friend. But then you were stumped until you found out that her doctor had given her that sleeping prescription. So being a morphine addict yourself... How do you know that? I saw your arms the other day, and I recognized the scars of the needle. Okay. Okay, you got it on me. You win. So as I said, being a morphine addict yourself, you broke into her room just as you did tonight and filled one of the capsules in the top row with morphine, which would kill her instantly. Yeah. I knew she couldn't take that much of a dose. By the way, how did you find out about that prescription? Uh, She told me about it herself when we were talking one time. But if you knew all this stuff before, why didn't you pull me in down to the garage instead of laying and wait for me like this? I could prove it all to myself, but I couldn't prove it to a jury. However, now I can. Because by your coming here, you've confessed. It's a shame, killing her like that. Because she never had the slightest suspicion you were the Spring Lake murderer. Yeah, don't try to kid me. She knew right enough. That's why I had to get that diary. The whole story would have been in that... Mabel, that girl I killed. She was in love with me. She wanted me to marry her. She said if I didn't, she'd tell the cops where I bought my dope. I made such a fuss, I finally had to hit her over the head. And you were burying her by the lake when the Jordan girl came along and took that picture. Yeah. Then I knew that when the body was discovered like it would be someday... This dame would remember seeing me out there, so I had to get that diary before the cops got it. 
Well, as you go to the electric chair, I want you to remember one thing, my friend. There is no diary. Huh? I invented it to smoke you out in the open. Why, An imaginary diary and a guilty conscience have done what clues and detection could only do with great difficulty. You've convicted yourself. A man's own conscience is a better detective than the greatest detective on earth. Always. <laughs> In just a moment, Nick and Patsy will bring you a preview of next week's exciting case. But now, a thought for this holiday season. Holiday time is hospitality time, and nothing reflects more clearly your hospitable feeling than the sparkling holiday look of your home. The look it has when you depend on the three great Linux home brighteners. Take Linux cream polish, for instance. In one easy application, it gives your fine furniture a lovely luster leaving no oily film to attract more dust and make more work. And Linux cream polish is so quick to use, for it cleans as it polishes, cutting out one whole step in your cleaning day routine. You see, Linux cream polish removes the cloudy accumulation of previous dust and polish, banishes messy fingerprints, and helps conceal ugly scratches all at once. Here is your real shortcut to furniture beauty. Get Linux cream polish now at your dealers. Get all three great Linux home brighteners. Linux clear gloss varnish, Linux cream polish, and Linux self-polishing wax. Remember, Linux is spelled L-I-N-X. Linux. So ask for these fine homemaking products now at your hardware, paint, or department store. Now let's hear from Nick Carter himself. And now, Nick, what's the story you're going to tell us next time? Well, Ken, next week I want to tell you about an adventure I had just because I went to a party to meet a famous man. And the famous man never showed up at all. Doesn't sound as if the party was much of a success. As far as I was concerned, it was a total flop, socially speaking. But there were three murders as a result of that evening's get-together. And Nick himself was almost added to the list. All due to a decanter of whiskey that turned out not to be whiskey at all. Uh Uh-uh, I think that's about enough for now, Patsy. Let's save the rest for next week. And on behalf of myself and the rest of our cast, our organist, Lou White, our sound effects, Walt Shaver, our engineer, Herman Berger, and our writer and director, Jock McGregor, may I wish every one of you the season's greetings in the biggest possible way. And that goes for me, too. So long, everybody. So long to you both. We'll be seeing you again next week. Next week at the same time, listen to another curious experience of Nick Carter, Master Detective, entitled Death in a Decanter. Or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Missing Brother. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is featured in Street and Smith magazines. Lon Clark is starred as Nick with Helen Choate as Patsy. Original music is played by Lou White, and the programs are written and directed by Jock McGregor. And now Acme, creator of the three great Linux home brighteners, Linux clear gloss varnish, Linux cream polish, and Linux self-polishing wax, wishes you the heartiest greetings of the holiday season and invites you to be listening next week when Acme will again present Nick Carter, Master Detective, over these same stations. Ken Powell speaking. This is Mutual. What's the matter? What is it? Another case for Nick Carter, Master Detective. Yes, it's another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective, presented by the three great Linux home brighteners, Linux clear gloss, Linux cream polish, and Linux self-polishing wax, created by Acme, America's great producer of Acme quality paints. <laughs> Today's curious adventure, Murder in a Decanter, or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Missing Body. In just a moment, we'll hear how Nick Carter solved the mystery of the decanter murder. 
But first, I want to ask you something. Does your home have that inviting holiday look the whole year round? It can have. Yes, just as Chemtone, the miracle wall finish, has brought new beauty to your walls, so the three great Linux home brighteners will bring added loveliness to your floors, woodwork, and furniture. Linux self-polishing wax, which beautifies your floors with a satiny yet tough non-skid finish that resists wear, water, and dirt. Linux cream polish, which cleans as it polishes, leaving no oily film on your furniture. And Linux clear gloss varnish, the durable super varnish that dries to an elastic, transparent surface which protects all wood and linoleum in your home. You'll find the three great Linux home brighteners at your hardware, paint, or department store. Your headquarters also for Chemtone, the miracle wall finish. And now for today's mysterious adventure with Nick Carter. As our story opens, we find Nick and Patsy at a New Year's party talking to their host. I am sorry, Mr. Carter, but the man I asked you here to meet has been unavoidably detained. You and he will have had a great deal in common, I know. Yes, Nick's been looking forward to it for a long time now, Mr. Corey. And I can keep looking forward to it for a while longer, I guess. Well, Mr. Carter, you'll probably find all kinds of people at my parties. I'll be seeing you. Well, there are certainly all kinds of people here, Patsy. But I can't see anyone I care about talking to. The trouble with you, Nick, is that all you think about is business. Well, true enough. But in my business, I meet people who are interesting and frequently intelligent, even if they are crooks. But here... There are probably interesting characters here if we only knew which ones they are. Yes. Now, look at that man just coming into the room. Hmm? If you can call him a man. Mackley, I believe his name is. Typical gigolo if I ever saw one. And he's not contented with drinking at the bar. He's carrying his own private decanter of whiskey right along with him. Yes, he's hardly an attractive type. To me, that is. I understand that he's considered very attractive by many women, however. Do you know him? No, but I know something about him. For one thing, I understand that he and our hostess are pretty thick. And that he... Uh Uh-oh, he's coming over here. I hope he doesn't want to stick around. Having fun, Carter. Great party, isn't it? Yes, if you like it. Well, I've just been giving a bit of extra attention to our lovely hostess. She's almost out. (laughs) Shouldn't drink so much, you know. The lovely Cynthia just can't take it, I'm afraid. Is she all right, Mr. Mackley? Oh, yes, yes. Practically speaking. Uh, I uh, just left her on the divan in a small den upstairs. Gave her a little snifter and left her there to sleep it off. The small den? Yes, her upstairs library where she keeps her account books and whatever. Nice private little place to get rid of that uh, too much, too fast feeling, you know. Yes, I see That's why that whiskey decanter you're carrying around, I suppose, Mr. Mackley. Oh, yes, yes. I can now put it back on the shelf behind the bar where it belongs. Cheerio. What an unpleasant creature. Yes. If Cynthia wants a two-timer husband for a thing like that, I certainly don't admire her taste. Well, I've had enough of this any time you have, Nick. Shall we leave here? You're Mr. Carter, the detective, aren't you? Why, yes, I am. It must be thrilling to be a detective. Well, I suppose that's all in the point of view, Miss... Bentham, Carla Bentham. My brother's Wallace Bentham, Mr. Cord's private secretary. Oh, yes. Mr. Carter. Yes, Miss Bentham. Will you please help me find my brother? Find your brother? Why, what do you mean? I'm sure he's here in the house somewhere, but I can't find him. I'm I'm really terribly worried. But why? He was to have taken me home an hour and a half ago, Mr. Carter, at 11 o'clock. We both work, and he knows I have to get up early for my job. But isn't it just possible he's simply forgotten it? He may be sitting in a corner somewhere with some... Wallace isn't like that, Mr. Carter. I know he'd have met me unless something serious was detaining him. Quite frankly, Miss Bentham, I can't get very worried about your brother. You'll turn up, I'm sure. Mr. Carter, I've searched all over the house. He simply isn't around. You mean you've looked in every room in the house? Every room but one, literally. But the door of the small den on the second floor is locked. I couldn't get in there. So I don't know if he's there or not. Did you knock? Yes, and nobody answered. Nick, that's the room where Mr. Mackley said he left our hostess. Probably, Betsy. Well, she's practically out on her feet. It's funny the door should be locked, isn't it? Oh, I don't know. Mr. Carter, will you come up with me? I'm afraid. I don't know why. I I just am. Well, go ahead, Nick. It won't take but just a few minutes. All right, Miss Bentham. It'll make you happier. Lead on, and we'll follow along. It's right over here, Mr. Carter. Huh? Is this where the uh, 40 thieves hung out? How do you mean? Look at the size of those jaws or urns or whatever you call them. Two at the head of the stairs and two more in the landing. Boy. They're oriental, I believe. Brought back by one of Mr. Cord's ancestors. 
This is the room. Here. The door's locked, all right. Well, let's try knocking. You see? No answer. Well, detective's supposed to look through keyholes, so I might as well live up to my reputation. Yes, I think I will have a look in there after all. Well, something is wrong, Nick. Mr. Carter, what is it? You'll see in just a moment. And it won't be pleasant, I warn you. And let me get this door open. There. <gasps> Nick, that's Mrs. Cord. That was Mrs. Cord. Oh, the whole top of her skull is smashed in. Oh, Nick. Wallace. Wallace? There's obviously no one in this room but the body. But Wallace, where's Wallace? This is the only place where he could be if he isn't here. He isn't. Please, please, Miss Van. This is a matter for the police. I hope Lieutenant Riley doesn't mind being hauled out of bed in the middle of the night. You sure nobody's touched anything since you found the body? Positive, Sergeant Kilroy. It's a wonder to me how we always find you on the scene of a killing whenever we get here. Lieutenant Riley lets you get away with murder. But now that he ain't here, you got me to deal with. And I ain't as soft in the head as he is, not where you're concerned. Sorry, I annoy you, Sergeant, but I just happen to be here. Yeah, I suppose so. Well, suppose you just happen to tell me what you found out so far. Always glad to help the police, Sergeant, when they need it, which is often enough generally. Now, look here. The body was just where you'll see it now, on the floor there. I could see it through the keyhole, which is why I opened the door in the first place. On the desk, you see two glasses and an empty bottle of burgundy. And that's all. Where's the murder weapon? That you'll have to answer for yourself. I haven't found it anywhere. Got any suspects? Have you talked to Mackley yet? I have. He says he was up here in the den helping Mrs. Cord get over a bad spell. He says he gave her a shot of liquor and went downstairs again. That's all he knows. Puts him in a pretty tight spot, doesn't it? It might, except for a few facts you've overlooked. Such as what? Carla Bentham swears her brother must have been in this room. Says she searched the rest of the house and couldn't find him. Therefore, he was in here. Therefore, he killed Mrs. Cord. And scrammed out of here with a murder weapon. It ain't here anywhere, so he must have taken it with him. Sure of that? Mrs. Cord was clubbed to death. There's nothing in any of these rooms that could have done the clubbing. Therefore, young Wallace and the weapon went out of here together. Kilroy, sounds like a pretty feeble story to me. You don't even know Wallace was in this room. He may have been outside on the grounds while his sister was looking for him. You think Mackley did it? I feel quite sure he didn't. His motive would have been to keep her alive rather than otherwise. He could get money and gifts out of her only as long as she was alive and healthy. No, I haven't found the murderer yet, and neither have you, Kilroy. Yeah? Well, how about this? Wallace Bentham ain't here now, is he? Apparently not. Then how did he get out of this place? He ain't in the house, he ain't anywhere on the grounds. My men know that now. And there's a wall around this place with only one gate. And the man at the gate says he ain't left here since he came in last night. Which means he sneaked away by somehow climbing over the wall. If that don't mean he's guilty, I'm a herring's uncle. You got any theory about what happened here? I got just one theory, and it's the right one. The servants told us there's been something going on between young Bentham and Mrs. Cord. Tonight, young Bentham found Mrs. Cord and Mackley having a drink in here. There's the two glasses in the empty burgundy bottle. He was jealous, waited until Mackley had gone out, and clubbed her over the head in a jealous rage. Very simple when you put it that way. You got any better ideas? Until I have facts to go on, I don't have any ideas at all. Well, I think I'll be getting home where I can find Patsy. Good night, Lieutenant. Or should I say Sergeant? That's all right, Carter. It'll be Lieutenant one of these days, and don't you forget it. And when it is, Carter, watch your step. I'll be happy to. So long. <laughs> Nick Carter's office. Mr. Carter, this is you know who. Don't mention my name. Oh, yes, I recognize your voice. Can you what come? Can you come to 2343 Aldine Street at once? I'm in terrible trouble. Terrible. But what's the matter? I can't tell you on the phone. For the love of heaven, come. All right. Lucky you caught me. I was just going out to dinner. Be right over. <laughs> in quick. Look, there. Why, that's Mackley. With the top of his head crushed in, too. Yes, there's what did it. Hmm. Heavy glass bookend. Huh? I found him like that when I came home. You just got in when you phoned me? Yes. I opened my door and there he was. 
been dead less than an hour, I should say. Oh, what will the police say? And after what happened to Mrs. Cord last night? Yes, yeah, Sergeant Kilroy will undoubtedly have plenty to say. How do you suppose Mackley got in here? He may have picked the lock. Or... Or what? My brother Wallace had the only other key to my apartment. If he were here and opened the door to find Mackley there instead of you, he might have swung with the bookend. Oh, I wonder... Miss Bentham, how well do you know Mr. Magley? I only met him once before last night. If he's almost a stranger, why should he come here to see you? I don't know. And that's the truth. Let's see what he has in his pockets. Maybe that'll tell us something. Usual junk man carries around. Pencils, pen, a seated bill, check for his car in a parking lot around the corner. Oh, see here. This is addressed to you. What is it? it says, Dear Miss Bentham... I phoned all day to try to get in touch with you. Finally, I came in person as I could wait no longer. I must see you. I have something to tell you about last night and your brother. Also, I want your help. I want you to keep... And that's all. That's a funny way for a note to end, Mr. Carter. Yes. That in the ragged way the note is folded makes it obvious. He was scribbling this note to you here at your table when something startled him and he crammed it in his pocket. And then he was killed. But who killed him and how did they get in here? Let's see what's outside this window. Ah, here's the answer. Marks of shoe nails on the windowsill. The flat roof only six feet below your window here. Mm -hmm. Looks as if somebody got out here. Probably the killer. May have heard your key in the lock and dashed out this way. Maybe I'm lucky he didn't wait and kill me, too. Miss Bentham, does your brother drink wine? You're thinking of the empty bottle and the two glasses in Mrs. Cord's room last night, I suppose. Yes. Yes, Wallace drinks only wine, nothing else. What does that... Open up in the name of the law. The police. Open up, Carter. I know you're there, and the girl, too. Quiet. Let me handle this. Just a second. So, another killing, eh? And you are in on this, Carter. Last night I thought you weren't, but now I find you here with this girl and a dead man. What I told you last night was the truth, Kilroy. I know nothing about this except what you see here. Miss Bentham came home tonight and found Mackley back... Sure, sure, I know. Hold out your hands, Carter. What are you figuring on, Sergeant? What do you think? You're in this thing up to your neck. I'm taking you in and locking you up. Well, what can Nick do now? Arrested and in jail for a murder he didn't commit, he can't do much to find the real murderer. What's going to be his next step? We'll see in just a moment. No matter how careful we are, we're all likely to track in mud, snow, and slush from out of doors these winter days. Save time and energy by protecting your floors. Use Linex Self-Polishing Wax, the non-skid finish, to give your wood and linoleum floor surfaces protection plus beauty. Because Linex Self-Polishing Wax contains genuine Carnauba wax, it wears well and may be renewed at any time without re-waxing the whole floor. Linex self-polishing wax resists water, too, so that it may be wiped up easily. And it lessens your work, because Linex self-polishing wax keeps dirt on the surface, where it's readily wiped away. What's more, Linex self-polishing wax gives all your floors a beautiful, satiny appearance you'll be proud of. Best of all, Linex self-polishing wax requires no tiresome rubbing or polishing. You simply wipe it on in a jiffy. So depend on the modern way to keep your floors looking their best with a minimum of work. Get Linex, L-I-N-X, Linex self-polishing wax now. You'll find all three great Linex home brighteners and Chemtone, the miracle wall finish, at hardware, paint, and department stores everywhere. And now back to our story. We left Nick trying to talk Sergeant Kilroy out of arresting him for murder, but without much success. You're in this thing up to your neck, and I'm taking you in and locking you up. Well, that's absurd, Kilroy. I have nothing to do Put with it. Put your hands out, Carter. Kilroy, you're a fool. Why, you in a fool? You shouldn't hit a policeman, Mr. Carter. I know it, but I had to do it. I've got to be on the loose for a time. I'm just beginning to make sense out of this. Come on. Where? Kilroy was alone when he came up here, but he must have men downstairs. We have to get out of here before they come here looking for him. You got any money? Yes, some. Good. Go to a side street hotel somewhere and register under an assumed name. I'll be at the Green Hotel under the name of John Nicholas. But don't call me unless it's very important. (laughs) 
Casey's parking lot. Yes, this is the one. Will you get this car for me, please? Here's the check. Yes, this ought to be far enough away. Now, let's see if there's anything in this car, Magley's. Hmm. Nothing inside here. Well, maybe he has something in the rear compartment. Now, which one of these keys unlocks this? There. Ah, hat box, huh? That's a whole lot heavier than any hat box I ever... S- Uh-oh. I'll have to postpone this investigation for now. I better get out of here. So long since you've used that private entrance of yours, I'd almost forgotten about it. It's been a long time, Patsy, since I've had to get into my office without anyone seeing me. What have you done now? Oh, Sergeant Kilroy and I had a little argument, and I won by a knockout. Oh, Nick, you didn't. I had to. It was Kilroy or me. So that's why those two cops have been hanging around out in front here for the last hour. What's going on? Plenty. Well, is that a hat box you have there? Yes, it belonged to Mac- to Mackley. To Mackley? Yes, he was murdered in Carla Bentham's apartment earlier this evening. Oh? I'll tell you all about it later. Right now, I want to find out why a hat box should be so heavy. Give me those scissors. Here you are. Now, a snip here, a snip there. The string is off. We lift the lid and we find... Huh, lots of tissue paper. Oh, hurry up, Nick. And under the tissue paper, we find a whiskey decanter. Oh, but that can't be whiskey in it. It's too red. You're right there. No, don't touch it, Betsy. Maybe fingerprints on it. Oh. Now, let me use my handkerchief. I'll take it out where I can see it better. Oh, that's a beautiful thing, Nick. Why, it's cut glass. Yes, but what's that in it? It Smells like wine. Yes, it is wine. A sparkling burgundy, I should say, with no more sparkle left in it. That's a funny thing to do, put wine in a whiskey decanter. Yes, and I have a feeling I've seen this decanter before. Of course, Nick. Mackley had it at the Cord's party last night. Right, Patsy. He brought it downstairs and set it on the shelf of that little private bar. Brought it downstairs from the den. Or Mrs. Cord was murdered. Let me look at it again. Of course! That's why the wine was put in it. This was what killed Mrs. Cord, Patsy. What? Yes, see the blood right on the corner here? What? You can't see it with a decanter full of wine unless you look for it. And our fingerprints on it, too. I can see them. Patsy, that's the answer. I don't get it, Nick. You will later. Right now, I've got to get over to the Green Hotel, where I'm supposed to be registered as John Nicholas. I'll see you later. And take good care of that decanter. Why I ever picked out such a dump to come to. I should at least have picked a radio. Yes? Shh. Can you come to see me again? Right away? What is it this time? Something special. Wallace is coming to see me, and I thought... Wallace? Your brother? Yes. And I thought he could get some advice from you. How do you know he's coming? He just phoned me. Said he'd be here in five minutes. But that's utterly and completely impossible. That's what he said. How do you know where to phone you? Tell when I left you followed me here. Can you come? You bet I'll come. I wouldn't miss it. Where are you? The model. Ask for Helen Lawson. I'll be there in ten minutes. Oh, clerk. Yes, sir? Miss Helen Laughlin's room. Uh, number 211, right at the head of the stairs. Uh, is she expecting you? No, she's not expecting me. And I don't want to phone up to her. I want to surprise her, see? Oh, sorry, sir. Rules are that all visitors have to be announced. Is that so? Well, here's a $5 bill. See it? Yes, sir. Now, tear it in half. So. Here's half for you and half for me. You get the other half if you don't phone on ahead that I'm coming. If you do phone ahead, I've got something else here in my hip pocket that'll, that you'll get when I come down. And I know how to handle it, too. You get me? Uh, yes, sir, I get you. You can go right on up. Nobody will announce you. Okay. See you later. Come in. Get your hands up quick, Carter. Close the door, Arthur. Yes, Father. Oh, very nicely done. Mr. Cord and son Arthur, if I'm not mistaken. I'm sorry, Mr. Carter. They made me phone you. We did. A few twists of her arm, and she was glad to oblige. I knew they'd be here, Miss Bentham. 
So I notified the cops on our way up here. They should be along any minute. Well, hear that. We've got to get He's out. lying. The police would never believe him now. He's wanted himself. Besides, why should he expect to find us here? For the simple reason that Miss Bentham's brother Wallace just couldn't be coming here to see her. It's a physical impossibility. What do you mean by that? The dead can't walk. Oh. He's just talking, Carla. Come, Carter. Where's that decanter? Suppose I told you it was at headquarters. Fingerprints, blood and all. I wouldn't believe you. You couldn't know anything about it. It couldn't be much plainer. Blood in two places in the decanter. Where your wife was clubbed once and the other place must have been where you clubbed Wallace. Oh, no. I, no. I'm sorry, Miss Benton. <laughs> These two killed your brother, who? Well, uh, he knows. Just what do you know, Carter? Plenty. You caught Wallace and your wife together and killed them both by slugging them with a whiskey decanter. I imagine that Mackley was close enough to see you do it without being seen himself. Then you had the idea that if young Bentham disappeared, the police had blamed the murder on him. So you and your precious son carried his body out and hid it. But while you were gone, Mackley got his big idea. Blackmail. Here in front of him was a decanter with blood and fingerprints on it. And you, Mr. Cord, were now a very rich man, having inherited your wife's fortune at her death. So Mackley got the decanter, poured out the whiskey, and filled it with the wine from the bottle on the desk. The blood didn't show up that way. Then he took it down to the bar, carrying it carefully so as to preserve the valuable fingerprints. Father, how can he know all this? Go on, Carter. Anything else? Plenty. Judging by the note we found on Mackley's body a while ago, he must have gone to Carla's apartment to let her in on the blackmailing scheme, too. Maybe he wanted to hide the decanter there for safety. But you trailed him there, Cord, and socked him with the bookend, figuring you don't hang any higher for three murders than for two. But Carla came in just then, and you had to leave before you could search Mackley's body. And then I got into the case. You trailed me and saw me get hold of Mackley's car, in which the decanter was hidden. Meanwhile, your sweet son trailed Carla here. And the rest was easy. Force her to call me and then force me to produce the incriminating decanter. You're a fool. Why should I kill my own wife? Because she had money and because you were broke. That and the jealous disposition are motive enough. Okay, so I killed her. Now I want that decanter. You'll call a messenger on that phone. Tell him where to bring it to you at once. If you don't, we'll start working on Carla again. Okay, Gord, you win. For Carla's sake, I'll do it. Let me have the phone. That's more like it, Carter. Call Cranston, 1365. That's the nearest messenger office. Here, take the receiver. I'll dial it for you. Very well. Back up! Get your hands up, Carter! No, you don't! Are you a slack little word? Give me that gun, I'll fix you! Carter, take it easy. I'll take over now. Hey, right, good for you, Sergeant. Well, did you hear anything while you were out there? I heard enough to send the old boy to the chair. I'm glad you got my message okay. Message? I didn't get any message from you. The hotel clerk downstairs phoned and said... That was the message I sent you. After I threatened him with my gun and flashed a torn $5 bill on him, I knew he'd get in touch with headquarters right away. Smart fellow, that clerk. Wouldn't let anyone put anything over on him. And you're a smart fellow, too, Kilroy, recognizing his description of me and answering the call yourself. Well, nobody but me was going to have the pleasure of pulling you in. But look here, Carter. You said Cord and his son hid young Bentham's body. We went all over the house last night, and he isn't hidden there. Did you look in one of those big urns that Cord's place is decorated with? You mean those big vases? Heck no, never thought to look inside them. I'll send someone up right away. Well, how about me? I haven't forgotten you wanted to arrest me a while back. I ain't forgotten it, Carter, and I ain't forgotten about that sock in the jaw you gave me. But, uh, look, suppose we decide that I broke this murder case myself. Would you have any objections? Why, no, Sergeant. Tell you what I'll do. I'll swap you a decanter complete with fingerprints and bloodstains in return for letting bygones be bygones. No hard feelings anywhere. Agreed? Okay, but in the future, keep out of my way. I don't want to have any more arguments with you. Your arguments have too much punch behind them for me. In just a moment, Nick and Patsy will return with a preview of next week's exciting case. But before they do, here's a New Year's resolution for you, one you'll find it easy to keep. The resolution that this year you'll make your home a more pleasant, more inviting place to be. With the three great Linux home brighteners, it's always easy to keep your floors, furniture, and woodwork shining clean. Take Linux cream polish, for instance, which gives your furniture a handsome, lustrous look in half the time. Yes, it's true, for Linex Cream Polish cleans as it polishes, saving you one whole step in your cleaning day routine and removing in one quick application the cloudy accumulation of dust and previous polish. 
Linux cream polish banishes messy fingerprints and helps conceal ugly scratches, too. And it leaves no oily film to attract more dust to make more work. So be sure to ask your dealer for Linux cream polish. Get all three great Linux home brighteners. That's Linux, spelled L-I-N-X. You'll find them, Linux self-polishing wax, Linux cream polish, and Linux clear gloss varnish at your nearest hardware paint or department store. One other important reminder. This is the final week of the great Sixth War Loan Drive. Make the world's safest investment now. Invest in victory, in post-war stability, in your own future security. Buy an extra war bond and make your idle dollars fighting dollars. And now let's hear from Nick Carter himself. How are you going to start the new year off, Nick? Have you got a good story for us? Well, I think so, Ken. A friend of mine, a college professor, was shot in his own home just a few minutes before I got there to see him. The motive was not robbery, but we couldn't find any other motive either. And as Nick didn't take me with him on that trip, he didn't have the advantage of my experience and training as a super detective. (laughs) Which was a great mistake, Patsy, as Nick undoubtedly found out. (laughs) Another murder followed on the heels of the first. And a third victim was nearly added to the list. The said third victim being Nick himself. Yes, I came near the end that time than at any other in my life. What do you call it, Nick? I've called it Monkey Sees Murder. Or the mystery of the Peruvian Red Mark. Well, listen next week for further details. So long for now. I think you'd be interested to hear Nick Carter as the guest detective on the Quick as a Flash program. This evening at 6 o'clock over most of these stations. Why not tune in? And now, so long. And so long to you both, Nick and Patsy. Be seeing you again next week. Next week at the same time, listen to another curious experience of Nick Carter, Master Detective, entitled... Monkey Sees Murder. Or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Peruvian Red Mark. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is featured in Street and Smith magazines. Lon Clark is starred as Nick with Helen Choate as Patsy. Original music is played by Lou White, and the programs are written and directed by Jock McGregor. And now, the three great Linux home brighteners, Linux clear gloss varnish, Linux cream polish, and Linux self-polishing wax, created by Acme White Lead and Color Works, America's great producer of fine Acme quality paints, wishes every one of you real contentment and success during the new year. Ken Powell speaking. This is Mutual. It's another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective, presented by the three great Linux home brighteners, Linux clear gloss, Linux cream polish, and Linux self-polishing wax, created by Acme, America's great producer of Acme quality paints. Today's curious adventure, Monkey Sees Murder, or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Peruvian Red Mark. In just a moment, we'll hear how Nick Carter solved the mystery of the Peruvian Red Mark with the aid of Professor Ben Toole's stuffed monkey. But first, a word about good housekeeping. Millions of women have wisely come to depend upon Chemtone, the miracle wall finish. Another millions are now coming to depend upon the three great Linux home brighteners to give their floors, their woodwork, and their furniture the same radiant beauty that Chemtone gives to walls. Linux clear gloss varnish, the durable super varnish that dries to an elastic, transparent surface which protects all wood and linoleum in your home. Linux cream polish, which cleans as it polishes, leaving no oily film on your furniture. 
and Linex self-polishing wax, which beautifies your floors with a satiny yet tough non-skid finish that resists wear, water, and dirt. You'll find the three great Linex home brighteners at your hardware, paint, or department store. Your headquarters also for Chemtone, the miracle wall finish. And now for today's mysterious adventure with Nick Carter. As we pick up our story for today, we find Nick packing his bag in preparation for a trip to Boston. Patsy is supervising the job. But do you think you ought to go to Boston with that cold, Nick? Well, I'd much rather stay home, Patsy, but I feel that Professor Coleman really needs my help. How do you happen to know this Professor Coleman? Well, some years ago, before you came to work with me, a friend of my father's took me on an expedition into the wilds of Peru. Mm -hmm. Professor Coleman was one of the men in charge. We've been close friends ever since. Where's that letter you got from him? Right here. Thanks. Dear Carter, is there a chance of your getting up this way? I should like to discuss with you a most delicate problem which has suddenly come up, one which is driving me out of my mind. I've tried to write it, but without success. With exams coming up, I can't get away. Please come. I need you desperately. Charlie Coleman. Well, it certainly sounds pretty serious. Yes. Can't imagine what he's talking about, but I think enough of him to want to help him if I possibly can. So I'm going to Boston, cold or no cold. Wonder if old John is still with the professor. Who's old John? Oh, he was sort of a handyman around the university for a long time. Then his memory began to fail him, and after a rather serious accident that cost the chemical lab quite a bit of money, I let him go. Professor Coleman took pity on him and gave him a job as his housekeeper. Old John idolizes the professor. When do you get there, Nick? Oh, I should be there about dinner time this afternoon, I expect. Uh Sir, I'd be glad to see the old boy again. Suppose I should have phoned before coming. Stupid of me. Hmm. Door's open. Not even latched. That's odd. Anyone home? Are you here, Professor? Hello? Well, guess I might as well go in and wait for him. Professor! What on earth? Shot. Right through the head. Not long ago. John! John! Well, obviously, it's a case for the police. Operator. Police headquarters, please. Police headquarters. Yes, sir. Who's there? Oh, it's you, John. Yes, sir. Oh, how are you, Mr. Carter? Police headquarters, Sergeant Donnelly speaking. This is Nick Carter, Sergeant. I want to report that Professor Coleman of 4873 Beacon Street has been murdered. I just found the body. Don't leave the house. I'll have someone up there right away. I'll wait. Goodbye. Did I hear you saying on the phone that he was dead? Yes. Where have you been, John? Well, I've been out. Yes, I know, but where? Well, he said for me to go over to Logman's Hall to a lecture... He ain't really dead, is he? You're just saying that, ain't you? He told you to go out. Why? Well, I don't know. Maybe he was expecting company. He told me to go. Well, whom was he expecting, John? Well, I don't know. Maybe the man who was here twice already asking for him. The man who looked kind of like the professor himself. I see. John, tell me. Do you know anyone who would want to kill the professor? Oh, no, sir. No, indeed. Well, what about this man who looks like him? Who came here twice, you say? Oh, he just came. The professor was out each time, so he went away. Did he leave his name? No, sir, he didn't. Just looked sad and went away. You told Professor Coleman about this man, didn't you? Oh, yes, sir. Yes. And what did he say when you told him? Well, he seemed sort of troubled, sir. He kept asking me what the man looked like and what he said and what he did and all like that. You think the professor was afraid? Well, I don't know. Maybe a little. Oh, I'll go let him in, Mr. Carter. All right, men, wait here. I'm Captain Jeffrey, police department. Is the man who phoned us? Yes, I'm Nick Carter, an old friend of the professor's. He's... His body is in the living room there. Okay, thanks. We'll look the place over. Then I'd like you to tell us what you can about. Wait here, will you? And you say you've known Coleman for years? Yes, ever since we went on that Peruvian expedition together. I only stayed there a few months, but Benjamin Toole, the head of the expedition, and most of the others stayed on until their work was finished. Well, Mr. Carter, if there's nothing else you can tell us, we'll be getting back to headquarters. You're going to be in the city for a while? Yes, at least until this is cleared up. Where will you be? I imagine Ben Toole will want me to stay with him when he knows I'm in town. He generally does. I see. You can get me there if you want me. Carter. Nick Carter. Well, 
this is a surprise. When did you get into town? This afternoon. Well, well, I'll call Peterson and Charlie Coleman right away. We must have a real old-time reunion. I have just come from Professor Coleman's, Ben. He's dead. Huh? Dead? Charlie dead? Oh, surely you're not serious. I'm afraid I am, Ben. He was murdered late this afternoon. Murdered? It doesn't seem possible. Didn't to me either. You see, here, we better call Peterson and tell him. He should know at once. Suppose I ask him to come over right away. But you don't realize, Nick, how he and Coleman have drifted apart in the last couple of years. He's still hot-headed as ever, I'm afraid. Oh? Why, what was the trouble between him and Coleman? Coleman thought Peterson drank too much. Peterson was in his department, you know. And Peterson thought it was none of Coleman's business what he did outside of ours. Once they actually came to blows, very briefly. I see. I suppose Pete will take over Professor Coleman's job now. He was in line for it, wasn't he? Yes, with a nice salary increase, too. Well, I'll give him a ring when he gets here. You can tell us both all the details. And that's all I can tell you. I don't suppose, Peterson, that you have any more idea than Ben does what the problem was that Coleman wanted to discuss with me. Not the slightest, Carter. You and I were scarcely on as intimate terms as that. Of course, I'm sorry that he's dead, but I don't expect to go into mourning for him. We're all sorry he's dead. He was a good man and a good scientist. Yeah, I've got to be running along. I have work to do. Uh, Nice to have seen you, Carter. Now, wait a minute, Peterson. Let's drink a toast to Coleman's memory before you go. No, thanks. I've stopped drinking. Since when? The stuff was beginning to get me. I was beginning to do things without knowing it. You changed, Peterson. Things like that didn't use to worry you. Yes, yes, I know. Yes, I'm getting older. Well, good night. I'll uh, see you again if you stay around a few days, Nick. Well, I'll let you out if you want to. Oh, never go. mind, Ben. I know my way around here. Good night. You'll stay here with me, of course, Nick. We're glad to, Ben. Rather hoped you'd ask me. Before we turn in, I'd like to show you the work I've been doing. My book on the expedition, you know. Oh, yes. How's it coming along? Nearly finished at last. It's been a terrific job to correlate all that material that we gathered in that year in Peru. It's not the money I'm after, you know. It's recognition. Recognition for all those months and years of hard work and perseverance. I'm getting old, you know, and I I may not have... What is it, Ben? Look here. All of them, my manuscript. These red marks. Oh, what do they mean? You know what this is, don't you? The mark that's scrawled all over these papers? Why, it looks like a big red letter F. Is it? After you left the expedition and went back to New York, we found one of our head guides murdered in his tent one morning. And on his face and all over the walls of the tent, written in his blood, was the same symbol. The natives told us it was a message, a warning, a promise of death. But who in the world could have... I don't know. I don't understand it at all. First Charlie Coleman murdered, and now this. What can it mean? I don't know, Ben. But the best thing to do right now is call the police. It's undoubtedly linked to Charlie Coleman's death some way. It's been two days now, Nick, since Charlie was killed and my manuscript was mutilated. Have the police gone to sleep entirely? I talked to Captain Jeffrey yesterday, Ben, but he hadn't learned much that was of any help. Oh, pardon me, Nick. I'll see who's there. Good afternoon, Professor Toole. Hello, Captain Jeffrey. Have you got some news? Well, yes and no. Oh, hello, Mr. Carter. Captain. Glad you're here. See what you two can make out of this. What is it, Captain? This letter. We found it among Professor Coleman's things yesterday. As you see, it's dated about a week ago and comes from a firm of lawyers in Chicago. You care to read it, Mr. Carter? Yes, of course. Well, that's odd. What is it, Nick? Briefly, it says that Professor Coleman's father died a few weeks ago. And the lawyers just found out. His will left his entire estate to his two sons, Charles and Bennett. Well, that fits in with what old John was telling me the other day about the stranger who resembled Coleman. I hadn't heard that. When Professor Coleman's servant told us about him, we checked up on him. It's pretty certain that a man who looks a lot like the professor has been seen around quite a bit recently. Several persons have seen him. Was he alone always? Yeah. No one has ever seen him with a professor. Uh, did you read the rest of the letter? Yes. Goes on to say, Ben, that if one brother only survives, he shall have all the money. But the letter says the lawyers have had no word about Bennett's whereabouts for over five years. They want to know if the professor could help them. The surviving brother gets the whole estate? That's it. Then maybe the stranger was Bennett. 
And maybe he'll, he killed Charlie so that he'd be the surviving brother. Or perhaps they had an argument over the money and the professor was killed in a quarrel. Did you know about his brother, Ben? Yes. Charlie told me a long time ago. But he swore me to secrecy. But after what's happened, I think I'd better tell you. Ah. Charlie's brother, Bennett Coleman, has another name. Vern Call. Vern Call? Why, he's a crook. Is he Charlie's brother? Yes, and he's bad. All bad. He recently escaped from a Carolina prison after serving three years of a long sentence for armed robbery. Well, that's the answer to the whole thing right there. As this Bennett was a fugitive from justice, he knew he couldn't collect his share of the money without being caught. So he made tracks here to see his brother. They had an argument... That's impossible. Why? Bennett couldn't have come here for his share of the money. Because he was seen here in town before Charlie got the letter telling of their father's death. Well, maybe I was wrong about the motive, but I'm right about him being the killer. That delicate situation the professor wrote you about could very well have been because Vern Call was hanging around. And that would have been very delicate for a professor in a college like this. You make it sound very simple, Captain. Well, it is simple, so why complicate it? Our job right now is to find Vern Call. I'll get out an alarm for him immediately. <laughs> Professor Coleman has a brother who's an escaped convict. He's been seen near the scene of the crime. That seems to be the obvious answer. But is Nick himself satisfied with the solution, or do his suspicions point in another direction? We'll see in just a moment. These are days when your folks are likely to come tracking into the house with wet boots and galoshes. And those tracks can mean a great deal of work for you homemakers. Not only do you have to wipe up the floors... But it's quite likely that moisture may impair the floor finish. So here's the wise thing to do. Protect the floor surfaces in your home with Linux Clear Gloss Varnish. It's easy to brush on, and it leaves your floors and linoleum with a lustrous finish that keeps its beauty a long, long time. For Linux Clear Gloss provides an elastic, transparent finish that really wears. It actually resists damage by hot grease, boiling water, fruit acids, perfume even alcohol, and it lessens your housework amazingly, for it keeps dirt on the surface where you can wipe it away easily with a damp cloth. Depend on Linux Clear Gloss, the super varnish. Thousands of wise homemakers have found it the finest household protective finish in their experience. So ask for it at your dealers. Linux, L-I-N-X, Linux Clear Gloss Varnish. You'll find all three great Linux home brighteners and Chemtone, the miracle wall finish, at hardware, paint, and department stores everywhere. Now, back to our story. As we pick up our story, it's about 10 o'clock in the evening. Nick and Professor Ben Toole are sitting in the professor's study. I think I'll turn in, Ben, if you don't mind. Nick... Do you think Captain Jeffrey was right this afternoon? No, I doubt it. Vern Cole doesn't explain the marks on your manuscript. I be... It sounded like the window in your study being... What I thought. The stuffed monkey on my desk. What the deuce? Somebody moved the monkey from the top of the bookcase down onto my desk. Put the dunce cap on him and put that card in his hand. That red ink sign on the card. The same as the one that was on your manuscript, isn't it? Yes, Nick. The same sign. It's come again. Is your window locked? No. No, it isn't. That's how he got in. But who, Nick, and why? Ben, this card is fastened to the monkey's paw by a hunk of chewing gum. Chewing gum? Yes. Ben, I'm going out. I don't yet know why this stuffed monkey was placed on your desk. But I think I know who did it. I've been waiting for you, Nick. Come in quick. You're soaking wet. Peterson was here. Just left a few moments ago. I phoned him to come over after you went out. Ben, old John Dyson was murdered tonight. Old John? Murdered? Yes, shot. Same as the professor was. I knew it. I could feel it in the air. How did you happen to go there? Chewing gum that fastened that card to the monkey's paw was scented with clove. And old John chews clove-flavored gum all the time. You're soaked through, Nick. You already have a bad cold. Would you like some coffee? Peterson and I had some. There's a little left. It's still quite hot. Yes, I think I would, Ben. I feel pretty down just now. Let me hang my coat up. 
But, Nick, what's back of all this? Vern Cole surely wouldn't have any reason to kill old John, too. I wish I could answer that, man. I have a general idea of what's going on, but I can't make it sound sensible. Ah, second cup of coffee was just what I needed. I think if you don't mind, Nick, I'll go to bed. I'm all in. Well, certainly, Ben. Run along. I'll sit here for a while and finish my coffee and try to think things out. retired at a reasonable hour, I should have died without ever getting out of bed. But fortunately, when the poison took effect, I was still sitting in the study. I managed to get to the kitchen and find some mustard and eggs and warm water and got cleaned out. Oh, if you hadn't hauled me out of bed and treated me, I don't think I could have made it. I couldn't move when you found me. What course did you suppose? It must have been that coffee you made, Ben. I didn't make it. Peterson did. Peterson made it? Yes. I poured us each a cup from what was left. Ben, I'm going over to the chemistry lab and analyze that coffee we drank. See if there's anything in it except coffee. You found there was arsenic in the coffee left in your cup, Connor? Unquestionably, Captain. Enough to have killed us both many times over. Uh, And two old... Says Peterson made the coffee. Yes. Say, Peterson was with you on that Peruvian expedition, wasn't he? Oh, yes, he was, but there's no motive, Captain. Yeah. Oh, by the way, the alarm I sent out for Vern Call, or Bennett Coleman, if you prefer, has brought results. He's been in a hospital in Alabama for the past month with a broken back. Victim of a hit-and-run driver. I was right, then. I thought it was funny he and Charlie were never seen together. Huh? Then who is the stranger who looks so much like Professor Coleman? Hey, maybe Peterson tells something about that. He's got a lot to explain before he's in the clear. Oh, Captain, come in. I just got here myself. Uh, What's this all about, Carter? Why did you want me to meet you here at Professor Coleman's residence? A hunch, Captain Jeffrey. Yeah? See, it's like this. After I left you this morning, I got to thinking. And suddenly things began to fall into place. That was when I called you and asked you to meet me here. I need one more piece of evidence, and I hope we'll find it here. What are you going to do, Carter? I want to go through old John Dyson's things. It may take time, but I feel sure it'll be worth it. If you can find any place in this room that you haven't gone over with a fine tooth comb, I'll eat it. The only place you've missed is that old tobacco jar over there. That's right. And old John didn't smoke. Here, I'll dump it out here on the table. Candy, mm. chewing gum, a few buttons, and ah, a sheet of paper. Well, is that what you want, Connor? I'll say it is. Come on. Let's show this letter to Ben Tool and see what he thinks of it. Then you can make your arrest. This is Ben's room. Come in. Oh, hello, Nick. Captain Jeffrey. Have you found something? Yes, Ben. We found this. Here. I see. Where did you find it? In old John's room. In the tobacco jar. Tobacco jar? I didn't look there. I thought I looked everywhere. Even at murder, I was a failure. 
like everything else. Yes, Ben, you've made a mess of your whole life, I'm afraid. You know what I did? Yes, I know everything. Well, I guess it's time for me to take over here. I'm sorry, Professor Toole, but you're under arrest for the murder of Professor Coleman and old John Dyson. The attempted murder of Nick Carter. I'm sorry, Nick. I've always liked you. But I couldn't stand the thought of being known as a failure in my chosen profession. I hope you understand. Yes, Ben, I do. And I'm sorry for you. But murder is never the answer. It can't be. Although most murderers find it out too late. Well, go on, Nick. You gave Professor Toole a letter to read. What did it say? It was a letter from Professor Coleman to me. One he wrote to me, but never sent. But what did it say? It was that he, Professor Coleman, had suddenly learned that the whole affair of the expedition to Peru was a colossal fake. What? Engineered by men who made a small fortune by selling us supplies and renting us the Indians we used as guides and porters. It was a gigantic frame-up with fossils and other relics planted for us to find. Gee. It was done by men who knew the subject well enough to fool everyone at the time. And Coleman says it was only very recently that he accidentally discovered it. He investigated further and found that it was true. Ben Toole was writing his life's work on the basis of a fake lot of evidence. Ben must have known it, of course, but must have decided to go through with it rather than admit the truth. Gosh, what a terrible thing it would be to find that the biggest thing in your life was phony. Exactly, Betsy. So terrible that when Ben found Coleman knew, he resolved to kill him before he could tell anyone. So he made himself up to look like Coleman and hoped to be taken for his brother. But they were never seen together. That was my first clue. Oh? Then, having set the stage that way, and knowing that the brother, being an escaped convict, could not appear to defend himself, he killed Coleman. But, Nick, what about that red Indian sign on Professor Toole's manuscript? They weren't Indian marks at all, Patsy. They were plain, everyday Fs. F? Ben never flunked a student except for cheating. And then always put a big red F on the paper. Oh. Well, old John found the letter Coleman wrote to me and didn't send, realized what it was, and kept it to torment Ben with. He hated Ben because Ben was one of those who had old John fired from the college after the accident in the chem lab. And he marked the manuscript himself to show he knew Ben was cheating. Oh, he must have hated him to do a thing like that. He did. And putting the dunce cap on the stuffed monkey and putting the card in his paw with the big red F on it was his way of rubbing it in. But he gave himself away with the clove-scented gum he used. And when I left Ben's house to go see old John, Ben knew where I was going and beat me to it. And, of course, poisoning the coffee was the really fatal mistake. You mean because you didn't die? No. Because he put a lot of poison in my cup and only enough in his own to make him slightly ill. He drank a whole cup and was only barely sick while I drank only a little of mine and nearly died. Oh, I see. So the poison couldn't have been in the coffee. It was put in the cups themselves while I went to put my coat away. And what was that delicate problem that Professor Coleman wanted to put up to you? Oh, Patsy, don't you see that yet? Well, I'm afraid not. Should I know? Well, I think so. Coleman simply wanted to consult with me as to whether he should tell the truth about Ben and his expedition or let Ben get away with it. If he hadn't learned the truth about the expedition, he'd still be alive. And so would old John. And Professor Toole wouldn't be waiting for his execution. Very true, Patsy. Sometimes the things we learn by accident are the most important things in our lives. In just a moment, Nick and Patsy will bring you a preview of next week's exciting case. But first, note this. Pleasant surroundings make you happier, calmer, more contented, don't they? That's why thoughtful homemakers make a point of keeping their homes pleasant, shining bright, and sparkling clean. Thousands of American women have turned to the three great Linex home brighteners to help them with this task. For instance, Linex cream polish for fine furniture gives your household things a handsome, lustrous look in half the time. That's because Linex cream polish cleans as it polishes, saving one whole step in your cleaning day routine. Only one quick application is needed to remove that cloudy accumulation of dust and previous polish. And at the same time, Linux cream polish does away with messy fingerprints and helps conceal ugly scratches. And it leaves no oily film to attract more dust to make more work. There's no doubt about it. 
Linux cream polish is a really worthwhile shortcut to furniture upkeep. It's the modern way to protect your fine belongings. So make a point of asking your dealer for Linux cream polish. Get all three great Linux home brighteners. Remember that's Linux, spelled L-I-N dash X. You'll find them all. Linux self-polishing wax, Linux cream polish, and Linux clear gloss varnish at your nearest hardware, paint, or department store. And now let's hear from Nick Carter himself. What's the subject of your story for next week, Nick? It's about a fire, Ken. A fire that started mysteriously in a button factory in the dead of night. But what interested Nick was that a girl was found, bound and gagged and burned to death on the top floor of the factory. Yes, Ken, it was not only first-degree arson, it was first-degree murder. Sounds good. What's the title of the story? I call it Murder by Fire. Or the Mystery of the Midnight Alarm. Uh, No more for now. Join us again next week for one of the most exciting stories in a long time. So long. So long, everybody. And so long to you both. We'll be looking forward to seeing you again next week. Next week at this same time, listen to another curious experience of Nick Carter, Master Detective, entitled Murder by Fire, or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Midnight Alarm. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is featured in Street and Smith magazines. Lon Clark is starred as Nick with Helen Choate as Patsy. Original music is played by Lou White, and the programs are written and directed by Jock McGregor. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this same time and over these same stations by the three great Linux home brighteners. Linux clear gloss varnish, Linux cream polish, and Linux self-polishing wax, created by Acme. America's great producer of Acme fine quality paints. This is Ken Powell speaking for the thousands of Linux dealers all over America and saying so long until next week. This is Mutual. case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective, presented by the three great Linux home brighteners, Linux clear gloss varnish, Linux cream polish, and Linux self-polishing wax, created by Acme, America's great producer of fine Acme quality paints. Today's curious adventure... Murder by Fire, or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Midnight Alarm. In just a moment, we'll hear how Nick solved the mystery of who killed Jenny Baker and why, and what was behind the fire that destroyed Oscar Warren's button factory at midnight. But first, let me tell you something. Millions have learned from experience that Chemtone, the miracle wall finish, brings amazing new beauty to walls. Now, millions more are finding that the three great Linux home brighteners brings amazing new beauty to floors, woodwork, and furniture. Linux self-polishing wax, which beautifies your floors with that satiny yet tough non-skid finish that resists wear, water, and dirt. Linux cream polish, which cleans as it polishes, leaving no oily film on your furniture. And Linux clear gloss varnish, the durable super varnish that dries to an elastic, transparent surface which protects all wood and linoleum in your home. You'll find the three great Linux home brighteners at your hardware, paint, or department store. Your headquarters also for Chemtone, the miracle wall finish. And now for today's mysterious adventure with Nick Carter. As we start today's story, Nick and Patsy are watching a big factory fire in the downtown district. Suddenly, Nick calls to the battalion chief. Chief, there's a woman trapped up there on the top floor. You're crazy, Carter. The boys reported all clear several minutes ago. I don't care what they reported. There's a girl up there. I just heard a scream. I'm going up and get her. You're a fool to go in there. But if you don't be sure to get that gas mask of yours on tight, or you won't come out again. These button factory fires are full of poison gas from the celluloid and peroxide. Makes no difference. 
Masters. I gotta find out about that girl, Chief. So long. Hey, Bill. Yeah. Get one of those two inch nozzles over here. Rush it up the big ladder, up to the top floor. Cover Carter while he's inside there. He's a fool, but he's a brave man. Washington Heights. And where did you go to the movies tonight? In Union Square. So you come all the way from your home in Washington Heights to go to see a movie in Union Square. Oh, yes, but I... And on the way home, you stop at your office, which is a couple of miles out of your way, to pick up a bundle. It's a fine story. Look, if I left a bundle in my office, where else could I go to pick it up? Did you start this fire here tonight? Why should I start a fire in my own factory? Answer yes or no. Did you start this fire and why? No, I didn't. Why should I? Same reason any other firebug has. To make money out of the insurance company. But I Your firm you... been making money this year? No. Business isn't so good this year. Yeah, but now that you can get your insurance money, everything's okay, I suppose. Look, why should you accuse me of things like that? Listen, Warren. A factory has been burned down. And a girl has been killed. And someone is responsible. And we're going to find out who. Hi, Nick. Sorry I'm late, Riley. I hoped to get here before you started questioning, Warren, but I couldn't make it. What have you found out? It's been like pulling teeth, Nick. But he's told us that the dead girl, Jenny Baker, was office manager and bookkeeper for his firm for the past seven years. Knew more about customers and accounts than he did. Invaluable, he says. The only thing wrong with her was that she's been going out recently with his partner, Alfred Hoffman. So what if she did go out with this, Herman? Ah, uh, it's a crook! I know! Easy now, Mr. Warren. None of that. Now, you see, Nick, Warren and Herman just didn't get along so good. Couldn't agree on how the business was to be run. Mr. Carter, a couple of months ago, a lot of funny business started. Some shipments were made that hadn't been ordered. Then money was borrowed on the shipments. Other things, too. Yeah, they had arguments, too. Lots of them, Nick. About a week ago, they finally had a fist fight. Yeah, and I licked him, too, the crook. Then we called the partnership off. Which one of you is getting out of the partnership? I'm buying him out. Uh, well, as soon as I get the money together. Yeah, with the money you're hoping to collect from the insurance company, you mean? This is a serious accusation, Lieutenant Riley. Very serious. Why, my client's reputation would be ruined if these charges of yours were made public. Stop sounding off that way, Hamilton. You're not in court and your client's not in jail yet. Strikes me, Hamilton, that if you were to tell your client what a jam he's in and advise him to tell us what we want to know, he'd be a lot better off. That fire was incendiary, no mistake about that. And his bookkeeper died in it. Yeah, and his alibi ain't even good for a laugh. Absurd, ridiculous. Mr. Warren's spotless reputation over a long ah, period of years. Forget years. your speech for a minute, Hamilton. See if it can help your client explain a couple of points here. See here, Lieutenant. I don't need any instruction from you as to my duties as a lawyer. Mm. Though perhaps I could instruct you in your duties as a public official. Why, what do you mean by that crack? It's plain enough who set the factory on fire if it was set. Oh, and who do you think did it? Alfred Herman. 
He threatened to do it a week ago and threatened to kill my client, too, if he got the chance. Huh? You say he threatened that a week ago? Yeah. Mr. Hamilton's telling the truth, Mr. Carter. Herman said I'd live only just long enough to be sorry I'd kicked him out of the firm. Which I didn't do, really. We, well, we agreed I should buy him out. But you say you haven't paid him yet? No, I haven't had the money yet. Well, will you get enough out of this insurance company, if you get anything at all, to pay off all your creditors, including Herman? All the creditors, maybe, but nothing left for Herman. Then it hardly seems logical that he'd spoil his chances of getting money from you by putting you out of business. Yeah, why would he want to do that, Mr. Wise Guy? Have you ever heard of revenge? Many men will pay more for revenge than for anything else. Riley, I think I'll have a talk with this Alfred Herman. Where does he live, Warren? 1335 West End Boulevard. What does he look like? Uh, slender, blonde, young-looking, clean-shaven. You know, a ladies' man. All right, I'll find him. See you later, Riley. Apartment 3D, you said, didn't you, Nick? Yes, this is it. What do you want to get out of Herman, Nick? First, I want to see if he has an alibi. Ring again, Betsy. Okay. Well, guess he's not in. No, oh, I'm afraid you're... Huh. Well, what is it? I smell gas. Gas? And it's leaking around the door to Herman's apartment. You think there's something wrong? I'm going to find out. Where's my pick lock? Oh, here it is. This is easy. Oh, good. There. Yes, there is gas in here. Stay outside, Betsy. While I take a look in the kitchen. All right, Nick, but be careful. I'll be all right. Yes, it's coming out of the kitchen here, all right. Whew. Have to get the window open first. That'll let some fresh air in here. Now, trying to kill yourself, are you? Well, not this time, my friend. Come on over to the window. There. I got you just in time, didn't I? Well, you'll be all right. You okay, Nick? Yes, Patsy. But don't come in till the gas clears out some. All right. Is it Alfred Herman you found? Looks like him from the description I got. He's coming around now. All right, breathe deep. Get some fresh air into your lungs in place of all that gas. Oh, why didn't you let me finish it? Stop being sorry for yourself. Breathe deep. Oh, why should I want to live? Money stolen. Business taken away. Now my girl is dead. You know how she died? What agony she went through? Yes. I saw her when he took her away. How'd you happen to be there? I went to the plant to meet her. She asked me to. What was she doing there so late? Checking over the books to find out how much old Oscar Warren had stolen from me these past months. That's all she was staying with the old crook for. As soon as she got the goods on him, she was going to leave. And we were going to get married. You'd like to prove that to a jury? I don't care what happens now. Jenny's dead. True. But would you like to be convicted of her murder? Murder? You mean the fire was set? It was. Let me help you up. Yes, it was set by someone who knew enough about the button business to gather up all the shavings of celluloid and put them where they'd start burning the best. When was it set? Around 9.30 to 10 o'clock, as near as we can figure. You have an alibi for that time? Well, yes, I I spent the whole evening with Dottie Baker, Jenny's sister. Where? At their apartment on Royal Avenue. You fond of Dottie? Well, yes, I am. Maybe you'd rather marry Dottie than her sister. Why, you... If you weren't a cop, I'd kill you for saying I am that. not a cop. I'm a private detective. And if this You've killing... got no right to say that. Jenny's the only girl in the world for me. You sure? Am I sure? Here, look at this. What is it? Here, in my hand. Why, I... Oh, my eyes! Here's something else for you! Oh. Nick, what are you doing? Here's one for you. So Nick fell for the oldest trick in the world of crooks. Red Pepper hurriedly snatched from the kitchen table and thrown in his eyes when he was off guard, then slugged and knocked out. And Patsy knocked unconscious in the apartment hall as Alfred Herman makes his getaway to parts unknown. Where does all this leave Nick? We'll see in just a moment. If your youngsters have ever tracked in slush, mud, or snow when you just finished cleaning the floor, you know how exasperating it is. But it can be a lot less trouble when your floors are protected by Linex self-polishing wax. 
For Linux self-polishing wax resists water so that it's removed in a jiffy. Linux self-polishing wax resists dirt, too, keeping it on the surface so that it's easily cleaned away. And although Linux self-polishing wax is simply wiped on without tiresome rubbing or polishing, it resists wear as well. What's more, when worn spots appear, it may be renewed at any time without re-waxing the whole floor. Yes, Linux self-polishing wax is a splendid finish for any floor, wood, tile, or linoleum, giving a beautiful satiny appearance. And it's the non-skid finish. The underwriters' laboratories have proved that fact. Get Linux, L-I-N-X, Linux self-polishing wax now. You'll find all three great Linux home brighteners and Chemtone, the miracle wall finish, at hardware, paint, and department stores everywhere. And now, back to our story. We left both Nick and Patsy unconscious in the apartment of Alfred Herman, partner in the button factory in which Jenny Baker was burned to death. Herman has vanished. As we pick them up, they're on their way downtown in Nick's car. It's early evening. Feeling better now, Patsy? Yes, thanks, Nick. That cup of coffee made a new woman out of me. And I feel more normal myself than I did a while back. What a sap that Herman made out of me. You ain't kidding. Where do you suppose he is now? Somewhere miles away from here, no doubt. Your trip to his place didn't accomplish much, did it? No. Except for saving his life, it accomplished absolutely nothing. That's right. I went through everything in the apartment. Found nothing that interested me in the least. Not a clue in a carload. Net result of the trip. One bump on the head for you where he hit you with the iron skillet. One sore jaw for me where he punched me. Ouch. Well, I hope I have better luck where I'm going now. Who is that? I want to have another look at the burnt factory now that the fire's died down enough so I can get in the place. Oh, is it safe? Framework of the building is still standing. Only the contents were burned. Not all of them. Well, There's a hot fire and a short one. That's it. Just ahead there, isn't it? Yes. Now, Patsy, I'm going in. But I want you to wait in the car. Oh, but... Nick, I have no. a hunch something's wrong in there. I want you out here so I can have a friend on the outside. Now, wait here for an hour. If I don't come out by then, call Riley. You mean you think there's still someone in there? I don't know what I think, Patsy. I'm just playing a hunch coming down here at all. And my hunch says be careful. You stay here and watch. All right, Nick. But do take care of yourself. Don't worry, Patsy. I like me well enough to do that very vigorously. Be seeing you. Still warm. Whoever started this fire did a very careful job. Contents of the stock room burned completely. The office not hit so hard. Except for the the office files. Huh. Strange. It's a safe door should be standing open that way. This must have been Oscar Warren's desk. Hmm. I hardly touched this corner. That's odd. Bells off the telephone box. Hmm. Huh. Was taken off so it wouldn't ring. Aha, I see. Well, I guess I'll just take this bell box with me. Take out these two screws, and I. Ah, oh, poor shot. Try these. Huh. Took a couple of shots at me and ran. It wasn't so dark in here, I might stand a better chance of seeing which way. Is that a shadow or... Anybody there? Get your hands up and keep them up. And keep coming toward me. All right, I'm coming. Got a flashlight? Yes. Turn it on yourself. I want to get a good look at you. All right. Here. Why, you... You're Dottie Baker, aren't you? Yes, I'm Dottie Baker. You look just like your sister. You tried to kill me just now? I didn't try to kill anybody. You have a gun? No. I wouldn't even know how to fire one. Did you hear the shooting? Yes, that's what scared me so. What are you doing up here? I I, I came to look for evidence that my sister was murdered. And what makes you think Jenny was murdered? She was afraid someone was going to kill her. She wouldn't tell me who, but she knew someone had been juggling the stockroom inventories and the shipping records. That's why she was here last night, trying to find out what was going on. But she was afraid something would happen to her before she got the proof. And it did. But I've got the proof. What? Look here. See these metal bands? Yes. They were on the cartons of merchandise that were burned. And they proved that there were only a few of them in the stockroom when the fire started. 
It's the oldest trick in the business. Remove most of your stock, then have a fire, and claim it burned up all your stock. But where are the cartons of stuff that they took out of here? If you could only find them, they'd prove who did it, wouldn't they? They certainly would, Daddy. And I think I know where to find them. But how could you know that? The bell box for the telephone on Mr. Warren's desk told me. Come on. Where? I'm going to take you home first. And I'm going hunting for those missing cases. Because the man who juggled the books and removed the cases was the man who killed your sister and set the fire. Oh, I hope you're right, Mr. Carter. Nick Carter. The detective? That's right. Oh, now I know you'll find the murderer. Well, I hope you're right. Oh, by the way, you seen Alfred Herman lately? Oh, yes. He spent last evening at our apartment waiting for Jenny to get through at the factory. Why? Oh, curiosity, Dolly. Just curiosity. One of a detective's most important weapons. All right, come on. Let's get you home. Now, listen carefully, Betsy. Judging from the light on the second floor there, although Mr. Oscar Warren should be in bed, he's still up. Which makes it more dangerous for you. Yes. But I'm going to have a look in his basement just the same. I'm sure I'll find the missing cartons there. And if I do, the case is over. So I'm going to let myself in while you keep a look out here. I can't tell you what to look for, so just keep your eyes open. Okay. Now listen, Patsy, we're up against something very dangerous in this case. So take care of yourself while I'm gone. hundred cases piled up against the back wall of this basement, which will send Mr. Oscar Warren... Now, Tapkin, get your hands up. Turn around and face the wall. It'll be hard to make my death look like an accident right here in your own house, Mr. Warren. <laughs> They'll get you if you try it. Why, it's Mr. Carter. I thought you were a burglar. What are you doing here in my house without permission? Looking over your stock of buttons. You have a permit to store this inflammable stuff here? Look, Mr. Carter, I told you Herman was pulling some funny business. These boxes are each supposed to contain two, three hundred dollars worth buttons. Look, I cut one of these cases open. You see? They're full of junk, rubbish. Herman steals the buttons, fills the boxes with this stuff. Then he ships them and we got to make good. Twenty-five thousand we lost already. Why didn't you have him arrested? I couldn't catch him doing it. It's no go, Mr. Warren. Alfred Herman has an airtight alibi. Have you? I was at the movies. All right, Mr. Warren, you... Stop! Fire! There's fire all over the place. Yes, there must have been a firebox. Out this way. The outside door's unlocked where I came in. This way. I, I can't see. It's small. Here, I'll get you out. Come out. Uh, I thought I was a goner, Mr. Clark. If you hadn't been finished, you would have been. Are you all right? I think so. Lost a little hair. Uh, There's still someone in there. It's on fire. Warren, I thought you said the house was empty. Uh, what? I can't understand. I'll see who it is. Uh, I think this house will be standing over a few minutes longer. Uh, Saved my life, Mr. Carter. I'm very grateful. What's the idea of insisting that I go down to police headquarters with you? Because that's where you belong, Hamilton. I know now that you're the one who bound and gagged Jenny Baker and then set fire to the factory. What? You're crazy. That's absurd. You. It could be. Of course. Yes. It was you, not Herman. You had a key. You could get at the stock in the books. And I owe you money, too. So it was you, my lawyer. He's no lawyer, Mr. Warren. I looked him up. He was disbarred some years ago. It was you, Dan Hamilton, who got me to bring these cases of scrap celluloid to my house. You said it would be evidence against Herman. This is ridiculous. Why, at the time the police say the fire started, I was at headquarters reporting Herman's threats against Mr. Warren. He... I'll bet you set off that firebomb in my basement to kill Mr. Carter and me. I'm quite sure he did. But he didn't realize how fast the fire would spread. And he almost got caught in it himself. Going through Mr. Warren's papers, weren't you, Hamilton? What? This is all too fantastic, Carter. But if you insist on my going along with you, you, you won't mind if I call my office first, will you? Who'd be at your office at 3.30 in the morning? Well, the cleaning woman. I could ask her to tell my secretary where you're taking me. So you want to call your office, do you? Well, I'll tell you what. Let's go to your office instead. Oh, no, no, no. That won't be necessary. I'll call later. No, I think we'll go there now. Patsy. Drive to Mr. Hamilton's office on Broad Avenue. 
and hurry. All right, Hamilton. Open the door. And no tricks. Very well. <gasps> Nick, look. Alfred Herman. Yes, Herman. And very dead. Bullet hole right through the heart. And a gun in his hand. Suicide. But why in my office? No, Hamilton. Not suicide, but murder. Murder number two for you. But you can see that no right-handed man could shoot himself so straight in the heart. And there were no marks of powder in his hand, as there would be if he'd fired a gun. He must have known more about you than I thought he did for you to kill him. All right, Carter, let's go down to headquarters. We're wasting time here. Now, not so fast, Hamilton. You're too anxious. I want to look at your telephone bell box. Don't move, Hamilton. I'll shoot if I do. Well, what about the bell box, Nick? Look here, uh, Bessie. Hmm? And you too, Warren. Hey, what's that arrangement, Carter? He takes the bell off, sticks a piece of emery paper on the clapper of the bell. Then he fastens a blue tip match where it'll be lighted by the emery paper on the clapper as it vibrates against the tip of the match when the bell rings. The match sets fire to this oil-soaked rag, which leads to this wastebasket full of paper and excelsior. So when he phones his office, he sets fire to it. The body is burned up, together with all the papers and files that might incriminate him. Is that how he set fire to the factory? It is, Patsy. I have in my car the bell box from Warren's desk at the factory for proof. Hamilton probably called the factory from the police station, which would give him an ironclad alibi. Mr. Carter, so far you haven't found one bit of proof to connect me with this thing in any way. Now, come on, let's get out of here. Why the rush, Hamilton? Have I missed something? Well, then, let's take a good look around. Behind the desk. Under. Uh Ah, so that's it. Dottie Baker, under that big desk. Gagged and tied up so she can't move. Just the way he left Jenny in the factory. All right, Dottie, just a minute. Wait a minute. That Hamilton, I saw him kill Alfred. He's lying. He's lying. I saw him do it. I came in just as he shot him. So he tied me up and left me here. He was going to burn the whole building up when he could get where he'd have an alibi. He said so. I guess that does it, Hamilton. I should have killed you outright instead of waiting you, you and your sister. Both of you got in my way. Hamilton, it won't take you as long to die in the electric chair as it took Jenny Baker to die in that flaming factory you left her in. But you'll be just as dead in the end, which is as it should be. All right, come on. Let's get down and turn you over to Riley. I've had all I can stand of a skunk like you. In just a moment, Nick and Patsy will bring you a preview of next week's exciting case. But now, a tip on relaxing. Everybody enjoys relaxation. And you know yourself how much easier it is to relax in surroundings that are pleasant. Your home can be more pleasant every day in the year when you rely on the three great Linux home brighteners to keep it inviting. That's the way to keep your home sparkling with cleanliness and beauty. Your fine furniture, for example, always looks its gleaming best when you use Linux cream polish. The furniture aid that gives a handsome luster in half the time. You see, Linux cream polish removes the cloudy accumulation of dust and previous polish in one quick application. Actually cleans as it polishes, giving your furniture new beauty and saving you one whole step in your cleaning day routine. Linux cream polish does away with messy fingerprints and helps conceal ugly scratches, too. And no oily film remains on your furniture to attract additional dust to make additional work. So be sure to ask your dealer for Linux Cream Polish for fine furniture. You'll find all three great Linux home brighteners, Linux self-polishing wax, Linux Cream Polish, and Linux clear gloss varnish at your nearest hardware paint or department store. Remember to ask for them by name, Linux. It's spelled L-I-N-X. Linux. Ask for it now. Now let's hear from Nick Carter himself. Well, Nick, what do you think next week's story will be exciting? I know it'll be exciting, Cal. It's a simple little story to start with, but it gets into a mad tangle of murder before we're through with it. Usually it's Nick who gets himself in danger of his life. But this time it was yours truly who got in the way of the killer and nearly added to the total score. An old lady, rich and eccentric, was dying without leaving a will. And there were six claimants for the three million she was leaving. Some of them extremely money-hungry. And extremely ruthless, too. What do you call it, Nick? 
Death by Ricochet. Oh, the mystery of the abandoned gravel pit. For full details of an exciting few hours, join us next week. So long. So long, everybody. And so long to both of you. See you next week at the same time. week at the same time, listen to another curious experience of Nick Carter, Master Detective, entitled Death by Ricochet, or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Abandoned Gravel Pit. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is featured in Street and Smith magazines. Lon Clark is starred as Nick, with Helen Choate as Patsy. Original music is played by Lou White... And the programs are written and directed by Jock McGregor. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this time and over these same stations by the three great Linux home brighteners. Linux clear gloss varnish, Linux cream polish, and Linux self-polishing wax. Created by Acme, America's great producer of Acme fine quality paints. This is Ken Powell speaking for the thousands of Linux dealers all over America and saying so long until next week. This is Mutual. What's the matter? What is it? Another case for Nick Carter, master detective. It's another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective, presented by the three great Linux home brighteners Linux clear gloss, Linux cream polish, and Linux self polishing wax, created by Acme, America's great producer of Acme quality paints. <laughs> Today's curious adventure, Death by Ricochet, or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Abandoned Gravel Pit. In just a moment, we'll hear how Nick solved the mystery of how the bullet from the abandoned gravel pit killed the heir to the Marquis Fortune. But first, here's something you should know. Millions have found what wonders Chemtone, the miracle wall finish, can do for walls. Now, millions more are learning what amazing new beauty the three great Linux home brighteners bring to floors, woodwork, and furniture. Linux clear gloss varnish, the durable super varnish that dries to an elastic transparent surface which protects all wood and linoleum in your home. Linux cream polish, which cleans as it polishes, leaving no oily film on your furniture. And Linux self-polishing wax, which beautifies your floors with a satiny yet tough non-skid finish that resists wear, water, and dirt. You'll find the three great Linux home brighteners at your hardware, paint, or department store. Your headquarters also for Chemtone, the miracle wall finish. And now for today's mysterious adventure with Nick Carter. As we open our story, Nick is talking with a young friend of his whom Patsy has just brought in. But if it's not a criminal case, John, why come to me? Because it's the next thing to it, Nick. Well, all right. Let's hear it. I better take notes, Patsy, in case we want them later. Of course, Nick. Go ahead, Mr. Nick. Nick, I killed a man this morning. What? Oh, it was an accident, of course, but he's dead just the same. Well, tell me about it. What happened? Well, I was shooting in the old gravel pit back of my place on the highway. I've been shooting there a lot, getting ready for the pistol meet that's coming up. Well, this morning, I was practicing out there when one of my slugs hit something and ricocheted. I never dreamed that a ricochet could get out of the gravel pit, but this one did, and traveled as far as the Marquis estate. You mean the Clara Marquis estate? Yeah, that's right. And the man I killed was her son, Randolph. Well, that certainly ought to make front page copy. I should say so. Patsy, get me her file out of the file room. Coming right up. Now, John, where was Randolph when he was hit? At the back of the estate, helping one of his nephews rebuild the fence. Uh The nephew, Dave Barton, said he heard the shot, and then the whine of the bullet, and then Randolph fell over. He died instantly. Here you are, Nick. Our file on Clara Marquis. Thanks, Betsy. Now, let's see. Lives in a rambling old red brick mansion a mile out of town along the highway. No servants. That's funny, with all her money. 
Relatives living with her take the place of servants. Her son, Randolph, acts as general handyman on the estate. She handles all business matters herself. Mm. Hmm. Jolly old soul, I should say. No one ever accused old Clara Marcus of being jolly. I've tried to get better acquainted with her granddaughter, Teresa, but the old lady won't let me take her out or go there to see her. I only know Teresa from what little I've seen of her around town and a few times I've driven her home. Now that I've killed her father, I suppose I'll never see her again. Wouldn't be in love with her, would you? Uh, no. Do, do you think I, I can be sued for Randolph's death? Well, what's the coroner's verdict, you know? Well, he told me he was going to report it was an accident. Huh. Well, John, how far is it from the gravel pit to where Randolph was killed? About a quarter mile. The Brundage place is in between. Old man Brundage was, was out picking berries in the back of his place. He says he heard the bullet whine over his head. I suppose there's no doubt about the time? No, no. The sheriff checked on that. Randolph was killed while I was shooting in the pit. No mistake about that. I see. Was the bullet identified as coming from your gun? Well, not exactly. It was too badly mutilated, the sheriff said, to be identified as having come from any particular gun. Ah. It was all flattened and twisted. Well, from what you tell me, John, it looks as if you're responsible, all right. For the funeral expenses and so on, at least. Well, I know that, Nick. I just want to be sure I don't get hooked for what money I've got saved by a damage suit later on. That's why I want you to investigate this for me right away. I want to have it proved an accident so that nothing can come up later to put me in the wrong more than I am now. Yes, I see what you mean, John. You want me to be sure that we know now all there is to know. Then we file that information away and hope we never need it, right? That's it exactly, Nick. Will you do it? Why, certainly, John. I have nothing else on my hands for the moment. Shouldn't be a long job, nor a difficult one. Now, first, I want to have a look at your gravel pit. All right. I won't be there, but Mother will let you in. I... I don't suppose there's any chance... I didn't fire the shot that got Randolph. Now, the chances are you did, John. I want to determine the degree of negligence involved. If there's none on your part, you can hardly be held liable for the accident. Okay, Nick. I'll leave it to you. I'll be seeing you. Right, John. And don't worry. I think I can clean this up for you. It doesn't seem possible that a forty-five bullet could get out of that gravel pit. And especially not going fast enough to travel a quarter of a mile afterwards. Strange things happen with bullets sometimes, Betsy. I suppose. You heard what Mr. Brundage said. Yes, according to him, about as many bullets come out of the gravel pit as stay in. Yet he's heard them whizzing over his head many a time. Well, he was probably exaggerating. But there's no question but what he heard the one that killed Randolph Marquis this morning. He said it went only about a foot or so over his head. Is that possible, Nick? Oh, yes, indeed. Perfectly possible. And from the way John May's target is set up in the pit... A bullet that did get loose might very well come right across Brundage's berry patch. Well, I certainly hope you find some way to prove Mr. May didn't do it. He's such a nice fellow. I don't expect to prove that, Patsy. You don't? By the way, how well do you know Teresa Marquis? Not too well. Think you could use her name to get us in to look over the grounds, in case the old lady objects? Oh, gosh, Nick, that's a big order. Nobody has any say around there but old Clara herself, so I understand. I'll try it. What can we lose? That a girl. Let's attack him from all sides at once. It's so nice of you to see us, Miss Marquis. This is Nick Carter. He's acting for John May. You can tell John, Mr. May, that we won't make him any trouble for the death of my father. I knew you'd feel like that. You can also tell him that... I never want to see him again. Now, Teresa, I'm afraid you're blaming John May for something he couldn't help. We've just been to look over his gra gravel pit, and it seems utterly impossible that a bullet could get out of there and travel so far after getting out. I'm sure... If you're so trying to tell her what happened wasn't May's fault, you can get going. And right now. How do you do? I'm only trying to find out just how it did happen. Mr. Carter, this is my cousin, Dave Barton. He was with my father when he was... Killed. You're in charge here, Mr. Barton. I'd like your permission to examine the grounds around where Randolph was killed. Nobody's got the rights to say who can snoop around here but Clara Marquis herself. Surely she could have no objection to... You'll have to get out. Dave, if you won't show Mr. Carter around, I will. I know Grandmother wouldn't mind. You're a fool, Teresa. But, well, come on. If I can do anything else for you, let me know. <laughs> Putting up a new fence here, Brandy and I. We've been working out here for several days. We could hear young May shooting down in that pit of his all the time. This morning it was different. The shots sounded the same, 
Only this time I heard the whine of the bullet right after it. Now there. Uh, here's where Randy was standing. I was down there. The time I got to him was deader than a doornail. If I could get my hands on that young lady... Garden. Is that fence over there about 30 feet? The edge of your property? Yes. The bush is there on Brundage's side. He was picking berries out there somewhere this morning when Randy was killed. Nick, would you hear the shot before you heard the whine of the bullet going by? Certainly, Patsy. You would with an Army 45, which John was using. Because of the size of the bullet, its velocity is slower than that of sound. So you'll hear the report before you hear the bullet. Mm-hmm. Somewhat to... Uh... Mr. Carter, Grandmother's very ill. We sent for the doctor, but she heard that you were here and for some strange reason wants to see you right now. Mrs. Marquis wants to see me? You sure? Very sure, Mr. Carter. She insisted. Can you come right away, please? I've heard about you, Nick Carter. I... I never thought I'd have any reason to hire you, but it's a strange world. I think heaven sent you here today. Well, Mrs. Marquis, I've been called many things, but never heaven sent. There you are this time. My time has come at last. I know it. Dr. Sutton always said a shock would finish me, and Randolph's death has done it. I know. Nonsense, Mrs. Marquis. You'll live for years yet. Rubbish. I'll be dead by tomorrow. And I... I want you to make the will before I go. That's why I wanted to see you alone like this. But, madam, I'm not a lawyer. I know what you are. And I know you're honest. You... You can draw up a will, can't you? Yes, of course I can. Very well, then. Do it. I've never had a will, and I I want one. Very well. If you'll tell me what disposition you want made of your property, I'll draw it up for you. Well, that's easy. Half my estate goes to Teresa... The other half is to be divided equally between my other five grandchildren. I see. And who's to be executor? Theresa. She's the only one of the whole bunch I'd trust. Of course, I'll have to have the names of the five grandchildren. Of course you will. Of course you will. They're Bartons. David, Forrest, and Jack. And the twins, Myrtle and Hazel. Very well, Mrs. Marquis. I'll have this ready for your signature in the morning. Well, morning nothing. You'll have it ready for me just as soon as you can get it written down on paper. There's an old typewriter in the library you can use. Now, now, hurry up, Mr. Carter, and let's get this over with. May I come in, Nick? Oh, yes, Patsy. Finish what I'm doing. You've been writing out the old lady's will? Oh, what makes you think that? I can't think of any other reason why you should lock yourself up in this musty old library and spend an hour pounding on a typewriter. You're quite right, Patsy. But keep it to yourself. Does she take good care of Teresa? None of your business, my inquisitive young assistant. All right, suit yourself. I came to tell you the doctor's here. He says you'll have to wait before you can see Clara. She's lapsed into a coma. What? Says she may come out and she may not. But if she does, her mind will be clear enough to sign the will, in case that was what you wanted. Well, what a bunch of mind readers around here. Okay, I'll wait. Oh, by the way, Nick, we're invited to dine with the Bartons tonight. Oh, good. I'm getting hungry. <laughs> you haven't seen the rest of them yet. Maybe you won't be so happy about it when you do. Why? you seen them? I'll say I have. Besides Dave Barton, the man we met when we first got here, there's Forrest. He's some sort of a dope, apparently. And there's Jack, a rather good-looking kid of about 20. And, last but not least, there are the twins, Myrtle and Hazel. Hmm. They cute? Cute. They're 30 if they're a day. They look 40 and act 50. Hmm. They're a pair, no mistake. And, incidentally, we're eating in the kitchen, if it interests you. Where we eat is secondary, Patsy. It's the eating part of it that really interests me. That kitchen is something, too. I just saw it. It's the most home-like part of the whole house. Cozy and comfortable. I don't think it's a bit bigger than Madison Square Garden. And with a shotgun behind the door to add just the right touch. Now, Bessie, I want you to take care of this will I've drawn up. The moment old Clara comes to, have her sign it. And if you're fond of Teresa, pray that the old lady does come to before she dies. All right, Nick, I'll take care of it. Good. Now I'm going to call John May and tell him to come here to the Marquis estate about 8 o'clock. Well, why do that, Nick? You may start something. Maybe, but I think it's the wise thing to do. I want you to find Teresa and persuade her to go and meet him in the drive when he blows his horn twice. Now, that's important. Okay, Nick. 
She's to meet him in the drive when he blows his horn twice. I still don't get it, Nick. Couldn't you find a better time and place for me to meet Teresa? A better time, perhaps, but not a better place. Jan, I want you to take Teresa away from here, at once. Are you kidding? I am not. The odds are that you'll be saving her life. Before morning, she may be in deadly peril. Believe me. Okay, Nick. I'll take her. If she comes... Oh, John. John. Teresa. Oh, darling. Oh, John. Which is my cue to... Early this morning, a shot rang out and Randolph Marquis fell dead. Once again, a shot has startled the Marquis household. Who is dead this time? And what will be its effect on Nick Carter and his attempts to learn the real facts behind Randolph's death? We'll see in just a moment. If you're having difficulty keeping your floor spick and span these slushy winter days, here's the answer. You needn't have track-in trouble at your house, not when you use Linux clear gloss varnish to protect your floors. You see, Linux clear gloss varnish resists both water and dirt so that they're easily wiped away. And Linux clear gloss provides an elastic, durable finish that really wears, retaining its lustrous, transparent beauty for a long, long time. Yet it's easily brushed on, and it lessens your housework amazingly. Linux Clear Gloss even resists damage by hot grease, boiling water, fruit acids, perfume, and alcohol, making it the ideal protection for every wood and linoleum surface in your home. Yes, Linux Clear Gloss Varnish is the finest household protective finish you can buy. Depend on it, as so many wise homemakers do. Ask your dealer now for Linux, L-I-N-X. Linux Clear Gloss Varnish. You'll find all three great Linux home brighteners and Chemtone, the miracle wall finish, at hardware, paint, and department stores everywhere. And now, back to our story. The report of the shotgun, which startled Nick and the rest of the Marquis household, seemed to come from the room where Clara Marquis lay dying. Nick and Patsy raced to the door of the room, only to find the twins, Myrtle and Hazel, standing in the doorway, staring fascinatedly at the old lady's bed. What's happened? What was... Don't look at oh. Patsy. Oh. oh, it's ghastly. Her face has been blown away. Why, she's... Why, oh, Dr. Sutton. Dr. Sutton. What's happened to him, Nick? Why, he's out cold, Patsy. Oh. A blow in the back of the head, I should say. Dr. Sutton. Oh. Oh. What's happened to you, Doctor? I don't know. I, I was alone here with a patient. Something hit me. That's all I know. I don't even know where whoever hit me came from. Well, whoever hit you did for the old lady, all right. Did either of you girls see anything? No. Where are your brothers? Where were they when this happened? Oh, come on. You might as well tell me if you know. Oh, all right. I'm going to call the sheriff's office. Do you suppose you two could sort of stay here with the body until someone gets here? We'll stay. Well, there's nothing more I can do for her now. I think I'll get some fresh air. Want to step outside with me, Mr. Carter? Why, of course. I'll be right with you. Oh, Patsy. Mm Mm-hmm? Will you pack up the doctor's things and bring them out to the car? Surely, Nick. All right, doctor. Let's get out of here. Uh, Terrible thing, Mr. Carter. Terrible. Yes, it is. Poor old lady. She wouldn't have lasted the night anyway. What I wanted to tell you was this. Patsy said it was very important to Teresa to get that will signed. So I gave the old lady an injection which revived her long enough to read the will. And she signed it, and Patsy and I witnessed it. Was that right? Perfect, Doctor. Perfect. You have the will now? No, I gave it to Patsy. What? Well, you trusted her with it, so I did. Clara's murderer finds Patsy, has it? Patsy will be the next victim. Come on. I wonder if she's still in Clara's room where we left her. I didn't know. I should have... Patsy. Patsy! She's not here. Do either of you twins know where she went? No. She left. We thought she was with you. Didn't we, Myrtle? Yes. We thought she was with you. Come on, Doctor. We've got to search the house. There's no time to lose. Doctor, we've been through this house from cellar to attic. She's not here anywhere. 
I don't like it. How about the carriage house? There's a light upstairs there. Oh, yeah, so there is. Well, let's have a look up there. Oh, that's funny. John May's car is still here. Yes. Didn't take Teresa away after all. I wonder why. Well, I hope we find Patsy up here. Merciful heavens! Oh! Martin, stop that! Let John alone! You keep out of this! This dirty murderer is getting what's coming to him. The law won't do nothing to John May, but we will! Oh! Martin, if you touch him again, I'll shoot to kill! You wouldn't have the nerve! Nails, plenty of nerve for cowards like you! All right. You're on top for now. But we'll get him later. See if we don't. How do you two? Forrest and Jack, let Teresa go. Uh, all right. Take that gag out of her mouth. Be quick about it. Oh, Mr. Carr. Oh, thank heaven you've come. Oh, doctor, you better have a look at May. He's pretty badly beaten up. The only thing holding him up are the ropes tying him to that post. Yes, he's in a pretty bad way. Dave must have hit John at least 20 times. What happened, Teresa? Well, they, they got John right after you left and made me come with them. They brought us up here and tied John to the post so that he couldn't defend himself. Then they gagged me. Hold on. You mean that all three of them, Forrest, Jake, and Dave, have been with you since right after I left you with John? Why, yes. Why? Has anything happened? I'll say there has. Take care of things, Doctor. I've got a job to do. Where have you got her? Got who? What have you done with her? No one in the closet, I suppose. What the... Why, that's not... Drop that gun. Don't be a fool. Take that shotgun out of the middle of my back. You're a fool. Drop that gun. Very well. Here. Since the body in the closet is that of old Clara, I suppose you must have Patsy under that sheet on the bed. Yes. What have you done with her? Not much. We had to twist her arm a little to make her tell us where she put the will, that's all. Isn't it, Myrtle? Yes. We have it now. It's torn in little pieces. All right. So you've got what you wanted. Now let us go. No. We got us a lawyer, too. We know you and your girl could go to court and tell what the will was, and that would be as good as a will. Yes. We aim to take care of you both. You can't get away with this. I warn you. Yes, we can. Easy. We'll say Teresa did it. Yes, we will. You didn't suspect us, neither will anyone else. We'll blame Teresa. Well, Patsy, I've heard about enough, haven't you? <laughs> oh, you don't? Sorry to hit a woman, but... All right, Patsy. That takes care of the twins for now. Now, let's see what you look like under that sheet. Uh-uh, uh-uh. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Where till I get this gag out of your mouth? There. Oh, Nick, I thought you'd never get here. How'd you ever get away from that gun she was holding in your back? I've studied commando tactics, Betsy. One thing I learned was that if someone is holding a gun at your back, you can twist away from the gun faster than if someone can pull the trigger. Oh. Try it sometime. Thanks. I'll take your word for it, gladly. So, with Hazel, or Myrtle, knocked cold from the recoil of that 10-gauge shotgun, and Myrtle, or Hazel, out cold from the sock on the jaw I was supposed to give her, we have peace. Temporarily. Peace. Blessed peace. Even temporary peace. I hope the sheriff gets here pretty soon now. I'd like to get rid of these two vipers. Uh, viperesses, Nick. Viperesses. Before they try biting someone else. They had me fooled completely at first, Sheriff. I didn't believe either of those twins could handle as big a gun as a 10 gauge shotgun. Yet I felt sure, as soon as I saw that shotgun, that the forty-five bullet that killed Randolph Marquis came from its barrel. But why? Old man Brundage said he heard it whine over his head. Well, the whine of a ricocheting bullet, John, is one of the most deceptive sounds in the world. You can't tell really where it comes from. But I was right with Randy. I didn't hear any gun fired close. It was fired from the gravel pit, and the bullet came whining. Of course it did, Barton. The twins were clever enough to pick a mutilated bullet out of the gravel pit where John May shoots. They loaded it into a 10-gauge shell and fired it from behind the bushes on Brundage's property. The bushes acted as a silencer, probably. Both Brundage and Dave heard the wine had set up and assumed it was a ricochet from the pit. Who'd ever think a woman would figure out a way to load a 10-gauge with a banged-up bullet and then lay for a guy and shoot when somebody else shoots a quarter mile away? Why did they do it, Mr. Carter? Money, Teresa. 
Money they'd inherit from your grandmother, Clara Marquis. But I don't get it, Nick. How would Randolph being dead benefit the twins? His daughter would get his share, wouldn't she? Not if Clara didn't leave a will. That's the point around which everything else revolves, Patsy. But how does that work out, Nick? According to the law of the state, if the old lady left no will, Randolph would inherit one half the estate. Uh Uh-huh. And the five Bartons would inherit the other half, or one-tenth each. And if Randolph was dead? With Randolph dead, the five Bartons and Teresa, Randolph's daughter, would each inherit equally, or one-sixth of the estate apiece. How much difference would that make? Well, figure it out, Patsy. If the estate amounts to three million dollars, as I understand it does... Each twin would get $300,000 if Randolph were alive. Mm -hmm. But with him dead, they would each get $500,000 or $200,000 more. Oh. Wouldn't that be worthwhile for them? Gosh, that is some difference, isn't it? So when they found that old Clara was about to make a will, they had to stop it. Of course. They knew Teresa was a favorite and would get most of the money. So they killed Clara before she could sign the will I drew up. Well, then they must have found out afterwards that old Mrs. Marquis had signed the will before she was killed. How'd they learn that? Now, that, John, we'll never know. Somebody said too much or too little. At any rate, they found out just enough to know that Patsy had the will and that it was signed. So they bided their time and got it away from Patsy. Then they laid for me to get rid of any possible witness to the existence of a will. Do you suppose they would have killed me, Mr. Carter? No, Teresa. Not if they had got rid of Patsy and me. I asked John to come here and take you away because I didn't know which way the cat was going to jump. And I was afraid the killer would try to nullify the effects of the will by killing you. But fortunately, the dear twins selected Patsy and me as the victims and you for the logical suspect. Well, anyway, I, I'm glad you asked John to come over here, no matter what the reason was. It settled things for him and me very nicely. It's just the way I wanted it to be, Nick. Although I hadn't hoped to get it for a long time yet. Which proves that you never know where your blessings are coming from. Or something. Well, anyway, good luck to you both. <laughs> In just a moment, Nick and Patsy will bring you a preview of next week's exciting case. But first, here's a suggestion. On a winter night, as the family gathers cozily at home for an evening of fun together, every moment is more enjoyable when home looks its inviting best. And it always does, when you depend on the three great Linux home brighteners to keep woodwork, floors, and furniture sparkling. Your furniture, for example, regains its original gleaming beauty when you use Linex Cream Polish. For Linex Cream Polish cleans as it polishes, removing in one quick application all the cloudy accumulation of dust in previous polish. Yes, you save one whole step in your cleaning day routine when you use Linex Cream Polish on your furniture. It's truly the modern shortcut to furniture upkeep, taking only half the time. You'll find that Linex Cream Polish banishes messy fingerprints from your furniture, helps to hide ugly scratches, too. And there's no oily film on your furniture to attract more dust to make more work. So do ask your dealer for Linex Cream Polish. Ask for all three great Linex home brighteners. Remember, that's Linex, spelled L-I-N-X. You'll find them all. Linex Self-Polishing Wax, Linex Cream Polish, and Linux Clear Gloss Varnish at your nearest hardware, paint, or department store. And now let's hear from Nick Carter himself. What about it, Nick? Have you an exciting story for next week? Well, next week, Ken, I want to tell you what happened when I stopped off in a little town upstate to tell a rookie cop's family how sorry we were that he'd been killed in line of duty. Well, that doesn't sound very exciting to me. It was what happened after Nick stopped off there that makes the story. He found a household ruled by fear. Fear and hate. With a mad old woman at the head of it who was convinced that she had been divinely appointed to set the world right. Oh, that's very different, Nick. Where did you come into it? Nick stopped a well-laid plan to commit wholesale murder and saved the daughter of the house a fortune running into the millions. Just because the killer forgot to quote the right Bible verse at the right time. What do you call it? An eye for an eye. Or the mystery of the upstate murders. And that's all for now. So long. So long, everybody. So long to you both, Nick and Patsy. We'll be seeing you again next week. <laughs> Next week at the same time, listen to another curious experience of Nick Carter, Master Detective, entitled... An Eye for an Eye. 
for Nick Carter and the mystery of the upstate murders. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is featured in Street and Smith magazines. Lon Clark is starred as Nick with Helen Choate as Patsy. Original music is played by Lou White, and the programs are written and directed by Jock McGregor. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this time and over these same stations by the three great Linux home brighteners. Linux clear gloss varnish, Linux cream polish, and Linux self-polishing wax, created by Acme, America's great producer of Acme fine quality paints. This is Ken Powell speaking for the thousands of Linux dealers all over America and saying so long until next week. This is Mutual. The detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Presented by the three great Linux home brighteners. Linux clear gloss varnish, Linux cream polish, and Linux self-polishing wax. Created by Acme, America's great producer of fine Acme quality paints. Today's curious adventure, an eye for an eye. For Nick Carter and the mystery of the upstate murders. In just a moment, we'll hear how Nick Carter solved the mystery of the upstate murders and saved Sharon Fraser a fortune by doing so. But first, here's a tip on homemaking. Millions of American homemakers have learned to care for their walls with Chemtone, the miracle wall finish that brings amazing new beauty. Now millions more are learning to care for their floors, woodwork, and furniture with the three great Linux home brighteners. Linux self-polishing wax, which beautifies your floors with a satiny yet tough non-skid finish that resists wear, water, and dirt. Linux cream polish, which cleans as it polishes, leaving no oily film on your furniture. And Linux clear gloss varnish, the durable super varnish that dries to an elastic, transparent surface which protects all wood and linoleum in your home. You'll find the three great Linux home brighteners at your hardware, paint, or department store. Your headquarters also for Chemtone, the miracle wall finish. And now for today's mysterious adventure with Nick Carter. As we start today's story, we find Nick and Patsy just entering Lieutenant Riley's office. Well, Riley, what's on your mind? What do you want to see me about? Well, I'll make it short, Nick. You're taking a trip upstate, aren't you? Yes, Lieutenant. For a wonder, Nick is leaving me in charge of the office and taking a few days off. It's hard to believe, but it's true. Well, Nick, you remember Tom Fraser, the young rookie cop who was shot down in cold blood last week? Oh, yes, indeed. Nice young chap. Sorry to see him go like that. Well, his folks live in Watertown. It's right on the way to where you're going. Uh, would you stop off there long enough to call on him and tell him personal like how sorry we are at what happened to him? Oh, Nick would love to do that. He makes beautiful speeches. Quiet, Patsy. <laughs> This vacation I'm taking seems to have gone to your head. W would you do it, Nick? It's a favor to me. Of course he will, Lieutenant. Okay, Riley, I'll do it for you. I suppose the old folks will feel his death a little less keenly if we tell him he died a hero in line of duty. I think that's a darn nice thing to do, Nick. I'm proud of you. Well, thanks, Nick. I knew I could count on you. <laughs> Can you take me to the Fraser place on Upper Main Street? I sure can, mister. Get here now. Get going. From the city, ain't you? Yes. Come to pay your respects a bit, huh? I suppose that's what you'd call it. Why? Oh, just wondered how far you'd get. Been expecting somebody ever since young Tom got himself killed. Family taking it hard? Some is, some ain't. Some we don't know whether they is or they ain't. Meaning what? 
There, nobody ever gets to see the old lady. You mean Mrs. Fraser? Yeah. Nobody but her doctor has seen her since she got sick. From what I hear, she might take it anyway. Oh, a little peculiar? A little. They told Sharon, her own daughter, she was wild and wicked. And she'd be better off dead. Same for the boy Don. Yeah, that's the house just ahead there. Well, nice looking old place, isn't it? Yeah, looks don't mean much. Outside of a package, don't tell what's inside. Uh, wait, please. I'll be right out. Oh, uh, no, I'll come back. But I'll only be a few... I said I'd come back half an hour. Well, okay, but don't forget me. I won't. Don't you forget about me. Nobody's home. No? Who are you? I'm Uncle Roy. Who are you? I, why... I'm a policeman. Policeman? Hey, hey, steady there, steady. You know, so drunk you can't stand up. Hey, he's out cold. And I'll lay him down. You ought to be ashamed bringing him home in that condition. I'm not bringing him home. I'm just... Oh, taking him out, that's worse. Look here, I'm Nick Carter, and I came here... I'm Sharon Fraser. What do you want? I have a message from Mrs. Fraser, from Lieutenant Riley of the Metropolitan Police. Oh, well, we've been expecting somebody. Come on, I'll take you to her room. Dr. Gavin, this is Nick Carter. He wants to talk to Mother. Uh, nothing exciting, I hope, Mr. Carter. Well, just the condolences of the Metropolitan Police Department on the recent death of her son, Tom. Tom. Oh. Tom. Tom. Mrs. Fraser, Tom. Lieutenant Riley thought the world of your son, and he wanted me to tell you that Tom died in service to the people. You may well be proud of him. Proud of him. And the Lord said, Take now thy son whom thou lovest. And offer him for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I shall tell thee of. Proud of him. Oh, maybe you don't understand, Mrs. Fraser. Burnt Lieutenant Riley, Mr. Carter, uh, suppose you come outside with me. Well, all right. <laughs> Mrs. Fraser is not fully conscious of what goes on around her. Uh, you've done all you could. Uh, what was all that she was quoting from the Bible? In cases of this kind, it's not unusual for the patient to lean heavily on the Bible as a refuge from reality. But her son... Yes, I know, Mr. Carter. There's nothing to be done about it. All right, Doctor, whatever you say. Well, if you think I can do no good here, I'll just get back to the station. That would be best, I'm sure. And uh, thank you for coming. <laughs> Driver's long overdue. Wonder if he ever intended to come back. You waiting for somebody? Oh, yes. Say, what goes with the taxi service in this town? I'd like to get that train to Albany. It's already gone. You don't have to stay here tonight. No, thanks. I don't care for the atmosphere here. You feel it, too? I do. It's the most unpleasant feeling of hatred. Hatred that's monstrous and unnatural. Yeah, you know, I get a little uneasy here evening to myself... I'll be glad to have you... Uh... Yeah, that's my sister. Mrs. Fraser? Yes. Well, come on. Let's travel up there, all right. Oh, you wicked, wicked. You try to poison me. Here, here. What's all this? Get out of here. Mother's upset and there's no reason. Poison. Poison is my milk. You tried to kiss her, me. Is her milk here? Yes, but it's... I'll have handle it. That milk's all right. I just brought it up. She hadn't even tasted it. And what made her think it was poison? You tell me. You're a detective, aren't you? Where did this milk come from? I got it out of the refrigerator. My brother Don was with me. He got a glass for himself and brought it upstairs. He stopped to talk to Mother while I changed my clothes. And where's your brother now? In his room, I suppose. Well, take me there at once. It's the next room to this. Look for yourself. I will. Sharon, come here. What's the matter? Your brother's dead. And he's been murdered. Mr. Carter, this is Mr. Welch, our county sheriff. How are you, Sheriff? Uh, Dr. Gavin says you don't think young Don Frazier died of heart failure. He died of heart failure, all right. Heart failure brought on by a generous dose of poison. I'm afraid Mr. Carter, being from the city, is used to dealing with the sensation. Mm, probably. 
But since he makes the accusation, I'll have the coroner analyze the boy's glass of milk. Uh, that ain't necessary. It was murder, all right, and you know who did it? Sharon did it. You're crazy, Uncle Roy. No, no, I ain't. You scared Alec Lord won't fall for you if you ain't rich and you want money so bad you're willing to kill for it. Why, you... You drunken old bum, you dare to say that to me. You probably killed him yourself. If we were all dead, you'd be the one to stop get... Stop it, stop it, both of you. We don't even know Don was killed. It's just that Mr. Carter here is... Oh, Alec, I'm so glad you've come. It's all right, dear. You, Alex Lord? That's right. Thought I'd better drop in before you city cops carted the whole household off to jail. I have nothing to do with this. This is off my beat. Don't let me slow you up, Carter. Don't worry, Sheriff, I wouldn't. But I'm getting out of here. Killer or no killer, I'd like to be getting to Albany. Where's the phone? It's in the downstairs entrance hall. You'll see it right at the foot of the stairs. Thanks. I'll close the door. Then I won't disturb anyone. Oh, don't mind us. We're leaving now anyway. Good night. And you'll get me there in time for the 127 to Albany? All right, I'll be on the porch whenever you get here. And don't fail me now. I've had too much trouble finding someone to get me out of here to want you to slip up, too. Okay, goodbye. I don't know why I feel as if I... Good Lord. That was close. I don't hear a soul. But an urn that big never fell off that upper landing without being pushed. I'd better see who's up there. You get some transportation, Mr. Carter? Doctor, come here. Yes? I want to show you something. What is it? Something wrong? Look over the railing. See that big urn? All smashed up at the foot of the stairs? Oh, yes. Why? That just missed me by inches a moment ago. You think somebody was trying to kill you? Think? I'm sure of it. Did you hear anyone up here? What? Yes. Yes, I did think I heard someone here out here a minute ago. So there really is a killer in the house. I hadn't believed it before. You fellas hear anything? Why, no. Did you? I just thought I heard a crash. Well, you did. Someone tried to kill me. Oh, golly, then I did hear somebody tiptoe past my door a bit back. You know who it was? No, it sounded like they went down the back stairs to the kitchen. Let's see who's down there. If anyone is, which I doubt. Come on. Be safe a minute until he's gone. Don't worry. We'll make it so hot for him, he'll be glad to go. But Alec, we can't. Miss Fraser, I've changed my mind. I'm staying for the night. You're staying here? Yes. I'd hoped I'd seen the last of you. You almost did, until someone dropped that oversized plaster vase at my head. It was a wonderful idea. I'm sorry it missed. Well, I'll show you where you can sleep. Come on. Feels good. Damp inside that old house. Well, eight o'clock. Wonder what time they serve breakfast around here. Starting your snooping early, aren't you? Why, yes. Lovely morning for it. Out for a walk in the sunshine? Just out to get the mail, if you must know. I'll let you know if there's anything for you in the box. Thanks, but I'm not expecting anything. Oh, happy to say nobody else thinks any more of you than I do. There's no mail. Downstairs, drop to the ground. This looks more serious. Is someone trying to kill Sharon? Or is it Nick they're trying to get? And why? What is this to do with the hate that seems to rule the Fraser household? We'll see in just a moment. Your youngsters are sometimes thoughtless about tracking in mud, slush, and snow these winter days. Even the careful grown-ups sometimes can't help it. But it needn't be a problem to keep your floors looking lovely when you depend on Linux self-polishing wax to protect them. That's because Linex self-polishing wax resists water. It keeps dirt on the surface, too, so that you can clean it up instantly. And because it contains genuine Carnauba wax, Linex self-polishing wax resists wear, although it's simply wiped on without tiresome rubbing or polishing. And it's handy to use because when worn spots do appear in the finish, you may renew it without re-waxing the whole floor. 
There's no doubt about it. Linux self-polishing wax is a splendid finish for any floor, wood, tile, or linoleum, for it gives a beautiful satiny appearance and gives protection besides. What's more, the underwriters' laboratories, whose seal is on every bottle, have proved that it's less slippery underfoot. Here's the modern shortcut to floor care. Linux, L-I-N-X, Linux self-polishing wax. Ask your dealer for it now. You'll find all three great Linux home brighteners and Chemtone, the miracle wall finish, at hardware, paint, and department stores everywhere. And now, back to our story. We left Nick and Sharon as they were being shot at by an unknown killer who seemed to be hiding in the nearby brush. Down there! Down to the ground! He's gone now. You hurt? Not much. Did you see who it was? No. Saw the bushes move, that's all. It wasn't Peter Rabbit. Let me see that arm. It's nothing. Oh, yeah, right. Just a bad scratch. You'll be all right. Here. Let me help you back to the house. Thanks. I feel a little fuzzy. I don't like being shot at. You're lucky his aim was no better. He might have killed you. I know. Uh, What's going on here? Did I hear shooting? You did. Take care, Sharon. I'm going to do some investigating. Hello there. Looking for something? Yes. Looking for a killer. A killer? Yes. And the man I'm looking for has my mark on him. I found blood in the bushes from which he did his shooting. Well, maybe that's the man I saw. What do you mean? Well, I was driving up the back road and I saw somebody in here. I was curious, so I stopped and I came in. But I must have missed whoever it was. Well, there's no one here now, that's sure. So if your car is here, you can drive me back to the house. Well, of course. The car's right over there behind the tree. Oh, yes, I see it. Did the killer get anybody? No, he was a poor shot. But he intended murder, all right. Mm-hmm. Here we are. Climb in, Mr. Carter. I see you have a rifle in the car here. Why, yes. Mind if I look at it? Not at all. Hmm. Nice little gun. Haven't had time to clean it, have you? I know. I was doing a bit of hunting this morning on the way out. I see. Let's be getting back, shall we? Well, that is a coincidence, Mr. Carter. Look there, just coming around the corner of the house. Uncle Roy with a rifle. I wonder what he's been shooting. Think I'll have a talk with him. Okay, I'll see you later. Hope he's not the one you're after. Get anything? No, didn't see a thing. Nice gun you've got there. May I see it? Oh, sure, sure, here you are. Nice balance. Yeah. Dirty, isn't it? Uh, Thought you hadn't shot it today. Uh, heaven. Uh, I must have forgot to clean it the last time. Smells pretty fresh for that. Where are you getting at with all them questions? Somebody shot Sharon a little while ago. Sharon? She hurt bad? No. But that's only because the killer missed. You know anything about it? Me? Why, Mr. Carter, I loved that girl as if she was my own daughter. And why did you accuse her last night of killing her brother? That was for her own protection, Mr. Carter. I hoped you'd take her away someplace and lock her up where she'd be safe. Isn't she safe here? No, sir. If she stays around here, she'll be murdered, too. I know what's going on around here. And who'd want to kill her? Why, there's... I'm sorry to interrupt, but Mrs. Frazier is very low. Maybe you better come up, Roy. Sure, sure, Doc. Uh, where's Sharon? In her room, resting. How is she, Doc? She'll be all right. Excitement and shock were too much for her. If Mrs. Fraser is really worse, maybe I better get her. Get who? Me? Yes, uh, Sharon, your mother's pretty bad. Oh. Quiet now. She looks about the same to me. Thy life shall hang in doubt before thee, and thou shalt see our day and night and have no assurance of thy life. Oh, don't be tiresome, Mother. Sharon, please. Oh, she is. I'll wait downstairs, I guess. 
Oh, there you are, Carter. Thought you might like to see the results of the analysis of the milk you say killed down Fraser. Yes, I'd like to. You have it? Sure have. <clears throat> According to this, Don's glass of milk contained calcium, phosphorus, lactic acid, water, and 5% butterfat. In other words, Mr. Carter, just plain milk. Here. How about the other sample I gave you? The milk from Mrs. Fraser's glass. That? Didn't even look at the report on that. She wasn't killed, was she? No, but she claims she was being poisoned. What does that analysis show? Uh, let's see. Uh, 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 hmm, uh, what's hyacinth? A slow-acting poison. Well, I'll be darned. Says here there was enough hyacinth in Mrs. Fraser's milk to have poisoned half the county. I thought so. Then why was it Don who got poisoned instead of the old lady? Sheriff, this is all part of a well-thought-up plan. The plan to commit wholesale murder, unless we can stop it. Uh, Carter, you're crazy. Uh, you carry any guns? Why, of course I do. One. Better let me have it. Be safer that way. Why should I turn my gun over to you? As sheriff of this district, it's my duty to see that nobody carries a gun he ain't got a permit for. And I don't trust you. You see things don't exist. Okay, sheriff. I know I have no rights in this part of the state. Just a minute. Mm. There you are, sheriff. Look, what's the idea of taking out the cartridges before you turn the gun over to me? I don't trust you any more than you do me. I'd hate to be shot with my own gun. Why? All right. Give it back to you when you're ready to leave. I hope it'll be soon. Just as soon as I find out a few answers, I don't know yet. Oh, Sheriff, I'm not anything yet. Nothing that helps, Mike. Sharon, if you children didn't get your mother's money when she dies, to whom would it go? Well, Uncle Roy would get it. And if Uncle Roy didn't get it? It goes to some charity, I think. What are you getting at? Does your mother take small doses of hyacinth as a sedative? Yes, and it's darned expensive. Could anybody get at it? Probably. It's not locked up. What is all this? I wonder just how sick your mother really is. But you coward! Trying to drag a sick woman's name into this mess. I'm dragging nobody, and I'm just I'm trying too to... too loud, please. Mrs. Frazier's feeling better now. Where's Uncle Roy? I left him with Mrs. Frazier. You what? Great grief! Get out of my way! Mr. Carter, what's the name? I was afraid of that. Vengeance is mine. Vengeance is mine. I will be paid, said the Lord. Vengeance is mine. Sure. What? Uncle Roy. Yes, Uncle Roy. Dead. So she killed Uncle Roy. Stabbed him in the back. Yes. Must have made him lean over the bed and then drove the knife in his back. I should have warned you, Mr. Carter. I've known for a long time that she was dangerously insane, but I never dreamed she would go this far. First Don, now Uncle Roy. Mr. Carter, do you mean that Mrs. Fraser had anything to do with, with Don's death? That's ridiculous. How could she have killed Don? It was really very easy, Sharon. Just as soon as I found the analysis showed hyacinth in her milk, I knew the answer. She coaxed Don to try it. And there was so much poison in it that even the sip he took was fatal. The poison made him sleepy, and he went to his own room to lie down. <laughs> Why? Why should she want to do it? I'll get to that in a minute. Well, old Mrs. Fraser certainly wasn't the one who fired at Sharon this morning. Naturally not. But if you'd got there a little sooner, Alex, you'd have caught the murderer red-handed. He stopped his car by the road, ran into the brush, shot at Sharon, missed her because he was in a hurry, and then got back in his car and drove on. Do you know who it was that did the shooting, Mr. Carter? I do. It was the same one who was responsible for Don's death and for Uncle Roy's. But you said Mother killed him. You notice I said the one who was responsible. Your mother isn't responsible. She's just the instrument the murderer used to accomplish his ends. But who is it, then? Sharon, whose leather jacket is that on the chair behind you? Leather jacket? What? Yes. That's Dr. Gavin. I remember he wore it when he helped me into the house this morning. Well, look at the right sleeve. The right sleeve? Oh, I see. There's blood on it. It must have come from where I was shot when I leaned on him. That isn't your blood, Sharon. You'll find more blood inside the sleeve. Which certainly couldn't have come from your arm. What are you getting at, Miss Carter? The real murderer is the one who could best work on poor Mrs. Fraser's mind with drugs and suggestions. The one who implanted in her sick mind the idea that her children were evil and wicked. The only one who could have left a surgeon's scalpel where her hand could get at it when she wanted to stab Uncle Roy in compliance with his suggestion. Carter, you mean the Dr. Gavin? Yes, Alec, that's what he means. And he's quite right. Dr. Gavin, you... It would have worked out except for you, Carter. I was afraid of you when you first came here. That's why I tried to kill you with that urn. You overplayed your hand, Gavin. You let me go my way as I wanted to. I would never have given the Fraser household a second thought. But you made me mad. 
And that was your mistake. I didn't dare let you go. But you wished you had this morning when my shots winged you in the arm as you tried to kill Sharon. I'll get even for that right now. <gasps> Dr. Gavin, it's gone. You can't... Oh, yes, he can, Sheriff. Right, Mr. Carter. I happen to know that the sheriff took your gun away from you. So you're helpless. There'll be no last-minute gun battle with you in the fight. There'll just be one shot for each of you, and I... Oh, Sorry to disappoint you, Gavin. But the sheriff only took one of my guns. We well, overlooked the one on my shoulder holster, which you see is quite effective. All right, Alec, pick up his gun. I'll get the sheriff. He'll know what to do with a cowardly rat like this. <laughs> I don't understand why Dr. Gavin wanted to get them all killed off. What did he hope to get out of it, Nick? Well, that was all brought out of the inquest, Nancy. Seems that this Gavin was an imposter. Never was a doctor. Got kicked out of medical school in his senior year for being mixed up in an illegal operation. He met old Mrs. Fraser a few years ago and in some way convinced her that he was a great doctor. As far as I know, he had no other patients. He concentrated on her because he knew that she had over a million dollars sold it away. And he wanted it. But how could he hope to get it, Nick, even if he did kill off all the other heirs? Well, Patsy, remember I told you that after the children and Uncle Roy were killed, the money was to go to some charity? Yes, I remember that. Well, investigation showed that the charity that was to get the money was a phony outfit that Gavin had fixed up for the occasion. Oh. In other words, Gavin and the charity were one and the same thing, and existed only for the purpose of getting the Fraser million. That's a pretty clever setup at that. Yes, but Gavin forgot one thing, though. Well, what was that? When he was whispering biblical quotations to the old lady, he should remember the one that goes, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a life for a life. Oh, I see what you mean. That's the one that applies to him right now. A life for a life. Too bad he missed that one. Well, how are you, oh. Patsy? Many words from Nick. Oh, just a minute, Nick. Oh, hello, Lieutenant. I'm talking to Nick right now. Oh. Want to say hello to him? Well, sure. Why not? Nick? Yes? Lieutenant Riley just dropped in. He wants to say hello to you. Hold on. Nothing doing. One reason I came up here for a vacation. That's why I wouldn't have to say hello to Riley. Oh, but Nick... Bye-bye, Patsy. See you when I get back. Well, he couldn't wait to talk to you, Lieutenant, but he said to give you his regards anyway. In just a moment, Nick and Patsy will give you a preview of next week's exciting case. But before they do, here's a hint to every good hostess. When you invite guests these days, it's so brisk outside, there's an added warmth of hospitality inside a home that's beautifully cared for. And your home has that look when you care for your floors, your woodwork, your furniture, with the three great Linux home brighteners. You'll notice, for instance, that your furniture takes on new loveliness when you've used Linux cream polish to remove that cloudy accumulation of dust and previous polish. For Linux, cream polish cleans as it polishes your furniture. Yes, it's true. In one quick, easy application, you banish messy fingerprints and dirt from your furniture, leaving a gleaming luster without that oily film which attracts more dust, makes more work. Linux cream polish saves one whole step in your cleaning day routine. And you'll like the way it helps conceal ugly scratches, too. Get it at your dealers now. Linux cream polish. Spelled L-I-N-X. Get all three great Linux home brighteners, Linux self-polishing wax, Linux cream polish, and Linux clear gloss varnish at your nearest hardware, paint, or department store. And now let's hear from Nick Carter himself. Well, Nick, what can you tell us about your next thriller? A young friend of mine fell heir to a large and prosperous farm. But the three members of the family who had owned the farm before him had all three died within a period of four years. Their deaths were also natural and so perfectly open and above board that he got suspicious. Everything looked too good. Well, that seems like a peculiar way to feel. Well, Ken, the peculiar part of it came in when we started our investigations and found he was right. And found it out only just in time to save the life of the young fellow himself. The whole thing was extremely cleverly worked out. What do you call it, Nick? Ready for murder. Or the mystery of the dead Scotty. Now, so long. So long, everybody. And so long to you both. See you again next week as usual. (laughs) 
Next week at this same time, listen to another curious experience of Nick Carter, Master Detective, entitled... Ready for Murder. Or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Dead Scotty. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is featured in Street and Smith magazines. Lon Clark is starred as Nick with Helen Schultz as Patsy. Original music is played by Lou White, and the programs are written and directed by Jock McGregor. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented at this time and over these same stations each week by the three great Linux home brighteners. Linux clear gloss varnish, Linux cream polish, and Linux self-polishing wax, created by Acme, America's great producer of Acme fine quality paints. This is Ken Powell speaking for the thousands of Linux dealers all over America and saying so long until next week. This is Mutual. Another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective, presented by the three great Linux home brighteners, Linux clear gloss varnish, Linux cream polish, and Linux self-polishing wax, created by Acme, America's great producer of fine Acme quality paints. Today's curious adventure... Ready for murder. Or Nick Carter and the mystery of the dead Scotty. In just a moment, we'll hear how the dead Scotty dog helped Nick Carter solve the mystery of the Ames farm and of how he saved from death the young heir to the estate who was ready for murder. You know, it doesn't take folks long to learn what's worthwhile. That's why millions of wise American homemakers have discovered Chemtone, the miracle wall finish. That's why they're now discovering this new magic for woodwork, floors, and furniture, the three great Linux home brightness. Linux clear gloss varnish to give lustrous, longer-lasting protection to every wood and linoleum surface. Linux cream polish to renew the sleek, gleaming beauty of fine furniture. And Linux self-polishing wax to lend rich, satiny loveliness to any floor, wood, linoleum, or tile. Take the modern shortcut to new home beauty with the three great Linux home brightness. You'll find them all at your hardware, paint, or department store. Your headquarters also for Chemtone, the miracle wall finish. And now for today's mysterious adventure with Nick Carter. As our story opens, we find Nick and Patsy just entering the hotel room of John Ames, a young friend of Nick's. Oh, hello, Nick. Patsy. Hello. hello, John. Glad to see you. Come on in. Thanks. Good to see you again. Oh, Nick, look at that darling Scotty on the bed. Hey, Mac, get down off that bed. Oh, he looks so cute there with his head on the pillow. Yeah, I've never been able to break McTavish of the habit. Oh, by the way, this is Chief Danis of the local police. Nick Carter and Patsy Bowen, Chief. How are you, Carter? Well, Bowen? let's get down to business. Chief Danis and I have just come from my Aunt Mary's funeral, as you know. The coroner's verdict was that Aunt Mary killed herself with aconite. But I don't believe it. Why not, John? Well, first, because she wasn't the suicide kind. Second, because if she wanted to kill herself, she would have used poison she was more familiar with. She was a gardener, knew all about nicotine sulfate and arsenic and so on. Well, nothing very positive there. Well, Mr. Carter, how about this? Since John's grandfather, old Henry Ames, passed on at the age of 83 four years ago, three of the heirs have died. Typhoid killed Frank last year. Phil was shot in a hunting accident two years ago. And now Mary dies of aconite poisoning. But the Purcells keep right on running the farm, the way they always have. Who are the Purcells? Adam and Paul Purcell were first employed as farm managers by my grandfather. Uh-huh. Each successive owner since then has kept them on. So far, everything seems quite open and above board. Yes, but each time one of the last three Ameses has died, the word murder has been whispered all over town. But why? I don't get it. Well, just a feeling. No proof at all, but... The rumor persists that the Purcells know more about than they can let on. And as a medical student, I can say that the chances of three healthy people dying off like that, one after another, purely as a coincidence, is less than one in a hundred. Is there any question about your grandfather's death being natural? Well, no, none at all. Mm-hmm. And how about Phil? He shot himself in the chest. 
while out hunting with the Purcell. And it was his gun, with only his fingerprints on it. I see. And how about Frank's death? Died in bed of not typhoid. Huh. Nothing to show it wasn't on the level? Not a thing, Mr. Carter. Uh-huh. Well, now, tell me about your Aunt Mary's death. Anything wrong there? Well, nothing you can put your finger on. So here are the facts. And I want to say that they've been checked and proven in every detail. That's right, Mr. Carter. What John will tell you is nothing but facts. All right, let's have them. Aunt Mary lived alone in the big house. The Purcells and Lizzie Gregg, their hired girl, lived in the tenant house. Lizzie took care of the big house and got the meals for Aunt Mary, but she didn't sleep there. Well, this particular morning, Lizzie walked over to the big house at 7 in the morning, called my aunt, got no answer, and investigated. My aunt was in bed, dead. And it snowed that night before all night. And the tracks we found when we got there proved, proved, mind you, that no one was in the house that night with his aunt. And the post-mortem shows she died of aconite poisoning, huh? Yes, a minute dose, but fatal and positive. Just enough to kill her. Well, where'd she get this aconite? Well, Lizzie used it for a heart condition for years. Kept the bottle in the big house in the kitchen cabinet. Oh, I see. The bottle was found on his aunt's bedside table, with her fingerprints plainly showing on top of Lizzie's. But it couldn't be an accident, because aconite is neither odorless nor tasteless, and couldn't be taken without knowing it. And the poison was administered to my aunt through her mouth. Well, it certainly looks like suicide to me. Except for one thing, Patsy. What's that? A person going to commit suicide would pour themselves out a good sizable portion of the poison they intended to use. Not just barely enough to kill them. She wouldn't know enough to do that. If she didn't leave any suicide note, either. But if it wasn't suicide, and if she couldn't have taken it by accident, and if nobody could have forced it on her without her knowing it was being done, where does that leave you? Exactly, Patsy. It proves just one thing in my mind... It proves a cold-blooded, deliberate murder, carefully planned and executed. I don't know how it was done, but it was. The same goes for Phil's death and Frank's. And I'll bet the Purcells of the murderers are the accomplices. They stand to gain a nice income from the farm, which goes to them if the last heir dies. They've been planning this for years. They planned it so carefully that the evidence proves them not guilty every time. Uh, Adam Purcell, where did you come from? I knocked, but there was so much talk and nobody heard me. So I come in. John, I heard what you said. Well, I meant it, every word. How do you happen to be here, Purcell? I heard John was coming down here to meet Chief Dennis and you, Mr. Carter. I guessed why, so I followed him. To spy on me? No, young man, not to spy, to resign. Paul and Lizzie are against the idea. I'm the elder brother, and what I say goes. You mean you'll all move off the farm? Just that, and right now. Mr. Purcell, I meant every word I said just now, and I'm not taking back a word of it. But you can't resign, and I can't let you go. No. Why not? Because if they go now, it means either they're quitting under fire, or I'm afraid to live in the farm with them. Besides, I need farm managers, and the Purcell's the best managers I know. I think you're right, John. Well, how do you feel about it, Mr. Purcell? I don't know. But I... Well, I guess I can stand it if he can. All right. We'll put the food on your table, clean your house, run your farm. But that's all. We won't have nothing to do with you, nor you with us. I understand, and I agree. I'll be getting along. Hey, quiet, Mac, and get down off my bed. Come on, come on, get down. You're going back to the farm tonight, Mr. Ames? Yes, especially in view of what just happened. You still think Purcell's guilty? Yes, I do. Adam wanted to resign either because he was afraid or because he wanted to establish an alibi. Because if I should be killed while the Purcells weren't living on the farm, they'd be cleared of all the deaths. No, no. I'm going back there and prove that the Purcells actually did what I think they did. Well, Mac, this seems to be the kitchen. Oh, there's nobody here. Yes, there is, in that rocking chair. Uh, how do you do? You let your dog in the house? I uh, yes. Max always lived with me in my room. Ain't it? Where's your sleep? Why, in the master bedroom, of course. Good. Best room in the house. What time do you want breakfast? About 8 o'clock. I'd like uh, eggs, bacon, and coffee. Hmm. You set the time, young man. I'll finish the meals. Good night. <laughs> well, yes, Max, that was probably Lizzie. Well, if that's the way they want it, Okay. Come on, let's have a look at our house. Ah, so this is 
is the master bedroom. Gosh, Mac. So furniture is beautiful. <coughs> hey, get down off that bed, Mac. You've got to turn over a new leaf in this house. Lizzie won't have you sleeping on beds, I know. <coughs> oh, all right. Stay there for now. Gosh, I wonder why the whole house smells so strongly of alcohol. Smells like a box. Oh, the phone's here in the bedroom. Swell. Well. Hello? Hello, John. I just thought I'd call and see how you're making out. Oh, gosh, Nick, it's good to hear your voice. This is a grand old house, but it's so quiet you can cut it with a knife. Any new ideas yet? Yes, one or two. Nick, I'd like to have you get me a permit to exhume Frank Ames' body and autopsy the remains. If arsenic poisoning was wrongly diagnosed as typhoid, that can still be checked. All right, John, I'll bring the permit out with me when I come tomorrow. Oh, by the way, if the first cells were to inherit the farm, where would Lizzie come in? She wouldn't. She has no interest in it at all. She wouldn't get to touch a dollar of it. Why? Oh, just wonder. <laughs> I, uh, I understand Lizzie and Paul were talking of getting married about five years ago, but nothing came of it. I see. Well, all right, John. I'll see you about 11 in the morning. Good night. Good night, Nick. Well, come on, Mac. I'm going to have to get off the bed now because I'm getting in it myself. Lizzie, that was the best breakfast I ever ate. And I mean it. Yes, maybe you do. I know when I'm being made fun of. Um, Lizzie, I wonder if you could manage to get rid of that barrel of alcohol I saw in the cellar this evening. This morning. I, I can smell it all over the house. Yes, yeah, better speak to Paul, young man. I've been trying to get rid of that barrel all winter. It leaks. Yes, it certainly does. You'll have to get Paul to get rid of it. And he's real stubborn. Hey, where is Paul now? Clown, of course. Where else this time of year? Well, thanks, Lizzie. See if I can find him. the wire here, and he went over the fence there, shoved his gun through ahead of him, Doc hit that rock, and bang, got him in the chest. Mm, I see. Thanks. You might if I get back to my plow and we're behind now. No, not at all. You and Adam certainly keep this place in beautiful shape. We aim to all run down when Adam and me was hired, but now everything's up to snuff, and no aim has ever put his hand to it yet. Oh, I think I'll roam around and see what there is to see. Haven't been here since I was a kid. Come on, Mac. Hey, Mac, look at the time. Seven o'clock. Must be Nick blowing for us. Come on. We'll go back through the cattle lane. Ought to be the quickest way to the house. Gosh, this cattle lane's a beautiful job. Almost 200 yards straight from the barn out of the fields where the cows are put out to pasture. Hmm. Fenced on both sides with five strands of barbed wire. Oh, each one of them is tight as a banjo string. That, Mac, is a model fence if I ever saw one. <laughs> yes, Mac, I see him. It's Nick, all right. Oh, he's got Patsy with him. Run! 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 of accidents is continuing. John's first day on the farm and already death runs to meet him. Can this murderous setup be solved in time to save John from being killed? We'll see in just a moment. When your youngsters track in mud, slush, or snow, just after you've cleaned the floor, you know it's exasperating. But when your floors are protected by Linux clear gloss varnish, presto, those wintertime puddles are whisked away in a hurry. That's because Linux clear gloss keeps dirt and water right on the surface. Linux Clear Gloss gives a beautiful finish, too. Its gleaming, transparent luster gives that lovely, sparkling, clean look every homemaker delights in. And how Linux Clear Gloss wears. It even resists damage by hot grease, boiling water, fruit acids, perfume, and alcohol, which makes it especially fine for tabletops as well as for linoleum and wood floors. Best of all, Linux Clear Gloss is brushed on so easily 
so smoothly that it's practically no work at all. And once it's applied, your home has that handsome, well-kept appearance for a long, long time. Ask for it at your dealers now. Linux, L-I-N-X, Linux Clear Gloss Varnish. You'll find all three great Linux home brightness and Chemtone, the miracle wall finish, at hardware, paint, and department stores everywhere. And now back to our story. As we left John, he was in a narrow lane, hemmed in on both sides with high barbed wire, trying to escape the mad rush of a bull charging down on him from the farm. It is now a few minutes later. Did the bull get you, John? No, I'm all right. I never saw such a pretty villa balding as you did over the top of that fence. I can't understand it. The bull couldn't break out of his pen. Somebody must have left the gate to the pen unlatched. Well, it doesn't matter now. No damage was done. I told you that bull would get away someday. Told you the pad locked the pen. But no, you men knew it all. What are you doing here, Lizzie? Get back to the house where you belong. Come down here to tell the young man he's got company. That she's found out for herself. Yes, I found him. Well, John, shall we go somewhere and talk? We won't be disturbed there. Nobody will bother us here, Nick. Good. Now, first, John, I got the permit to exhume your uncle's body. I brought the undertaker along to dig it up and take it back to town. Good. Second, I got hold of your Uncle Phil's shotgun, the one that killed him. I examined it pretty closely. Find anything interesting? I did. I found evidence that seems to bear out your feeling that his death may not have been the accident they claim it was. Well, this house reeks of alcohol, doesn't it? Yes, there's a barrel of the stuff in the cellar. For some reason, it smells up the whole place. Come in. Young man, you'll leave this farm tonight. Otherwise, you're going to get yourself killed. Killed? By whom? Maybe I don't know, and maybe I do. I seen the hand and the arm that pushed the bolt on the bullpen gate open. That bull was loose deliberate. Well, if you know who did it, you ought to speak up to prevent further tragedy. I only recognize the sleeve of the shirt. It was Tolomite. But they could have got their shirts mixed up, so I ain't saying. Now you heed what I tell you, young man. Get out and get quick. Huh. Well, she could have been more positive in her identification. I wonder how positive she really is. Maybe she doesn't know herself. Maybe. But I'm beginning to get an idea. You mean you can see an end to this riddle? No, but I think I begin to see where we're headed. And it's not pretty. Well, I've got work to do right now. I'll see you tonight, John. And in the meantime, be careful. Hello, Nick. I know I'm going to see you tonight, but since you've been gone, something's happened I think you ought to know. What's that, John? Both Adam and Paul have come to me secretly at different times, and each one has told me that he saw his brother unlatch the gate to the bull's pen. You mean they each accuse the other? Yes, Nick. Well, very interesting. Oh, by the way, John, an autopsy in your Uncle Frank's body shows arsenical poison in fatal quantities. No question but what it was murder. But who did it, Nick? Who did it? I suppose you get all three of the first cells in the big house at ten in the morning. I'll need until then to clean up the details. Tell them I found out something conclusive. But don't tell them what. May make one of them come through with a confession, maybe. All right, Nick. Ten in the morning. Right, John. And watch yourself tonight. I'm poisoned. Get me a doctor, quick. And then get Nick Carter at the hotel. You got that? Get a doctor. And then call Nick Carter. Seems as if you and Nick got here awful fast, Nancy. Well, when Nick's in a hurry, he doesn't waste any time getting places. You know what you were poisoned with, John? Yes, it was aconite, all right. I know that. I can't figure out how I got it. Your pulse is very low. We've got to make it pick up. Do you know how? Of course she does. Patsy's practically a full-fledged nurse. Well, it's lucky. 
There's nobody here on the farm I can trust. Here, drink this, John. It'll stimulate your heart. And you better walk up and down. Oh, say, uh, I just heard on the extension phone that John was poisoned. Is that true? It's true, all right. You only know what you heard on the phone? Why, sure. What else? How is he? We don't know yet. Oh, I'd rather take in the poison in my own stomach than he should get it. I never dreamed of any killing or knowed any was being done. Nick, will you get me? Evan! Adam, Adam, come quick! It's Paul! Eh? What? He's put poison, too! He's hardly breathing! Adam! Paul, too? Paul poisoned? Adam! Paul's dying! Uh, if you could let me have some of that stuff you're using for John, ma'am, I'll go tend to Paul. Well, of course. Here you are. Adam! Come in, Lizzie. Come in. Paul must have poisoned you and himself, John. That's the only answer. And that means Paul did all those other things, too. But I took nothing since dinner. That was much too long ago to have waited all this time to take effect. It isn't possible. I've eaten nothing and drunk nothing since 7 o'clock. It's 2.40 in the morning now. Then what in the world could I... If, if that's the doctor, Patsy, rush him to Paul. Okay. Paul must talk before he dies. He's got to clear this thing up. John, did you say you'd had nothing to eat or drink for the last seven or eight hours? That's right, Nick. The same as Aunt Mary's case, exactly. She was poisoned without knowing how it was done. So was I. The answer to one is the answer to both. And Paul's killing himself looks as if he were that answer. Although I can't figure out how he could have done it. Hmm. John, I'd like to have a look at your room. Feeling strong enough? Yeah, sure, Nick. Let's do it now. Nick, do you think that... Hey, Mac, get off that bed. Hey, Mac, come on. Mac! Well, that's funny. Usually... It's... Nick! He's dead. Don't touch him. Why not? Look, John. His head's on the pillow in the same place yours would be if you were in bed. Yes, Nick, but so what? You slept on that pillow and almost died. Mac sleeps there and does die. Doesn't that mean anything to you? No, I'm afraid not. What should it mean? Aconite was poured on the pillowcase before you went to bed. What? Remember, aconite is so powerful it can be absorbed through the skin. Particularly the thin, damp, mucous membrane of the lips. Well, that's right, Nick. A person sleeping on that pillow with aconite spilled on it had poisoned himself in a couple of hours. Because you were restless, you got up before the dose was fatal. But Mac, with his very bad habit of sleeping on your pillow and sleeping very soundly, slept there once too often. But Nick, why didn't I smell it? What does aconite smell like? Well, alcohol. Right. Oh, of course, the house reeks of alcohol. Naturally, I'd never smell it. That alcohol smell is part of the plot, John. But who, Nick? Who? Let's get everybody together and talk it over. Maybe that way we'll get along faster. So up to now, we've got this much settled. I found that the safety catch on the shotgun that killed Phil two years ago had been tampered with, so it is no good. Lizzie swears she saw Paul fooling around the gun just before the accident. An autopsy proved that Frank was killed by a mixture of arsenic and boron, which Lizzie and Adam both say Paul was trying out as a new spray for bean beetles. The bull was let out of his pen on purpose, unquestionably to kill John Ames. Lizzie says she recognized the torn sleeve of Paul's shirt on the arm she saw slip the latch. Adam agrees with her. Unfortunately, Paul died without saying anything, so we don't know his side of the story. But we do know he told John that Adam did it. I don't need to hear no more, Mr. Carter. I'm packing up and getting out of here now, tonight. I'll help you pack, Adam. I know where your things are. I ain't leaving you. You ain't a Purcell, Lizzie. It ain't fair to ask you to share my troubles. But I want to, Adam. I've always looked after you. You think I'm going to stop now? Lizzie, you're real kind, but... Can't allow it. I can take care of myself. Adam, if I were you, I wouldn't refuse Lizzie like that. Huh? She's in love with you. She ain't neither. Lizzie's an old maid. That's where you're wrong. And that's where everybody went wrong. Lizzie is in love with you. That's how all this came to happen. Oh, Nick, you aren't making any sense now. Yes, I am, Patsy. Lizzie hated Paul for not marrying her that time they were engaged. Now she's grown to love Adam, and she wanted him to have the farm because she thought that was what he wanted more than anything else in the world. So she tried to kill off the heirs, one after another, and throw the blame on Paul. But the safety catch on Phil's gun, the, the poison that killed Frank. Oh, John, any farm woman knows enough to do those things, and she killed your Aunt Mary the same way she tried to kill you. No trace of aconite was found on your aunt's pillow because Lizzie changed the pillowcase before calling for help. 
She'd have changed yours, too, if things had gone right. But she didn't have time. And every once in a while, she spilled a little alcohol out of the barrel in the cellar to keep the house smelling of it. But that's not proof, Nick. No, it isn't. But I'm willing to bet that if you look, you'll find she just changed Paul's pillowcase. And I don't doubt you'll find that pillowcase still smelling of aconite somewhere in the house where the first sales live. And that will be proof. You don't need to look. Of course, I done it. All of it. Just like you say. It was easy. You're all so dumb. Just like old men. Never thought a woman could do anything for you but cook and sew. <laughs> Letting the bull out of his pen. You couldn't have done that. Oh, couldn't I? Look at my hands. They look just like a man. I put one of Paul's shirts under my skirt when I went out to the barn and slipped it over my arm when I opened the bolt. Nobody knowed it was me. Even them as saw me do it didn't know. How did you know, Nick? Well, it had to be that way. There was no other answer that would fit all the facts as I gathered them in. The exact method used and the motive behind it were the things I had to find out before I could act. Lizzie almost beat me to it this last time. I didn't think she was ready to act so quickly. Gosh, Nick. I hate to think of having to turn her over to the police. Since I've been here, I've grown fond of Lizzie. You won't have to feel sorry for me, young man. I do things instead of talking about them. When you was John, I took the rest of the aconite in the bottle. Now, just leave me be. I'll die without no help from any of you. In just a moment, Nick and Patsy will bring you a preview of next week's exciting case. But first, a word to the ladies. Homemaking is an art. An art that brings genuine happiness to everyone who lives in a well-kept home, everyone who visits it. It's a real achievement to keep your home attractive. So it's worthwhile to know how much help the three great Linux home brighteners can give you. Linux cream polish, for instance, restores the original shining beauty of your fine furniture. Disposes of blurry fingerprints almost by magic. Gets rid of that cloudy film left by dust and old polish. Linux cream polish helps hide ugly scratches, too. Yet it takes only one quick application, because Linux cream polish actually cleans your furniture as it polishes, leaving it spick and span, bringing out the true beauty of the wood. What's more, Linux cream polish dries to a hard surface without oiliness to attract more dust. Ask your dealer for the modern furniture polish which cleans as it polishes, saving one whole step in your cleaning routine. Ask him for Linux cream polish for fine furniture. You will find all three great Linux home brighteners, Linux self-polishing wax, Linux clear gloss varnish, and Linux cream polish at your nearest hardware, paint, or department store. And now let's hear from Nick Carter himself. Well, Nick, what new and exciting adventure do you plan to tell us about next week? A scientist and inventor whose home was on the coast was found in his laboratory one morning with a bullet hole through his forehead. Much to my regret, because we were supposed to be vacationing up there, not capturing murderers. Well, I suppose murderers have to be captured no matter what happens. Yes, Ken. And this time I was intrigued by the killing, because the only clue that had any value was a piece of rope. A kind of rope that none of us had ever seen before. And there was a thunder shower at midnight, too, which helped to put the finger on the killer. Sounds interesting. Yes, I'll listen. What's the title of your story? I call it Crime at Cold Harbor. Or the Mystery of the Murdered Scientist. And that's all for now. Details next week. So long. So long, everybody. And so long to both of you. We'll be expecting to hear from you again next week as usual. <laughs> Next week at this same time, listen to another curious experience of Nick Carter, Master Detective, entitled... Crime at Cold Harbor. Or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Murdered Scientist. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is featured in Street and Smith magazine. Lon Clark is starred as Nick with Helen Schultz as Patsy. Original music is played by Lou White. And the programs are written and directed by Jock McGregor. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented at this time and over these same stations each week by the three great Linux home brighteners. Linux clear gloss varnish, Linux cream polish, and Linux self-polishing wax, created by Acme, America's great producer of Acme fine quality paints. 
This is Ken Powell speaking for the thousands of Linux dealers all over America and saying so long until next week. This is Mutual. It's another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective, presented by the three great Linux home brighteners Linux clear gloss varnish, Linux cream polish, and Linux self polishing wax. Created by Acme, America's great producer of fine Acme quality paints. <laughs> Today's curious adventure, Mind Over Murder, on Nick Carter and the mystery of the missing John Doe. In just a moment, we'll hear how Nick Carter found out who John Doe really was and who was behind the murders of the two men John Doe thought he had killed. But first, here's a tip for good homekeeping. Millions of American homemakers have discovered how Chemtone, the miracle wall finish, keeps their walls fresh and lovely. Now they're discovering how the three great Linux home brighteners bring sparkling cleanliness to furniture, woodwork, and walls. Linux clear gloss varnish gives lustrous, longer-lasting protection to every wood and linoleum surface. Linux cream polish renews the sleek, gleaming beauty of fine furniture. And Linux self-polishing wax lends rich, satiny loveliness to any floor, wood, linoleum, or tile. Take the modern shortcut to new home beauty with the three great Linux home brighteners. You'll find them all at your hardware, paint, or department store. Your headquarters also for Chemtone, the miracle wall finish. And now for today's mysterious adventure with Nick Carter. Today's story starts in Nick's office as Nick and Patsy are interviewing a stranger, a young man who has just called to consult Nick. Well, how did you happen to come here? Well, I asked a policeman where I could find a good detective, and he gave me your name. Suppose you tell us what's bothering you. Well, three mornings ago, I woke up in a strange bed in a strange apartment. Until the young lady whose apartment it was told me, I had no idea where I was. Well, judging by the bandage around your head, you must have had an accident. Was that before or after you woke up in this strange bed? It must have been before. I don't remember anything about it. The girl whose apartment it was told me she found me on the steps of her apartment house last Friday night. Or rather, Saturday morning as she returned from a party. Well, she saw I was injured, so she managed to get me up to her place and called her doctor. Well, he said my injury wasn't serious, but I had to be quiet for a few days. So she let me stay there for the night. But the next morning, even though I was able to answer her questions, I, I knew nothing about myself. I had to tell her something, so I invented a name, and I told her some story about uh, being from out of town, having had a bad fall, and so on. What name did you give him? John Powell. That name doesn't mean anything to you? No, I just picked it out of the air. What makes you think you may be a criminal? This. Look. <gasps> Good grief, Nick. Look at all that money. Yes. There's over $10,000 there. And look at this. Oh. Well, a diamond lavalier. One like that, even though it's pretty old-fashioned, must be worth at least five or six thousand. And those diamond eardrops are pretty special, too. Did you find anything in your pockets that might help you establish your identity? No. The suit I was wearing the night she found me was bloodstained, so I bought this suit and hat this morning at a small store I passed. I left the other suit at the cleaners, but uh, I went over it thoroughly first. All I found was this. A calling card. Warren McAllister. No address or anything. Does this mean anything to you? Not a thing. I looked in the telephone book and found there is a Warren McAllister on East 81st Street. I thought maybe I was he, so I called up and asked for him, but whoever answered said Mr. McAllister was just leaving for the country and couldn't come to the phone. What do you want me to do? Find out who I am, if you can, and especially find out whether or not I'm a criminal. Come on, Nick, we've got nothing better to do. Why don't you help him out? All right. First, what's the girl's name and address? Her name is Laura David. She lives at 7684 Windsor Road. And what about the doctor? Well, Miss David called him Dr. Bourne. That's all I know about him. And why'd you leave your other suit to be cleaned? Here's the claim check for it. I I'm sure he won't find anything. You never can tell. Where are you going to be? I don't know, but I'll let you know as soon as I get settled. Very well, Mr. Powell. Meanwhile, Patsy and I'll start by calling on Miss Laura David. <laughs> Apartment 
3D, David. Well, he told us the truth about this, anyway. Well, in. Well, Riley, what are you doing here? I was just going to ask you that. What do you know about her? About who? The dame who rents this apartment, wise guy. We never even heard of her until half an hour ago, Lieutenant. Oh, you don't say. You just dropped in to pass the time of day, I suppose. We came to see her about a client of ours. Hey, look here, Riley. What's this all about? And why are you here? Right now I am asking the questions. What's the name of this client of yours? He told us his name was John Powell. And what did he want you to do for him? He wanted us to find out who he is. He has amnesia from a sock on the head. Oh, so that's what that note meant. Well, what note's that, Riley? Uh, we found it on the table here. The hundred dollar bill pinned to it. Yeah, it is. Dear Miss David, thanks for all you've done. I can impose on your hospitality no longer. Please reimburse both the doctor and yourself for any expense you've been put to on my account. Gratefully yours, John Powell. Well, doesn't say much. The David girl will tell us what it means once we start working on it. Why, where is she? In the jug. A cop on the beat found her trying to hide a gun in an ash can on her way to work this morning. He brought her and the gun down to headquarters. She claims she found it on her steps last Friday night and was trying to get rid of it. Maybe she's telling the truth, Riley. People do that, you know. Uh, Anything wrong with the gun? Plenty. In the first place, it was a Swedish gun, a Bofors thirty-two caliber. Now, you just don't find them on your doorstep. In the second place, we checked it and found it was the gun used to knock off a stiff who was killed near the waterfront last Friday night. Oh, is that so? So you better kick in with what you know about this so-called client of yours. Well, I'd be glad to let you talk with him, Riley, but I don't know where to find him. For the love of... You got a client and you don't know where to find him? Just as soon as he gets in touch with us, we'll let you know. In the meantime, how about letting us talk to the David girl? Sure, sure. Anything I can do for you, Mr. Carter, will be a pleasure. Even though you won't do nothing for me. Come on. Well, Patsy, we certainly didn't get much out of that David girl. No, she just told us the same thing she told Riley. Oh, yes, uh, please. We want to see the suit this check calls for. Oh, oh, yes, sure, for just a moment. I'll get it for you. I ain't sent it out yet. I uh, knew that stuff on it was blood. Uh, said he had an accident, if it is. Thanks. Oh. Oh. Pockets all empty. Mm -hmm. Just as he said they were. No labels. It... Uh-oh. Look here, Patsy. A hole right through pocket, lining cloth, and everything. Mm, smells of powder, too, Nick. Yes. He fired the gun right through the pocket. Didn't have time to draw it. Nick, is, is this part of the lining of the jacket, or is it something in the lining? Let me see. Yeah. Feels like something in the lining, I should say. Yes. There's a hole in the pocket here. Just a second. Ah, here it is. But what is it, Nick? It's one of these small labels you paste on your baggage showing the ship you sailed on. Oh. This one came from the Abercrombie. Well, does that help? It may. We'll find out later. Well, that's all we can do here. Now let's call on Mr. McAllister. Lieutenant is expecting you in the library. Hey, Nick, what did you... Hold it, Patsy. We'll find out fast enough. Well, what took you so long, Nick? You get a flat tire, maybe? Thanks for the welcome, Riley. Hey, what's going on here? As if you didn't know. But I don't. Well, Riley, what is it? Uh-oh. Look there, Nick. Is that McAllister? Yes, it's McAllister. And dead as a doornail. And don't tell me you don't know nothing about it, because I wouldn't believe it. Well, so McAllister is dead, too. How is this going to affect Nick's efforts to learn who John Powell really is? Or does John Powell know more about this than he's told Nick? We'll see in just a moment. Folks have a habit of forgetting to use the doormat, whether they come home through winter snow and spring rain or from summertime swimming pools. And the water they track in certainly spoils the appearance of shining, freshly clean floors. But those floors look spick and span again in a twinkling when you keep them protected with Linux clear gloss varnish because it keeps both dirt and water right there on the surface where they're easy to whisk away. That same protective finish gives sparkling beauty to woodwork and furniture as well, for Linux clear gloss has a gleaming, transparent luster that provides a background of distinction for all your household things. And how Linux clear gloss wears. It resists damage by hot grease, boiling water, fruit acids, perfume, even alcohol, 
which means it's as fine for use on tabletops as for wood floors and linoleum. What's more, Linex clear gloss varnish is so easy, so smooth to brush on that it's no job at all. And once applied, it gives your home the handsome, well-kept appearance in which you take such pride. So ask your dealer now for Linex, L-I-N-X, Linex clear gloss varnish. You'll find all three great Linex home brighteners and Chemtone, the miracle wall finish, at hardware, paint, and department stores everywhere. And now back to our story. We left Nick and Patsy facing an angry Lieutenant Riley who was accusing them of knowing more about the murder of Mr. McAllister than they pretended. Yes, it's McAllister and dead as a doornail. And don't tell me you don't know nothing about it because I wouldn't believe it. But we don't, Lieutenant, honest. Of course we don't. Now, what happened, Riley? He was just about to learn the details when you drove up. So we waited for you to join us. Well, thank you, Riley. I knew I could count on you to do the right thing. What? Why Watch you... your blood pressure, Lieutenant. I ought to throw you both in the clink for 99 years. All right, all right. Now, how about finding out what happened to McAllister? All right, all right. Now, you. You, chauffeur. Uh, yes, sir. What's your name? Barry, sir. All right, Barry. Tell us what you know about this. And don't leave nothing out. Well, I was driving Mr. McAllister home from the bank, and I stopped in front of the house, same as always. I was just going to get out and open the door for him when a man came up to me with a gun in his hand. He told me to keep my hands on the wheel and to look straight ahead, not to pay any attention to what I heard. Go on. What happened then? Well, I heard the car door open behind me. Mr. McAllister started to say something, and then I heard a shot. Then I heard a man say, come on, Mike, and they ran up the street. I turned around, saw Mr. McAllister slumped down in the back seat and two men running toward a car. Where was this other car? In the middle of the block on the other side of the street. The men got in and it drove off. You got any idea who them men were, what they was after? Oh, no, sir. All right, Barry. It's all for you for now. But don't go away. We may want you again in a few minutes. Oh, sure, Lieutenant. I'll stick around. Now, you. What's your name? Well, what do you know about this? Uh, the name is Stovell, Lieutenant. I'm, uh, I was Mr. McAllister's butler, sir. Oh, just a moment. Stover, did a man named John Powell call here today? Uh, yes, sir, he did. Uh, just as Mr. McAllister was leaving, sir. Uh, but Mr. McAllister said he didn't know anyone by that name, so he didn't speak to him. Did you recognize the voice? Uh, no, sir. But I'm almost sure it was the same person who called about an hour ago and asked if Mr. McAllister had returned yet. I told him I expected him in about half an hour. I asked him his name, sir, but he hung up. So, Mr. Detective Carter, this guy Powell didn't just happen to call you two up and tell you he knocked off this guy, too, now, did he? He couldn't have called us, Lieutenant. We haven't been back to the office since we left you. Then how did you happen to show up here just when you did, then? We found McAllister's card in Powell's wallet. That's right, Lieutenant. Powell asked us to see if McAllister knew anything about him, who he might really be. I'd sure like to get a look at this client of yours. He seems to have a finger in every murder that goes on around here. You wouldn't let me just take a little peek at him, would you, Nick? Just for the sake of our long and lovely friendship. Riley, I mean it. I haven't the... Hey, yeah, yeah, what's going on? Nick, there goes McAllister's show. I told that guy to stick around here. Uh, he'll be right back, sir. He's just taking the car around to the garage on the next avenue, the same as he always does when it's not being used. But we got to go over that car for fingerprints as soon as my men get here. I'll go get him. I'll have him back here before you can say John Jorgett, Michael Riley. Stover. What do you know about that chauffeur, Barry? Why, not much, sir. He came to work here about three months ago. But Mr. McAllister hired him himself. Did you see any part of what happened when Mr. McAllister was shot? Uh, just the end, sir. I heard the car drive up and I went to open the door. Just as I did, I heard a shot and saw the two men start toward the other car. And Barry was sitting in the front seat, the way he said? Yes, sir. He was sitting there with his hands on the wheel. As soon as the men started running, he called me. And I went to see how badly Mr. McAllister was hurt. I see. Oh, by the way, Stover, do you happen to know where the chauffeur Barry lives? I think he has a room over in the next avenue, sir. Uh, number 7612, I believe it is. Uh, it's over a bakery. Thank you. Well, Patsy, I think that's all for us here. Where to now, Nick? I think we'll take a trip down to the waterfront. I want to call on the purser of the Abercrombie. Uh, did you say the Abercrombie, sir? Why, yes. Why? It's probably only a coincidence, sir, but Mr. McAllister was very much worried last Friday night because a man he was expecting on the Abercrombie failed to show up. Is that so? Who was this chap who didn't show up? I don't know, sir. Uh, Mr. McAllister was looking forward to seeing him. He was bringing him something important, I believe. He sent his car down to the pier to meet him, but Barry reported that he wasn't on the boat. Was Mr. McAllister interested in anything besides his bank? Oh, yes, sir. 
He was the head of several committees which were acting against enemy propaganda in this country. Combating enemy propaganda, huh? Oh, this thing is beginning to make sense, Patsy. Now I'm more anxious than ever to talk to the purser of the Abercrombie. Will you tell the purser I'd like to see him, please? This doesn't look like an American ship, Nick, even though it is named the Abercrombie. It isn't, Patsy. It was originally the Prince Knut, a Danish vessel. It was oh. taken over by the English when Hitler rolled over Denmark. Now it sails for Sweden, I believe. And you think that the label we found in John Powell's clothes may mean that he came in on this boat? I hope so, Patsy. And there's another thing makes me think that may be true. The gun that Miss David found, the one that Powell must have dropped in the steps of her apartment house, was a Swedish gun, remember? Yes. A Bofors, 32. Mr. Carter, you want to talk to me, yes? Yes. Was there a passenger on your boat this last trip by the name of John Powell? John Powell? Uh, no, we have only three young gentlemen traveling alone. I remember well uh, one Swedish-American, Mr. Lars Jostrom from Michigan, one Norwegian, Mr. Harbison, and the young South American, Mr. Richard Vallon. Richard Vallon, huh? It doesn't sound much like Powell, Nick. You are from the police, maybe? Well, yes, in a way. Why? Uh, then I think maybe this Mr. Vallon could be the one you are looking for. We had trouble with him on the way. What kind of trouble? Oh, it was not serious. Just uh, his room steward report to me that he was armed, that he had seen pistol on his dresser. So I call on him and ask him to give me pistol for the trip. It is a rules, you know. Yes, I understand. But he did not want to give it to me. He talked about it for a long time... Then at last he gave it to me, and I put it in safe. And then we dock, I give it back to him. Very interesting. Did you notice the make of it? Oh, yes. It was Bofus, 32 caliber. The Bofus, 32. Could you describe this Richard Vallon for me? Hey, he was a young man, slender, good-looking, a blonde hair, about my size. That's Powell, all right, Nick. Oh, Purser, did you happen to notice if a car met him at the dock? But yes, when he leaves the boat. He gets into big black limousine... They start away, and then about the block from the dock, the car stopped again. It was too dark to see what was happening. I think maybe there was trouble with the engine because I hear a backfire, and then the car go on again. But that was the same place where police find dead man next morning. Nick, it all adds up, doesn't it? Yes, Patsy, I think it does. Well, thanks for your trouble, Purser. Oh, it's no trouble, thank you. Patsy, I think we'll have a look at this room where Mr. McAllister's chauffeur lives. Do you expect to find Barry here, Nick? I rather hope not. I'd like to get a look at his room without his knowing it. Oh. Are you looking for someone? Yes. We have an appointment with Barry, Mr. McAllister's chauffeur. He told us to come here and wait for him. Said you'd unlock his door so we could wait inside. I don't unlock no rumor's door for no strangers. Oh, yes, you do. See this? Uh, oh, sure, sure. Sure, I'll open it for you. Don't have to act like that about it, though. Go ahead, open up. Is it on this floor? Yeah, right over here. There you are. Hurry up, will you? Well, sit down inside here where I can see you. Okay. That's it. All right, Patsy, shut the door. Okay. Now, let's see what we can find here. Hey, look. Hurry up, will you? I got work to do. I can't sit here forever. You'll sit there till we finish this search. Nick, uh... what do you suppose is in this little can? I can't open it. Huh? Hey, Patsy, let me have that. Yes, mm -hmm. Yes, the cover is on pretty tight. Well, that's movie film, isn't it? Certainly is. Now, let's see. Oh, boy, look at that. Well, what is it, Nick? Looks like pictures of German atrocities and destruction in some of the conquered countries. Oh. Oh, these are brutal. Where did you find this, Patsy? In the bottom drawer, wrapped up in some long underwear. There's a briefcase there, too. Briefcase? Let me see it. Here it is. That's it, all right. Come on, Patsy. No, but Nick... No time to lose. We're going to take this stuff down to Riley to be turned over to the FBI. They'll be very happy to get it. Maybe they would, but they ain't gonna... Barry! Now, Carter, take a look at this gun of mine and then hand over the film and the briefcase. I'll take care of them myself. Barry, I'd like to make a deal with you. Yeah? What kind of a deal? I want... <laughs> Excuse me, do you mind if I get my handkerchief? Never mind the funny business. Give me the stuff you found here. Very well. 
Here. May I get my handkerchief? All right, but I'm watching you, so don't try anything. I don't carry any guns in my breast pocket. I just... Just want my handkerchief. There. Hey, what was that? Why, you... you... All right, Patsy, you can stop holding your breath now. We get out of here fast. Find a cop and bring him up to quick. Right, Nick. Gee, I'm glad I realized what you were doing in time, so I didn't get knocked out, too. That little flask of quick-acting knockout gas comes in handy sometimes. Now, my unconscious friend, I'll just collect the film and the briefcase and turn them over to Riley to be forwarded to the FBI. They'll be glad to get evidence like this. Barry was only working for McAllister so he could keep an eye on him, huh? Yes, Riley. McAllister was very active in combating enemy propaganda. And Barry was on the other side. Mm -hmm. I believe that as soon as he, Barry, found out the names of the men McAllister was working with, he had him killed. Well, with the pictures and other data in that briefcase, the FBI should be able to make short work of the whole crew. Uh, Lieutenant Riley, homicide speaking. Oh, sure, sure, Senator Bratton. Something interesting, Riley? It could be. Well, Schultz... I was on my beach tonight when a big car goes around the corner fast and the guy falls out. Lands with his head up against one of the L-pillars, out cold. I got an ambulance and took him to the hospital. Well? Well, I, I found these things on him, Lieutenant. That's why I come direct to you. Oh. Nick, Paul's lavalier and eardrop. Yes. And that's McAllister's card and all the money. You mean that guy could be John Powell? Certainly could be, Riley. So he wasn't no crook, eh? Well, this sure looks like it. Well, I'm sure he wasn't, Riley. I am going to the hospital and have a look at that guy. You want to come? Right you are. Grab your hatchet, Patsy, and let's get going. Oh, it's wonderful, Nick. When you ride with the police department, you don't have to watch out for traffic or red lights or anything. That's more. You save gas when you don't use your own car. That's right. mighty important. Calling Lieutenant Riley. Headquarters yeah. calling Lieutenant uh, that, Riley. That calls for me. Hold everything. Schultz. Schultz, this is Lieutenant Riley. Go ahead. We just got a call from the guy we took to the hospital last night, Lieutenant. He says he saw a car used by McAllister's killers. Says car license is KX56-7D. I checked that number and it belongs to Gussie Lang. Gussie Lang? Schultz, send out some men at once and pick up Gussie and his gang and bring him in and hold him for questioning. Get going, fast. That's all. Right, Lieutenant. You take care of him fast enough. Well, step on his race. What's holding you back? So, Paul, you actually saw McAllister killed last night. Yes, plain as I see you now. I was waiting for him to come home in the hopes that he could identify me. When the killers started off, I jumped on the rear bumper of their car, but when they went around a corner, I got thrown off. Hit something, I guess. You hit your head on an L pillar. Best cure in the world for amnesia. Practically never fails, Mr. Vallon. Vallon? How'd you know my name? I only knew it myself a few minutes ago. We find out things. Now, suppose you tell us what happened when you landed off the Abercrombie last Friday night. That is, if you can remember now. I remember, all right. I got off the boat, and McAllister's chauffeur met me. We drove a block or so from the dock, and he stopped. Two men opened the car door and started to get in. I saw they had guns, so I fired at one of them. Then something hit me on the head, and that's the last I knew. Now, look here, Powell or Valen or whatever your name is. Where'd you get all that money we found on you? Them sparklers. They don't look honest to me. The jewels belong to my great-aunt Miriam. I took them across to have them recut in Amsterdam. Then the Germans took Amsterdam, so I had to bring them back. Mm. The money belonged to a refugee I met who asked me to deposit to my account until he could get over here. Mm -hmm. But I still don't see why those men tried to hold me up. Nobody knew I had the jewels with me. It wasn't the jewels they wanted, Valen. It was a roll of film on the envelope of documents you had in your briefcase. Were they important? Where did you get them? Well, a friend of my father's gave them to me, asked me to give them to Mr. McAllister when I got over here. But what were they, Mr. Carter? The film showed Nazi atrocities in conquered countries. The documents were pictures, descriptions, and names of active workers in anti-American activities here in this country. McAllister's chauffeur, Barry, was one of the head workers... When you prevented those men from getting what they wanted, Barry dumped you out of the car and took the film and the papers to his room to hold until he could dispose of them safely. 
But we got there first. Well, Lieutenant, are you satisfied that Mr. Powell, or I should say Mr. Vallon, is innocent? Mm, yeah, yeah, I guess so. Oh, come on, Riley, cheer up. You've got the film and the anti-American data, you've got McAllister's murderers, yeah. and you're going to get all the credit for solving the case. Huh? What more do you want? <laughs> In just a moment, Nick and Patsy will bring you a preview of next week's exciting case. But before they do, think this over. The more homelike the place you live in, the more fun you have inviting folks to share your hospitality. And these days, every home can look its shining best with very little effort when you depend on the three great Linux home brighteners. Take Linux cream polish, for instance. In one quick, easy application, it reveals your fine furniture in all its original gleaming beauty, renews the appearance of the wood, Freeze it from the dull cloudiness of dust, old polish, and finger marks. You see, Linux cream polish actually cleans as it polishes, cutting your job in half, saving one whole step. And when you're through, you'll find that Linux cream polish has left no oiliness on the surface of your furniture. It dries hard, bright, and dustless. Yes, in every way, Linux cream polish for fine furniture is the modern shortcut to furniture loveliness. Be sure to ask your dealer for it by name. Linux cream polish for fine furniture, which cleans as it polishes. You'll find all three great Linux home brighteners, Linux self-polishing wax, Linux clear gloss varnish, and Linux cream polish at your nearest hardware, paint, or department store. And now let's hear from Nick Carter himself. Well, Nick, how about a peek into next week's story? Got a few hints for us? Well, next week's story, Ken, is about one of the wildest and most exciting nights Patsy and I ever spent. I should say it was. What happened, Nick? Four rich old Tories during the Revolution buried all their valuables in a small rocky island. Their heirs had found a clue to the burial place of the treasure and called me in to solve the clue which was in code. But they didn't figure on the one man who wanted it all for himself and who was willing to kill to be sure he got it. What do you call the story, Nick? It's called Four Rings of Death. Or the Mystery of the Tory Island Murders. I hope you'll be with us next week. So long for now. So long to all of you. See you soon. And so long to both of you, Nick and Patsy. We'll be here waiting for you next week. Next week at this same time, listen to another curious experience of Nick Carter, Master Detective, entitled Four Rings of Death. Or Nick Carter and the mystery of the Tory Island murders. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is featured in Street and Smith magazines. Lon Clark is starred as Nick with Helen Choate as Patsy. Original music is played by Lou White, and the programs are written and directed by Jock McGregor. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented at this time and over these same stations each week by the three great Linux home brighteners. Linux Clear Gloss Varnish, Linux Cream Polish, and Linux Self-Polishing Wax, created by Acme, America's great producer of Acme fine quality paints. This is Ken Powell speaking for the thousands of Linux dealers all over America and saying so long until next week. This is Mutual. <laughs> case for that most famous of all Manhattan's, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective, presented by the three great Linux home brighteners, Linux clear gloss varnish, Linux cream polish, and Linux self-polishing wax, created by Acme, America's great producer of fine Acme quality paint. <laughs> Today's curious adventure, Four Rings of Death, or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Tory Island. In just a moment, we'll hear how Nick Carter solved the mystery of the Four Rings. 
But first, do you realize that millions of homes are now brighter, more beautiful than ever because so many American homemakers have come to depend on Chemtone, the miracle wall finish. Now they're discovering the way to new beauty for woodwork, furniture, and floors with the three great Linux home brighteners. Linux self-polishing wax, which beautifies your floors with a satiny yet tough anti-skid finish that resists wear, water, and dirt. Linux cream polish, which cleans as it polishes, leaving no oily film on your furniture. And Linux clear gloss varnish, the durable super varnish that dries to an elastic, transparent surface which protects all wood and linoleum in your home. You'll find the three great Linux home brighteners at your hardware, paint, or department store. Your headquarters also for Chemtone, the miracle wall finish. And now for today's mysterious adventure with Nick Carter. As our story opens, we find Nick and Patsy on board a small motorboat headed for Torrey Island, a small island just off the Long Island shore. If I'd known the weather was going to be like this, I never would have accepted this job. Why are you doing it, Nick? Oh, special favor to Colonel Howard. A friend of his, Andrew Jessup, asked him to find the best code expert he knew. And he said I was the man for the job. So when the colonel called me, I agreed to do it. Just what is it you're going to do? Well, it seems that back in 1776, four wealthy Tories who were afraid that Washington was going to capture Manhattan Island got all their valuables together and went to this little island where we're going now. Uh-huh. They buried everything somewhere on the island and recorded the burial place in a secret code or cipher. They lived there for a while, and later were all lost in a storm while trying to get back to the mainland. That sounds pretty fantastic, Nick. Is there any real truth in it? His lawyer, Andrew Jessup, recently came across something that convinced him the story's true. So he rounded up the heirs of the four original Tories and arranged for them to meet on the island this afternoon. If I can decipher the code, they'll dig up the treasure and divide it. It's a some night to dig up anything, I'd say. Oh, gosh, Nick, I wish you hadn't let that boat leave us here like this. This is the loneliest looking island I ever saw. Especially on a nasty night like this. It's all right, Betsy. We'll go back with Jessup when he goes. Okay, you're the boss. Ah, that must be the house up there. Uh-huh. Oh, my God. Nick, listen. Yes, I hear it. Wait here, Patsy, in the dock. I want to see what's wrong. Hey, you! There you are! Get your hands up! Stop, I said! Oh, got away. Well, here, let me help you out. My dead. Murdered. Nick! Nick, what is it? How I'm okay, it? Patsy. This man isn't. He stopped a bullet with his head. Who is it, Nick? I don't know. Let's see if he's any identification on him. Ah, here we are. Cyrus J. Trial. Why, that's one of the heirs, Patsy. I remember the name. One of the heirs? Yes. Nick, what's that shining in the mud at your hmm? Where? Right there. Oh, yes. Why, it's a napkin ring. A napkin ring? Out here? What in the world? I don't know, Patsy. But let's get this man's body up to the house. They may know what it's all about. What in heaven's name? Are you Jessup? Yes. Who are you? Nick Carter. Oh, come in, come in. Do you know this man? Great heavens, that's file. Put him down here. What happened? Well, I heard him call out. And then I heard a shot. I found him dead. Are all your people here with you? Why, yes. Fire was here a few minutes ago, but discovered he'd left his glasses on my boat and went down to get them. Anyone else on the island? Only Matt O'Dell, the caretaker for the fishing company that owns the island. We're expecting Peter Brady, the personal representative of the owner, to arrive shortly, but he hasn't come yet. Well, where are the others? In the living room. You're sure Fire was murdered? You don't get a shot through the head the way he was accidentally. You ever see this ring before? That file ring. It's his part of the clue to the treasure. How could a napkin ring be a clue to a treasure? I can't tell you that. I simply know that each of the four heirs has a napkin ring like this. And that the four rings together give the key to the hiding place of the treasure. Ah. And it's possible that whoever killed this man wanted to get hold of the ring for himself. Oh, who'd want to do that? Where did this Matt Odell stay? He has a shack just below here where he lives. Why? I think I'll have a talk with him. I'll be right back. Now, this must be Odell's shack. The only one around here. Oh, 
I'm out here. I think it's stay home on a night like this. Well, no one's... Who's there? That... Oh. Oh, fine way to start on a case. Now, who the deuce would want to... Carter! Carter! Over here. What's up? Hey, what happened to you? I don't quite know. Except that somebody knocked me cold when I was looking for Odell. Did you see anybody? No. Did you? No. I came down here to tell you that Odell's at the house. Came in just after you left. I thought you might be searching for him. How long I... after I left did Odell show up? Why, about five minutes, I should say. I want to talk to that man. I think... Hey, wait a minute. The ring. Files napkin ring. What about it? It's gone. I had it in my pocket when I came down here, but it's gone now. So that's what your assailant was after. Well, it looks that way. Well, let's be getting back. Fine business. One of the rings missing before we can... Hey, hold on. There's a hole in my coat pocket. Maybe I... There, there, there it is. I just caught the glitter of it in a flashlight. Oh, you're right. That's it. And the murderer has missed again. Hello there. Is that you, Jensen? Yes, who is it? Nick Brady. Oh, hello, Brady. This is Nick Carter. Well, how going do you? to solve the cipher for us. You hope. Well, the way things are going now, there may be no cipher left to solve. Well, let's get back to the house. I want to talk to Odell. Well, Carter, did you learn anything from Odell? No. But I'm pretty sure now he had nothing to do with what's been going on here. You mean he wasn't the one who hit you? No. I'm quite sure he knows nothing about that or about Files' death. Oh, by the way, Carter, I want you to meet the other three heirs. This is Cecil Whittemore. How do you do, Mr. Carter? This is George Oldman. How are you, Mr. Carter? And that's Kurt Sturdivant for the fireplace. How, How do you do, do gentlemen? I understand that no one of you men said anything to anybody about the search for the treasure you expected to make here tonight. Yeah, I didn't for one. Did Brady know what this is all about, Jessup? Oh, yes. We had to tell the owners of the island what we intended to do here. And did you mention it to anyone, Brady? No, certainly not. That is, except for a chap who used to work here on the island as Odell's assistant. You mean Charlie Bainbridge? Yes, I thought he might be interested having worked here. Ah, there's the man, Carter. He worked here on the island up until about six months ago. He was a fanatic on the subject of the Cory treasure. Hunted for it every spare moment he had. He got so he felt the treasure was his because he spent so much time looking for it. You think he'd be crazy enough to come out here and start a private war to get hold of it? He might. He's practically cracked on the subject. All right, we'll see. But first, where are the other napkin rings? Each man has his own ring, Carter. Right, I have mine. And there's no doubt at all, but the treasure is still here on the island? This island hasn't been tenanted for nearly a hundred years, except for the caretakers. It's used as a tie-up and stopover for the boats working for the fishing company who owns it. Brady can tell you that. Well, that's right, Miss Carter. There's every reason to believe the stuff is right where the original owners buried it. How much is it worth? Any idea? Oh, something over two millions, as far as I can gather. Gosh, if it's worth all that, how come the whole island hasn't been dug up before this? That's a lot of money. The whole island's practically one big rock, and without some idea of where to look, it to be an impossible job. I see. Well, whether the killer is Charlie Vane or someone else, he's probably on this island right now. First thing to do is to see that he doesn't get off the island. Then we can catch him. Sounds logical. How can we do it? Odell. Yes, sir. Will you come in here, please? Yes. What do you want? I want you to go down to the dock and take the spark plugs out of each of the company boats. Then no one can use them. Yes, sir. Jessup, you and Brady do the same with the boats you came in. All right. Come on, Brady. Right. I'm going to make a tour of the island to be sure there are no other boats here. And we can sit tight until morning and catch whoever's behind us. I'll go with you, Nick. It's a nasty night outside, Patsy. It's very dangerous. I don't care. I'll feel safer where you are than I would anywhere else. So let's go. Yes. And no arguments. <laughs> Well, there's the house, Patsy, right up there. Uh-huh. We've been almost around the island, and we haven't found a trace of another boat. Maybe... Wait. Huh? Aha! Look here, Patsy. On this rock. Could have been a boat drawn up here recently. Right. That's the only possible explanation of those scrape marks and the barnacles there. But since there's no boat here now, the killer may have left the island already. I certainly hope so. I've had enough for one night. If he got drowned in the... No! No! What's happened now? 
A killer loose on the island on a black stormy night promised more trouble. And that scream sounded as if the promise has been fulfilled. How is Nick going to find the murderer of one and possibly two men before he does any more killing? And what's the riddle of the old Tory treasure? We'll see in just a moment. Whatever your family's preference may be in home decoration, your home is bound to be more beautiful when its floors are well kept and shining. And with Linux self-polishing wax, floors always look their very best without tiresome rubbing or polishing. Yes, with Linux self-polishing wax, which is simply wiped on, your floors are handsome for a long time because Linux self-polishing wax dries to a rich, satiny, long-lasting finish that really wears thanks to its high content of genuine Carnauba wax. And the finish may be renewed wherever you like without re-waxing the whole floor. What's more, Linux self-polishing wax is easy to keep lovely for you whisk surface dirt away in a twinkling with a damp cloth. And Linux self-polishing wax is the anti-skid floor finish for the underwriter's laboratories have proved by test that wood, linoleum, and rubber tile floors are actually less slippery after Linux self-polishing wax has been applied. Be sure to ask for Linux, L-I-N-X. Linux self-polishing wax. You'll find all three great Linux home brighteners and Kentone, the miracle wall finish, at hardware, paint, and department stores everywhere. And now back to our story. We left Nick and Patsy on the beach near the house hunting for the mysterious killer. Suddenly... No! No! Come on, come on. That came from the house. Is that you, Carter? Yes. You hear that scream, Jacob? Yes, I was just leaving my bowl tonight. Here, help. He fell off the roof. Coming, Brady. He's dead. He landed on his head. Yes, he's dead, all right. By Gertibus. Gertibus dead, too. What's going on here? Carter, no, quiet, 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 everybody. How can we find out what happened? We always better talk at once. Uh, quiet, please. Now, Brady. What do you know about this? I was just coming back from my boat when I heard a scream. I looked up and silhouetted against the sky were two men on the roof. One of them pushed the other over the edge and screamed again as he fell. It was awful. Did you see anything else? I was looking at the body when I heard the back door slam. Then it sounded as if somebody ran off through the brush. Well, why didn't you go after him? I chased him after a murderer in the dark, unarmed. Do you think I'm crazy? I don't know. Wait a moment. What do you know about servant at death? Why, we, uh, Sturdivant Ullman and I, are waiting in the living room for you and Jessup and Brady to come back. Sturdivant got the bright idea that he'd go up to the roof and see if he could see anything. A little later, we heard him yell, and we started up the stairs to see what was wrong. Did you hear anything after he was killed? Why, we, we thought we heard someone dash down, down the back stairs and out the back door. Well, you better get Sturdivant's body inside. I'm going to have a look at the roof, see what I can find there. Come on, Patsy. Right with you, Nick. <coughs> Anything useful, Carter? No tracks in the ground outside that mean anything. The ground's too cut up. There's a sort of stone platform, though, up there in the roof that the Tories must have used as a lookout platform. The faint marks of two men up there. But still not good enough to help us any. There's no question, though, that Stevenant was thrown from there. Well, what do we do now? If we had more guns, that suggests we all get out and try to find whoever's doing this killing. But with only one gun, mine is hopeless. Nick, are you going to try to solve the cipher? I'm afraid we can't, Patsy. But the killer got away with Sturdivant's ring. No, no, he didn't. Sturdivant gave it to me to keep for him. Oh, well, we still have all four rings. Our murdering friend is having all this trouble for nothing. Then let's get started. All right, let me have the rings. Here are, Carter. All four of them. Good. Now, let's see. Mm-hmm. Each of these rings has a different inscription. Here's me, dear. Mind if I go back and eat my supper? I ain't had time to eat yet, ma'am. Getting a mite hungry. No, no, Adele. Go right ahead. We'll let you know if we need you. Thank you. The only answer to this is that the inscriptions and the rings constitute the cipher itself. The only question is how to arrange the rings to get the correct interpretation. Nick, did you notice that there are little notches piled in the edges of the rings? Mm Mm-hmm. Two of the rings have the notches on both the top and bottom, and these other two have them only on one edge. Yes, Patsy. I believe that if the rings are put together with the notches matching up, We'll be heading in the right direction. You mean stack them one on top of the other? Exactly. Mm -hmm. With the notches matching up in each case. The rings with the single notches will go on the top and the bottom, respectively. I see. Like this. That's it. 
Now what? You notice, Betsy? There are two lines of inscription on each ring. Okay. And from the uneven way the letters on the inscriptions are engraved, I feel sure it was done so that with the rings stacked on top of each other the way you have them, certain of the letters in the inscriptions will come directly under each other. There are only three or four places where they do that, Nick. As a matter of fact, Patsy, there's only one place, if you look closely, where the letters are really directly under each other. Yes, you're right. Write these letters down as I read them. Okay, go ahead. H A E T M L I three. Did you say three? Yes, one of the rings has the date 1730 in the second line. Oh, yes, of course. Hey, wait a minute. Right under the three on the bottom ring is another number. Looks like, yes, yeah, there's 251. Write that down, too. You think that's part of it? I believe it is. Now, what have you got there? Nothing that makes sense. H-A-E-T-M-L-I-3-251. Hmm. Maybe that's in cipher, too, Betty. Maybe... No. We've got the right ring on the top and the right ring on the bottom, but not to prove that. But we've got the two rings in the center in the wrong order. We just transpose them, we... Why, of course. You're way ahead of me. It refers to a book. A book just as well known to those old toys as it is to us. Now, why can I find a copy of it here? Ah, Matt O'Dell. He has quite a collection of books in his shack. He must have a copy there. Oh, but Nick, do you think... I'll be back in a minute, Patsy. Just long enough to get the book. Odell, can you tell me who did it? He killed Charlie. Saw him. He, he did it. Spade. House. Oh, uh, uh. oh, poor fellow. So that's it. I should have known him. What happened? The killer. Oh, no, no, no. I surprised him. He came up here. We followed him. Must have waited for us. In here. Shot Altman. As I'll say, he did. Must have killed him instantly. Go on. Go on. Then he shot me through the arm. Went out the window. Climbed down that big tree outside and ran off into the woods. Carter! Come here! Hurry! More trouble? I just found it. I... In the room by the rings were. The rings were. Uh, oh, Patsy. Patsy. Uh, Patsy, are you hurt? Oh, Patsy. my head. Oh. What happened, Patsy? Well, I was sitting here waiting for you when suddenly the ceiling fell in on me. Somebody hit you? I guess so. I didn't see anybody or hear them. Oh, Nick, the rings. They're gone. But oh. it makes no difference. I have the notes we made. I took them with me to be sure. I guess whoever hit me wanted the rings for himself. Did I hear some shooting? Yes, you did. Baldwin is dead. And Brady shot through the arm. Oh, did you get back in time to catch the murderer? No. Brady says he went out the window and down the tree. I'm going outside to see if I can find anything that might be a clue. Did you find anything, Carter? I think so. Now, tell me what happened here. Well, we were all sitting in the living room. Well, Brady heard something outside in the hall. He went out to look, and a moment later we heard him call out to someone to stop. Oldman ran out, and they both dashed up the stairs. There were several shots, and I called to you. You know the rest. I see. Brady, did you get a look at his face? Why, no. No, I didn't. It was dark in the hall, and I couldn't All right, see. all right. Never mind, never mind. Let's get finished with this cipher. But, Carter, shouldn't we do something about this Plenty of time for that. Plenty of time. Cipher comes first. Oh, by the way, I found Matt Hodell dead in his shack. Poisoned. What? 
Somebody put strychnine in his food. Odell dead? But why would anyone want to kill him? Matt didn't have any of the rings. Right. Odell was killed for an entirely different reason. Well, now let's get this cipher finished. I found this book in Odell's shack, and it gave me the answer. That copy of Hamlet told you where the treasure was buried? It did. You remember, Patsy, we had the letters H-A-E-T-M-L-I-3-2-5-1? That's right. Well, if you transpose the two rings in the middle of the stack we made, you get these letters. H-A-M-L-E-T. One, three, two, five, one. That's wonderful, Miss. Hamlet, Act One, Scene Three, Line 251. Is that it? Exactly, Patsy. I looked it up, and the clue gives us this line. Deep in the cellar, seek for our remains. And the treasure's buried in the cellar of this house. Apparently. So let's see what we can find down there. We'll probably have some hunting to do around here. And it shouldn't take too long. To... Uh, hey, hey, don't shine that light in my eyes. I can't see. Oh, sorry, Brady. Now we'll see. Look out, Nick. No, you don't, Brady. Oh, God. Why did you knock Brady out? He was trying to kill Nick. He was afraid I was getting too close to his secret. His secret? Brady is the murderer we've been looking for. Brady? But what about Charlie Vane? Vane existed only in Brady's imagination. He's been dead six months. Vane dead? Yes. And you'll find him buried in that corner over there. Where Brady buried him after he killed him. How do you know where he's buried, Nick? When I flashed the light in your faces a moment ago, I saw where Brady was looking. Naturally, he'd looked toward the spot which held his secret. He was afraid I might accidentally stumble on the body if we started digging down here. But how in the world did you know that Vane was dead and buried there? Odell lived long enough to give me a clue to that. And with what I already had figured out, it all made sense. That's why Brady killed Odell. To keep him from talking. Absolutely incredible, Tom. It's like a nightmare. Except that it makes sense. Vane and Brady together found the treasure when they were working here six months ago. Brady killed Vane so he could have the treasure for himself. Then when you, Jessup, organized this trip to solve the napkin ring cipher code, he determined to kill you all off so as to prevent you discovering it. Before you knew he was here on the island, he killed Pyle, then went out again and came into dock. It was Brady who threw Stevenson off the roof and later knocked Patsy out and killed Ullman. He also shot himself. The powder marks on his sleeve prove that. Incredible. Absolutely incredible. Well, now let's find the treasure. But if the treasure's buried in the cellar, Nick, what are we looking up here on the roof for? Oh, didn't I tell you, Patsy? The treasure isn't buried down there. It's up here. What? Up here. But the quotation from Hamlet Carter that said... The quotation I read you was not the right one, Jessup. Now, let's see. You see those large flat stones forming the platform on that side? Yes. What about them? Count off the first 11 and lift the next one up. Lift it up? Well, it's cemented down there. I doubt that. Go ahead, Jessup. Try it. Give him a hand with it, more. All right. If you say so, you seem to be right about everything so far. Even the finding of Dane's body where you said it was. Now, with it, more. Oh, Nick, you're right. The stone is coming up. Well, will you look at that? The old Tory's treasure. Nick, look at those gorgeous rings and necklaces and gold coins. Yes, Patsy. If Jessup is right, you're looking at about $2 million worth of gold and jewels. But how did you know it was here under this particular stone cutter? Because the quotation from Hamlet, the correct quotation, not the one I made up to fool Brady, reads like this. Upon the platform, fixed 11 and 12. And there was no other solution possible. In just a moment, Nick and Patsy will bring you a preview of next week's exciting case. But first, let's face the fact. Everybody's days are busy. We've all filled our daily schedule full to overflowing doing our home front jobs, and helping with the all-out effort toward victory in every way we know how. So we appreciate more than ever before what it means to relax and how much easier it is to relax when a home is pleasant and inviting. American homemakers are learning how much easier it is to keep a home that way with the three great Linux home brighteners. For example, they're learning that Linux cream polish restores the original handsomeness of fine furniture in one quick, easy application. Banishes messy fingerprints, helps conceal ugly scratches, does away with cloudy old polish and dust. 
You see, Linux cream polish for fine furniture actually cleans as it polishes, saving one whole step in the cleaning day routine of busy homemakers, cutting their work in half. Let your fine furniture regain its loveliness with Linux cream polish. Remember always to ask your dealer for Linux cream polish, which cleans as it polishes. It's the streamlined way to furniture care. You'll find all three great Linux home brighteners at your nearest hardware, paint, or department store. And now let's hear from Nick Carter himself. Well, Nick, what's on the program for next week? Now, next week, Ken, I want to tell you about a man who was killed by an unknown poison, and apparently without opportunity or motive. Four people were gathered for a discussion on Hindu philosophy, and suddenly one of them fell over dead. None of the others had any idea what had happened. Sounds pretty blind to me. How did it work out? Well, what clues there were were uncovered accidentally and unexpectedly. And it wasn't until the second murder that things became clear. And even then, nobody but Nick could figure out what anything meant. But he got the right answer. And the murderer. Uh, well, what's the name of the story, Nick? I call it Poison with a Past. Or oh, the Mystery of the Vedanta Killing. And that's all about that for now. So long. So long, everybody. And so long to you both, Nick and Patsy. We'll be looking forward to seeing you again next week. <laughs> Next week at this same time, listen to another curious experience of Nick Carter, Master Detective, entitled Poison with a Past. Or Nick Carter, The Mystery of the Vedanta Killing. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is featured in Street and Smith magazine. Long Clark is starred as Nick with Helen Schultz as Patsy. Original music is played by Lou White, and the programs are written and directed by Jock McGregor. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented at this time and over these same stations each week by the three great Linux home brighteners. Linux Clear Gloss Varnish, Linux Cream Polish, and Linux Self-Polishing Wax, created by Acme, America's great producer of Acme fine quality paint. This is Ken Powell speaking for the thousands of Linux dealers all over America and saying so long until next week. This is Mutual. of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective, presented by the three great Linux home brighteners, Linux clear gloss varnish, Linux cream polish, and Linux self-polishing wax, created by Acme, America's great producer of fine Acme quality paints. Today's curious adventure, Poison with a Past. Or Nick Carter, and the mystery of the Vedanta killing. In just a moment, we'll hear how Nick Carter was able to solve the mystery of the Vedanta killings and prevent the strange poison from claiming any more victims. But first, here's a good tip. Millions of American families are happier these days because women who run their homes wisely have learned about Chemtone, the miracle wall finish which makes every home more bright and inviting. Now those same wise homemakers are learning the modern way to new beauty for woodwork, furniture, and floors. The three great Linux home brighteners. Linux clear gloss to give lustrous, longer-lasting protection to every wood and linoleum surface. Linux cream polish to renew the sleek, gleaming beauty of fine furniture. And Linux self-polishing wax to lend rich, satiny loveliness to any floor, wood, linoleum, or tile. Take the modern shortcut to new home beauty with the three great Linux home brighteners. You'll find them all at your hardware, paint, or department store. Your headquarters also for Chemtone, the Miracle Wall Finish. 
And now for today's mysterious adventure with Nick Carter. As we join Nick and Patsy in Nick Carter's office, we find Nick talking to Riley on the phone. But look here, Riley. I can't drop everything I'm doing and help the police department out every time somebody gets killed. I'm not asking you to, Nick. But but this is something special. I think you'll enjoy working on it. Yes, you always say that, Riley. Every time you get stuck, you tell me it's an unusually interesting case. But this time it is, Nick. Honest it is. All right. Give me one reason why it's not just a routine murder case. Well, because the guy was killed while a lot of other people was around. Yeah. And nobody knows what's happened. The medical examiner is here and he swears it's a poison case. But he's stuck completely. He had some queer stuff he never ran into before. Now, you're an expert on poisons, Nick. You ought to look into this. An unknown poison, huh? Was it given him externally or internally? We don't know. There, there's not a trace of evidence to show how it was done at all. And you know old Doc Buck is no slouch when it comes to poisons. No, Doc Buck knows his stuff, all right. And he can't figure it out? He's tried every trick he knows, Nick, and nothing seems to work. Look, will you take a run over here again and see what you can make of it? Okay, Riley, what's the address? The Hamilton Apartments on Riverside Drive, apartment G4. I'll be right here waiting for you. We're there in 20 minutes, but it better be good. Oh, it is, Nick. You won't be sorry. So long. So long. So he managed to rope you, did he? I don't know whether he's roped me or not, as you so elegantly put it. <laughs> he's got me interested enough, so I'm going over and have a look at it. Want to come? Do I want to come? You don't think I want to sit around here when there's a murder case to be solved, do you? I suppose not. Okay, get your hat and let's be on our way. And you too, Patsy. Sure, it is nice of you to invite us. Oh, all right, all right. Let's dispense with the preliminaries, Riley. Get down to business right away. Who's dead and where's the body? Oh, it's rare to go, you are now, eh? Okay. The corpse is Frederick Shelby, the explorer. Shelby? Well, that fellow's got more lives than a cat. Well, he must have used up all nine of them if he's dead now. The body's right in here, Nick. In the library. Mm, if you look at all the books. Most of them pretty old, too. French, German, Russian... What are these, Nick? That one's Sanskrit, Patsy. Oh. Those there are Hindu. Uh-huh. Who lives here, Riley? Is this Shelby's apartment? No, Nick. It belongs to Professor Alexander Travers. Travers, Travers. Oh, yes. The specialist on Hindu literature and philosophy. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's right. Him and some of his friends were talking about that Hindu stuff when Shelby was killed. Well, here's the body here. Oh, yes. Hmm. Been dead long? Oh, not over an hour, the doc says. And that text is what the others tell us. We're holding them here for now. Look at the expression on his face. He must have died in terrible agony. No doubt of that. And there's no doubt of its being poison either. Not with that look on his face. Doc Buck said the same thing. But not one of his tests showed him what kind of poison was used. He said it could be most anything. Patsy, shift that light over here. Look closer, will you? I want to see something. Turn it. Here. Mm, yeah. Look at the color of his skin. It's practically blue-white. He looks almost like a marble statue. Yeah. All right, Riley. Where are the rest of the party? Say you're holding them here? Yeah, they're in the next room. Uh, there's Professor Travers. This is his apartment, like I said. A good-looking dame by the name of Mary Devine and Dr. Paul Starr. He's a college teacher. Now, they didn't know what happened when this Shelby passed out, so they phoned for an ambulance. And the intern took one look at him and called us. Anything else before I talk to them? Uh, yeah, they told the doc that none of them had uh, eaten or drunk anything before or after they came here. So the doc figured maybe Shelby was poisoned by the cigarettes he smoked. So we sent all the butts and ashes down to the lab for analysis. So they sent down the pack of cigarettes, too. Only one pack? Yep, they was all smoking out of the same pack. And a report yet? No, no, I, I told them to call me here as soon as they finished. All right, have a look at your witnesses. Okay, Nick, right in here. Why they keep us uh, this here is Nick Carter, folks. Nick, this is Mary Devine here. Devine? Over here is Professor Travers. Oh, that's uh, Dr. Starr. Glad to know you, Mr. Carter. Now, first, let's get straightened out who you all are. Professor Travers, what do you do? I teach Oriental literature at the university, Mr. Carter, but I don't see what you that will. has to... Dr. Starr, what do you do? I'm a botanist, Mr. Carter. I'm connected with the university, too, indirectly. See? You, Miss Devine? I'm just a student at the university. But oh. a very fine student, Mr. Carter. Miss Devine won a fellowship in Oriental Literature. She's done some excellent work. Any of you know any possible motive for Shelby's death? I know. We've been talking about it, and we're as much in the dark as you are. 
What do you know about Shelby? Not very much. We have only one common interest, the Vedanta. As a matter of fact, we first met him at a meeting of the Vedanta Society. Shelby feeling all right this afternoon? As far as we know, he said nothing about feeling ill. Mm -hmm. Now, tell me what happened here this afternoon, as near as you can recall. You say you were all sitting around talking? That's right. We were discussing the Vedanta. What does this Vedanta mean? Professor Travers can probably explain that better than I, Patsy. It's a philosophy of life. It was first put forward 1,500 years ago by Hindu scholars. It has to do with controlling the bodily expression so as to heighten the powers of the mind. Why don't you come to a meeting of the Vedanta Society with us someday? That would explain it better than I could, perhaps. Thanks, maybe I will, someday. But now, what happened here? Why, we were all seated around, smoking and chatting, when suddenly Shelby started to get faint. In a few minutes, he passed out. That's all. You were all smoking? Oh, yes. Why? I understand you were all smoking the same brand of cigarette. Who's were they? Oh, they were mine, Mr. Carter. Shelby forgot to bring his pipe, and Star was out of the private brand he smokes. I had a full pack, so I used mine. Even Star smoked one. <laughs> he usually wouldn't look at any cigarette that wasn't his own private mixture. Anything else you can think of? No, I think not. Well, that's all I know. Nothing happened that was really unusual, except that Mr. Shelby died. All right. Give your names and addresses to Lieutenant Riley. And don't leave town until we tell you you can. That's all. Good. All, all right. right. All right. And Nick, what do you make of it? I don't know. No apparent motive, no suspects, unknown poison. Of course, it's too early to know definitely. It couldn't be suicide, could it? No, I don't think so, Patsy. I'm pretty sure it's murder. But I'm also sure the murderer covered his tracks very thoroughly. Yes, Lieutenant. Yes, I got it. Of course, I'll tell him. Well, what did you expect? Oh, you. Goodbye. I gather that was Riley you were talking to? You gather, right. He said to be sure and tell you that the laboratory reports absolutely nothing wrong with the cigarette or the butts or the ashes. All normal and natural. Hmm, too bad. Sort of hoping that... Well, never mind. There's an answer somewhere, and I'll find it yet. He also said to tell you that Mary Devine was coming in to see you very shortly now. Did he say what for? No, just said she was coming. Maybe she remembered something that... Oh, I'll get it, Nick. That may be Miss Devine now. Or a bill collector. Oh, come in, Miss Devine. Mr. Carter is expecting you. Thank you. Good morning, Miss Devine. Good morning, Mr. Carter. Uh, I don't know that what I have to tell you is of any value, but I'll let you decide that. Fair enough. What is it? Do you know what this is? Oh, what a beautiful flower. What is it? In India, they call it Datura. It has other names, too. Natura? Well, that's a poison. Yes. That's it. That be my notes on poison. <laughs> They're right here, Nick. Here you are. Thanks. Natura. Natura. That, yes, here we are. Hmm. Taste is pleasant, given in small doses. It intoxicates strongly. Two drams will prove fatal at once. Can be mixed with food or drink and will kill without leaving a trace. Cannot be isolated unless the chemist knows what he's looking for. Gosh, that's a nasty poison, isn't it? Yes. In India, mothers feed it to unwanted girl babies. Miss Devine, where did you get this flower? Well, I... I got it special delivery this morning. Dr. Starr got one, and Professor Travis got one, too, the same way. I see. In other words, the murderer warns you that he's going to kill all three of you. Same way he murdered Shelby. It looks that way. Why would he want to kill all of them, Nick? Probably because he's afraid that they noticed something when Shelby was killed yesterday that would give him away if they told anyone about it. But I, I don't know anything, Mr. Carter. Neither do the others. Perhaps you do, Mr. Devine, and don't realize it. It often happens. At any rate, the killer's taking no chances. Patsy, call Riley. Have him tell the lab what to look for. Maybe they can find some traces of it that way. Of course, Nick. What do you think I'd better do, Mr. Carter? Just be very careful of what you eat or drink and with whom you associate for a few days. In the meantime, I'll be busy finding out what I can. You have any plans for the immediate future? No, not especially. And you're sure nothing happened at Professor Travers' apartment yesterday that would help us? No, Mr. Carter. Not a thing. Hmm. i better see Star and Travers. Maybe they can tell me something they overlooked before. Well, Mr. Carter, they'll both be at the Vedanta Society meeting this morning at 11. Swami Atulanada is speaking, and he's the favorite lecturer. Why don't we go to the meeting, too? You can talk to them there. Excellent idea, Mr. Byrne. Riley says he'll take care of notifying the lab. Thanks, Betsy. 
Mr. Vine and I are going to a meeting of the Vedanta Society. You better stay here in case Riley does learn anything. I'll call you later. You ready, Mr. Vine? Yes. All right, let's go. I really don't know much about them, Mr. Carter. I see, but perhaps you could tell me this. How close to Shelby were Travers and Starr? Well, Paul Starr barely knew him. As a matter of fact, he met Shelby for the first time yesterday. And Professor Travers? Oh, he and Shelby were pretty chummy. They had a common interest in the Vedanta, and they each have a collection of rare Sanskrit manuscripts, which they will to each other when they die. You mean whoever dies first bequeaths his manuscripts to the others? Yes, that's it. How valuable are these manuscripts? Oh, they're priceless, I understand. Hmm. Now, what about you? Where do you fit into this picture? Well, I... I met them because of my interest in Oriental languages and literature. I, I feel that after the war, with the world made so much smaller by the use of airlines all over the globe, I, I may be glad to know all I can about the Orient. Oh, yes, of course. How much further is this place where the meeting's being held? Oh, just across the next avenue, in that old brownstone house. I'm sure you'll enjoy the meeting with Swami Atulanada being the lecturer. He, he's wonderful. Perhaps so, but I think I'm going to enjoy talking to Star and Travis even more. Well, Mr. Carter, wasn't he wonderful? Yes, just very interesting. Much more intellectual than I expected. Oh. Well, Mary, I see you've managed to convert Mr. Carter. That's fast work. Well, I wouldn't call it conversion, Dr. Star. My main reason for coming here was to talk to you and Professor Travis. Yes. You, uh, you want to talk to me, Carter? I do, just for a few minutes. Well, suppose we have lunch first and then talk later. Oh, good idea. Where shall we go? Let's go to the Bombay Curry Shop, the best place of its kind in town. Oh, Excellent. Right. I'm starved. How about you, Miss Carter? Well, I could certainly eat something. Well, come on, then. The Curry Shop it is. This is the main dish, mm -hmm. this curried rice and vegetables. And then over there in the center of the restaurant, on that long table there, those are the special seasonings, like hors d'oeuvres. You help yourself to those, whatever you want, to go with this main dish. Such as what? Oh, Bombay duck, dried saltfish, tamarind, and other spicy things. See, Dr. Starr is getting his now. Shall we try some? Oh, by all means. Yeah, come on. Some of these things are really delicious. Here, Professor, how about some of this tamarind? Have you learned to like it yet? <laughs> I ate tamarind before you were born. Give me a good helping of it, will you, Star? Yeah, you are. Oh, certainly. It's delicious. Take anything you like, Mr. Carter. You never know what's good until you try it, you know. Yes, but it looks appetizing. Now, let's try a little of everything. Well, that certainly was good. I enjoyed that meal. Yeah, I thought you would. Uh, cigarette, Carter? Oh, no, thanks. I don't smoke. How about you, Star? Care for one? Oh, no, thanks. I prefer my own special mixture. <laughs> Dr. Star is a cigarette fiend, Mr. Carter, but he won't smoke anything but his own brand. If there's any other kind, makes him sick. Well, gentlemen, now that we've taken care of the inner man, I'd like to ask you a few questions about Shelby. Uh, sure. Sure, ask away. Well, we don't know, we won't tell you. Why, Professor... I believe you're drunk. Drunk? No, sir. I never touch a drop of liquor. It's too intox... Intox... It, it's not good for you. Well, you are drunk, Professor. Don't try to kid us. I'm not. I know what's eating you. You're jealous. I'm... I'm a better man than you, and I proved it, didn't I? I, I don't know what you're talking about. No? You're a liar, Star. You know all right, all right. But she... She would... Dr. Travers. Travers. Why, he's dead. Mr. Carter, that's just the way Shelby died. Well, here's another clue for Nick in his effort to find out who killed Shelby and how. Will he be able to track down the murderer before any more killings can take place? We'll see in just a moment. Do you youngsters track in slush? Do those umbrellas drip puddles in the hall? Does the dog leave muddy paw marks on all your shining floors? 
Never mind. When you keep your floors protected with beautiful Linux clear gloss varnish, you'll find that it keeps both dirt and water right on the surface, where they're easy to clean away. And that same sturdy protective finish gives sparkling beauty as well to linoleum, floors, and woodwork. For Linux clear gloss has a gleaming, transparent luster that gives all your household things renewed attractiveness. And how well Linux clear gloss wears... Resisting damage by hot grease, boiling water, fruit acids, perfumes, even alcohol. Use it on tabletops, on bathroom tile, on linoleum throughout your home. You'll find it the most satisfactory household finish you've tried, as thousands of other successful American homemakers have. What's more, Linex Clear Gloss Varnish is easy to brush on. So ask your dealer for Linex, L-I-N-X, Linex Clear Gloss Varnish. You'll find all three great Linux home brighteners and Chemtone, the miracle wall finish, at hardware, paint, and department stores everywhere. And now, back to our story. We left Nick Carter in the Bombay curry shop where he has been lunching. Suddenly, Professor Travers uttered a few strange remarks and fell over dead. Later that same afternoon, Nick is talking to Lieutenant Riley in the latter's office. You say, Nick, that this, this that tour, uh, whatever it is, killed him, huh? Well, obviously, Riley. All the symptoms are present, although I didn't realize it until after it was all over. No, but, Nick, Lieutenant Riley's chemist has analyzed all the food in the restaurant, and nothing out of the way was found. You all ate the same food, didn't you? Yes, Patsy, we did. Then how is it that Professor Travis died and none of the rest of you were even sick? I don't know yet. Well, I think you're nuts, Nick. Now, look, you said Travers and Shelby was got to leave each other their collections of manuscripts now, didn't you? That's what Mary said. Well, then, Travers invited Shelby to his apartment and killed him so as to get Shelby's collection. Then when you started questioning him today, he got scared and committed suicide. It's as plain as any... No, 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 Riley. That's impossible. A man of Travers' type wouldn't kill himself to escape arrest. He tried to kill me instead. He was an egotist that his conversation proved... Egotist considers suicide a sign of weakness. But if it was murdered, how was it done, Nick? Answer me that. I'm not ready to answer that yet. Well, have you got even one little clue that says it's murder? Just one. Yes, Riley, I have. You have? What is it? Why did Dr. Starr smoke one of Professor Travers' cigarettes when they were at Travers' apartment? When Mary tells me he'd rather go without smoking than to smoke anything but his own particular mixture. Ah, but they all smoked the same cigarettes that day, Nick. Only Shelby was killed where the star come in. And today, Nick, you said the star did smoke his own mixture. Yes, but facts are facts, Patsy. You can't get away from that. If Dr. Starr did something unusual, it probably was done for a reason. The fact that I don't yet understand the reason doesn't make it any less important. Nicholas Carter's office. Is Mr. Carter there, please? This is Mary Devine's mother calling. Oh, surely. Just a moment. See you, Nick. Mary's mother. Oh, thank you. Hello, Mr. Devine. What can I do for you? Well, I just want you to know that Mary will be a little late in meeting you. Meeting me? Yes, she expects you to be there by 8 o'clock, but she'll be delayed 15 or 20 minutes. Hey, just a minute, Mrs. Devine. She expects you to be where? What? At Dr. Starr's apartment, as you asked her to. When did I ask her to meet me at Dr. Starr's apartment? Why, why you phoned an hour ago. I did Didn't not. Did you? I did not. Well, well, whoever phoned said he was you, and said you or he had something important to tell her, and asked her to be at Dr. Starr's apartment by 8 o'clock. I'm glad you called, Mrs. Devine. I'll take care of it right away. Well, what's wrong, Mr. Carter? Mary isn't in any danger, is she? Not yet. But she might have been if you hadn't called. Oh, Mr. Carter. Well, please don't let anything happen now, to me. don't Mary. worry, Mrs. Devine. I'll take care of her. And I'll take care of him, too. Come in, Mary. Carter. Yes, Dr. Starr. Carter, you expected me? I know. I, I thought... You thought I was Mary Devine, didn't you? Why, I... Why do you say that? Mary's mother told me. You were the one who phoned her, weren't you? Clever, aren't you? Yes, I phoned her. I I had something I wanted to show her. Well, suppose you show it to me instead. I don't think you'd be interested. Why, well, you're wrong. I'd be interested in anything about you. For example, why you smoked one of Professor Travers' cigarettes yesterday at his apartment. When you'd usually prefer to go without, rather than smoke anything but your own particular mixture. Why, I, I just... I answer my question for you? You wanted to kill Travers. It was Vlad Bud between you. Probably over that woman Travers mentioned in the curry shop this afternoon. So you prepared a cigarette full of the Tura, dried, ground fine. And when you took one of the cigarettes from the pack Travers had, you substituted the one you prepared. You knew Mary was safe because she didn't smoke. 
But you made a mistake in your calculation somewhere, and Shelby got the poison cigarette instead of Travers, isn't that it? You're very clever, aren't you, Mr. Carter? I've changed my mind. I do have something here I want to show you. This. Hmm. A gun. Was that what you were going to show Mary when she got here? No, but I can't take any chance on you. No, I just tell you are. How do you know it was Dartura killed Shelby? I recognized the symptoms as soon as Mary told me what they were. And they were the same symptoms as Travis showed when he died this afternoon. Died from eating tamarind sprinkled with a Tura powder, right? You seem to be always right, Mr. Carter. Yes, I got to the condiment table first, sprinkled the poison on some of the tamarind. Then I made sure Travers got it. Star, why did you hate him so? Because he took my girl away from me. Took her away from me just because he wanted to prove he could do it. He didn't want her. In fact, after he got her, he refused to marry her. And broke her heart. And she killed herself. He's an egotistical beast. And having got rid of Travers, you felt you had to get rid of Mary, too, because she might unconsciously betray you some way, right? Quite right, my omniscient detective. Now that you've cleared up all the mystery, I'm afraid I shall have to get rid of you, too. Because I can't have you going around. Mary. Come in. No one gets in here until after I've taken care of you. Well, you're wrong, Star. I left the outside latch off when I came in earlier. Left the latch off? Come on in, Mary. Why, oh, you... Don't you... take a gun. Don't... Don't... I don't like having anyone try to finish me off, Star. I prefer to do the finishing off myself. Just a minute. Come on in, Mary. Are you all right, Nick? What happened? Did you get him? What happened, Mr. Carter? Patsy wouldn't tell me. Uh, Dr. Starr's in no condition to ask you in, so I will. Come on in, all of you. What's the matter with Doc? <gasps> Did you have to kill him, Nick? Oh, Riley, you know me better than that. No, he's just uh, temporarily out. Oh, well, let me get the cuffs on him before he comes to. Yeah, that'll hold him. So you were right, Nick. It was Dr. Starr. Yes, Patsy, it was. I felt pretty sure of it from the first. Because being a botanist and a specialist in oriental plant life, he'd know all about the Datura plant. But I couldn't figure out any motive for him to want to kill Shelby. And that stopped me. Until Travers was killed. Then I realized that maybe Starr didn't intend to kill Shelby at all. Which turned out to be the case. But, Mr. Carter, how did you know that it was Dr. Starr even when Professor Travers was killed? It was Travers himself who gave me the clue I needed. You remember what he said in the curry shop about having proved himself a better man than Starr? Yes, but... I thought he was just raving. Oh, no, Mary. He was doing that deliberately. The Vedanta philosophy teaches control of the body to sharpen the mind. Doesn't it? Yes, it does, but... I feel sure that when Travers knew he was dying, that's just what he did. By an extraordinary effort, he kept his mind clear enough to accuse Starr by giving me Starr's motive for killing him. But he did it by insinuation so as not to warn Star what he was doing. Yeah, that's sure a new one on me. Using a Hindu philosophy to accuse your murderer. Yes, Riley, that is a new one. Just shows you how you can get something valuable out of anything you study. Every religion, every system of thought, every philosophy has something worthwhile in it, no matter how peculiar it may seem to us at first. <laughs> In just a moment, Nick and Patsy will give you a preview of next week's exciting case. Thousands upon thousands of American men are fighting overseas, fighting for home as they remember it. One of the most important things we can do is to keep home as they remember it. And the most satisfactory way to care for your home is with those three modern shortcuts to household loveliness. The three great Linux home brighteners. Linex Cream Polish, for instance, renews the original gleaming beauty of your fine furniture, reveals the handsome grain of the wood, frees it from the unsightly cloudiness of fingerprints, dust, and old polish. And it accomplishes this result in one quick, easy application. For Linex Cream Polish actually cleans as it polishes. It cuts your job in half, saves you one whole step in your cleaning day routine. And when you've finished, you'll see that Linex Cream Polish has left no oily film on the surface of your furniture. For it dries hard so that no dust clings to it. Linex cream polish is truly the ideal method of caring for fine furniture. So use it regularly. Ask your dealer for it by name. Linex cream polish for fine furniture. You'll find all three great Linex home brighteners, Linex self-polishing wax, Linex clear gloss varnish, 
and Linux Cream Polish at your nearest hardware, paint, or department store. And now let's hear from Nick Carter himself. Well, Nick, what's your story about this next time? Black widows, Ken. Uh, what kind of widows are black widows? They're spiders, Ken. Poisonous spiders. But they spin very lovely webs that are used by the Army and Navy for making precision instruments. See, the web of black widow spiders is unexcelled for making hairs and sighting devices used by our armed forces. Well, who got into trouble, the black widows or the armed forces? Neither, Ken. It was a killer who wanted to steal a large shipment of spider web, and to do so was forced to kill two people. But a black widow stopped him with Nick's help. Well, what do you call this cheerful little tale? Webs of murder. Oh, the mystery of the black widow spiders. Complete details next week. So long. So long, everybody. And so long to both of you, Nick and Patsy. We'll be waiting for your story next week as usual. <laughs> Next week at the same time, listen to another curious experience of Nick Carter, Master Detective, entitled Webs of Murder. Or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Black Widow Spiders. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is featured in Street and Smith magazines. Lon Clark is starred as Nick with Helen Choate as Patsy. Original music is played by Lou White, and the programs are written and directed by Jock McGregor. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented at this time and over these same stations each week by the three great Linux home brighteners. Linux clear gloss varnish, Linux cream polish, and Linux self-polishing wax. Created by Acme, America's great producer of Acme fine quality paints. This is Ken Powell speaking for the thousands of Linux dealers all over America and saying so long until next week. This is Mutual. What's the matter? What is it? Another case for Nick Carter. Master Detective. Yes, it's another case for that most famous of all manhunters. The detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective, presented by the three great Linux home brighteners. Linux clear gloss varnish, Linux cream polish, and Linux self-polishing wax. Created by Acme, America's great producer of fine Acme quality paints. Today's curious adventure, Webs of Murder. Or Nick Carter and the mystery of the Black Widow Spiders. In just a moment, we'll hear how Nick Carter solves the mystery of the Black Widow murders and saves the West from getting into the hands of the enemy. But before we do, consider this. Millions of Americans have learned how easily Ken's home, the miracle wall finish, brings amazing new beauty to the home. Now, millions more are learning that floors, woodwork, and furniture can be made to look like new with the three great Linux home brighteners. Linux self-polishing wax beautifies floors with a satiny, yet tough, anti-skid finish that resists wear, water, and dirt. Linux cream polish cleans as it polishes, leaving no oily film on your furniture. And Linux clear gloss varnish, the durable super varnish that dries to an elastic, transparent surface, protects all wood and linoleum in your home. You'll find the three great Linux home brighteners at your hardware, paint, or department store. Your headquarters also for Chemtone, the miracle wall finish. And now for today's mysterious adventure with Nick Carter. As we begin today's story, we find Nick and Patsy in Nick's car returning to town. Oh, gosh, Nick, I'm glad you were able to prevent that poor old lady's home from being taken away from us. So am I, Patsy. That was a jet game if ever I saw one. Mm, no. The old lady was to the right, but I had to find a proof for her. Otherwise, she'd have been turned out in the streets with nowhere to go. You went right back to the office? No, not directly. I had to stop off and do an errand for Riley first. Do an errand for Riley? <laughs> Since when have you started that? I haven't started anything, Patsy. Riley called me this morning just before you got to the office and asked me if I do this job as a special favor to him. What do you have to do? 
Well, it seems that there's a woman on Cherry Street who makes a business of supplying spider webs to the Army and Navy. Oh? They use them for cross hairs for engineering instruments and sighting devices for gun sites, bomb sites, and so on. Mm-hmm. It's only a small business, but it's pretty valuable and mighty important, too. Well, where do you come in? Well, this woman called Riley early this morning and said that someone had tried to break into her place last night. She has a large shipment just ready to go out, and she's afraid that someone may try to keep her from delivering it. I see. So Riley asked me if I'd stop in on my way back and pick it up. Said he had no good man he could send for it now because of some special work the police are doing just now. And good natured old Nick said he would. Where do you have to take it? To one of the naval buildings downtown. Besides being worth about ten thousand dollars, the web's very important to the service. Also, I thought you might like to see how they collect this web from the spiders. You want to come with me? Well, I've got a dental appointment in about an hour, Nick. But I'll stop off and have a look at this spider conservatory. How long are you going to be there? Only long enough to pick up the stuff I expect. Unless there's some delay, you ought to get back to town. Plenty of time for your appointment with a tooth specialist. Yes? I'm Nick Carter. I've come to pick up the web that's the one delivered to town. Who told you to come here? Lieutenant Riley said you wanted police protection. That's right, I do. Uh... Would you mind identifying yourself, please? Not at all. Would this prove my identity sufficiently? Oh, oh of course. Come in, Mr. Carter. Thank you, Miss... Uh... Uh, Lewis, K. Lewis, I own this business. This is Miss Bowen, my assistant. How do you do? How do you do? Uh, the web will be ready in just a few minutes. I have one more spider to take care of. This is a new one on Miners, Lewis. I've seen plenty of spider webs, but I never thought of saving any of them. <laughs> well, that's a very different thing, Miss Bowen. You can't just save any old web you might find around the house. You have to go at it the right way and have the right kind of spiders. What kind do you use? Black Widow, aren't they? Yes. Their web is very strong and very uniform. Black Widows? Mm-hmm. Aren't they deadly poisonous? Well, there's really no danger if I get bitten. A solution of Epsom salt injected into the bloodstream will counteract the poison. It's nice to know, but I hope I never have to use it. So do I. Oh, look at all the jars, Nick. Is there a spider in each jar? Not quite. We have uh, 160 here just now. I checked up last night. My assistant, Jim Baldwin, is out in the field collecting more today. How do you get the web, Miss Lewis? Well, uh, watch me. I let the spider out of the jar, and almost at once it starts to spin a web. I oh. take the end of the web, so, and fasten it to this small wire frame. There. Then I just wind up the frame, and the web winds up as fast as the spider produces it. I understand you had an attempted burglary here last night, Miss Lewis. Yes, someone tried to break in the back door. We found chisel marks all around it this morning, but they were unsuccessful or else they got scared away. Any idea who might want to steal your stuff? No, but I didn't want to take any chances with such an unusually large shipment as this, so I asked for police protection. And I don't blame you. You say there are 160 spiders here? Uh, Yes, all widows. Okay, I'm back. In here, Jim. Uh, That's my assistant, Jim Baldwin. Not much like this time, Kate. I only got 11 more black widows. The woods are too dry just now. Oh, Jim, this is Mr. Carter and Miss Bowen. How do you do? How do you do? Mr. Carter is taking the shipment of Webb to the naval building for me to be sure it gets there. Oh, I see. You know, I can't understand why anyone would want to steal the Webb. We're the only collectors in this part of the country, and no one else could sell them without attracting attention. Well, I know it sounds foolish, but... Well, I'm not criticizing you. I'm just uh, thinking out loud, that's all. Oh, Miss Miss Norris, uh, how much longer before the web will be ready? Oh, not long. As soon as I've made just one web, I'll pack them in those cases, and they'll be ready to go. Not uh, over half hours at most. I think I'd better get along, Nick. I can take the subway. I don't want to be late for my appointment with the dentist. Okay, Patsy. I'll see you in the office about noon. All right. Thanks for the demonstration, Miss Lewis. You're very welcome. Bye-bye. Goodbye. I'm sorry to keep you waiting, Mr. Carter, but you can't hurry these spiders. That's quite all right. I don't have to hurry. <laughs> oh, uh, Jim, get that, will you please? Uh, sure, I'll take it. Those cases you pack the web in look like boxes of fishing tackle, don't they? Yes. You can pack a lot of webs into a pretty small space. This is for you, Case. Pete Morrow. Pete? Oh, thank you. I'll only be a moment. Excuse me, Pete. Pete Morrow? Isn't he that small-time gangster who runs the garage? Yeah, that's the one. Sells black market tires and gasoline? That's him. Now, what's your connection with him? Uh, nothing, I guess. They've been out together a few times. Well, it's time to feed the spiders. Each one gets a fresh kill fly once a day. Uh, what's this? Now, what's her go after? See that? Yes. Well, don't think I'd care to be that. Oh, oh. The ball was too. 
I do too, huh? I wonder... Where the web? They're gone, both cases. Quick, quick. Miss Lewis. Miss Lewis, are you... Dead. Shot right through the head. And wait. That's my gun there on the floor. Why do we shot with my gun? Hey, Bolton. Bolton. Bolton, wake up, wake up. Uh, 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 what happened? Bolton, can you hear me? <laughs> yeah. What's the matter? Kay Lewis has been murdered. Kay? Murdered? Yes, shot through the head. And the web is gone, all of it. The web gone? Yes. Did you see the guy who slugged us? Well, no, I, I looked around as you went down. I saw someone behind me, and then I got it, and got it good. Oh, come on, come on, come on. Snap out of it, will you? Get on the phone and call the police. Police? Of course, get in the office and call them now. Yeah, all right, I'll call them. I'll have a look around. See if I can find anything to tell us who's behind it. Hmm. Whoever it was used my gun wiped all the fingerprints off. Clean as a whistle now. Hello. What's this? Wasn't here before. That I'm sure of. Hmm. Ticket for a parked car. Morrow's garage. Beat Morrow. He's owned here. Just I got home. them. We got, uh, they're coming right out. Look here, Baldwin. Are you sure that was Pete Morrow on the phone a few minutes ago? Well, oh, sure it was. I know his voice. Fine. I just found this on the floor here. A parking ticket for Morrow's garage. Oh, hmm. probably well, just a coincidence. Somebody who had parked at Morrow's place did this. You're on there. This is the other end of the ticket. The end held by the garage. Yeah, so it is. So what? I know that was Marlowe on the phone. Besides, he was still talking to Kay when we were slugged. Yes, you're right there. Miss Lewis was still talking last I knew. I wonder. The ticket wasn't here before the killing. And it's here now. In lieu of a better clue, I think I'll take a run over to Morrow's place and see what I can get out of him. Oh, I wish you luck, Carter. And by the way, how long have you been in business here? About a year. Who started the business? Kay did. How'd you get into it? Well, she knew I was a zoologist, so she asked me where she could get some blackwood and spiders. The idea interested me, and I finally gave up what I was doing and came over here. I collected the spiders, and she collects, uh, collected the webs. We've been very successful. You know anything about her past? No, nothing. Never thought much about it before. But why all these questions, Carter? I just want to learn what I can before I talk tomorrow. Sorry. I don't know anything more than I've told you. All right, brother. You wait here for the police. I'll have a talk with our friend Pete Morrow. Pete Morrow around? Oh, yeah, yeah, he's in the office. Anybody with him? No, no, you can go in if you want to. Thanks, I will. Okay, you got the floor. Suppose you keep your hands on top of your desk while we talk. What the... Just sit still. Keep your hands in sight. Hey, who are you anyway? What do you want with me? I'm Nick Carter. As I said, I want to talk to you. Okay, so you're Nick Carter. So what? I just want to ask you if you know anything about this bump on the back of my head. Bump on the... I don't know what you're talking about. Maybe you don't, maybe you do. You know Kay Lewis? Yeah, sure I know her. Good looking thing. Been out with her? Yeah, what's it to you? Know what business he was in? Sure, I knew about them spiders. And you also knew the webs were worth a lot of money, didn't you? Hey, what are you getting at? You trying to pin something on me? Sit down. Uh, Did you telephone Kay Lewis about an hour ago? Huh? Oh, uh, yeah, sure, sure. I, uh, I had to talk to him. What about? Why, I... You're lying, moron. Now stay right where you are. I want to have a little look around this office of yours. I don't know what you're trying to do, Copper. But I'm telling you, I what don't... What are those boxes under your desk, Morrow? Uh, boxes? Yes, boxes. What are they? They're, uh, They're tools. Mechanics tools. Yes? I suppose you shove those tools out from under your desk and let me have a look at them. Well, there ain't nothing there. Oh, don't hey. try reaching for your gun again. Next time, I'll aim lower. Now, shove those boxes out here. With your feet... Uh, I don't see why you're so interested in them boxes. They just... You know well enough why. 
There's enough spider web in those cages to send you to the chair. To the chair? You shouldn't have killed Kay Lewis, Ma. I, I didn't, didn't kill her. I took the web, sure, but I didn't do anything to her. You admit you stole the web. Sure, I got the web. It wasn't my fault. That was... Uh... <laughs> shooting this time. Was it Nick or was it someone trying to kill Nick? Did Pete Morrow kill Kay Lewis or was it someone else? We'll see in just a moment. I know every man notices that beautiful floors add to the appearance of a room. And every woman knows that well-kept floors reflect the pride she takes in her home. Now, with Linux self-polishing wax, you can give your floors a more beautiful finish than ever without tiresome rubbing or polishing. For Linux self-polishing wax is simply wiped on drying to a handsome, satiny finish that really wears. Because Linux self-polishing wax contains genuine Carnauba wax. When worn spots do appear, you simply renew the finish where it's needed without re-waxing the whole floor. And Linux self-polishing wax is easy to keep lovely, for surface dirt is quickly whisked away with a damp cloth. What's more, Linux self-polishing wax is the anti-slip floor finish, as the underwriter's laboratories have proved. And it's equally fine for tile, wood, or linoleum. Ask your dealer now for Linux, L-I-N-X, Linux Self-Polishing Wax. You'll find all three great Linux home brushes and Chemtone, the miracle wall finish, at hardware, paint, and department stores everywhere. And now back to our story. Nick had just made Pete Morrow, small-time gangster, admit that he had stolen the missing spider web when two shots were fired in rapid succession. It's a few minutes later. You must be a charmed life jacket. Neither of the two shots hit you. Only the second one was aimed at me, Patsy. The first one went right through Pete's forehead. I dropped behind the desk, and the other one went over my head. Do you have any idea who killed him? Not yet. Tried to get him, but he got away. But why would anyone want to kill Pete? To keep him from talking too much, probably. Pete had just admitted he stole the web was about to tell me something else when he was shot. I imagine the killer himself was listening, and when Pete started confessing, shot him to keep him quiet. Did you get the web back, Nick? Yes, both cases. They're in my car now. I'm going to take them back to the spider place. Riley should be there by now. You walked into something when you agreed to deliver those cases, didn't you? Apparently I did. But here's why I called you, Patsy. I want you to look into our file. Get together all the information you can find on Kay Lewis and her business. Call me at the spider place as soon as you get it. There's something very peculiar going on around here someplace. I never saw the beat of it, Nick. The way you're always around when somebody gets killed. And I suppose you know nothing about it the same as usual. Oh, I wouldn't say I know nothing about it, Raleigh, but I certainly don't have the solution all ready to hand over to you. No. Have you made any of your usual startling discoveries yet? None of your ways, Christ, Carter. I'm doing all right. Ah, fine, fine. And what have you found so far? Well, we got the bullet that killed this Lewis woman. And it came from a 45. That bullet's got to identify the killer for us. I doubt that, Riley. And why do you doubt it? Because I'm pretty sure the bullet was fired from my gun. From, from your gun? You mean you, Carter? I mean nothing of the kind. After I was knocked out, someone stole my gun, shot Miss Lewis, and left the gun on the floor beside her. Ah, God, God, that's the only real clue we had. Well, there are other clues, Riley. Although I doubt that you would get much out of them. Why, you... For example, I know that Pete Morrow, small-time gangster and black market operator, stole the spider webs that are missing. Pete Morrow is it? Hey, Sergeant! Send a couple of the boys out to pick up Pete Morrow! That won't do any good, Riley. Well, why not? Pete ought to be able to give us some dough upon this. Pete is not going to tell anybody anything anymore. Huh? Someone put a slug through his head while I was talking to him. Another killer? We ain't even solved this one yet. When you solve this one, Riley, if you do solve it, you'll have the answer to both of them. I believe the same person killed both Kay Lewis and Pete Morrow. Uh, did, did you learn anything from Pete before he was killed? Only that he stole the webs and that someone else was back of it. Where are the webs now? Outside my car. That ain't safe, Nick. Maybe the killer will be back to get them. They'll be safe enough. I left them in charge of one of your men out there. Oh. Hey, where's Jim? Who's Jim? Kay Lewis' assistant. Jim Baldwin. Oh, oh, him, sure. Uh, he was here a while ago, but he said he was feeling pretty sick after finding Miss Lewis shot the way she was. So I let him go over to the drugstore, something to make him feel better. How long has he been gone? Oh, only a few minutes, sir. Let me see here. Well, good gosh, he ate longer than I thought. 
He's been gone about three quarters of an hour. Sure, he, he ought to have been back here before this. Huh. Very interesting. Oh, 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 I know. What's going on out there? Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Cotton, you're going to go to the time. Yes, oh, Mr. Mr. Cotton. Oh, Scotty, uh, what's the trouble to you? Well, Mr. Carter asked me to keep an eye on his car so no one would bother him. Huh? When I just took a look at it, I found this fella fooling around. So I brought him in. That's ridiculous. I didn't know it was Carter's car. What were you doing with it? I wasn't doing anything with it. I was on my way back from the drugstore, and as I passed the car, I just happened to glance inside. I thought I recognized the cases we used to pack the spider webs in. And I was just having a look at them to make sure when, when this dumb cop came up and grabbed me. Some cop, did you say? Why, for you Oh, that's ours, Scotty. Uh, Go back and watch the car like you were told to. Yes, Lieutenant. Uh, Jim, have you been at the drugstore ever since Lieutenant Riley let you go? Well, sure I have. What else would I be doing? It's exactly what I'd like to know. Are you insinuating... I'm right? insinuating nothing. By the way, you said someone tried to break in here last night. That's right. Which door was it? That one there? Yes. You can see the chisel marks all over the outside where they tried to break the lock. That's just what I do want to see. We're right back, Riley. Take your time. Take your time. I got nothing else to do but watch you play around here. Uh, shall I answer, Lieutenant? Why shouldn't you answer? Well, I, I didn't know now that you're in charge. Go of on and answer. Sure, sure. Hello? Sure. Uh, wait a minute. Uh, Carter, telephone to you. Okay, thanks. Well, where my own? Now look here, Barbara. Hello? You said you got back here with them spiders you caught just before the killing this morning, didn't you? That's right. The weather was bad for spiders, and I hadn't had much luck. I only got 11 spiders for 12 hours' work. Hmm? Well, sometimes I got as many as 35 and maybe 40 in the same length of time. Oh. But this time, all I could find was 11. Hmm, hardly worth the trouble. Mm-hmm. Did I hear you say you got 11 spiders, Jim? Yes. You saw them when I brought them in this morning. So I did. So I did. How's your arithmetic? Arithmetic? I don't get you. How much is 160 and 11 added together? Are you being funny, Carter? Definitely not. Add 160 and 11 and see what you get. Any fool could answer that, Nick. I know the answer myself. You get 171. That's what I make it, too, Riley. What's this all about, Nick? Let's count the spiders here in this room and see how many there are. What do you want to do that for, Nick? Just to satisfy my curiosity. Now, what do you say? You and your curiosity. All right, all right. Let's count the things and get it done so we can get to something important. This is important, Riley. You take that side. I'll take this. No. One, two, three, four. Eight. Don't move. I'll shoot if you do. Keep your hands up high. He broke the doors and some of them spiders is loose and they're poisoned. Just step on it, Riley. They can't bite you unless you get out of them. If the spiders don't get you, gentlemen, I will. With my little 45. Hey, Nick, one of them is on me. He's going to bite me. Knock it off, Riley. You're not dead yet. Not yet, but soon. I missed you in Pete's office this morning, Carter, because I was in a hurry. But I won't miss you this time. You mean you killed Pete Morrow? I did, just as I'm going to kill you. I now. don't think you are, Jim. And why not? Look behind you and you'll see. You can't fool me that way, Carter. I'm no chump. Oh! oh good good Lord, Nick. I'll take care of him now. Hey! Uh, I've been bitten. One of the spiders got out of my pine friend. Try and get out of these. Oh. Uh, good work, Riley. Quick! Get some of the Epsom salt before I die. Do the first aid cabinet there. You killed Kay Lewis, didn't you? Yes, yes. Get the salt quick. And you killed Pete Mall, too, didn't you? Yes. Do something. I'm dying. Pete stole the web as part of your deal, didn't he? For the love of heaven, would you hurry up? Didn't he? Yes, yes, yes. I'll find him, but he just caught me. Will you do something before I die? Oh, yes, sir. I'll give you the Epsom salt. Oh, now. Sorry, sir. I want to save you for the electric chair. <laughs> Quite a day. Yes, Patsy, quite a day. And now that everything's quiet and peaceful, suppose you give out with the missing details. Did you know Jim Baldwin was behind us and started out? No, not at first, Patsy. There didn't seem to be any motive for him to do it. But as soon as you told me that our files show Kay Lewis's partner and not an employee, I got suspicious. Mm-hmm. Well, go on. Tell me all about it. All right, slave driver. Jim Baldwin knew there was a big shipment of webs going out this morning. And he wanted it for himself. So he planned everything to look as if he couldn't possibly be mixed up in it. Uh-huh. We told Miss Lewis he was going out after a new batch of spiders. 
But instead, he came back after dark and chiseled around the lock on the door to make it look as if someone had tried to get in. Oh. As soon as I examined the door, I knew it was a phony attempt. Then he arranged with someone to call Miss Lewis at a certain time this morning, just as he got back in with his 11 spiders. He answered the phone himself and told us it was Pete Morrow, that he recognized his voice. That gave Morrow an alibi as well as himself. Then he knocked me out, and Morrow, as they'd arranged, came in and took the web. Jim says he never planned to kill Miss Lewis, and I think that's true. When he found me there, he was afraid, as he hadn't expected any witnesses. He probably thought it would look more legitimate if she were killed. So he took my gun and shot her, then tapped himself on the head hard enough to raise a good bump just to fool me. Then if you hadn't found a parking ticket from Morrow's garage, you wouldn't have had any reason to suspect Morrow, would you? No, that was a lucky break. For me, not for Morrow. But how did Jim get away to kill Morrow? He stayed at the spider lab, didn't he? Well, after Riley got there, he talked Riley into letting him go to the drugstore for some medicine. Oh. But instead, drove to Morrow's place and got there in time to overhear our conversation. Then, being afraid Morrow was going to confess that he, Jim, was behind the deal, shot him. And on his way back, he saw the webs in your car and tried to steal them again. Right. Uh, yes, and um, if Jim didn't go out gathering spiders, as he said he was going to do, where'd he get those 11 spiders he brought back with him? Took them out of the stock at the lab when he was there last night trying to make the lock look as if someone had tried to break in. Oh, then that was why you wanted to count the spiders. Exactly, Betsy. Oh, I get it. Miss Lewis told us in the morning that she had 160 spiders on hand, remember? Mm-hmm. Well, if Jim had brought in 11 more... That would have made 171 and all. Right. So I wanted to count them to see how many there actually were. And when I started to do that, Jim knew the game was up because he knew we'd find only 160, which had been there before. So he tried to get rid of us by breaking several of the jars in order to let some of the black widows out, hoping they'd bite him. But one did him instead. Yes. I saw one heading for him, so I kept talking, hoping he wouldn't notice it. Then when it did bite him... I shot his gun out of his hand. It's an old story, isn't it? As has happened many times before, a widow caused his downfall, poor man. In just a moment, Nick and Patsy will bring you a preview of next week's exciting case. But right now, here's a helpful hint. When there are children in your home, it's a real job to keep your furniture looking its best. Small hands leave fingerprints, small shoes leave scratches, and the youngsters demand so much of your time. So it's really wise to depend on the quick, easy shortcut to furniture beauty, Linux Cream Polish. Linux Cream Polish renews the gleaming beauty of your fine furniture, and it's so simple to use, for it cleans as it polishes, saving you half the time and energy. Yes, in one quick application, Linux Cream Polish does away with the cloudy look of dust and old polish, erases finger marks, helps conceal scratches. And Linux Cream Polish dries hard, so there's no leftover oil for dust to cling to. Ask for Linux Cream Polish at your dealers now. You'll find all three great Linux home brighteners, Linux Cream Polish, Linux Clear Gloss Varnish, and Linux Self-Polishing Wax. At your nearest hardware, paint, or department store. Now, an urgent reminder. Your serviceman needs the Red Cross. Needs the touch of home it provides for him wherever he may be. Help support the Red Cross Overseas Clubs and what they can do for that fighting man of yours. Contribute now toward the $200 million the Red Cross needs. And keep your Red Cross at his side. <laughs> And now let's hear from Nick Carter himself. Well, Nicholas, what's your story about next week? Patsy and I went to the races one afternoon just before the season closed and saw one of the most exciting races I've ever witnessed. But as the winning jockey came down the home stretch, he suddenly fell from his horse and was instantly killed. And Nick, being a detective, born and bred, instantly smelled a murder. Nothing to go on, just one of his hunches. Was it murder, Nick? Even in the absence of proof, Ken, I knew it was murder. The only job was to get something concrete in the way of evidence. Which Nick, being Nick, proceeded to do. Much to the annoyance of a great many people who all tried to do something about it. What do you call this story of yours, Nick? Death goes to the post. Or the mystery of the murdered jockey. And that's all for now. So long. Details next week. 
So long, everybody. And so long to both of you. We'll be looking forward to seeing you next week as usual. Time, listen to another curious experience of Nick Carter, master detective, entitled Death Goes to the Post. Or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Murdered Jockey. <laughs> Nick Carter, master detective, is featured in Street and Smith magazine. Long Clark is starred as Nick with Helen Schultz as Patsy. Original music is played by Lou White, and the programs are written and directed by Jock McGregor. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented at this time and over these same stations each week by the three great Linux home brighteners. Linux clear gloss varnish, Linux cream polish, and Linux self-polishing wax. Created by Acme, America's great producer of Acme fine quality paint. This is Ken Powell speaking for the thousands of Linux dealers all over America and saying so long until next week. This is Mutual. <laughs> It's another case for that most famous of all manhunters. The detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Presented by the three great Linux home brighteners. Linux clear gloss varnish, Linux cream polish, and Linux self-polishing wax. Created by Acme, America's great producer of fine Acme quality paints. Today's curious adventure, Death goes to the post. Or Nick Carter and the mystery of the unlucky jockey. In just a moment, we'll hear how Nick Carter was able to solve the mystery of what happened to the unlucky jockey and why he failed to win the big race. But now, here's a suggestion for you. It doesn't take folks long to learn what's worthwhile. That's why millions of wise American homemakers have discovered Chemtone, the miracle wall finish. That's why they're now discovering the new magic for woodwork, floors, and furniture. The three great Linux home brighteners. Linux clear gloss varnish to give lustrous, longer-lasting protection to every wood and linoleum surface. Linux cream polish to renew the sleek, gleaming beauty of fine furniture. And Linux self-polishing wax to lend rich, satiny loveliness to any floor, wood, linoleum, or tile. Take the modern shortcut to new home beauty with the three great Linux home brighteners. You'll find them all at your hardware, paint, or department store. Your headquarters also for Chemtone, the miracle wall finish. And now for today's mysterious adventure with Nick Carter. As today's story opens, it's near the end of the last racing season in World City. Nick and Patsy are walking back to Nick's office when Nick suddenly seizes Patsy's arm and says, Hold it, Patsy. What's the matter, Nick? That woman coming out of the pawn shop. Looks familiar, but I can't place her. She's a good-looking woman. Although if that blonde hair of hers is natural, I'm a Chinese grandmother. She doesn't seem to be connected with crime in any way, yet... And look who's trailing her. Hmm? Benny Retzel. I know him right enough. He's a private cop for the Mutual Protective Agency, isn't he? Yes, and they're a choice outfit not to get mixed up with. Their slogan is, you marry them and we trail them. Well, let them go. What do we care who's getting married or divorced? We can just mind our own business now, and wait go a minute. On... I'm going in the pawn shop. I want to ask a few questions. But why? What's it to us? Oh, probably nothing. Just curious to know who that woman was. Go ahead, make a fool of yourself. She's probably nobody. Well, Mr. Carter here. Oh, so it's you, Al. Yeah, I swear to you, though, I ain't guilty. What's this you're not guilty of? Whatever you say I've done, I ain't. Oh, you probably have at that. Yep. But that's not why I'm here. Who was that good-looking blonde that just went out of here? Uh -oh. You know her, but I don't. Eh, such a one she is. The wife of Colonel Pembert, no less. Colonel Pembert? The big horse race man? Yeah, that's the one. And you know, if I was a betting man, Carter, which I ain't, I'd see if the colonel had a horse running at the track this afternoon, and I'd put a bet down on him. <laughs> on the colonel or the horse? 
such a question. <laughs> the colonel, he could have been a horse race, maybe? <laughs> Go on, Al. What's the story? Uh, it's just a hunch, that's all. But uh, when a dame asks me to give her $3,000 on a string of pearls worth maybe 10000 and swear she'll redeem them in 24 hours, and if she's married to a string of fast horses... Well, you can make your own guess. And it would still be a guess. Take me to the races, Nick. Why should I? I want to win some money by betting on the colonel's horse. You know the colonel, don't oh, you? Oh, yes, I know him slightly, but I hardly think that's... Oh, come what... on, Nick. It'll be fun out there anyway. I love horses. All right, but don't expect me to pay your betting losses. You're strictly on your own out there. <laughs> It's always a thrill to me to be in the paddock where you can see the horses close to. Gosh, they're such beautiful things. You certainly are. Oh, there's the colonel in his party. Let's stroll over there. Oh, there's his wife, too. Yeah. She looks more interested in the young man beside her than she does in the colonel. Maybe she is. He's much better looking. Not so old, either. Hello, Colonel Pembert. How are you? Oh, hello, Carter. Fine, thanks. I believe you know my wife. I don't, but I'm happy to. Thank you, Mr. Carter. This is Miss Bowen. Miss Hi, Bowen. How do you do? How do you do? Oh, what a beautiful horse. Is that yours, Colonel? Uh, yes, Miss Bowen. That's Speed Queen, the winner of the next race. Oh. How do you know that, Colonel? Because she's ready. She'll run the legs off every other horse in the race. Better put something down on her. I'll believe a horse is really going to win when I see her trainer putting up some of his own money. Well, you'd see that right now, except that I never allow my employees to bet on any race in which we have an entry. <laughs> is that right, Dearson? That's right. It's only that rule of yours that's keeping me from picking up a fortune on this race. Well, I still say I'll believe it when I see it. The end of the race is the time to tell how good Speed Queen really is. Shall we go, Patsy? Mm-hmm. Right to the betting window. I want to put two dollars down on Speed Queen. She's too beautiful to lose a race. Sunny Boy still in the lead with Nimrod and Golden Spur close behind. Sunny Boy's pulling away from Nimrod. Looks like a strong winner, but you can't tell you, of course. Nimrod's getting a good lead on Golden Spur, who's coming up Well, third. Betsy, your friend Speed Queen is pretty far back in the bunch, if I can see straight from here. That doesn't mean a thing, Nick, you know it. Nothing, except that you're probably out two dollars. I am not. I'm going to win. Look at Speed Queen now. She's starting to come up. Say, she is at that. But now things seem to be changing. Speed Queen, who's been hanging in the back of the bunch so far, is beginning to pull up. Come on, She's passing the other horses as if they were standing still. Sunny Boy still in the lead with Nimrod close behind. Now Speed Queen is third and still growing strong. It's almost incredible the way she's running. Uh-oh, Speed Queen lost ground then when her jockey swung her wide to get around the leaders. Oh, too bad. Oh, no, look at that. She's coming up neck and neck with Sunny Boy. They're coming down the stretch together. Now Speed Queen pulling ahead. Oh, I'm a sucker, am I? Look at that baby girl. Oh, Nick, she's going to win. She's going to win. Looks very possible now, Patsy. She's certainly showing her heels to the rest of them. If she can pass Sunny Boy now, she may make it. She's ignorant. She's out in front. She's... Oh, that was awful, Nick. What do you suppose happened to Speed Queen's jockey? We may never know, Patsy. He wasn't dead when he fell off his horse. The horses coming up behind him trampled him to death. Do you suppose he had heart failure? Maybe. And maybe not. When a horse that isn't a favorite suddenly comes up from behind to take the lead away from the favorite, and then something happens that lets the favorite win after all, I'm just naturally a little suspicious. Oh, hiya, Nick. Oh, hiya, Tim. Well, do you have anything on this race? Well, Patsy had two dollars on Speed Queen, That's but right. you saw what happened. Well, she must have gotten the same tip I did. Well, Speed Queen was all set to win, but the big money didn't know it. I was so sure the tip was good that I put a hundred bucks on her nose. Well, here's one ticket I'll never cash in. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Huh? Don't tear up that ticket. If you don't want it, give it to me, will you? Oh, you want a souvenir? Sure. You're welcome to it and anything you can collect on it. <laughs> Thanks. You know, if Speed Queen had one, that'd be worth 1300 bucks. Now it's just waste paper. Perhaps you're right, Tim, but I have a hunch. Come on, Patsy. Let's stroll down to the payoff windows. <laughs> Well, look who's at the $100 window. Pinky Deems. Never had over $5 on a race in his life. Nick, will you look at the handful of tickets he has? If those are all winners, there must be five or $6,000 there. Easily that much. No question about it, Patsy. Somebody knew something was going to happen to make Sonny Boy the winner. And for the sake of the poor dead jockey and speed queen, I'm going to find out what it was that did happen. Wait a minute. I'll be right back. Okay, Nick. Pinky? Pinky Deems. Huh? Oh, oh, you got it. 
And you give a guy the jumps grabbing at him that way. I didn't think you touts ever believed in your own tips, Pinky. Not enough to bet all that money on him. You got me wrong, Connor. I didn't have nothing on this race. It was just hanging around. I only got bus fare back to town. Uh, Pinky, uh, I hold a $100 ticket on Speed Queen. I hate to be a sucker. A sucker? Oh, yeah, yeah. You, you Joe was tough about the jock falling dead just when he was winning like that. Yeah. But lucky for those betting on Sonny Boy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, look, Carter, I got to go see a At guy. At 13 to 1, the ticket I have is worth $1,300. I'm keeping that ticket. Might be a smart idea for somebody to buy it from me. Huh? I'll be in my office until four o'clock. After four, we'll be too late. Hey, I, I, I don't know what you're talking about. Just pass the word along. That's all. All right, Patsy. That's enough racing for one day. Let's get back to the office. <laughs> think you're going to hear from somebody before four o'clock, Nick? It's almost that now. We have callers, Betsy. I'll get it. Yes? Okay, thanks very much. Not a caller, Nick. It's a package. Package? Mm -hmm. What did I tell you? Well, I'll be a... What is it, Nick? Look. Somebody's ear. Oh, Nick, how horrible. There's a note. Says, Pinky, listen too hard. He won't hear you the next time you talk too much. If you do. So I was right. Was murder. You mean Speed Queen's jockey? Exactly. Give me the phone. But, Nick, I, I don't understand. You will. Hello. Daily Globe? Put Tim Rourke on. Just a minute. What are you going to do? Oh, Tim Rourke speaking. Tim? This is Nick Carter. Oh, hello, Nick. What's on your mind? Got a hot special for your final edition. Yeah, what is it? Quote me this way. The death of Speed Queen's jockey in the third race this afternoon was not accidental. What? It was murder. Hey, now, wait a minute, Nick. Are you sure you're... Run it just that way and quote me. Then you'll be in the clear. Yeah, but I can't just... Yes, you can. I've never given you a bum steer yet, have I? No, but well, I... Thanks, Tim. So long. That ought to start something. Maybe somebody will try to buy that $100 ticket for me yet. Nick, you can't mean you're trying to blackmail somebody into paying you $1,500 for not investigating. Oh, you know me better than that, Patsy. I hope somebody will try to pay me the money so I can get a lead on where to look for the jockey's murderer. Because it was murder, and no mistake. Well, we've never known Nick to be wrong when he finally makes up his mind, but this looks like pretty slim evidence on which to make a charge of murder. Is Nick on the right track, or is he sticking his neck out looking for trouble? Can he prove the charge that he's just made? And how will he go about it? We'll see in just a moment. If you're a homemaker, you have every reason to take pride in a home that fairly gleams with the evidence of careful attention. And every wood and linoleum surface in your home will gleam when you use Linex Clear Gloss Varnish. Because Linex Clear Gloss lends a lustrous finish that keeps its beauty a long, long time. It lessens your housework amazingly, too, for it's so easy to keep clean. Dirt stays on the surface, where you can wipe it away in a jiffy. And Linex Clear Gloss is so simple to apply. You just brush it on, and it dries without brush marks to an elastic, transparent finish that wears and wears. A finish which protects every surface to which it's applied. Yes, it's a fact. Linex Clear Gloss protects all the wood and linoleum surfaces in your home against damage by boiling water, hot grease, fruit acids, perfume, even alcohol. In every way, it's truly the super varnish. Ask for it by name at your dealers. Linex, L-I-N-X, Linex Clear Gloss Varnish. You'll find all three great Linex home brighteners and Chemtone, the miracle wall finish, at hardware, paint, and department stores everywhere. Now back to our story. Nick is convinced that the death of the jockey on Speed Queen was not an accident. In fact, he believes it was deliberate murder. But it's going to be a long, hard road proving it. It's later the same day as we look in on Lieutenant Riley's office at headquarters just as Nick drops in. Well, how are you, Nick? Haven't seen you around here in a dog's age. Riley, how many murders does it take to interest you? Murders? I haven't heard about any murders, but, but if you'll tell me where you hid the bodies, I'll be glad to look into it for you. One of the bodies was the jockey in the third race this afternoon. Ah. What's your report on him? 
unavoidable accident it was. The doc says it was a heart attack, and the other horses was bunched so close they couldn't get out of his way when he fell off. Better change that to lead poisoning, Riley. Lead poisoning? You're nuts. Can you prove it? No, not yet. But the doc didn't mention any bullet wounds. Naturally not. How could he with a jockey's head all smashed up? But Another I... thing. A small-time tout by the name of Pinky Deems won't be doing any more touting from now on. Why not? He's dead. Murdered. If you don't believe me, put out a pickup order on him and see if any of your boys can find him. Do you know anything, Nick, or is this all guesswork? Two murders in the last couple of hours, Riley, and I may be the third. Yeah, come in. Lieutenant Riley, I'm mad, and I want Why, you... Why, hello, to... Colonel Pembroke. Something bothering you? Oh, it's you. Yes, you're bothering me. Why do you have to shoot off your big mouth to the papers the way you did? You approve of murder, Colonel? No, I don't. I don't approve of rumors of murder, either. I demand that you retract your accusations or produce some concrete proof to back them up. I didn't accuse you of anything, Colonel. I didn't say you did. It was a reflection on my stable and on the glorious sport of thoroughbred racing. It's really all your fault, you know. My fault? Yes. You recommended Speed Queen so highly that I watched the race much more closely than usual. And what I saw led me to make the statement you see there in the paper. You say the death of my jockey was murder? I do. I say you're a fool. Maybe. But I'm going to keep on saying it's murder until someone does something about it. But, Nick, you, you must have something to back up this claim of yours. I have, but none of it's evidence yet. For one thing, don't forget that with Speed Queen out of the way, Sonny Boy won that race at very attractive odds. John Gainley, Sonny Boy's owner, made a sweet lot of money on the deal. Ah, John Gainley's a crafty old bird, but he wouldn't murder my jockey. Uh, Colonel Pembert, before I go any further with this, I'd like to talk to your trainer. Dearson, is it? Dearson is no longer my trainer. I fired him a couple of hours ago. Fired him? Why? Well, you saw the race. You saw the way Speed Queen's jockey pulled white on the turn, failed to take the fence. Probably just Mr. Skew, that's all. My trainers are responsible for all such things. I will not tolerate such blunders. That's a little thin, Colonel. Are you sure you didn't use that as an excuse to get rid of this? Now, see here, Carter. I don't have... Come in, come in. Lieutenant Riley, I demand that you... Well, oh, hello, Pembert. Are you responsible for this? This stuff in the paper? I am not. What makes you think I'd do a thing like that? It sounds like one of your tricks. It was entirely my idea, Mr. Gainley. Oh. Well, what's your gripe? Did you have two bucks on Speed Queen's nose? My gripe, Mr. Gainley, is that a jockey who was supporting his mother and a little sister was killed so somebody could make money. And I don't like things like that. Also, I have a hundred dollar ticket on Speed Queen's nose that isn't worth anything now. Oh, blackmail. I get it. Just because my horse was a better horse than Pembert's, you kick when he wins. Your horse was beaten to a standstill when a rifle bullet gave him his chance to win. If you think you're scaring me... Mr. Ganley, I'm only trying to do one thing. I want to know who killed Speed Queen's jockey and why. I was there this afternoon. I saw nothing to indicate murder. Few men have ever seen a rifle bullet actually at work. But the medical report, Carter... A steel jacketed bullet won't leave much evidence of its passage in a skull that's smashed a few seconds later by a dozen iron shot hoops. Well, Riley, you got enough to start on? Gosh, Nick, I don't see where to begin. There's no evidence. Okay. But well, don't blame me if the commissioner gets on the phone and starts asking questions. But, Nick, I... You come in, Colonel Pembert. Just a minute. I want to talk to Lieutenant Riley a moment. Come on, Carter. I want to talk to you anyway, privately. Why, of course, Mr. Gainley. I'll be seeing you, Riley. So long, Nick. So long, Colonel. <laughs> Step in my car with me for a minute. We can talk quietly. All right. But I don't see what you and I have to talk about. It won't take but a minute. Now. All right, Carter. What's your game? I told you that upstairs. I don't believe you. You're sore because you failed to win your bet on Speed Queen. You don't really care for the jockey who was killed. You're welcome to think anything you like, Mr. Ganley. You think if you talk long enough and loudly enough... Somebody's going to pay you to shut up. Go on. Unfortunately for me, your accusation points directly at me. As the owner of the winning horse, I profited by the jockey's death. But I certainly didn't murder him. No one has accused you of murder? Yet? But they will. There'll be fingers pointed at me. There'll be investigations by the racing commission. How much was the ticket you have on that race? A hundred dollars. A thirteen to one, it's thirteen hundred dollars. Here you are. I trust we understand each other now. I understand that you've just given me thirteen hundred dollars. And I also understand that a jockey was killed in cold blood. But Carter, I said we had nothing to talk about, Mr. Ganley, and I was right. So long. Oh, 
there you are, Nick. Mrs. Pembert's been waiting over an hour to see you. Hello, Mrs. Pembert. What's on your mind? Could I speak to you alone? Whatever you can tell me, you can tell Patsy. We work together. Well, all right. Mr. Carter, I know everything. My husband told me this afternoon that you've been spying on me. Yes? Colonel Pembert was in a dreadful temper. He, he fired Dick, Mr. Dearson, and then told me about having you follow me. So that's why he fired Dearson. Yes. Oh, I don't know what came over me. I really love the colonel, but Dick, Mr. Dearson swept me off my feet. I guess I'm just weak. Why have you come here now? I must know, Mr. Carter. Have you told the colonel that I pawned my necklace this morning? Why is that important? If the colonel knew that I pawned my pearls and gave the money to Dick to bet on Speed Queen, then he must be the one behind the jockey's murder. He wanted to be sure that Dick would lose, because if he won, I was planning to run away with him on the winnings we'd make. Are you saying that your husband killed the jockey so you and Dearson couldn't run away together? Oh, it must be that. He must love me very much. I thought he didn't care. Did the colonel tell you I'd been following you, spying on you? We said he'd hired a private detective to report everything I did. Mrs. Pembert, I'm a private detective, but I wouldn't touch one of those divorce investigations if I starved to death. Then, these things I've told you, you didn't know them? Not positively. But you give me some valuable information. Thank you. I'd guessed at most of it, but had no confirmation. Nicholas Carter's office. Mr. Carter's busy just now. May I take a message for him? Very well, I'll tell him. Goodbye. Well, that was short and sweet. What was it? It was Colonel Pember. <gasps> Colonel Pember? Yes, he said to tell you, Nick, that he was sending you $1,300 by messenger. He said you'd know what he meant. So the colonel's decided that he can't ignore my charges, and he wants me to drop them. Doesn't that prove what I just said, Mr. Carter? I don't know. Does it? He must be behind it. Oh, the poor man. I must go to him at once. You better not tell him you were here when his message came. Oh, I won't. Goodbye, Mr. Carter. Patsy. Mm hmm. Get me the Mutual Protective Agency. Joe Brown. Okay. Maybe it's not blackmail, Nick, but it's certainly producing results. <laughs> Originally, I let it be known that I'd lost $100 on Speed Queen just to see what reaction I'd stir up. I wanted to get a lead on the killer. And now the money comes in by itself. Well, we'll give it to the Red Cross. There's no better use for any money than that. Hello? Mr. Joe Brown, please. Wish I had more to give them. Hello? Just a minute. Nick Carter calling. Thanks, Betsy. Hello, Joe. Have you finished that job for Colonel Pembert yet? Uh, what job? On his wife. His wife and Dick Dearson. Oh, well, yeah. Just delivered the final report. Why? Well, if you're finished with it, you won't mind giving me Dearson's address, will you? He moved from his old place recently, I find, and left no forwarding address. Just a minute. 47 East Willow Road. You know, the colonel bounced it just a little while ago. Yes, I know. 47 East Willow Road. Thanks, Joe. Do as much for you someday. So long. What makes you think Colonel Pember's trainer's mixed up in this, Nick? How could he get in on it? He has some information I want, that's all. Oh. For now. So you better drive me out to 47 East Willow Road. And fast. <laughs> Mr. Dearson, well, he's left already. Any idea where he's gone? No, he packed his stuff and went out. Expressman's coming for his stuff in a few minutes now. He's meeting him at the station. This is stuff here? Yes, and three bags and a trunk. You mind if I look at them? Uh, suit yourself. It's a new trunk, Nick. Yes. The bags look quite new, too. Mm. I wonder if there are any tags. Well, here's a tag on the trunk. William Stewart, 711 4th Street, Evansville, Indiana. Yes. A new trunk. And yet... Well, what is it, Nick? Come on, Patsy. Let's meet Dearson at the station. See this headline, Dearson? Huh? What? Oh, it's you. I said, have you seen the headlines? It says Speed Queen's jockey was murdered. Who said so? I do. What do you know about it? Practically everything. How come you know so much? I get around. And I keep my eyes and ears open. For instance, I know that there's some connection between you and a certain William Stewart of Evansville, Indiana. What? What are you talking about? The tag on your trunk. Your nice new trunk. The trunk 
with the blood stains on it. I, I don't... Keep your hands in sight, Tyson. If you don't, I'll shoot first. That's better. Now, suppose we forget about taking the train and call on Lieutenant Riley instead. He thinks I'm nuts. But when you tell him what you know, he'll find out I was right all along. Will you get to the point, Carter? You didn't ask us here just to talk about the weather. Very well. Now that Mr. Gainley's here, let's get on with it. Now, you've each paid me $1,300 to hush up the investigation into the death of Speed Queen's jockey. You thought I was blackmailing you. But if you'd known me better, you'd have known I can't be bribed. I took the money, and I'm turning it over to the Red Cross. But I kept on looking around, and now I have the whole story. Well, if you've got the answer to this business, you can turn my money over to the Red Cross, and welcome. And I'll put as much more with it. And that goes for me, Carter. Now, now, what is the story? Briefly, it's this. Mrs. Pembert pawned her necklace and gave the $3,000 to Dearson to bet on Speed Queen. He thought Dearson was in love with her, but he wasn't. He just wanted her money. So he bet the money on Sonny Boy to win and arranged for having Speed Queen's jockey shot at the turn if Speed Queen took the lead. Pinky Deems put the bets down for him and collected his winnings. But I saw Pinky do it, and I spoke to him. I told him I should expect some action by 4 o'clock. Instead of what I expected, I got Pinky's ear as a warning to lay off. And I suppose that when I paid you that $1,300, you thought I was behind it. No, Gainley, I knew that you paid me to keep the scandal out of the papers, if possible. You didn't want racing to get a black eye. Yes, that was it. And you, Colonel Pembert, you paid me $1,300 to keep your wife from learning what a fool she'd been, didn't you? Yes, I knew she'd made a fool of herself over Dearson, and I wanted to protect her. I love her. And she loves you, Colonel. I know that. Can you prove any of this, Carter? Not much of it, unless Dearson confesses which I feel sure he'll do. But why should he confess, Nick, if you can't prove anything on him? Because there's one thing we can hang on him, fairly and squarely. What's that? Pinky's death. If you were to look in the trunk which Dearson just bought, you'd find Pinky's body minus one ear being shipped to what is undoubtedly a fake address. There were minute traces of blood in the trunk when I examined it. That alone will take care of our Mr. Dearson, who seems to have double-crossed everyone he came in contact with except himself. <laughs> Looks to me as if fate had double-crossed him, the way it turns out. Quite right, Patsy. Fate is a way of double-crossing those who don't obey the laws of right and wrong. In just a moment, Nick and Patsy will bring you a preview of next week's exciting case. You know that the more homelike the place you live in, the more fun you have inviting folks to share your hospitality. And these days, every home can look its shining best with very little effort when you depend on the three great Linux home brighteners. Take Linux cream polish, for instance. One quick, easy application reveals your fine furniture in all its original gleaming beauty. Renews the appearance of the wood. Frees it from the dull cloudiness of dust, old polish, and finger marks. You see, Linux cream polish actually cleans as it polishes, cutting your job in half, saving one whole step. And when you're through, you'll find that Linux cream polish has left no oiliness on the surface of your furniture. It dries hard, bright, and dustless. Yes, in every way, Linux cream polish for fine furniture is the modern shortcut to furniture loveliness. Be sure to ask your dealer for it by name. Linux cream polish for fine furniture, which cleans as it polishes. You'll find all three great Linux home brighteners, Linux self-polishing wax, Linux clear gloss varnish, and Linux Cream Polish at your nearest hardware, paint, or department store. And now let's hear from Nick Carter himself. Well, Nick, would you care to give us a peek into next week's story? He'd be delighted to. He's been waiting for just that very question. (laughs) Thanks for the build-up, Patsy. It's a story of an actor. An actor who, for some strange reason, seemed to be followed by a constant procession of almost fatal accidents. He was hurt several times, but always escaped death. What was it all about? Well, the manager of the theater, a friend of mine, called me in to find the answer to that same question. Which Nick found, of course, and just in the nick of time. Well, what do you call it, Nick? Death behind the scenes. Or the mystery of the persecuted actor. Complete details next week. So long. So long, everybody. And so long to you both, Patsy and Nick. Be seeing you next week, same as usual.
Next week, the same time, listen to another curious experience of Nick Carter, master detective, entitled Death Behind the Scenes, or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Persecuted Actor. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is featured in Street and Smith magazines. Lon Clark is starred as Nick with Helen Choate as Patsy. Original music is played by Lou White, and the programs are written and directed by Jock McGregor. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented at this time and over these same stations each week by the three great Linux home brighteners. Linux Clear Gloss Varnish, Linux Cream Polish, and Linux Self-Polishing Wax. Created by Acme, America's great producer of Acme fine quality paints. This is Ken Powell speaking for the thousands of Linux dealers all over America and saying so long until next week. This is Mutual. The detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Presented by the three great Linux home brighteners. Linux clear gloss varnish, Linux cream polish, and Linux self-polishing wax. Created by Acme, America's great producer of fine Acme quality paint. Today's curious adventure, Death Behind the Scenes. On Nick Carter and the mystery of the persecuted actor. In just a moment, we'll hear how Nick Carter solved the mystery of the persecuted actor and prevented death behind the scenes from becoming a grim reality. But now, a word to the women. Millions of homemakers can't be wrong. For example, the millions who have learned what wonders Chemtone, the miracle wall finish, can do. And those same homemakers are now discovering the modern way to new beauty for their floors, woodwork, and furniture. The three great Linux home brighteners. Linux self-polishing wax, which beautifies your floors with a satiny, yet tough, no-skid finish that resists wear, water, and dirt. Linux cream polish, which cleans as it polishes, leaving no oily film on your furniture. And Linux clear gloss varnish, the durable super varnish that dries to an elastic, transparent surface, which protects all wood and linoleum in your home. You'll find the three great Linux home brighteners at your hardware, paint, or department store. Your headquarters also for Chemtone, the miracle wall finish. And now for today's mysterious adventure with Nick Carter. As today's story begins, we're backstage at the Republic Theater, where Charles Forrest is directing a rehearsal of his new play, Lord Byron. But it will not be possible for us to live our lives as we want to. We must live for those nearest and dearest to us. You're right, my darling. I see it all now. Nothing that may happen to us can ever change the fact that I love you. Love you with every fiber of my being. Love you with a depth I'd never thought possible. Nothing will ever change that. And I feel the same way, Robert. And I always... Well, well, go on, Miss Davis. She can't go on, Mr. Forrest. That's why my cue to enter. And as usual, he isn't here. Oh! Oh, that's your cue. I don't see why we always have to wait until Paul Weimar condescends to honor us with his presence. We spend more time waiting for him to pick up his cues than we do with her thing. Take it easy, Dick. You don't have to go griping about Weimar all the time. Paul, on stage, please. We're waiting for you. Coming, Mr. Forrest. Just a moment. Coming, Mr. Forrest. Why can't he stay here the way the rest of us do? You forget it. Mr. Paul Weimar is a great foreign star. Who is? You got him, Paul? Oh, sorry to keep you waiting, Mr. Forrest. Oh, Paul, oh, what happened? Dick. It's happened again. It's happened again. I can't go on. What did it, Paul? Another accident. Again, someone tried to kill me. This time it's a sandbag that drops almost on my head. Bradley, what's going on up there? Don't worry, Mr. Forrest. Lying out in the sandbag must come on time. I'll take care of it. I'm through. I give up. Things break when I sit in them. Things fall over on me. And now, now this bag drops on my head. I'm sure it was an accident, Paul. Come on, let's get on with this scene. We open in three days. No, oh, I do not open in three days or ever. I'm through. Look, Paul, you can't quit on me now. It's too late. We're almost ready to open. We'll not stay here and get killed. Paul, suppose I get Nick Carter to come down here and find out what's going on. He can stop all these accidents you've been having. 
Will that satisfy you? You will get the great Nick Carter to make an investigation? I will if you'll stay with me. He'll see that nothing more happens to you. Yes, Mr. Weimar. Mr. Carter will protect you. Oh, shut up, Dick. This is serious. Will you get to work if I get Carter down here for... Oh, very well. I, I will try it once more. But if there are any more of these accidents that nearly kill me, I shall go home and stay there. Carter or no Carter. All right. Betty, take over the rehearsal. I'm going to get Nick Carter right now. <laughs> Say you're having trouble with your new play for us? I certainly am, Carter. It's supposed to be the life of Lord Byron, the poet. So to play the lead, I brought an actor over from Paris. A man named Paul Weimar. He looks almost exactly like Byron, and he's a good actor. Doesn't sound like trouble so far. Wait. And ever since we started rehearsals, one accident after another has happened to Weimar. So that by this time, he's getting so jittery that I'm afraid he won't be able to go on with the play. Well, what kind of accident for us? Well, one time a heavy door almost fell on him. Just missed him. Another time, a chair he was sitting in collapsed under him and sent him to the hospital for three days with a wrenched back and so on. Today, the final straw, a heavy sandbag counterweight fell on, almost on top of him as he crossed the stage. I don't blame him for being jittery. Any idea what's behind all these things? Neither one of two things. Neither somebody's trying to kill Paul or they're trying to scare him out of the show. And there's only one person, as far as I know, who'd profit by getting rid of Paul. And who's that? Richard Woolen, my American star. He was so upset at not being given the part of Byron that he swore he'd never act for me again. And suddenly he agreed to play the second lead, which surprised me, even though it is a pretty fat role. Hmm. And if Paul Weimar had to give up the role for any reason, I suppose Roland would automatically step into the part? Yes, of course. Well, that certainly gives Roland a motive, doesn't it? Will you take the case, Nick? If you don't, I'm afraid Weimar will walk out on me, contract or no contract. Mm-hmm. When do you have your next rehearsal? Tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock. If the rest of the scenery is hung and ready. All right. I'll be there at 10.30 to look over the ground. Will you see to it that ever... I'll take it, Nick. Nicholas Carter's office. Yes, he's here. Just a minute. It's for you, Mr. Carter. Uh, for me? Oh, mm-hmm. thanks. Hello? What? No, don't let anybody get away. Keep everything just as it is when we get there. Yes, I'm bringing him with me. Y- yes, yes, right away. Goodbye. That was Barry, my assistant stage manager. Roland is supposed to fire a shot at Paul in the second act. But when he fired just now, it wasn't a blank. It was real. Oh. But why am I hurt? No, fortunately, the bullet missed him. Another accident, huh? Yes, another one. Heaven only knows what Wymer will do now. Let's get down there immediately. I want to start working on this before it's too late. <laughs> Say you're doing, Mr. Forrest? One of the best known writers, Bert Lavard. Oh, mm-hmm. a very rich man, a successful playwright, writes for his own amusement. Didn't I read somewhere that he doesn't smoke or drink and that he never marries? That's right. He's a peculiar duck. What? No weaknesses? <laughs> no. There's a reason for that, Carter. He had a younger brother who went to Paris for training in art. He met a wild crew there, got to drinking and carrying on, and ended up in an insane asylum where he died a year or two later. Levan has never touched liquor or tobacco from that day to this. Well, I've enjoyed life for many years without smoking or drinking. Now, this is Ada. Yes, and there's Fred Knight Norman waiting for us. Fred, this is Mr. Carter. He's in charge now. Hello. Hello, Fred. Has anybody left here since the shooting? No, Mr. Carter. Nobody's been out or in. Through this way, Mr. Carter. Quiet! Quiet! Please, everybody! Ladies and gentlemen, this is Mr. Nick Carter. He's in charge here now, and whatever he says goes. Now, that's Paul Weimer over there, Mr. Carter, and Richard Rowland next to him. How do you do? Now, first, let me get the facts. So, Rowland, suppose you tell me what happened. Well, in the second scene in the second act, Lord Byron is threatened by the husband of a lady to whom Byron's making love. I play the husband, and I'm supposed to shoot him. Instead of the old-fashioned pistol we'll actually use in the play, we've been using a small automatic with blanks. When I fired it just now, it wasn't a blank, but a real bullet. Fortunately, it's missed Weimar, but I'm sorry to say it struck a stagehand who just happened to be in the line of fire. Was he badly hurt? No, it just scratched his cheek. Where's the gun you used? Oh, right here on the table. Hmm, that is cold. Only one shell in it, and that's been fired. Roland, who has charge of this gun before it's given to you? Rogers, the property man. Get him, please. Rogers! Rogers! On stage! Well, everybody, please take the same positions now that you were in when the shot was fired. 
This is about the way we were, Mr. Carter. Good. Is everybody here now? Where's Betty? Betty! Betty! Right here! Now, go upstairs, make your phone call when Roland fires are staying out of sight now. Okay, stay there for now. Where's the property man? Rogers, where are you? Here I am. Rogers, where were you when the gun was fired? In my property room. What can you tell us about this? Nothing. I loaded the gun, same as usual, with the blank. Anybody see you do it? Sure, Bradley, the stage hand was with me. Then I left the gun on the table and went out to talk to Fred, the doorman. And while you were gone, someone took out the blank and put in a real bullet. Could be. I wouldn't know. Anybody see anyone near the property room while Rogers was not there? Oh, come on, speak up. Did you see anyone near the gun after it was loaded? Now listen, if you know something, speak up. This isn't acting, it's murder. Mr. Carter... Did you I... see anyone near the property room after the gun was loaded? Well, yes, I did. My girlfriend and I were having a smoke behind one of the wings, and we saw... We saw... Well, go on. Who went in there? Well, it, it was... It was I, Carter. I went in there to find the match, but I didn't touch the gun. Oh, you did it on purpose, you jealous... Careful, why, Margo? Start calling me. You thought it'd be on purpose. You want to play the lead role, Well, Carter... Maybe Rowan could have done it, Luke. No, it's too obvious, Patsy. Uh-huh. Right now, I'd like to have a look at the bullet that was fired from the gun. How could you find it? It could be anywhere in here. Oh, no, it couldn't. Look here. Uh-huh. It started from where Roland is standing. Mm-hmm. Went across the stage to where the stagehand is standing. Must have gone through those two flats behind him and into the wall. Come on. Okay. Now, if we line up Roland with the holes in these flats, we should find... Uh... Sure, Nick, there it is. In that big wooden post. Ah, yes. Let me get my tweezers. I'll have that bullet out of there before you can see Hey, that was easy, wasn't it? Betty, hmm? look here. This bullet is a thirty-eight. The stage gun is a thirty-two. You mean that bullet didn't come from Roland's gun? No, Patsy. Whoever fired this bullet stood off stage and used the sound of Roland's gun to cover his own shot. But that... That would be murder. Yes, Patsy. Cold-blooded, deliberate murder. How much longer do you want these people, Miss Carter? Oh, they can go. I am through with them for now. That's all for the day, everyone. Tomorrow morning at 11 sharp. <laughs> Carter, do you think I'll be safe now? Yes, you're safe enough for now, Ivor. But I suggest you go to your hotel. I'll see you there later. Ah, I shall do it. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Carter. Uh, before you go, Carter, I'd like to have you meet our author. All right, Forrest. I was either one in the stage box on the other side. Yes, come on over. You'll like him. Mr. Levant, yes. I'd like you to meet Mr. Nick Carter. Mr. Carter, Mr. Levant. How do you do? Glad to know you. Have you learned anything, Mr. Carter? Yes. The gun Roland used was not the gun that fired the bullet. That I know definitely. Juan, that means the shooting wasn't an accident. It means if the one who did the shooting had been a better marksman, Weimer would be dead right now. What's your next step, Mr. Carter? I think I'll go back to the office for a while and do a little thinking. Then I'll drop in on Paul Weimar and see what his side of the story is. Uh, shall we have dinner first? An excellent idea, Carter. I'll pick up my coat and hat and be right with you. I left my things in the box I was sitting in. I'll get them and join you in just a minute. I'll see you outside, Nick. I want to part of my nose. All right, Patsy. Let's have a look around while I wait. Carter! Carter, what is it? What, what's the trouble, Carter? Fall over something? No. Something fell over me. I started to cross the stage and something knocked me over. Almost knocked me out. What's going on in here? Mr. Carter's had an accident. Another of them accidents? That flower pot was on top of that pedestal. For some reason, the whole thing fell over on you. You all right, Carter? Yes, I guess so. But let's get out of here before the roof falls in on us. So you see, Patsy, it has to be that way. You say every member of the cast was on stage when the shot was fired. Yes, but they're all in plain sight of each other. Mm-hmm. And there's only four persons, as far as we know, who were backstage and who could have fired the offstage gun. Rogers, the property man, Fred, the doorman, Barry, the stage manager, and the stagehand, Bradley. And Fred says Rogers was talking to him near the entrance, which gives both of them an alibi. Bradley. And Barry says he was telephoning, and we found that a call was made from that phone at that time. It seems to let him out. And Bradley was shot by the bullet, so he couldn't have fired it. No. Which accounts for all four of them. Which means there's something somewhere we don't know yet. That's one reason I want to talk to Weimar. He may be able to throw some light on the subject. Oh, here you are, driver. Want that thing. Now, clerk, 
Lo Weimer is in 279, isn't he? Yes, sir. Who shall I say it's called? Oh, never mind announcing it. We're expected. Well, what's the name, please? You must be announced. The name is Nick Carter, and don't announce it. But the road will announce all yet. We can walk, Patsy. It's only the second floor. Then why didn't you want to be announced? Just second nature. They don't know I'm coming to see them. They can't get ready to receive me. I like the element of surprise when I go calling officially. Hmm. Room 279. That must be right here. Oh, you, I want you better. Well, Paul Weimar seems to attract trouble as honey attracts the bee. What has happened now? Are his unfortunate accidents not confined to the theater after all? How is Nick going to unravel this tangled thread and reach a solution? We'll see in just a moment. Whatever your family's preference may be, in home decoration, your home is bound to be more beautiful when its floors are well kept and shining. And with Linux self-polishing wax, floors always look their very best without tiresome rubbing or polishing. Yes, with Linux self-polishing wax, which is simply wiped on, your floors are handsome for a long time because Linux self-polishing wax dries to a rich, satiny finish that really lasts thanks to its high content of genuine Carnauba wax. And the finish may be renewed wherever and whenever you like, without re-waxing the whole floor. What's more, Linux self-polishing wax is easy to keep lovely, for you whisk surface dirt away in a twinkling with a damp cloth. And Linux self-polishing wax is the anti-skid floor finish, for the underwriters' laboratories have proved by test that wood, linoleum, and rubber tile floors are actually less slippery after Linux self-polishing wax has been applied. Be sure to ask for Linux. L-I-N-X. Linux self-polishing wax. You'll find all three great Linux home brighteners and Chemtone, the miracle wall finish, at hardware, paint, and department stores everywhere. And now back to our story. We left Nick and Patsy racing toward Paul Weimar's hotel room, from which are coming cries for help. Oh, oh, oh. oh Nick, we've got to get in there. He's in trouble. I'll see if I can open this door. Oh, hurry, hurry. Well, you, you, you told me I wouldn't be safe here. What's happened? A man broke in through the window. He tried to find you. Where is he now? He, he heard you at the door. He ran into the bedroom, went out by the fire escape. And here? Well, there's no one in here now. Oh, fine thing. Even in my hotel, I'm not safe. You ever seen it before? Can you describe it? No, no. It was all too sudden. How long is this going on? I can stand it no more. Every day is something. You say you never saw the man who... Oh, what's that? Yes, only the telephone, Mr. Warner. I won't answer it. I won't. I won't. It might be trouble. You better answer, Patsy. Take the message. Certainly, Nick. Hello, Mr. Warner's room. Is Mr. Warner there? Yes, but he can answer the phone just now. May I take a message? Yes. Tell him Mr. Forrest called and wants Mr. Weimer to meet him in Mr. Weimer's dressing room at the theater at 8.30 tonight. Tonight? Are you sure of that? Yes, he was very specific. Said something about some revisions in the play that had to be made tonight to be ready for rehearsal tomorrow. All right, I'll tell him. Thank you. Oh, was it bad news quick? Oh, not at all, Mr. Weimer. That was the clerk downstairs. Oh. She said Mr. Forrest wants to see you in your dressing room tonight at 8.30 something to do with revisions in the play, and it must be tonight. Oh, oh that is a relief. I must prepare myself to leave. You will excuse me. That's quite all right, Mr. Weimar. Patsy and I must be running along anyway. See you tomorrow at rehearsal. Good night. Good night, and thank you. Good night. Oh, splendid, splendid. I couldn't have arranged it better myself. Nick, are you feeling all right? Oh, never better, Patsy, never better. But why all the unconcealed joy? I'd expected this case would come to a head faster now that I was in it, but I hadn't hoped it would come quite so fast. The end is now in sight, Patsy. You go back to the office and wait for me. Where are you going? To the theater. And I must get there before Weimar does, if his life is to be safeguarded. <laughs> Get the chain. Evening, Mr. Carter. Why, Fred, what are you doing here at this time of night? Do you have to guard the door 24 hours a day? Well, no, sir. Mr. Forrest said he was expecting some clocks about supper time, but they ain't come yet. Told me to wait for him, and I'm waiting. I see. Good. Oh, has anybody been here recently? Why, no. Uh, Brad was here about a half hour ago, but he only stayed a couple of minutes, long enough to get something he forgot, that's all. Mr. Forrest hasn't come down yet? No, he hasn't. Uh, was he coming back tonight? I understood so, but I may be wrong. 
Oh, is it okay to go in? I want to have a look at something. Oh, sure thing. I want some light? No, thanks. I have my flash. Okay, watch yourself, though. This ought to be why my dressing room. Oh, yes. The cane he was carrying in rehearsal this afternoon. Mm hmm. Seems to be no concealed bombs, no booby traps. Oh, okay, for now. Nothing to do now but wait until he arrives. <laughs> What are you doing here? I'm here protecting your life, Mr. Weimer, whether you know it or not. But, uh, Mr. Forrest... Mr. Forrest knows nothing about this. The call you got came from the would-be murderer. He wanted to get you down here so he could finish his job tonight. Finish his job? How? What do you mean? That's what I want you to tell me. Well, before you touch anything or sit down, look around the dressing room. What do you see that doesn't look natural in here? Not look natural? What do you mean? Oh, anything out of place. Something here that shouldn't be here. Something missing. Oh, oh, I see. Now, uh... uh oh, yes, yes. Someone has been smoking my cigarettes. I left nearly a fresh pack here, I remember. Now, look. There are only two cigarettes left. Uh, yes. I might have expected that. Will you have one? No. Neither will you. Unless you want to die fast. Uh, I don't understand. Wait. Yes. These cigarettes have been treated with a deadly drug. One so rare that he could only get enough for two cigarettes. That's why the rest of the pack is missing, so you'd be sure to be killed almost at once. That, Mr. Weimer, was why you received the message to beat Mr. Forrest in your dressing room. You'd smoke at least one cigarette while you waited. And that one would be your finish. But, but who wants to do this to me and why? I know the answer now, but I'd rather not say until I can produce the killer himself. As soon as I can, I... You and the Perry Miller, you'll never... Sorry, I had to shoot out the lights, but I didn't want him to hit you. Hey, Mr. Carter, are you there? What is it that has happened? Daniel you, Weimer. You're safe for the moment. I want to stop that man who just ran off. Your life's in danger as long as he's... Where are you going, Mr. Carter? That's right. I'll be right back. Fred! Fred! Yes, Mr. Carter, did I hear from you? Get in. Who has just ran out here? Well, nobody. Well, he went out some way. I heard him slam the door. Well, he must have gone out that little back door, up behind the dressing room. You mean this isn't the only way out of the theater or backstage? Oh, no, there's that other little door, but that's supposed to be kept locked all the time. Now, that leads out to the other street. Oh, I see. Well, where's your telephone? Now, right there in the office, Mr. Carter. Good. Let me make one phone call and I'll show you a would-be killer. <laughs> can't do this to me. Maybe we can, but we are. So just pipe down. Why won't you tell me what I'm accused of? Because I don't know. I'm acting under orders from... That is, I'm doing what Nick Carter suggests. <laughs> and Nick's a pretty clever guy if I do it, they do. Well, so you get for those kind words, Riley. Well, where the deuce have you been? We've been waiting here in my office. And... Yes, I know, I know, I know. I came as soon as I could. I got in a little traffic jam. Well, there he is. We picked him up just as he came in his hotel lobby, just, just like you said. I mean, now, what do we do with him? He's the man who's been trying to kill Paul Weimer, huh? and who almost succeeded tonight. That's a lie. Is it? What did he have in his pockets, Riley? Oh, well, well he, he, here it is, Nick. It's the usual stuff. Ah, yes. The usual stuff. But not with the usual implications. Now, never mind those two dollar words here. What do you see there that's so interesting? These loose cigarettes, for instance. There must be about ten or twelve there, about half a pack. Mm -hmm. Now, they're Paul Weimer's brand. You see what? And this little box, Riley. Mm -hmm. If you'll have your chemist examine these two cigarettes that were left in Weimar's dressing room, I believe you'll find them full of the same drug that was in this box. What? You'll undoubtedly find traces of it there now. So, sure. well, now you begin to make sense. This is all a pack of lies, a frame-up. It isn't either, and you know it. I am willing to bet that your fingerprints are on the door and out of the little back door where you made your hasty exit from the theater tonight. What's that? Together with a few prints belonging to your assistant Bradley, the stage hand. And I imagine that Bradley will be very willing to talk when he finds he's up on an attempted murder charge. <laughs> All right, Carter. You win. I did it. I hate that man, Weimar. But why should you hate him so, Mr. Levant? Because he was the leader of the gang in Paris who helped my brother drink himself into the insane asylum in the grave. He was more to blame than my poor brother, whom you know better. I wrote this play, Lord Byron, just to get him over here where I could work on him. 
I suggested him to Forrest as the man for the part, and Forrest fell for it. Why didn't you kill him and be done with it? I wanted him to suffer as my brother suffered. But when you got into the case, Carter, I knew I had to finish it up quicker because... Bradley let you into the theater tonight through the little back door, didn't he? Yes. And it was Bradley who phoned the message to Weimar to get him to come down to the theater tonight, wasn't it? Yes. And it was Bradley who worked the backstage accidents after you had planned them, wasn't it? Yes, yes, yes. But he thought it was all part of a practical joke. He didn't know I intended to kill <laughs> oh, All right, all right. Watch your language now. Is the lady present you? Oh, I thought uh, everybody had forgotten about me being over here in the corner. I was just sitting here listening. You fired that shot during the rehearsal, didn't you, Levan? Yes, and I wished I had aimed straighter. How come you hit the stage hand? Pure accident. I didn't even see him until after I'd fired. In a way, it saved us from suspecting he had a hand in these things because it didn't make sense that he should get shot if he was in it. But after a while, when I began to see things the way they were going... I saw it could be nobody but you working with his help. Alex? Yes, Patsy? May I ask a question? Oh, yes, Patsy. One little one. Did you see who shot at Weimar in the theater tonight? No, it was all too fast. Then how did you know it was Mr. Levan? Well, even before I got to Weimar's dressing room tonight, I felt quite sure that Levan was guilty. And then when I entered the room and found that it smelled very strongly of that highly scented eau de cologne that Levan uses... I was positive. Oh, by golly, you're right there, Nick. <laughs> sure, he smells like a perfume counter at the five and dime. Decidedly. That was the first thing I noticed about him when I met him earlier today. That was his only weakness, wasn't it? His excessive use of that scented eau de cologne. Well, maybe so, Patsy, but as far as I'm concerned, attempted murder is also a weakness. One that has to be punished. <laughs> In just a moment, Nick and Patsy will bring you a preview of next week's exciting case. You want to take it a little easier? Then listen. Everybody's days are busy. We've all filled our daily schedules full to overflowing, doing our own home front jobs and helping with the all-out effort toward victory in every way we know how. So we appreciate more than ever before what it means to relax and how much easier it is to relax when a home is pleasant and inviting. American homemakers are learning how much easier it is to keep a home that way with the three great Linux home brightness. For example, they're learning that Linux cream polish restores the original handsomeness of fine furniture in one quick, easy application. Vanishes messy finger marks, helps conceal scratches, does away with cloudy old polish and dust. You see, Linux cream polish for fine furniture actually cleans as it polishes, saving one whole step in the cleaning day routine of busy homemakers. Cutting their work in half. Let your fine furniture regain its loveliness with Linux Cream Polish. Remember always to ask your dealer for Linux Cream Polish, which cleans as it polishes. It's the streamlined way to furniture care. You'll find all three great Linux home brightness at your nearest hardware, paint, or department store. <laughs> And now let's hear from Nick Carter himself. Well, Nick, what's your story about next week? Next time, Ken, I'm going to tell you about an experience that Patsy and I had in one of the great movie studios. It started out very simply when the studio lost a reference book containing information about all kinds of poisons. You could look in that book and find out just what poisons to use for anything you wanted. It was much too dangerous a book to be at large. The unfortunate part of it was that I was called in too late to save the man whose body we found a few minutes later. No, but we did save the old man, Nick. If it hadn't been for you, he'd certainly have been killed. That's true enough, Patsy. What do you call a story, Nick? I call it Death at the Studio. Or the Mystery of the Murder Book. That's all for now. So long. So long, everybody. And so long to both of you until next week. We'll look forward to seeing you then, same as usual. Next week at the same time, listen to another curious experience of Nick Carter, Master Detective, entitled Death at the Studio. Or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Murder Book. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is featured in Street and Smith magazines. Long Clark is starred as Nick with Helen Choate as Patsy. Original music is played by Lou White, and the programs are written and directed by Jock McGregor. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented at this time and over these same stations each week by the three great Linux home brighteners. Linux Clear Gloss Varnish, Linux Cream Polish, and Linux Self-Polishing Wax. 
Created by Acme, America's great producer of Acme fine quality paint. This is Ken Powell speaking for the thousands of Linux dealers all over America and saying so long until next week. This is Mutual. America's great producer of fine quality paint. This is the story of a man known the world over as one of the most daring and resourceful characters in the history of detective fiction. A man whose name has become a symbol of the triumph of right and justice over the sinister forces of crime and lawlessness. A man recognized as one of the great masters of deduction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Today's baffling case, The Witch of Dunderberg Mountain. Another exciting chapter dramatized from the life story of Nick Carter. In just a moment, we'll find how a curious old moldy coin lured Nick Carter into a strange community, brooded over by Dunderberg Mountain and a collection of macabre superstitions. But now, millions of American families are happier these days because women who run their homes wisely have learned about Chemtone, the miracle wall finish, which makes every home more bright and inviting. Now those same wise homemakers are learning the modern way to new beauty for woodwork, furniture, and floors. The three great Linux home brighteners. Linux clear gloss to give lustrous, longer-lasting protection to every wood and linoleum surface. Linux cream polish to renew the sleek, gleaming beauty of fine furniture. And Linux self-polishing wax, the amazing new wax finish to lend rich, satiny loveliness to any floor, wood, linoleum, or tile. Take the modern shortcut to new home beauty with the three great Linux home brighteners. You'll find them all at your hardware, paint, or department store. Your headquarters also for Chemtone, the miracle wall finish. And now for today's exciting case from the life of Nick Carter. Today's thrilling adventure starts in the usual place the gloomy old brownstone mansion at the corner of 4th and 5th. Yes, looking at that comfortable old Victorian mansion with its gay flowered window boxes, its shiny brass door knocker and the bright and glistening windows, no one would ever guess that those panes are bulletproof. The doors, windows, and chimneys burglar-proof, and that on the top floor is probably the world's best-equipped laboratory for the scientific study of crime. As a matter of fact, our master detective is at this moment closeted in his laboratory while Patsy Bowen, his efficient and long-suffering secretary, holds the world at bay in his second-story office and consulting room. Finally, the hidden door that leads to a secret passageway creaks open. And enter Nick Carter. Patsy, will you get that blame thing fixed? Not me. The way you gumshoe around without making a sound gives me the jump. Every time I think I'm in a perfectly empty room and suddenly look up and see you at that old roll-top desk which you won't let me throw out, as if you'd just materialized out of thin air, it makes my heart do nip-ups. I just Yes, hit. Patsy, your grammar's a bit thumb diddle, but I think I get your drift. You want me to stamp her on a bumper to furniture like the average man? I do not. I... Tell me, did you finish whatever it was you were puttering around with up in the laboratory? I did. I examined the shirt the man accused of the Pemberton murder was wearing the night Daly Pemberton was killed. But that shirt had been washed and ironed here. Quite so. The murderer made the common mistake of believing that a thorough washing and boiling would eliminate traces of his crime. But not with the modern benzidine test, sweetheart. Oh? It took me less than three drops to reveal the presence of bloodstains. Mr. Pemberton's blood. You needn't look so pleased. I'm always pleased when I've managed to end a criminal career. Murder so often becomes a habit. Well, anything happened when I was upstairs? Anything, everything. The mayor called, the head of freedom from Moravia called, Lieutenant Riley called, the butcher called. Trivia, all trivia. Anything worth bothering about down in the waiting room? Mrs. DeLacy Trump's pearls. What about them? Stolen. Tell her to report to her insurance company. She can. Seems some gigolo swiped them. She doesn't want her husband to find out. Not interested. Old Mr. DeWitt Hemingway, second wife, has run away. She should have done it years ago. Not interested. Mr. Roger Winthrop, author and lecturer, has taken a house in some forsaken spot up the river. He's writing a history of the folklore and superstitions of the Catskills. He wants you... I to... never collaborate. 
Besides, what I know about the River Valley superstitions, and they're plenty gory, he can dig out of the records for himself. Not interested. Will you not jump to conclusions, Nick? He does not want you to collaborate. His servant has been hexed. The local witch has put a curse on him. And, and he's he... had a succession of headaches or corns or something. Tell him to wear a nice affetta bag. I believe that's a usual. It's remedy. too late. The servant, whose name was Jacob, died about dawn this morning. A violent and horrible death. His last words were something about a descent into hell. Well, why didn't you say so? You wouldn't let me. Send Mr. Winthrop up. Well, send him up. What are we waiting for? Keep your shirt on, Nick. I can't have him shot out of a cannon. Wait till I click my inter-office gadget, can't you? Butch. Hi, Angel Face. Butch, Mr. Carter will see Mr. Roger Winthrop. You mean the guy with the ribbons on his glasses? Right the very first time. Okay, Mr. Winthrop. Hey, he's halfway up the stairs already. Hmm. Athletic for an author, I huh, fancy. Come in. Mr. Carter, Mr. Nick Carter, where is he? Right behind you. Oh, Mr. Carter, I am... I know. Roger Winthrop. Author. I am now engaged in collecting data for my latest novel. In fact, I have already... Has this novel anything to do with your servant's death? Why, uh, no. Then skip it. Uh, of course. But if it weren't for the novel, I never would have rented the old Brocken house. And we'd never have met the old witch. You said witch? He did. You keep out of this, Betsy. What old witch do you mean, Mr. Winthrop? Who is this, uh... I'm Nick Carter's secretary, amanuensis, general factotum, and the lady who sews the buttons on his shirt. Now, let's get back to the witch. She sounds more interesting. Thanks. Of course, I don't actually think she is one. Still, the natives who live around the Brock and Farm are quite convinced of the fact. It seems she's placed a curse on people before this, mostly young boys who taunted her or stole her fruit. Young William Tappan was thrown from his father's farm horse and dragged twice round the barn. Hendrik Vandervoort fell out of an apple tree and broke his arm. And Johnny Upsendike had scarlet fever and jaundice both at the same time. Seems to me I've heard of accidents like that happening to kids even without their being hacked. Yes, Patsy, but that's not the significant part of the narrative. What is? The boy's last names. Tappan, Vandervoort, Upsendike. I take it, Mr. Winthrop, the old Brocken farm you've rented is in a Dutch community. It is. Up the river at the foot of the Donderberg, wild, hag-ridden country. Mm -hmm. Those families settled there before the revolution and have married and intermarried ever since. All but the Brockins. They seem to have been disliked right from the beginning. Some say they aren't Dutch at all, but Hessians. Yes. Let me see. Brocken. Isn't that the name of that mountain in Germany where all the witches are supposed to gather on Walpurgis Knot? Yes, that's why the Brockens are said to have settled where they did. Because old Donderberg, the local mountain, bears a strange resemblance to the Brocken. I see. Local gossip has it that on the eve of May Day, which, as you know, is Walpurgis Knot, all the family and their cats, they've always had black cats, would swoop up the chimney on broomsticks and fly away to Donderberg Mountain for some sort of witch's Sabbath. Then this witch who's supposed to have hexed your servant Jacob is, I gather, one of the famous Brockens. She's the last of them. Miss Hermina Brocken is an old maid, and when she dies, the family will be extinct. And high time, too, if you ask me. Now, you don't really think she's a witch. No, but she's a vindictive, highly neurotic, I might even say dangerous female. And you think she killed Jacob? I do. She laid a hex on him last week, made a rag doll out of an old scarf of his she managed to steal. She named the doll Jacob, of course, and then began sticking pins into it. And last night, or rather early this morning, he died. Tell me exactly what happened. Well, I rented the Brocken house for the summer. It seemed to have the sort of weird, not to say sinister, background I needed for my novel. Did Miss Hermina go with the house, Mr. Winter? Oh, no, no. She and her cat moved out to a sort of farmer's cottage. Oh. I insisted on that. I can't abide cats. Well, as I was saying, last night I was in my study scribbling away the better part of the night. It was a peculiarly black night, you may remember. This is what is called the dark of the moon. Yes, yes, I know. I know. <laughs> well, uh, finally I became aware that everything was unusually quiet. And then I realized I'd worked through the entire night, and this was that queer, unearthly silence that comes just before the dawn. Suddenly, I was conscious of a dull, muffled thud, a thud that was almost a clank. <coughs> what was that? <laughs> Curious how strange sounds become at night. Sounded like the clang of a coffin lid. <laughs> Better lay off work for tonight, Winthrop, old boy. First thing you know, you'll be imagining ghostly footsteps. Good Lord, what's that? Something's coming round the corner of the house. That's the tool house door. Someone's trying to get in. Oh, this is ridiculous. Better go see what it is before my imagination makes a fool of me. I'll take the lamp. It's probably nothing at all. Just the wind rattling the lock. But there isn't any wind tonight. <laughs> Pull yourself together, Winthrop. Down the steps to the woodshed. 
Yes. Something is moving the lock. Someone's out there. Some. Wait till I unlock the door. I'm done for. Jacob, what are you doing out here this time of night? Jacob, what's wrong with you? Don't go near it. Don't go. She's right. It goes straight down to hell. But I... I, I... Good Lord, he's having convulsions. <laughs> Jacob. Jacob. And what happened then, Mr. Winslow? Jacob died right there in my arms. It was horrible. As the death rattle left his throat, his right hand relaxed and something rolled to the floor with a metallic clink. I picked it up and brought it here, thinking it might serve as a clue to this whole horrible business. Let me see. Here. Hmm. Black with age. Looks like a metal slug of some kind. Betsy. Hmm? How about giving this a going over with that metal polish you keep around for polishing them up the doorknobs? With pleasure. It's right here in this drawer. I keep it handy, Mr. Winter, because all the hardware in this old house is brass. And I always say, what's the good of having real brass furnishings unless Not you keep them well... Not interested, Betsy. Postpone the housekeeping. Well, Mr. Winthrop, from your description of Jacob's death, the panting, the dragging footsteps, and the final convulsions, I'd say he was probably poisoned. No possibility of suicide, I suppose. Of course not. It was the witch, Miss Hermina Brocken. I told you she'd put a curse on him. Curses don't cause convulsions, Mr. Winthrop. I never said they did. The point was she hated Jacob enough to want him dead. Why? Well, I, I suppose it was my fault in a way... I told Jacob to make up to the gold girl in order to get her to tell him all the local ghost stories. He unearthed plenty. Some of them, like the headless horseman and the crew of Hendrick Hudson who go bowling in the mountains whenever there's a storm, have already been recorded by Washington Irving. Yes, yes. Then there's the two spectral riders who are supposed to be the ghosts of Major Andre and General Benedict Arnold. They met and rode through that territory, you know, the night Arnold sold out to the enemy. Yes, yes. Then there's the story of a lost treasure that's supposed to be cursed, not to mention a bat woman and a black vulture who appears whenever there's to be a death in the valley. Interesting, but irrelevant. Why did Mr. Arkin hate Jacob? Certainly not because he worried those stories out of her. Well, no. As a matter of fact, I rather imagine Jacob overdid his attentions to the old girl. When she discovered he had a wife and five children in the Bronx, well, she turned on him like a vixen. It was all Peter and I could do to tear him away from her. She was trying to scratch out his eyes. Hell hath no fury and so forth. Quiet, Betty. Just who is Peter, Mr. Winthrop? A local character who does the gardening for me. He's, well, not exactly bright, but he can make anything grow. How does he get on with Miss Brocken? Scared to death of her. Carries a piece of cold iron in his pocket all the time he's around the place. If you touch cold iron, you know, a witch can't harm you. Speaking of cold metal, how's this for a handsome hunk of stuff? It shines better than our doorknobs now that I've got the tarnish off. Well, oh, very interesting. That coin, Patsy, is gold. What? A British guinea, to be exact, minted in the reign of George III. In those days, coins like this were called traitor's gold. For Pete's sake, why? Every British soldier who brought in a member of Washington's army received one of these. And every member of Washington's forces who gave himself up got one, too. Where in the world do you suppose Jacob got hold of this? To answer that, we'll have to make a visit to the Dunderberg. Yes, Mr. Winter. I think you brought us a problem that's even more interesting than you suspect. What is the significance of the piece of traitor's gold found clutched in the dead man's hand? Is it connected in any way with the strange events which are happening in the shadow of old Dunderberg Mountain? We'll see in just a moment. Linux self-polishing wax is practical proof that there is something new under the sun. New beauty, new protection, new skid resistance for all your floors and linoleum. If you haven't used new Linux self-polishing wax, you haven't learned how different, how perfect the quick-drying wax can be. For Linex self-polishing wax, developed by leading research chemists to give you the best, lends a satiny appearance, a lasting protection, real anti-skid finish to every floor surface in your home. The formula of Linex self-polishing wax is completely new. It contains the greatest possible amount of genuine carnauba wax. And the underwriters' laboratories have proved that linoleum, hardwood, and rubber tile are actually less slippery after Linex self-polishing wax has been applied. When you walk on a Linex surface, you can actually feel the difference. 
Besides, it takes only a jiffy to wipe on, drying quickly to a handsome luster without tiresome rubbing. So it's just good sense to choose genuine Linux self-polishing wax. And, of course, if you want the modern type finish, which is brushed on, or even longer-lasting protection, use Linux clear gloss varnish, which dries overnight to a beautiful gloss finish that protects your floors and linoleum amazingly for months. Whichever you choose, Linux self-polishing wax or Linux clear gloss varnish, ask for it by name, Linux, and get the best. You'll find all three great Linux home brighteners and Chemtone, the miracle wall finish, at hardware, paint, and department stores everywhere. And now back to today's exciting case. As we pick up Nick Carter and Patsy, they are following Roger Winthrop along a desolate country road to the Brocken Farm, where Winthrop's servant, Jacob, has recently died a violent death. It is twilight, and the sinister hulk of the Donderberg Mountain broods over the landscape. I'm not surprised that people who live around here believe in witches and curses and hidden treasure, Mr. Winthrop. If you'd spent a couple of months around here the way I have, Miss Bowen, you'd believe in superstitions, too. Things like that don't seem possible back in the midst of the city's traffic. But up here, time seems to stand still. Here, people are still living in the dark ages. I noticed as we came along, most of the barns had hex signs painted on them. Nick, have you noticed the clouds gathering behind that mountain? Yes. I imagine the old Dutchman will start their game of nine pins any time now. I hope we reach your house, Mr. Winthrop, before the storm breaks. It's just over the next rise, Mr. Carter. Here's the gate behind the lilac bush. Well, not what you'd call in very good repair. After you, Patsy. Thank you. That's the house down there in the hollow. And that's Peter sitting outside the tool house door. I gave him strict instructions not to let anyone move the body until you arrive. I know you detectives prefer to find your clues undisturbed. It's sometimes helpful. Why doesn't Peter sit inside the tool house? Because he's afraid of the dead. Oh. There's a superstition around here that the soul of anyone who's died a violent death is afraid of being alone and always tries to take along a companion. <gasps> oh, what's that? Something up there in that tree. It's there, silhouetted against the sky. A black cat. It's Miss Brocken's Hecuba. They're inseparable. If that cat's around... Then the Brocken female isn't far behind. I wondered who's been following us the last quarter mile. Nick, I didn't see or hear a thing. You... You don't mean she's invisible or something? Calm yourself, Patsy. I'll admit she's kept out of sight, but no disembodied spirit breaks twigs and rustles dead leaves. She's been perfectly audible to anyone that took the trouble to listen. Hear that? She just stepped on a loose pebble. My teeth are chattering, though. I couldn't hear an avalanche. Oh, Nick, I don't like this place. Easy, Patsy. Oh, here comes Peter. Poor guy, he looks relieved to see us. I thought you was never coming. I told you I wouldn't stay if you didn't get back before nightfall. But we did, Peter. This is Mr. Nick Carter, the famous detective. Uh, He'll find out what killed Jacob. The light's fading fast. Better make our examination before it's completely dark. Oh, Patsy, may not be nice. You want to stay out here? With that woman and her cat crawling through the bushes? And a storm coming up beside? Oh, thank you. I'm coming inside, no matter what's in there. Hold the flashlight steady, Betsy. It's horrible, isn't it? Mm. Extreme rigor mortis and marked satanic constriction of the muscles. Jaws too firmly clamped together to permit any investigation of the oral cavity. We can take a look at the inside of the lips. Hmm? Oh, the poison, whatever it was, was violent, but I don't think it was administered by mouth. No. Well, let's see. Now, rest on the instep of the shoes between the sole and heel. Heavy boots and corduroy trousers, and all of the lower limbs. Ah, hands bare. Yes, yes, look here. The two small punctures of his right thumb. Yes. Winthrop, help me roll back his sleeve. Right, Mr. Carter. Ah, here we are. Two more. And here again. And again. And all the punctures have already started the gangrene. That's how the poison entered the body. Oh, uh -huh. It's the evil eye. Those two dents. It's the mark of the evil eye. They burn straight through you until you're dead. Interesting idea, Peter. But what killed Jacob was quite a bit more deadly than any evil eye. You mean you know who killed him? Definitely. The question now is to find where the killer's hiding. But, Nick, I... Let's see if we can get a line on how Jacob spent his last 12 hours. Get the small microscope out of my zipper case, will you, Patsy? Oh, and you might prepare a few slides. Right, you are, Nick. 
just exactly what are you doing that for, Mr. Carter? Uh, cleaning the dead man's nails, I mean. A good scientific detective, Mr. Withrop, can pretty well deduce from what he finds under any person's nails where that person has been and what he's done for some time previous. Oh, a slide, please, Patsy. Here you are. This is my most powerful lens, of course. This flashlight isn't as strong as one could wish. Still. You get anything, Nick? Yes. Quite a few things. He ate a piece of chocolate cake for dinner with a finger to pull it. Sawed quite a bit of wood. Minute bits of sawdust. That was yesterday afternoon. He also plucked a chicken recently and polished the furniture. Tiny globules of very fine oil. But the most interesting ingredient in the whole collection is a certain tiny spored mold or fungus. A great deal of it, as a matter of fact. Maybe he went out picking wildflowers in the woods. No. This particular fungus only grows in places where there's a great deal of moisture and where sunlight never reaches. Any place like that around here, Mr. Winthrop? Basement? Spring house? No, no. The basement's bone dry and there is no spring house. How about a well? There are few enough improvements on the place. No electricity, no telephone. But we do have a hand pump in the kitchen sink. Which means if there's a well under it, Jacob couldn't very easily get down into it. I'd say it would be absolutely impossible. Hmm. Wait a minute. There's some sort of boarded up stonework with a padlock out back of the barn. I remember someone told me it's a condemned cistern or well of some sort. Ah, that's the witch's well. You'll be wise to stay away from it. It's the way straight down to hell. The way to hell? Yeah. Weren't those Jacob's last words before he died? Why, yes, Mr. Carter. Come on, show me the place. Unless I'm very much mistaken, that's where we'll find the answer to this problem. Uh. At the bottom of the well. Sounds as if Henry Hudson's crew had started a game of ninepins. Oh, that means there's evil abroad tonight. Nick, Nick, I just remembered something. Now what? Isn't tomorrow the first of May? That means this is Walpurgis night. When witches ride and graves give up their dead. Yeah. Yeah. That one sounded like a strike. This is the system, Mr. Carter, or whatever it is. I thought you said it was padlocked, Mr. Winthrop. It always has been. Not now. A lot lying on the ground. Staples all bent and twisted. Looks as if someone had broken it. And the cover's been moved recently, too. But here, Nick, these scratches on the stone. That thing, I do believe you're finally beginning to notice things. You know where you can go, don't you? Yeah, that's just where you will go if you get too interested in that well. Now, look here, Peter. Uh, you're a big boy now. You don't really think Miss Brocken's a witch? I know she is. Ever see her ride a broomstick? No, but I've seen her go down this well. When was this? Winter nights, me and my brother Timmy would hide in the hay of that old barn and wait for her to come along. First, we'd hear the scrape as she pulled off the lid, and then we'd see her climb down inside with the lantern in her teeth and that old black cat sitting on her shoulder. Why do you think she did it? Climb down inside, I mean. To get warm, of course. It's nice and cozy in hell on a winter's night. She never went down in summer? No, why should she? It's hot enough right here in the valley in summertime. Very interesting observation, Peter. And it verifies my hunt just how Jacob was killed and why. What do you mean, Mr. Carter? Help me pull the lid off this well and I'll show you. Here, take that side now. Right, I have it. There. That does it. Now, Patsy, give me that flashlight. Here you are. Thanks. Now, let's see what we've got. Ah, yes. Notice those rusty spikes driven into the stonework to form a sort of ladder? And notice where the rust has been scraped recently. That's how Jacob got it on his boots. He followed Miss Brocken's example and climbed down into the well. You'll also notice that the stones are covered with that curious fungus we found under his... Nick. Nick, Nick, she's watching us. Over there under that apple tree, and the cat's standing on her shoulder. We've been waiting for you, Miss Brocken. I think you can tell us how Jacob died. It was his own greed killed him. I warned him no man could go down there and live. You knew he died if he went down into the well, and yet you let him go. I did not. I refused him the key, I did. But he broke up in the lock like a thief when no one was looking. He wouldn't listen, and so he had to die. And I'm not sorry. You killed him, you old... Easy, Winthrop. Miss Brocken isn't responsible for Jacob's death. Then who is? You said yourself he was poisoned. Quite right. 
And I think if I drop this rock down into the well, we may rouse the killers. <laughs> Aye, if you do, they'll play you their devil's tattoo. Oh, Nick, be careful. I'm afraid. Here goes the stone. Now, listen. Oh, Nick. Nick, I heard it. Good Lord, what is it? Oh. Rattlesnake. Forget, this is rattlesnake country. And I rather imagine there's a rattlesnake nest down there. Aye, that there is. Old ones and young ones, the darlings. I told Jacob not to go down in that well. I told him he'd go to hell, but all he cared for was gold. And so he's dead. Dead! Dead! And I'm glad! <laughs> There's one thing I still don't understand about that Dunderberg mystery. Why did Jacob go down into the well? And why wasn't Miss Brocken bitten when she did the same thing? I'll answer the last question first. Miss Brocken was careful to make all her descents into the well in winter. Well, so what? You see, when snakes hibernate, they become cold and almost lifeless. As can a snake charmer. It's an old trick of the trade to put snakes on ice just before a show makes them quite harmless. Oh. And as for the reason that drew both Miss Brocken and Jacob into the well... I deduce from the sample Jacob had in his hand that the Brocken Well is the hiding place of Benedict Arnold's famous lost treasure. What's that? Well, Major Andre is supposed to have given Arnold a golden guinea for every man then garrisoned at West Point. Arnold undoubtedly hid the money and didn't have time to dig it up when he had to flee for his life after his treachery was uncovered. But if the Brocken family knew where it was, why didn't they use it themselves? Probably because they thought it was tainted money with a curse on it. I see. Well, thanks, Nick. Now, in just a moment, I want you and Patsy to give us a preview of next week's exciting case. Everybody's heard the old saying that home is where the heart is. And because home does matter most, it deserves the most careful attention you can give it. Keep your home at its loveliest with the three great Linux home brighteners. Linux cream polish, for example, renews the original gleaming beauty of your fine furniture. The handsome appearance of the wood grain itself in one quick, easy application. That's because Linex Cream Polish cleans as it polishes, saving one whole step in your cleaning day routine. The cloudy look of old polish and dust, the blurry appearance of finger marks, are erased as if by magic. And Linex Cream Polish leaves no surface film of oil for dust to cling to. It helps conceal disfiguring scratches, too. So take the streamlined way to furniture care. Linex Cream Polish for fine furniture. Tell your dealer you want the product that cleans as it polishes. Ask for all three great Linux home brighteners. Linux cream polish, Linux self-polishing wax, and Linux clear gloss varnish at your nearest hardware, paint, or department store. And now let's hear from Nick Carter himself. Well, Nick, what about next week's story? Next week, Ken, I think I'll tell you the story of how an heir mysteriously disappeared before it was born. And a curious and frantic case it was. When a woman who's going to have a baby any minute disappears into thin air right on the threshold of a famous maternity hospital, then she... Now, Patsy, don't give the whole plot away. Wait until next week. What do you call the story, Nick? I call it... The Vanishing Lady. <laughs> Nick Carter, Master Detective, is featured in Street and Smith magazines. Lon Clark is starred as Nick with Helen Choate as Patsy. Original music is played by Lou White. The programs are written by Edith Miser, and any resemblance therein to actual persons living or dead is purely coincidental. The entire production is under the direction of Jock McGregor. <laughs> Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented at this time and over these same stations each week by the three great Linux home brighteners. Linux clear gloss varnish, Linux cream polish, and Linux self-polishing wax. Created by Acme, America's great producer of fine quality paint. This is Ken Powell speaking for the thousands of Linux dealers all over America and saying so long until next week. is the Mutual Broadcasting System. The Linux Show, starring Nick Carter, Master Detective, presented by Acme, America's great producer of fine quality paints.
This is the story of a man known the world over as one of the most daring and resourceful characters in the history of detective fiction. A man whose name has become a symbol of the triumph of right and justice over the sinister forces of crime and lawlessness. A man recognized as one of the great masters of deduction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Today's exciting case, The Vanishing Lady. Another exciting chapter dramatized from the life story of Nick Carter. In just a moment, we'll hear how Nick Carter traced a woman who vanished on the steps of the Mercy Maternity Hospital and found out what really happened to her unborn heir. But now, no ordinary phrase is heard oftener than what's new. And this is the answer wise homemakers are giving these days. The three great Linux home brighteners. Linux self-polishing wax, Linux cream polish, and Linux clear gloss varnish. The modern shortcuts to perfect care for floors, woodwork, and furniture. Linux self-polishing wax, the amazing new wax product, beautifies floors with a satiny yet tough anti-skid finish. Linux cream polish cleans as it polishes, leaving no oily film on your furniture. And Linux clear gloss varnish, which is brushed on, dries to an elastic, transparent surface that protects all wood and linoleum in your home. Do as thousands of modern homemakers do. Save hours of work each week. Enjoy sparkling new beauty in your home. Get the three great Linux home brighteners now. You'll find them all at your hardware, paint, or department store. Your headquarters also for Chemtone, the miracle wall finish. And now for today's exciting case from the life of Nick Carter. As we look in on Nick Carter today, we find him in his laboratory at the top of the old brownstone house on the corner of 5th and 4th. It is night. The laboratory is dark except for the strange, unearthly glow of a small mercury vapor lamp which casts an eerie light into the intent and watchful eyes of the great detective, Nick Carter. There is silence. Someone moves in the shadow. You're right, Patsy. The ultraviolet ray shows that two different inks were used in the writing of this will. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, the whole job's a forgery. That's all. Turn on the lights. Oh, praise be. Now I can go home and get a night's sleep for a change. Oh, no, no, not yet. Get the vaporizer ready. I want to test this sheet of paper for latent fingerprints. You want iodine or osmium tetroxide? Tetroxide. I want to take pictures. Okay. Iodine just isn't photogenic. Now, take it oh. easy, Patsy. It's only the night bell. Somebody's at the front door, so... I guess I'll never get over having my stomach do nip-ups if a phone or a doorbell rings suddenly in the middle of the night. Here, you take this stuff. I'll go down and see who it is. Mr. Carter, you are Mr. Nick Carter? Why, yes. Uh, What seems to be the trouble? It's my wife. She's disappeared. We had a quarrel and now she's gone. I wouldn't be too upset, Mr... Ashford, Harold Ashford. But I am upset. Anyone would be... You see, she's going to have a baby. When? No, any minute. I mean, any hour. She was on her way to the hospital. That's when she disappeared, right on the steps of Mercy Hospital. Why weren't you with her at the time? I just told you we had a quarrel. Don't don't you see? Now, look here, Mr. Ashford. Just a minute, Nick. I think we'd get more information if we gave Mr. Ashford a chance to collect himself. Here, sit down in this easy chair. Thanks. You're very kind, Mrs. Carter. I guess you've been through this yourself. Oh, no, my name's Bowen. Miss Patsy Bowen. What? I'm sorry. I mean, I apologize. <laughs> That's perfectly all right, Mr. Ashworth. You see, I was one of a large family, so I do know a little about these things. Mr. Carter, on the other no, hand... Now, look I... here, Patsy. Mr. Ashworth didn't come here, did he? Quiet, Nick. You may be tops when it comes to scientific detection, but how you ever pass in applied psychology? Now, Mr. Ashworth, suppose you tell us all about it from the beginning. Yes. Yes, of course. Patsy, sometimes I have to hand it to you. Thanks. All right, Mr. Ashworth, you and your wife are expecting a baby. Uh, what's her name, by the way? Nora. She was Nora Brent. Mm-hmm. Her two uncles own the Brent Tubing and Appliances Company. Then she has money. Oh, no. Her father was a minister. He died before we met. Her uncles never approved of me. You see, I'd been married before. Widowed or divorced? Divorced. That's what her uncles didn't approve of. 
And besides, Nora's a good ten years younger than I am. They say I married her on the rebound. You see, she had a childhood sweetheart, Jim Stanley, a boy she'd known all her life. He was reported missing with a carrier that went down on the Pacific. That was two years ago. Nora was pretty cut up about it. My first wife had just run away with another man. So you consoled each other? Well, maybe just at first, but it didn't take long for us to realize that we were made for each other. You've got to believe me, Mr. Carter, we loved each other. We were ideally happy. No arguments? No differences of opinion? No, never. That is, not until today. And what happened today? This morning, a letter came for Nora. It was addressed to Nora Brent. Not Mrs. Ashford, mind you. And up in the corner of the envelope, the sender's name and address read, Chief Petty Officer Jim Stanley, Tappan Even Hospital. But that's the man she was in love with. The man who was supposed to be dead. Now he's in a hospital only five miles down the bay. I take it she got excited when she saw the letter. I knew she would, Mr. Carter, and, well, maybe it was jealousy. Maybe I was afraid of what might happen. You see, we're expecting the baby almost any time, so... So what? So I destroyed the letter. Hmm. Very short-sighted. But I realize that now, but I couldn't bear to think of losing her. I'd have done anything to prevent it. It would have been much better to have brought the whole thing out into the open. It's too late now. It's happened. Just what I was afraid of. We were sitting in my den after dinner tonight. I was so worried, I just couldn't seem to take my eyes off her. Pretty soon I realized I was making her nervous, so I said I thought I'd go to bed and read. I just got into my pajamas when the phone rang. I let Nora answer it because her uncle, Timothy Brent, generally called about that time to find out how Nora was feeling. Oh, so the uncles had forgiven her for marrying you. Oh, yes. Tim Brent's a swell guy. He came right around to see us as soon as Paul, the other uncle, died five months ago. But Paul never forgave us. He even cut Nora out of his will. Stubborn old customer, huh? And was it Uncle Tim on the telephone? No. I could hear Nora's voice, but not what she was saying. She was talking on the extension in the dining room. Well... Pretty soon, she opened the bedroom door. She was sort of quiet and white. Harold, what did you do with that letter? What? What letter, Nora? The one from Jim Stanley. I just talked to him. But, Nora, there wasn't any letter. You mean Jim's alive? Harold, you've never lied to me before. How could you? How could you? Nora, please, I can explain. I don't want any explanations. I don't want... Nora. Nora, darling, what's wrong? What's the matter? Baby... I've got to get to the hospital. I've got... Nora, please, darling, don't be frightened. Just as soon as I get dressed again, I'll... I'll take it. It's probably Uncle Tim. Hello? Oh, yes, Uncle Tim. No, something's happened. It's the baby. I'm going to the hospital right away. Please call Dr. Jenkins and tell him that I need him. Tell him to come right away. Nora, for heaven's sakes, wait just a minute until I get... No, Harold, I'm going for good. I don't ever want to see you again. And she left without you? Yes. I heard the front door slam while I was putting on my shoes. I ran after her, but it was too late. Old Joe, that, that's the man who has the taxi on our corner, pulled away just as I ran out the front door. It was 20 minutes before I got another cab. I drove to Mercy Hospital as fast as I could make the driver go. It couldn't have taken us more than 12 minutes to get there, but it seemed like hours. What happened when you got to the hospital? I rushed up the steps into the reception room and demanded that the nurse ask at the desk to take me to my wife. And? They said they hadn't laid eyes on her. Well, maybe she went somewhere there. That's what I thought. I thought maybe she'd been in an accident, or maybe the baby had been born in the way. I thought all kinds of horrible things. Then I remembered Joe, the taxi driver, who owned the cab my wife had driven off in, so I drove back home again. Joe swears he drove her straight to Mercy Hospital. He even watched her go up the steps and open the big front door. Very interesting. Patsy, I think we shall have to interview both Joe and the nurse at the desk. Well, I was hoping you'd say that, Mr. Carter. I brought Joe along. His cab's waiting outside. He can drive us to the hospital. Well, what can Joe tell Nick about the vanishing lady that he hasn't already told her husband, Harold? And how could Nora open the big front door of the hospital and yet apparently never enter it? We'll see in just a moment. If you've used new Linux self-polishing wax, then you know firsthand how different, how perfect a quick-drying wax can be. If not, it's high time you tried it, because here at last is sparkling new beauty, new protection, new skid resistance for all your floors and linoleum. Developed by leading research chemists to give you the best 
Linex self-polishing wax lends handsome appearance, lasting protection, real anti-skid finish to every floor surface in your home. Yes, Linex self-polishing wax is made from a formula that's completely new. It has the highest possible content of genuine Carnauba wax, and it has been proved by the underwriters' laboratories that linoleum, hardwood, and rubber tile are actually less slippery after application of Linex self-polishing wax. When you walk on a Linex surface, you can actually feel the difference. What's more, it dries quickly to a satiny luster without tiresome rubbing, and it takes only a jiffy to wipe on. So do as wise modern homemakers have learned to do. Choose genuine Linex self-polishing wax. If you want the modern finish of the brush-on type, which gives even longer-lasting protection, use Linex clear gloss varnish, which dries overnight to a beautiful gloss finish and gives your floors and linoleum amazing protection for months. Whether you prefer Linex self-polishing wax or Linex clear gloss varnish, you get the best when you ask for it by name, Linex. You'll find all three great Linex home brighteners and Chemtone, the miracle wall finish that dries in one hour, at hardware, paint, and department stores everywhere. And now back to our story. As we see Nick Carter again, he and Patsy and Harold Ashforth are in old Joe's cab, which is whirling them off to Mercy Hospital, on whose steps Mrs. Ashforth disappeared less than an hour previously as she was on her way there to have a baby. Nick is questioning the driver. Look here, Joe. Yeah? You're sure it was Mrs. Ashforth you drove to Mercy Hospital tonight? Sure, I'm sure. I'd know her anyways. When you got to the hospital, did you help her up the steps? No, I helped her out of the cab, and just as she opens the door, a man comes out from under the portico, and she runs to him. He puts his arms around her. So I guessed it was somebody she knowed, and I drove off. Now, who was this man? What did he look like? Well, I couldn't rightly say. It was too dark. I see. Well, here you are. Here's the hospital. Go oh, wait here, Joe. You may need you again. Yes, yeah, sure. The reception desk is over here, Mr. Carter. That's the nurse that told me my wife was... Well, look who's there talking, George. It's Uncle Tim. What's been going on here, I'd like to know. What if the baby did decide to arrive ahead of time? Turn your hospital is kids take care of cases like that. But I tell you, Mr. Brent, we didn't turn your niece away. Mrs. Ashford never came here. I swear to you, she never walked in that door. Then why did I just get this wire saying you were full up? Mind if I have a look at that telegram, Mr. Brent? And who in blazes are you? This is Nick Carter, Uncle Tim. He's trying to find out what's happened to Nora. William Thunder, didn't you stick with Nora? You'd done your duty as a father. We'd know where she was. Suppose you let me look at that telegram and see what I can make of it. Oh, yes. Yes, of course. Hmm. Mercy Hospital full. Mrs. Ashforth taken elsewhere. Everything under control. No cause for anxiety. Signed, Mrs. Mary Brown. Who's Mrs. Brown? Never heard of her. You, Harold? The name means absolutely nothing to me. Mary Brown. Nice, indefinite sort of name. Let's see. His telegram was handed in at the Midtown Station at 10.45. That was only a few minutes after Nora left the house. Yes. Interesting. When did you receive the telegram, Mr. Brent? About ten minutes ago. I came right over here. I only lived three blocks away. Why didn't you receive it earlier? Should have had it three quarters of an hour ago. I suppose I would have if I'd been home, but I went to a late movie. Patsy. Yes, Nick. Suppose you go to the telegraph office as where I was sent from. See if you can get a line and who handed it in. Then get hold of a nurse's registry. It's just possible there may be a nurse by the name of Mary Brown. Okay. There is. Find out what hospital or sanatorium she works out of. Report back to Mr. Ashforth's apartment. Right, Nick. I'm on my way. And you, Mr. Ashforth, I suggest you go home. I have a hunch you'll get a telegram yourself in the not-too-distant future. You think so? Maybe there's one there already. I'll see you later. Mr. Brent, tell me. You really think your niece is still in love with this fellow, Jim Stanley? It's my personal opinion, Mr. Carter, that she found she didn't love her husband. She took that way out to sort of keep him at arm's length. Well, I guess I'm getting on home. Unless there's something more I can do for you. 
No, I think you've done everything we could expect, Mr. Brent. But there are still a few questions I'd like to ask the nurse at the reception desk. Good night. Good night, Mr. Brent. Now then, sister. Honest, Mr. Carter, Mrs. Ashford didn't come here tonight. We don't turn away cases like hers ever. Mr. Ashworth's doctor, what's his name? Stevens. He takes care of all the Brents and the Ashworths. Did he show up at any time tonight? Oh, no, sir. He hasn't been here all either. And yet Nora told her uncle to get hold of him. I wonder. Oh, I see there's a telephone down the hall. Suppose you ask the operator to connect me with the ambulatory ward at Tappan Base Hospital. And while I'm getting that call, you might phone Dr. Stevens' house and find out for me why he didn't get round to deliver the Ashworth baby. Oh, let him think it's a routine inquiry from the hospital. Will you do that for me? Oh, anything I can do for you is a pleasure, Mr. Carter, I'm sure. Thanks, sister. I'll take the call down here. Gee. Myrtle, connect the gentleman on the hall phone with the Tappan Base Hospital. Yeah, the Tappan Base Hospital, the ambulatory ward. Yeah, it's Mr. Nick Carter, the detective. Hurry up, will you, Myrtle? Hello? Is this the doctor in charge of the ambulatory ward? That's right. Nick Carter speaking. I want to find out about a patient named Jim or James Stanley. Oh, yes, of course, Mr. Carter. What would you like to know? Where is he now? Well, I don't know. He made a telephone call earlier in the evening, and apparently it upset him very much. He said he had to get into town at once, so, well, we let him go. He didn't say where he was going? No, but... I gather it was somewhere in town. If you think there's anything that I can... No, do... no, no, no. That's quite all right. Thanks. Oh, Mr. Carter, I got Dr. Stevens' house. He's out on an emergency. He never got the call about Mrs. Ashford. Gee, it must have been a big emergency. Hey, where are you going, Mr. Carter? To prevent another emergency, I hope. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Okay. Which is the Ashforth apartment? Ground floor right, just inside the front door. Thanks. Oh, yes. Somebody there, all right. Light slit, shades drawn. And what's that? Two figures. Male. Red Jupiter, one of them's got a gun. Well, they call boy, no time for a door. Here we go through the window. All right, up with your hands, both of you. But he shot at me. Maybe, but he didn't hit you. She undoubtedly would have if he meant to kill you. That's right, I... Well, I was just trying to keep him off me. He's got some crazy idea that I ran away with his wife. I take it you're Chief Petty Officer Jim Stanley. That's right. I found out today this guy had married Nora. Well, she sounded sort of upset when I talked to her on the phone, so I thought I'd just drop around and size up the situation. If he wasn't treating her right, I was going to beat his ears in. Nora and I grew up together. We were like brother and sister. You see, Mr. Stanley, unfortunately, Mr. Ashforth's wife disappeared just after you talked to her. And somehow, he rather imagined she might have run away with you. So that's why he jumped me. Oh, but he's got it all wrong about me and Nora. Oh, we had a crush when we were in school, but I married a girl in Australia three years ago. I wrote Nora at the time, and she wrote back wishing me luck. Well, she never told me that. We women do strange things sometimes to keep our boyfriends guessing. Oh, Patsy, stay away from that broken window. Wait for me outside. Don't worry, I'm not the one who takes chances. Oh, look, Nick, I found out about the telegram, and there's no Mary Brown Miss or Mrs. in the nurse's registry. And the telegram was handed in by a man. In fact, I think he sent another. I ran into Miss Patsy coming round the corner. Oh, Miss Brandt, hello. Yes, I had a hunch you'd get another wire. Let's have a look. No, don't try to come in. Patsy will hand it up. Here you are, Nick. Thanks. Your grandniece and her mother doing beautifully at Clay Sanatorium. What? Come and bring the papa. Mrs. Ashforth keeps asking for him. And no signature. She wants me. Nora wants me. And the baby's here. I have a little girl. It's wonderful. Where's my hat? Oh, I haven't got time. Come on, everybody. <laughs> Well, Joe, 
We seem to have kept you rather busy tonight. Yeah, that's all right by me. It just shows me me to keep sticking. I'm a father. Father of a baby girl. Sure, pal. Maybe you'll have better luck next time. After all, you and Nora are still young. And just what did you mean, Mr. Brent, about better luck next time? Anything unlucky about a baby girl? My brother, as you probably know, disinherited Nora. However, he did leave a codicil to his will. He couldn't bear to think of the Brent factory going out of the family. So he said that if Nora ever had a son, he would inherit my brother's share of the business. You see, my brother was a woman hater at heart. So having a girl baby cost Harold a half a million dollars. I see. Well, here you are, the Clay Sanitarium. Fancy looking place, ain't it? Fancy and expensive. Well, some of the very best babies get themselves born here. Old Dr. Jeremiah Clay is famous for that. He's brought more millionaires into the world than you can shake a stick at. Too bad Mr. Ashford's daughter isn't a millionaire, too. Oh, money doesn't matter. It's my wife and daughter who really count now. Come. Welcome, Mr. Brandt, and congratulations to you, sir. Uh, you must be the father. Sorry, I haven't that honor. This is Mr. Ashforth. Oh, yes, yes, of course. Uh, this way, Mr. Ashforth, please. The new mother is so anxious to see you. Uh, this way, please. Uh, such a curious case. Women are often most unreasonable at these times. Didn't want the family informed. Of course, the minute it was all over, when she saw the baby, complete return to normalcy. One of the family at once. Uh, this is her room. Sorry, I'm afraid only the father can go in. Uh, uh, just at first, you know. Nora. Oh, Nora, darling. Oh, Harold. Oh, dearest. Oh, my darling. Oh, oh, Harold, don't. Please, darling. It really wasn't so bad. I had a very easy time. It's a girl, you know. I'm sorry. Oh, dearest, I don't care what it is. Just as long as you love me. Silly, of course I do. It's funny when they showed her to me. It's like being introduced to a perfect stranger. Oh, darling, we'll get acquainted with her. Together. Well, come on, Nick. Our job's finished. Let's go home. Oh, Dr. Clay. Yes? I think I'd like to have a look at Mrs. Ashforth's baby. Of course. I'll have her nurse show it to you. Uh, just a moment, please. This is the first time I ever knew you to show an interest in the nursery. I'm playing a hunch, Betsy. Oh? A hunch that may split this case wide open. Mr. Carter, this is where we keep the babies. I'm sorry you can't go in, but I've asked the other nurse to bring the baby to the window. I'll motion to her. You haven't many babies here, have you? No, this is a small private hospital, you see. Oh, there she is. It's a fine, healthy-looking little girl, isn't she? So that's supposed to be the Ashforth baby. Hmm? What do you mean, supposed? There's a name on a tag. I put it there myself. That baby's at least three days old. Moreover, forceps were used at her delivery. Patsy, you heard Mrs. Ashworth say she had a very easy time. Nick, you mean it's been a mistake? Mistake nothing. It's been a criminal substitution. Nurse, how much did Mr. Timothy Brent pay you to substitute a girl for a boy baby? How dare you? I'll call Dr. Clay and have you arrested for slander. Oh, no, you won't. Of course, if you do, I'll insist that the police take a blood test of that baby. And if that test proves the baby's blood does not belong to Mr. and Mrs. Asforth's blood group, you'll end up in behind bars for a long, long stretch. Oh, no. No, don't. I'll tell you everything. I did it for Timothy Brent. He said his niece would lose her mind if she had a boy baby. He said that... You lie. I had nothing to do with it. You did, Mr. Brent. You brought her here. You arranged for the whole thing. Are you double-crossing little... Easy, easy. You'll wake the patient's. Now then, nurse, where's the real Ashworth baby, the boy? In the first crib by the door, Mr. Carter. You're sure there's no mistake this time? Yes, that's the Ashworth baby. Very well. Patsy, I think we'll introduce him to his mother. We'll talk to you later, nurse, and to you, Mr. Brent. I wouldn't have done it, but Mr. Brent said... I have nothing to do with this. Later, Brent, later. All right, Patsy, go get the baby. Don't you want to carry him in, Nick? Oh, good heavens, no. I'm afraid I might break him. Ah, uh, here we are. All right. Come, come on, on now. Betsy. Come on, come on. Oh, 
Come in. Well, Mrs. Ashworth, it seems there's been a slight mix-up. The baby they brought you before belonged to someone else. So we... Well, we thought you might like to see yours. It's a boy. A boy? Well, bring him in, Patsy. Okay. Young man, this is your mother. Oh. Oh, give him to me, please. Here you are. Oh, Harold. Oh, Harold, look at him screw his face up. Oh, he's so... So homely and so darling. I'd know he belonged to us anywhere. In just a moment, Nick will tell you the clues that enable him to solve the case of the vanishing lady. But now, there's always added warmth of hospitality in a home that's beautifully cared for. See to it that your home extends that sort of hospitality. It's easy when you have the three great Linux home brighteners to help you. For example, notice how your furniture takes on new loveliness after you've used Linux cream polish. Because it cleans as it polishes. One quick, easy application of Linex cream polish erases finger marks, removes dust and old polish deposits, helps conceal scratches, all at the same time. So save half the time, half the fuss of furniture upkeep. Depend on Linex cream polish, the modern shortcut to furniture protection. Get it at your dealers now. Linex cream polish which saves one whole step in your cleaning day routine. You will find all three great Linux home brighteners, Linux self-polishing wax, Linux cream polish, and Linux clear gloss varnish at your nearest hardware, paint, or department store. Your headquarters also for Chemtone, the modern wall finish that covers in one coat, dries in one hour. Now let's hear from Nick Carter himself. Nick, why didn't you have that old reprobate Uncle Tim Brent arrested? Yes, Nick. How come you let him go free? Well, when the DA's office goes over his books in order to straighten out the kid's inheritance, they'll do plenty to him without my help. Oh, of course. So that's why he had to change the boy for a girl. He's been up to some shenanigans with his brother's fortune. Obviously. Well, Nick, when did you first suspect the uncle? Right away. Oh, just like that, eh? Well, it couldn't have been anybody else. The man who met Nora on the hospital steps had to be responsible for her disappearance. Only two men knew she was on her way to the hospital. Her husband and her uncle. That's right. Her husband was left at the post, never caught up with her. Therefore, it had to be the uncle. Well, Nick, that was quite a story. Now, what can you tell us about next week's case? Well, let's see. Next week, I think I'll tell you about the pompous chemical magnet who rang our doorbell one evening, clad in pajamas, overcoat, and bare feet. And the pajama legs were partly burned off. In fact, that was the third night in a row that the old boy had been thrown out of a hotel because he... Uh, hold it, Patsy, hold it. Let's not give the whole plot away. That comes next week. Well, what do you call that story, Nick? I call it The Strange Case of the Involuntary Firebug. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is featured in Street and Smith magazines. Long Clark is starred as Nick with Helen Choate as Patsy. Original music is played by Lou White. The programs are written by Edith Miser, and any resemblance therein to actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. The entire production is under the direction of Jock McGregor. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented at this time and over these same stations each week by the three great Linux home brighteners. Linux clear gloss varnish, Linux cream polish, and Linux self-polishing wax, created by Acme, America's great producer of Acme fine quality paints. This is Ken Powell speaking for the thousands of Linux dealers all over America and saying so long until next week.
This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Cerebral Cinema hopes you have enjoyed this movie of the mind.